This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Mission of Honor, written by David Weber, narrated by Allison Johnson. December 1921, post diaspora. To understand solely foreign policy, we'd have to be sollies, and nothing would be worth that. Queen Elizabeth III of Manticore. Chapter One. Any dictionary editor stymied for an illustration of the word paralyzed would have pounced on him in an instant. In fact, a disinterested observer might have wondered if Inokenty Arsenovich Kolokoltsov, the Solarian League's permanent senior undersecretary for foreign affairs, was even breathing as he stared at the images on his display. Shock was part of that paralysis, but only part, and so was disbelief. Except that disbelief was far too pale a word for what he was feeling at that moment. He sat that way for over twenty seconds by Astrid Wang's personal chrono. Then he inhaled explosively, shook himself, and looked up at her. This is confirmed. It's the original message from the Mantecheran, sir. Wang replied. The foreign minister had the chip couriered straight over, along with the formal note, as soon as he'd viewed it. No. I mean, is there any independent confirmation of what they're saying? Despite two decades' experience in the ways of the Solarian League's bureaucracy, which included as the eleventh commandment, "Thou shalt never embarrass thy boss by word, deed, or expression," Wang actually blinked in surprise. Sir, she began a bit cautiously. According to the Mantes, this all happened at New Tuscany. And we still don't have independent confirmation of the first incident they say took place there. So, Kolokoltsov grimaced and cut her off with a wave of his hand. Of course, it hadn't. In fact, independent confirmation of the first New Tuscany incident, he could already hear the newsies capitalizing this one, would take almost another entire tea month if Joseph Bing had followed procedure. The damned mantis sat squarely inside the league's communications loop with the Talbot sector. They could get word of events there to the Sol system in little more than three T weeks, thanks to their never to be sufficiently damned wormhole junction. Whereas any direct report from New Tuscany to Old Terra would take almost two months to make the journey by dispatch boat, and if it went through the Meyer system headquarters of the Office of Frontier Security as regulations required, it would take over eleven T weeks. And assuming the Mantes aren't lying and manufacturing all this evidence for some godforsaken reason, any report from Bing has to have been routed by way of Myers. He thought, if he'd shortcut the regulations and sent it directly by way of Mesa and Visigoth, like any admiral with a functional brain would have, it would have been here eight days ago. He felt an uncharacteristic urge to rip the display unit from his desk and hurl it across the room. To watch it shatter and bounce back in broken bits and pieces, to curse at the top of his lungs in pure, unprocessed rage, but despite the fact that someone from pre-diaspora Old Terra would have estimated his age at no more than forty, he was actually eighty-five T years old. He'd spent almost seventy of those years working his way up to his present position, and now those decades of discipline, of learning how the game was played, came to his rescue. He remembered the twelfth commandment: "Thou shalt never admit the loss of thy composure before thine underlings," and actually managed to smile at his chief of staff. That was a silly question, wasn't it, Astrid? I guess I'm not as immune to the effects of surprise as I'd always thought I was. No, sir, Wang smiled back, but her own surprise, at the strength of his reaction as much as at the news itself, still showed in her blue eyes. I don't think anyone would be under these circumstances.、Mm, maybe not, but there's going to be hell to pay over this one. He told her completely unnecessarily. He wondered if he'd said it because he still hadn't recovered his mental balance. Get hold of Vodolovsky, Abruzzi, McCartney, Cordemain, and Rajampet. He went on. I want them here in conference one in one hour. Sir Admiral Rajampet is meeting with that delegation from the AG's office and. I don't care who he's meeting with," Kolokoltsev said flatly. "Just tell him to be here." "Yes, sir.、Uh, may I tell him why the meeting is so urgent?" "No," 
Kolokoltsov smiled thinly. If the Mantis are telling the truth, I don't want him turning up with any prepared comments. This one's too important for that kind of nonsense. So what's this all about, anyway? Fleet Admiral Rajampet Kashal Rajani demanded as he strode into the conference room. He was the last to arrive, a circumstance Kolokoltsov had taken some care to arrange. Rajampet was a small, wiry man with a dyspeptic personality well-suited to his almost painfully white hair and deeply wrinkled face. Although he remained physically spry and mentally alert, he was 123 years old, which made him one of the oldest human beings alive. Indeed, when the original first-generation prolonged therapy was initially developed, he'd missed being too old for it by less than five months. He'd also been an officer in the Solarian League Navy since he was 19, although he hadn't held a space-going command in over half a T-century, and he was rather proud of the fact that he did not suffer fools gladly. Of course, most of the rest of the human race was composed almost exclusively of fools in his considered opinion, but Kolokoltsov could hardly quibble with him on that particular point. Rajampet was also a formidable force within the Solarian League's all-powerful bureaucratic hierarchy, although he fell just short of the very uppermost niche. He knew all of the Navy's ins and outs, all of its senior admirals, the complex web of its family alliances and patronage, where all the bodies were buried, and precisely whose pockets were filled at the trough of the Navy's graft and corruption. After all, his own were prominent among them, and he personally controlled the spigots through which all the rest of it flowed. Now, if only the idiot knew what the hell his precious navy was up to, Kolokoltsov thought coldly. It seems we have a small problem, Rajani, he said out loud, beckoning the gorgeously bemetalled admiral towards a chair at the table. It bloody well better not be a small problem, Rajampet muttered, only half under his breath, as he stalked across to the indicated chair. I beg your pardon, Kolokoltsov said, with the air of a man who hadn't quite heard what someone had said. I was in the middle of a meeting with the Attorney General's people, Rajampet replied, without apologizing for his earlier comment. They still aren't done with all the indictments for those damned trials, which means we're only just now getting that whole business with Technodyne sorted out. I promised Omosupe and Agata. He twitched his head at Omosupe Quartermain, Permanent Senior Undersecretary of Commerce, and Permanent Senior Undersecretary of the Treasury, Agata Vodolovsky, a recommendation on the restructuring by the end of the week. It's taken forever just to get everyone assembled so we could sit down and talk about it, and I don't appreciate being yanked away from something that important. I can understand why you'd resent being interrupted, Rajani, Kolokoltsov said coolly. Unfortunately, this small matter's come up and it needs to be dealt with immediately. And his dark eyes bored suddenly into Rajampet's across the table. Unless I'm seriously mistaken, it's rather closely related to what got Technodyne into trouble in the first place. What? Rajampet settled the last couple of centimeters into his chair, and his expression was as perplexed as his voice. What are you talking about? Despite his own irritation, Kolokoltsov could almost understand the admiral's confusion. The repercussions of the Battle of Monaco were still wending their way through the Navy's labyrinthine bowels, and the gladiatorial circus of the courts was only just beginning, really, but the battle itself had been fought over ten T months ago. Although the SLN hadn't been directly involved in the Royal Manticoran Navy's destruction of the Monacan Navy, the consequences for Technodyne Industries had been profound and Technodyne had been one of the Navy's major contractors for 400 years. It was perfectly reasonable for Rajampet, as the chief of naval operations, to be deeply involved in trying to salvage something from the shipwreck of investigations, indictments, and show trials, and Kolokoltsov never doubted that the admiral's attention had been tightly focused on that task for the past several tea weeks. Even if it would have been helpful if he'd been able to give a modicum of his attention to dealing with this other little problem, the diplomat thought grimly. I'm talking about the Talbot Cluster, Rajani, he said out loud, letting just a trace of overtried patience into his voice. I'm talking about that incident between your Admiral Bing and the Mantis. 
What about it? Rajampit's tone was suddenly a bit cautious, his eyes wary, as instincts honed by a tea century of bureaucratic infighting reared their heads. It would appear the Mantis were just as pissed off as their original note indicated they were, Kolokoltsev told him. And? Rajampit's eyes turned warier than ever, and he seemed to settle back into his chair. And they weren't joking about sending their Admiral Goldpeak to inquire into matters on the ground in New Tuscany. They weren't? The question came from Vorolovsky, not Rajampit, and Kolokoltsov glanced at her. She was 25 T years younger than he was, a third-generation prolong recipient with dark red hair, gray eyes, and quite an attractive figure. She was also fairly new to her position as the real head of the Treasury Department, and she'd received it following her predecessor's demise only as a compromise between the other permanent senior undersecretaries. She knew perfectly well that she'd been everyone else's second choice, that all her current colleagues had allies they would really have preferred to see in that slot, but she'd been there for over a decade now, and she'd solidified her power base quite nicely. She was no longer the junior probationary member of the quintet of permanent undersecretaries who truly ran the League, from their personal fiefdoms in the Foreign Ministry, Commerce Department, Interior Department, Department of Education and Information, and Treasury Department. She was, however, the only one of them who'd been out-system and unavailable when the first Manticoran diplomatic note arrived. As such, she could make an excellent claim to bearing no responsibility for how that note had been handled, and from her expression, Kolokoltsev thought sourly, she was thoroughly aware of that minor fact. No, Agata, he said, moving his gaze to her. No, they weren't. And just over a tea month ago, on November the 17th, to be precise, Admiral Goldpeak arrived at New Tuscany, to find Admiral Bing still there. Oh, shit, permanent senior undersecretary of the interior, Nathan McCartney muttered. Don't tell us Bing opened fire on her, too. If he did, I'm sure it was only because she provoked it, Rajampit said sharply. With all due respect, Rajani, permanent senior undersecretary of education and information, Malachi Abruzzi said tartly, I wouldn't bet my life on that. Rajampit glared at him angrily, and Abruzzi shrugged. As far as I can tell from the Mantis' first note, none of their ships did a damn thing to provoke him the first time he killed several hundred of their spacers. That being so, is there any reason we ought to assume he wouldn't just as cheerfully kill a few thousand more for no particular reason? I'll remind you, Rajampit said even more sharply, that none of us were there, and the only evidence we have of what truly happened was delivered to us oh so generously by the Mantis. I see no reason to believe they'd be above tampering with the censor data they provided to us. In fact, one of my people over at Operational Analysis commented at the time that the data seemed suspiciously good and detailed. Abruzzi only snorted, although Kolokoltsov suspected he was tempted to do something considerably more forceful. The vast majority of the Solarian League's member star systems looked after their own educational systems, which meant, despite its name, that education and information was primarily concerned with the information half of its theoretical responsibilities. Abruzzi's position thus made him, in effect, the Solarian League's chief propagandist, in that role, it had been his job to find a positive spin to put on Joseph Bing's actions, and he'd been working on it ever since the Mantis' first diplomatic note reached Old Chicago. So far, he hadn't had a lot of success, which wasn't too surprising, Kolokoltsev thought sourly. When a Solarian admiral commanding 17 battlecruisers opened fire without warning on three destroyers, who didn't even have their wedges and sidewalls up, it was going to be just a trifle difficult to convince even the Solarian public he'd been justified. Nor was there much chance that any reports or censor data the Navy finally got around to providing were going to make things any better. Not without an awful lot of tweaking first, at least. Rajampet could say whatever he liked about the data the Mantis had provided, but Kolokoltsev agreed with Abruzzi's original analysis. The Mantis would never have sent them falsified data, 
not when they knew that eventually the League would be receiving accurate tactical data from its own people. All I'll say, Rajani, Abruzzi said after a moment, is that I'm just glad the Mantis haven't leaked this to the Newsies, yet at least. Because as hard as we've been trying, we haven't been able to find a way to make them look like the aggressors. And that means that when this does hit the faxes, we're going to find ourselves in a very difficult position, one where we'll probably have to apologize and actually offer to pay reparations. No, damn it, Rajampit snapped, betrayed by anger into forgetting, at least briefly, his former wariness. We can't establish that kind of precedent. If any pissant little neobarb navy decides the SLN can't tell it what to do, we're gonna have a hell of a problem out in the verge. And if Bing's been forced into another exchange of fire with them, we have to be even more careful about what sort of precedents we set. I'm afraid you're entirely correct about that one, Rajani, Kolokultsev said, and his frigid tone snapped everyone's eyes back to him. And, unfortunately, I'm equally afraid Nathan's mistaken about the Mantis' degree of discretion where the Newsies are concerned. What the hell do you mean? Rajampit demanded. Go ahead, spit it out. All right, Rajani. Approximately 90 minutes ago, we received a second note from the Manticorans. Under the circumstances, the fact that we decided to opt for a reasoned and deliberate response to their original complaint and refused to let anyone think we were allowing ourselves to be rushed by any Manticoran demands may have been less optimal than we'd thought. I don't imagine getting our response to their first note a couple of days after they banged off their second note to us is going to amuse Queen Elizabeth and her Prime Minister very much. And the reason they've sent us this second note is that when Admiral Goldpeak arrived in New Tuscany, she issued exactly the demands the Mantis had warned us about in their first note. She demanded that Bing stand down his ships and permit Manticoran boarding parties to sequester and examine their sensor data relative to the destruction of three of her destroyers. She also informed him that the Star Empire of Manticore intended to insist upon an open examination of the facts and intended to hold the guilty parties responsible under the appropriate provisions of interstellar law for the unprovoked destruction of their ships and the deaths of their personnel, and... Kolokoltsev allowed his eyes to flip sideways to Abruzzi for a moment. It would appear it wasn't all part of some sort of propaganda maneuver on their part after all. I don't. Rajampit's wrinkled face was darkened and his eyes glittered with fury. I can't believe anyone, even Mantis, would be stupid enough to really issue demands to the Solarian Navy. They'd have to be out of... I mean, surely this gold peak couldn't possibly have thought she'd get away with that. If Bing blew her damn ships into orbital debris, the only person she's got to blame for it is... Oh, he didn't blow up any of her ships, Rajani, Kolokoltsev said coldly. Despite the fact that she had only six battle cruisers and he had 17, she blew his flagship into, what was it you called it? Uh, yes, into orbital debris. Rajampet froze in mid-tirade, staring at Kolokoltsov in disbelief. Oh, my God, Omasupe Kordemain said quietly. Of everyone present, she and Rajampet probably personally disliked Manticorans the most. In Rajampet's case, that was because the Royal Manticoran Navy declined to kowtow satisfactorily to the Solarian League Navy's supremacy. In Quartermain's case, it was because of how deeply she resented Manticore's wormhole junction and its merchant marine's dominance of the League's carrying trade— which meant, among other things, that she had a very clear idea of how much damage the Star Empire of Manticore could do to the League's economy if it decided to retaliate economically for Solarian aggression. How many ships did the Mantis lose this time? She continued in a resigned tone, clearly already beginning to reckon up the restitution the Star Empire might find itself in a position to extort out of the League. Oh, they didn't lose any ships, Kolokoltsev replied. What? Rajampet exploded. That's goddamned nonsense. No Solarian flag officer's going to roll over and take something like that without... In that case, Rajani, I recommend you read Admiral Sigby's report yourself. 
She found herself in command after Admiral Bing's demise, and the Mantis were kind enough to forward her dispatches to us along with their note. According to our own security people, they didn't even open the file and read it first. Apparently, they saw no reason to. This time, Rajampet was clearly bereft of speech. He just sat there, staring at Kolokoltsev, and the diplomat shrugged. According to the synopsis of Admiral Sigby's report, the Mantis destroyed Admiral Bing's flagship, the Jean Bart, with a single missile salvo launched from far beyond our own ship's effective range. His flagship was completely destroyed, Rajani. There were no survivors at all. Under the circumstances, and since Admiral Goldpeak, who I suppose I might also mention, turns out to be none other than Queen Elizabeth's first cousin and fifth in line for the Manticoran throne, had made it crystal clear that she'd destroy all of Bing's ships if her demands were not met. Admiral Sigby, under protest, I need hardly add, complied with them. She! Rajampet couldn't get the complete sentence out, but Kolokoltsev nodded anyway. She surrendered, Rajani, he said in a marginally gentler voice, and the admiral closed his mouth with a snap. He wasn't the only one staring at Kolokoltsev in horrified disbelief now. All the others seemed struck equally dumb, and Kolokoltsev took a certain satisfaction from seeing the reflection of his own stunned reaction in their expressions, which, he admitted, was the only satisfaction he was likely to be feeling today. On the face of it, the loss of a single ship and the surrender of twenty or so others, counting Bing screening destroyers, could hardly be considered a catastrophe for the Solarian League Navy. The SLN was the biggest fleet in the galaxy. Counting active duty and reserve squadrons, it boasted almost 11,000 super dreadnoughts, and that didn't even count the thousands upon thousands of battlecruisers, cruisers, and destroyers of battle fleet and frontier fleet, or the thousands of ships in the various system defense forces maintained for local security by several of the League's wealthier member systems. Against that kind of firepower, against such a massive preponderance of tonnage, the destruction of a single battlecruiser and the 2,000 or so people aboard it was less than a flea bite. It was certainly a far, far smaller relative loss, in terms of both tonnage and personnel, that the Manticorans had suffered when Bing blew three of their newest destroyers out of space with absolutely no warning. But it was the first Solarian warship destroyed by hostile action in centuries, and no Solarian League admiral had ever surrendered his command. Until now. And that was what truly had the others worried, Kolokoltsev thought coldly just as it had him worried. The omnipotence of the Solarian League Navy was the fundamental bedrock upon which the entire League stood. The whole purpose of the League was to maintain interstellar order, protect and nurture the interactions, prosperity, and sovereignty of its member systems. There'd been times, more times than Kolokoltsev could count, really, when Rajampet and his predecessors had found themselves fighting tooth and nail for funding, given the fact that it was so obvious that no one conceivable hostile star nation or combination of them could truly threaten the League's security. Yet while they might have had to fight for the funding they wanted, they'd never come close to not getting the funding they actually needed. In fact, their fellow bureaucrats had never seriously considered cutting off or even drastically curtailing expenditures on the Navy. Partly that was because no matter how big Frontier Fleet was, it would never have enough ships to be everywhere it needed to be to carry out its mandate as the League's neighborhood cop and enforcer. Battlefleet would have been a much more reasonable area for cost reductions, except that it had more prestige and was even more deeply entrenched in the League's bureaucratic structure than Frontier Fleet, not to mention having so many more allies in the industrial sector, given how lucrative super-dreadnought building contracts were. But even the most fanatical expenditure-cutting reformer, assuming that any such mythical being existed anywhere in the Solarian League, would have found very few allies if he'd set his sights on the Navy's budget. Supporting the fleet was too important to the economy as a whole, and all the patronage that went with the disbursement of such enormous amounts was far too valuable to be surrendered. And after all, making certain everyone else was as well aware as they were of the Navy's invincibility 
was an essential element of the clout wielded by the League in general and by the Office of Frontier Security in particular. But now that invincibility had been challenged. Worse, although Kolokoltsov was no expert on naval matters, even the synopsis of Sigby's dispatches had made her shock at the effective range and deadliness of the Mantikoran missiles abundantly clear even to him. She surrendered? Permanent Senior Undersecretary of the Interior Nathan McCartney repeated very carefully after a moment, clearly making certain he hadn't misunderstood. Kolokoltsov was actually surprised anyone had recovered that quickly, especially McCartney. The Office of Frontier Security came under the control of the Department of the Interior, and after Rajamp and himself, it was McCartney whose responsibilities and arrangements were most likely to suffer if the rest of the galaxy began to question just how invincible the Solarian Navy truly was. She did, Kolokoltsov confirmed. And the Mantis did board her ships, and they did take possession of their computers, their fully operable computers, with intact databases. At the time, she was permitted to include her dispatches along with Admiral Goldpeaks, so we could receive her report as promptly as possible. She had no idea what ultimate disposition the Mantis intend to make where her ships are concerned. My God. Quartermain said again, shaking her head. Sigby didn't even dump her data cores, McCartney demanded incredulously. Given that Goldpeak had just finished blowing one of her ships into tiny pieces, I think the Admiral was justified in concluding the Mantis might really go ahead and pull the trigger if they discovered she dumped her data cores, Kolokoltsev replied. But if they got all their data, including the secure sections... McCartney's voice trailed off, and Kolokoltsev smiled thinly. Then they've got an enormous amount of our secure technical data, he agreed. Even worse, these were frontier fleet ships. McCartney looked physically ill. He was even better aware than Kolokoltsev of how the rest of the galaxy might react if some of the official, highly secret contingency plans stored in the computers of Frontier Fleet flagships were to be leaked. There was another moment of sickly silence, then Vodolovsky cleared her throat. What did they say in their note, Inokenti? she asked. They say the data they've recovered from Bing's computers completely supports the data they already sent to us. They say they've recovered Sigby's copy of Bing's order to open fire on the Mantikoran destroyers. They've appended her copy of the message traffic between Gold Peak and Bing as well, and pointed out that Gold Peak repeatedly warned Bing not only that she would fire if he failed to comply with her instructions, but that she had the capability to destroy his ships from beyond his effective range. And by the way, Sigby's attested the accuracy of the copies from her communications section. In other words, they've told us their original interpretation of what happened to their destroyers has been confirmed, and that the admiral responsible for that incident has now been killed, along with the destruction of his flagship and its entire crew, because he rejected their demands. And they've pointed out, in case any of us might miss it, that Bing's original actions at New Tuscany constitute an act of war under interstellar law, and that under that same interstellar law, Admiral Goldpeak was completely justified in the actions she took. Indeed, he showed his teeth in something no one would ever mistake for a smile. They've pointed out how restrained Goldpeak was under the circumstances, since Bing's entire task force was entirely at her mercy, and she gave him at least three separate opportunities to comply with their demands without bloodshed. They've declared war on the Solarian League? Abruzzi seemed unable to wrap his mind around the thought, which was particularly ironic, Kolokoltsov thought, given his original breezy assurance that the Mantikorans were only posturing, seeking an entirely cosmetic confrontation with the League in an effort to rally their battered domestic morale. No, they haven't declared war on the League, the diplomat replied out loud. In fact, they've refrained from declaring war, so far at least. I wouldn't say there's any give in their note, 
In fact, it's the most belligerent diplomatic communication I've ever seen directed to the League, and they've made no bones about observing that a de facto state of war already exists between us because of our flag officer's actions. But they've made it clear they aren't prepared to foreclose all possibility of a diplomatic resolution. Diplomatic resolution? Rajampat exploded. He slammed one fist down on the conference table. Fuck them and their diplomatic resolutions. They've destroyed a Solarian warship, killed Solarian naval personnel. I don't care whether they want a war or not, they've got one. Don't you think it might be a good idea to at least look at Sigby's messages and the data the Mantis have sent along, Rajani? McCartney demanded tartly. The Admiral glared at him, and McCartney glared right back. Didn't you hear what Inokenti just said? Gold Peak took out Jean Bart from outside Bing's effective missile range. If they outrange us that badly, then... Then it doesn't goddamn matter, Rajampit shot back. We're talking about friggin' battlecruisers, Nathan. Battle cruisers and frontier fleet battle cruisers at that. They don't begin to have the anti-missile defense as a ship of the wall does, and no battle cruiser can take the kind of damage a waller can take. I don't care how many fancy missiles they've got, there's no way they can stop battle fleet if we throw four or five hundred super dreadnoughts straight at them, especially after the losses they've already taken in their damned Battle of Manticore. I might find that thought just a little more reassuring, if not for the fact that all reports indicate they apparently just finished taking out something like three or four hundred Havenite SDs in the same battle, McCartney pointed out even more acidly. So what? Rajampit more than half sneered. One damned batch of barbarians beating on another one. What's that got to do with us? McCartney stared at him, as if he literally couldn't comprehend what Rajampet was saying, and Kolokoltsov didn't blame McCartney at all. Even allowing for the fact that all of this had come at the CNO cold. Excuse me, Rajani, the diplomat said. But don't our ships of the wall and our battlecruisers have the same effective missile range? Rajampet glowered at him, then nodded. Then I think we have to assume their ships of the wall have at least the same effective missile range as their battlecruisers, which means they outrange us too. And given the fact that the Republic of Haven has been fighting them for something like, oh, twenty T years and is still in existence, I think we have to assume they can match Manticore's combat range, since they'd have been forced to surrender quite some time ago if they couldn't. So if the Mantis manage to destroy or capture three or four hundred Havenite super dreadnoughts, Despite the fact that they had equivalent weapon ranges, what makes you think they couldn't stop 500 of our ships if they outrange us significantly? At least the Havenites could shoot back, you know. So we send a thousand, Rajampet said. Or hell, we send twice that many. We've got over 2,000 in full commission, another 300 in the yards for regular overhaul and refit cycles, and over 8,000 in reserve. They may have beaten the crap out of the Havenites, but they got the shit shot out of them, too, from all reports. They can't have more than a hundred of the wall left, and however long-range their missiles may be, it takes hundreds of laser heads to take out a single super dreadnought. Against the kind of counter-missile fire and decoys five or six hundred of our wallers can throw out, they'd need a hell of a lot more missiles than anything they've got left could possibly throw. And you think they wouldn't still be able to kill a lot of our ships and a lot of our spacers? Vodolovsky demanded skeptically. Oh, they could hurt us, Rajampet conceded. There's no way in the universe they could stop us, but I don't doubt we'd get hurt worse than the Navy's ever been hurt before. But that's beside the point, Agatha. Her eyebrows arched skeptically, and he barked a short, sharp, and ugly laugh. Of course it's beside the point, he said. The point of this is that a jumped-up neobarb navies opened fire on the SLN, destroyed one of our warships, and captured an entire Solarian task group. We can't let that stand. No matter what it costs, we have to establish that no one, no one fucks with the Solarian navy. If we don't make that point right here, right now, who else is likely to suddenly decide he can issue ultimatums to the fleet? 
He turned his glower on McCartney. You should understand that if anyone can, Nathan. All right, McCartney replied, manifestly unhappily. I take your point. He looked around the conference table at his civilian colleagues. The truth is, he told them, that big as it is, Frontier Fleet can't possibly be everywhere it needs to be, not in any sort of strength. It manages to maintain nodes of concentrated strength at the various sector HQs and support bases, but even they get stretched pretty thin from time to time, and most of the time we send a single ship, at most a division or two, to deal with trouble spots as they turn hot, because we can't afford to weaken those concentrated nodes by diverting more units from them. And what Rajani's saying is that because we're spread so thinly, there are a lot of times when we don't actually have the firepower on the spot to enforce our policies. But what we do have on the spot is a representative of the entire Navy. Under the wrong circumstances, an unfriendly power may well have enough combat power to destroy whatever detachment we've sent out to show it the error of its ways. But they don't, because they know that if they do, the rest of the Navy, however much of it it takes, is going to turn up and destroy them. Exactly, Rajampit agreed, nodding vigorously. That's exactly the point. I don't care how damn justified the Mantis may have thought they were. For that matter, I don't care how justified they may actually have been, and I don't give a damn whether or not they were operating within the letter of interstellar war. What I care about is the fact that we have to make an example out of them if we don't want to suddenly find ourselves eyeball to eyeball with other neobarbs all over the galaxy who suddenly think they can screw around with the Solarian League, too. Wait. Malachi Abruzzi shook himself, then looked at Kolokoltsev. Before we go any further, what did you mean about their discretion where the Newsies were concerned, Inakenti? I mean, they officially released the news of Bing's attack on their destroyers and their response to it the same day they sent us this note, Kolokoltsev said flatly. Abruzzi stared at him in obvious disbelief, and Kolokoltsev smiled thinly. I imagine we should be hearing about it shortly, he continued, since, according to their note, they intended to release the news to their own media six hours after their dispatch boat cleared the junction headed for Old Terra. They've already released the news? Abruzzi seemed stunned in a way even the news of Jean Bart's destruction had failed to achieve. That's what they tell us, Kolokoltsev shrugged. When you get right down to it, they may not have a lot of choice. It's been two months since the first incident, and the communications loop from New Tuscany to Manticore is only about three weeks. Word of something this big was bound to leak to their newsies pretty damned quickly after Bing managed to get himself blown away. Rajambit's eyes glittered at his choice of words, but Kolokoltsev didn't especially care. Under the circumstances, they probably figured they couldn't keep it under wraps much longer even if they tried, so they damned well better get their version of it out first, especially to their own people. Then the bastards really have painted us all into a corner, Rajampit snarled. If they've gone ahead and broadcast this thing to the entire galaxy, we've got even less choice about how hard we respond. Just hold on, Rajani, Abruzzi said sharply. The admiral glared at him, and he glared right back. We don't have any idea at this point how they've positioned themselves on this, until we've at least had a chance to see the spin they put on it, we aren't in any position to decide how we want to spin our own response to it. And trust me on this one, we're going to have to handle it very, very carefully. Why? Rajampit snapped. Because the truth is that your idiot admiral was in the wrong, at least the first time around. Abruzzi replied coldly, meeting the admiral's eyes glare for glare. We can't debate this on their terms without conceding that point. And if public opinion decides he was wrong and they were right, and if we handle this even slightly wrong, the hullabaloo you're still dealing with over Technodyne and Monica's going to look like a pillow fight. If it does, it does, 
Rajambit said flatly. You do remember the Constitution gives every single member system veto power, don't you? Abruzzi inquired. Rajambit glared at him and he shrugged. If you wind up needing a formal declaration of war, don't you think it would be a good thing if nobody out there, like, oh, Beowulf, for example, decided to exercise that power? We don't need any friggin' declarations of war. This is a clear-cut case of self-defense, of responding to an actual attack on our ships and personnel, and the judiciary's interpretation of Article 7 has always supported the Navy's authority to respond to that kind of attack in whatever strength is necessary. Kolokoltsev started to respond to that statement, then made himself pause. Rajambet had a point about the judiciary's interpretation of Article 7 of the League Constitution, historically at least. The third section of that particular article had been specifically drafted to permit the SLN to respond to emergency situations without waiting weeks or months for reports to trickle back to the Capitol and for the ponderous political mechanism to issue formal declarations of war. It had not, however, been intended by the Constitution's drafters as a blank check, and if Rajampet wanted to move the Navy to an actual war footing, to begin mobilizing additional super-dreadnoughts from the Reserve, for example, someone was going to point out that he needed the authorization of that same formal declaration, at which point someone else was going to support Rajampet's position. At which point we'll wind up with a constitutional crisis as well as a military one, Kolokoltsev thought grimly. Wonderful. He wondered how many of his colleagues grasped the true gravity of the threat they faced. If Rajambat was able to crush Manticore quickly after all, this would almost certainly blow over, as many another Tempest had over the course of the League's long history. But if the Navy couldn't crush Manticore quickly, if this turned into a succession of bloody fiascos, not even the most resounding ultimate victory would be enough to prevent seismic shockwaves throughout the entire tissue of bureaucratic fiefdoms which held the League together. He suspected from Abruzzi's attitude that Malachi, if no one else, had at least an inkling of just how dangerous this could turn out to be. Vodolovsky probably did too, although it was harder to tell in her case. Rajampet obviously wasn't thinking that far ahead, and Kolokoltsev honestly didn't have a clue whether or not McCartney and Quartermain were able to see beyond the immediate potential consequences for their own departments. I agree with you about the historical interpretation of Article 7, Rajani, he said out loud, finally. I think you'd be well advised to consult with Brongven about the precedents, though, and to make sure the rest of her people over at Justice are on board with you for this one. Of course I'll check with her. Rajampet replied a bit more calmly. In the meantime, though, I'm confident I've got the authority to respond by taking prudent military precautions. He smiled thinly. And there's always the old saying about the best defense being a strong offense. Maybe there is, Abruzzi said. And I'll even agree that apologizing later is usually easier than getting permission first but I'd also like to point out that this one's quite a bit different from usually. So if you intend to sell that to the assembly in a way that's going to keep some of the busybodies over there from demanding all sorts of inquiries and holding all kinds of hearings, we're going to have to prepare the ground for it carefully anyway. Some of those people over there think they really ought to be in charge, you know, and the ones who think that way are likely to try to use this. As long as there's no strong public support for them, they aren't going to accomplish much, all the inertia in the systems against them. But if we want to deny them that public support, we're going to have to show everyone that you not only have that authority, but that we're in the right in this particular confrontation. Despite what you just said about my idiot admiral? Anger crackled in Rajampet's voice. If the adjective offends you, I'm sorry. Abruzzi didn't waste a lot of effort on the sincerity of his tone but the fact remains that he was in the wrong. Then how in hell do you think we're going to convince that public support of yours we're in the right if we smash the mantis like they deserve? Rajampet sneered. We lie. Abruzzi shrugged. It's not like we haven't done it before, and in the end, the truth is what the winner says it is. But in order to rebut the mantis version effectively, I have to know what it is first. 
and we can't make any military moves until after I've had a chance to do the preliminary spade work. Spade work. This time, Rajampit's sneer was marginally more restrained. Then he snorted harshly. Fine, you do your spade work. In the end, it's going to be my super dreadnoughts that make it stand up, though. Abruzzi started to shoot something back, but Omosupe Quartermain interrupted him. Let's not get carried away, she said. The others looked at her, and she shrugged. No matter what's happened, let's not just automatically assume we've got to move immediately to some sort of military response. You say they haven't ruled out the possibility of a diplomatic settlement in Okenti? Well, I'm sure the settlement they have in mind is us making apologies and offering them reparations. But what if we turn the tables? Even the Mantis have to be capable of doing the same math Rajani just did for us. They have to know that if push comes to shove, any qualitative advantage they might have can't possibly stand up to our quantitative advantage. So what if we were to tell them we're outraged by their high-handedness, their unilateral escalation of the confrontation before they even had our response to their first note? What if we tell them it's our position that, because of that escalation, all the additional bloodshed at New Tuscany was their responsibility— regardless of how Bing may have responded to their ultimatum. And what if we tell them we demand apologies and reparations from them on pain of an official declaration of war and the destruction of their entire star empire? You mean we hammer them hard enough over the negotiating table, demand a big enough kilo of flesh for leaving them intact, to make sure no one else is ever stupid enough to try this same kind of stunt? Abruzzi said thoughtfully. I don't know. Vodolovsky shook her head. From what you said about the tone of their note and what they've already done, don't we have to assume they'd be willing to go ahead and risk exactly that? Would they have gone this far if they weren't prepared to go farther? It's easy to be brave before the other fellow actually aims his pulser at you, Rajampet pointed out. Several of the others looked at him with combined skepticism and surprise, and he grunted. I don't really like it, he admitted. And I stand by what I said earlier. We can't let this pass, can't let them get away with it. But that doesn't mean Omosupe's idea isn't worth trying first. If they apologize abjectly enough... And if they're willing to throw this gold peak to the wolves, and if they're ready to cough up a big enough reparation, then we'll be in the position of graciously restraining ourselves instead of hammering their pathetic little star empire flat. And if they're still too stupid to accept the inevitable, he shrugged, we send in however much of battle fleet it takes and squash them like a bug. It was obvious how he expected it to work out in the end, Kolokoltsov thought. And the hell of it was that even though Quartermain's idea was probably worth trying, Rajampet was even more probably right. Vodolovsky was obviously thinking the same thing. I think we ought to do some risk-benefit analysis before we go embracing any military options, she said. Omosupe you're probably in a better position over at Commerce to come up with what kind of impact it would have if Mantico closed down our shipping through the wormholes they control. For that matter, just pulling their merchant ships off the League's cargo routes would probably hit our economy pretty damned hard. But whether that's true or not, I can tell you even without looking at the numbers that our financial markets will take a significant hit if the Mantis disrupt interstellar financial transactions as badly as they could. So we take an economic downtick, Rajampit shrugged. That's happened before, even without the Mantis getting behind and pushing it, and it's never been more than a short-term problem. I'm willing to concede this one could be worse, but even if it were, we'd still survive it. And don't forget this either, Agatha. 
If we go all the way, then, when the smoke clears, the Manticoran Wormhole Junction will belong to the Solarian League, not the Mantis. That ought to save your shippers a pretty penny in transit fees over at Commerce, Omasupe. And even if it doesn't, he smiled avariciously. All those fees would be coming to the League, not Manticore. Relatively speaking, it probably wouldn't mean all that much compared to our overall gross interstellar product, but it sure as hell ought to be enough to pay for whatever the war costs, and it would be an ongoing revenue source that brings in a nice piece of pocket change every year. And it would get the Montes out of our hair in the verge, too, McCartney said slowly. It's worst over around Talbot right now, but I don't like the way they've been sniffing around the Maya sector either. Slow down, everybody, Kolokultsev said firmly. They all looked at him, and he shook his head. Whatever we do or don't do, we're not going to make our mind up sitting around this conference table this afternoon. That's pretty much what we did with their first note, isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong, but that doesn't seem to have worked out all that well, does it? And for that matter, Malachi's right on the money about the way we have to handle this for public consumption. I want to see how the Mantis are spinning this in the faxes, and before we start suggesting any policies, I want us to think about it this time. I want all the data we have analyzed. I want the best possible models of what they've really got militarily, and I want a realistic estimate on how long military operations against the Mantis would take. I'm talking about one that uses the most pessimistic assumptions, Rajani. I want any errors to be on the side of caution, not overconfidence. And I want to see some kind of numbers from you and Agata, Omasupe, about what a full-scale war with Manticore could really cost us in economic and financial terms. There was silence around the table, a silence that was just a bit sullen on Rajampit's part, Kolokotsov thought. But it was also thoughtful, and he saw a high degree of agreement as he surveyed his fellow civilians' faces. At this moment, I'm strongly inclined to agree with Rajampant's reasoning, Nathan McCartney said after several seconds. But I also agree with you and Agatha about looking before we leap, Inokenti. And with Malachi about doing the spade work ahead of time as well. For that matter, if the Mantis have taken out Bing's task force, there can't be much left in sector for us to be launching any offensives with. I know for damn sure that Lorcan Verrocchio isn't going to be authorizing any additional action by the handful of frontier fleet battlecruisers and cruisers he's got left in the Madras sector at any rate. And I don't think the Mantis are going to go looking for yet another incident while this one's hanging over their heads. I doubt they are either, Kolokotsev agreed. On the other hand, I think we may need to put together a new note pretty quickly, one that makes the fact that we are distinctly unhappy with them abundantly clear, but adopts a cool-headed reason attitude. We'll tell them we'll get back to them as soon as we've had an opportunity to study the available information, but I think we need to get that done more quickly than we did last time around. Unless there are any objections, I'll recommend to the foreign minister that we get a stern but reasonable note off no later than tomorrow morning. Suit yourself, Rajampit said, and there might have been just a flicker of something in his eyes that Kolokoltsev didn't really care for. I think it's going to come down to shooting in the end, but I'm more than willing to go along with the attempt to avoid it first. And there won't be any unilateral decisions on your part to send reinforcements to Myers? Kolokoltsev pressed, trying hard not to sound overtly suspicious. I'm not planning on sending any reinforcements to Myers, Rajampit replied. Mind you, I'm not going to just sit here on my arse either. I'm going to be looking very hard at everything we can scrape up to throw at Manticore if it comes to that and I'm probably going to start activating and manning at least a little of the reserve fleet as well. But until we all agree a different policy's in order, I'll leave the balance of forces in the Talbot area just where it is. He shrugged. There's damn all we can do about it right now anyway, given the communications lag.
Kolokoltsov still wasn't fully satisfied, and he still didn't care for that eye flicker of whatever it had been, but there was nothing concrete he could find fault with, and so he only nodded. All right, he said then, and glanced at his chrono. I'll have full copies of the Mantis note, Sigby's report, and the accompanying technical data distributed to all of you by 1400. Chapter 2 I can't believe this, Fleet Admiral Winston Kingsford, CO Battlefleet, half muttered. I mean, I always knew Joseph hated the Mantis, but still. His voice trailed off as he realized what he just said. It wasn't the most diplomatic comment he could possibly have made, since it was Fleet Admiral Rajampet who had personally suggested Joseph Bing as the CO of Task Group 3021. Kingsford had thought it was a peculiar decision at the time, since the task group was a frontier fleet formation, and Bing, like Kingsford, was a battle fleet officer. He'd also expected Fleet Admiral Ingracia Alonso Iyanez, frontier fleet's commanding officer, to resist Bing's appointment. For that matter, he'd expected Bing to turn it down. From a battle fleet perspective, a frontier fleet command had to be viewed as a de facto demotion, and Joseph Bing had certainly had the family connections to avoid it if he'd chosen to. All of which suggested it might not be a good idea to even hint at, I told you so, now that things had gone so disastrously awry. Believe it, Rajampit said heavily. The two of them sat in Rajampit's luxurious office at the very apex of the Navy building's 400 stories. The view through the genuine windows was spectacular, and in another 30 or 40 years, it would almost certainly belong to one Winston Kingsford, assuming he didn't screw up irretrievably between now and then. Have you looked at the technical material yet, sir? He asked. Not yet. Rajampit shook his head. I doubt very much that you'll find any clues as to secret Manticker and super weapons in it. Even if they've got them, I'm sure they'll have vacuumed the sensor data before they send it on to us. And since Sigby surrendered all of her ships, I'd imagine they did a pretty fair job of vacuuming her computers, too. So I don't think we're going to get a lot of insight into their hardware out of this, even if they do oh-so-graciously return our property to us. With your permission, sir, I'll hand this over to Karl Heinz and Heishwun anyway. Admiral Karl Heinz Tamar commanded the Solarian League Navy's Office of Naval Intelligence, and Admiral Cheng Heishwun commanded the Office of Operational Analysis. Opan was the biggest of ONI's divisions, which made Cheng Tamar's senior deputy, and also the person who should have seen this coming. Of course, Rajampa agreed, waving one hand brusquely. Then his mouth tightened. Don't hand it over until I've had a chance to talk to Karl Heinz first, though. Someone's got to tell him about Carlotte, and I guess it's up to me. Yes, sir, Kingsford said quietly, and gave himself a mental kick for forgetting Rear Admiral Carlotte Timar, Bing's chief of staff, was, had been, Karl Heinz's first cousin. Actually, getting them started on this is probably a damn good idea, even if we're not going to get much in the way of hard data out of it. I want the best evaluation Opan can give me on these new missiles of theirs. I don't expect miracles, but see what you can get out of them. Yes, sir. And while they're working on that, you and I are going to sit down and look at our deployment posture. I know the entire Manti Navy's a fart in a windstorm compared to Battlefleet, but I don't want us suffering any avoidable casualties because of overconfidence. Kolokoltsov has a point, damn him, about the difference in missile ranges. We're going to need a hammer they won't be able to stop when we go after their home system. When we go after their home system? Kingsford stressed the adverb, and Rajampet barked a grating laugh. Those civilian idiots can talk about if all they want to, Winston, but let's not you and I fool ourselves, all right? It's not if, it's when and you know it as well as I do. Those Manticoran pricks are too arrogant to recognize what their real options are. They're not going to go for this ultimatum of Quartermains, and in the end, that means we'll be going in. Besides... He broke off rather abruptly, and Kingsford raised one eyebrow at him. But the CNO only shook his head, waving his hand in another brushing-away gesture. 
The point is, he continued, that it's going to come to shooting in the end, no matter what sort of negotiations anyone may try to set up. And when it does, the strategy's actually going to be pretty damned simple, since they've only got one really important star system. They don't have any choice, strategically. If we go after Manticore itself, they have to stand and fight. No matter how long range their missiles may be, they can't just cut and run. So I want to be sure we've got enough counter missiles and point defense to stand up to their missile fire while we drive straight for their planets. It may not be pretty, but it'll work. Yes, sir, Kingsford said yet again, and he knew his superior was right. After all, that concept lay at the bottom of virtually all of Battlefleet's strategic doctrine. But however much he might agree with the CNO about that, his brain was still working on that aborted besides of Rajampets. Something about it bothered him, but what? Then he remembered. I wonder, did he even mention Sandra Crandall and her task force to the others? And while I'm wondering... Just how much did he have to do with getting her deployed to the Madras sector in the first place? It took all of his self-control to keep his eyes from narrowing in sudden, intense speculation, but this was definitely not the time to ask either of those questions. And even if he'd asked, the answers, assuming Rajampet answered him honestly, would only have raised additional questions. Besides, however far into this particular pie Rajampet's finger might be, the CNO was covered. Bing's assignment, while not precisely routine, wasn't completely unprecedented. It was certainly justifiable in the wake of the Battle of Monica and all the charges and countercharges that had spawned as well. And equally certainly, Crandall had the seniority to choose, within reason, where to carry out her training exercises. So if it just happened she'd picked the Macintosh system for exercise winter forage, or whatever she decided to call it in the end, and if that just happened to mean Task Force 496 was barely 50 light-years away from the Meyer system, that didn't necessarily indicate any collusion on Rajampet's part. Sure it didn't, he thought. And I'll bet that answers my first question, too. Hell no, he didn't tell them, and he's covered no matter what happens, because she's undoubtedly made up her own mind by now what she's going to do— and he can't possibly get orders to her in time to stop her. So, really, there was no point in telling them, was there? Winston Kingsford hadn't commanded a fleet in space in decades, but he had plenty of experience in the tortuous Byzantine maneuvers of the Solarian League's bureaucracy, and he was well aware of how much Rajampet resented his own exclusion from the cozy little civilian fivesome which actually ran the League. Minister of Defense Takitomo's real power was no greater than that of any of the other cabinet ministers who theoretically governed the League, but defense was, or damned well ought to be anyway, at least as important as commerce or education and information. It had a big enough budget to be, at any rate, and it was critical enough to the League's prosperous stability. Yet Rajampet had been denied his place at the head table, and it irritated the hell out of him. But if we should just happen to get into a real genuine war for the first time in three or four hundred years, all of that could change, couldn't it? Kingsford thought. I wonder how many people Rajani would be willing to kill to bring that about. Despite his own trepidation, Kingsford felt a certain grudging admiration. It was always possible he was wrong, of course. In fact, he wouldn't have thought Rajampet had that sort of maneuver in him— but it wasn't as if Winston Kingsford felt any inclination to complain. After all, if Rajampet pulled it off, it was Kingsford who would eventually inherit that increased prestige and real political clout. And if everything went south on them, it wouldn't be Kingsford's fault. All he would have done was exactly what his lawful superior had instructed him to do. It never even crossed his mind that in most star nations, what he suspected Rajampet of would have constituted treason, or a reasonable facsimile thereof. For that matter, under the letter of the Solarian League Constitution, it did constitute treason, or at the very least, high crimes and misdemeanors, which carried the same penalty. But the Constitution had been a dead letter virtually from the day the original ink dried, 
and what someone else in some other star nation far, far away would have called treason was simply the way things were done here in the Solarian League. And after all, somebody had to get them done one way or another. Well, sir, he said, speaking for the recorders he knew were taking down every word, I can't say I'm looking forward to the thought of having any more of our people killed, but I'm afraid you're probably right about your civilian colleagues' hopes. I hope not, of course, but whatever happens there, you're definitely right about our in-house priorities. If this thing does blow up the way it has the potential to, we'd better be ready to respond hard and quickly. Exactly. Rajampit nodded firmly. In that case, I'd better be getting the technical data over to O&I. I know you want to tell Carl Hines about Carlotte yourself, sir, but I'm afraid we're going to need to move pretty quickly on this if we're going to have those models and analyses by tomorrow morning. Hint taken, Rajampit said with a tight smile. Head on over to his office. I'll screen him while you're on the way over. Probably be a good idea to give him something else to think about as quickly as possible anyway. Elizabeth III sat in her favorite old-fashioned armchair in King Michael's Tower. A three-meter Christmas tree, a griffin needle leaf this year, stood in the center of the room in the full splendor of its ornaments, mounting guard over the family gifts piled beneath its boughs. Its resinous scent filled the air with a comforting perfume, almost a subliminal opiate, which perfected the quiet peacefulness which always seemed to surround King Michael's and there was a reason it was here rather than somewhere else in Mount Royal Palace. The stumpy ancient stonework of the tower, set among its sunny gardens and fountains, was a solid, comforting reminder of permanence in Elizabeth's frequently chaotic world, and she often wondered if that was the reason it had become her and her family's private retreat. She might well conduct official business there, since a monarch who was also a ruling head of state was never really off-duty, but even for business purposes, King Michael's Tower was open only to her family and her personal friends. And to some people, she thought, looking at the tall, almond-eyed admiral sitting sideways in the window seat across from her, with her long legs drawn up and her back braced against one wall of the window's deep embrasure, who had become both. So, the queen said, what did your friend Stacy have to say over lunch yesterday? My friend? Admiral Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington arched one eyebrow. I think it's a fair choice of noun. Elizabeth's smile was more than a little tart. Mind you, I don't think anyone would have given very high odds on that particular friendship's ever happening, given the way you and her father first met. Klaus Hauptmann isn't actually the worst person in the world, Honor shrugged. Admittedly, he made an ass out of himself in Basilisk, and I wouldn't say we got off on the right foot in Silesia either. And, to be honest, I don't think I'm ever going to really like him. But he does have his own sense of honor and obligations, and that's something I can respect at least. The cream and gray tree cat stretched out on the windowsill, raised his head, and looked at her with quizzically tilted ears. Then he sat up, and his true hands began to flicker. He's smart enough to be scared of you, his agile flashing finger signed. And he knew what Crystal Mind would do to him if he didn't admit mistakes. Crystal Mind? Elizabeth repeated out loud. Is that what the cats call Stacy? Yes, Anna replied, but she was looking at the tree cat. I don't think that's entirely fair, Stinker, she told him. Fair is a two-leg idea, he signed back. The people think better to be accurate. Which is one of the reasons I personally prefer tree cats to most of the two legs I know, Elizabeth agreed. And, for that matter, Nimitz's estimate of Hauptmann the Elder's personality is closer to mine than yours is. I didn't put him up for sainthood, you know, Honor observed mildly. I only said he isn't the worst person in the world, and he isn't. Arrogant, opinionated, frequently thoughtless, 
and entirely too accustomed to getting his own way, yes, I'll grant you all of that. But the old pirate's also one of the most honest people I know, which is pretty amazing when you get down to it, given how rich he is, and once he figures out he has an obligation in the first place, he's downright relentless about meeting it. That much, Elizabeth conceded, is true, and... The queen's eyes narrowed shrewdly, and she cocked her head. The fact that he's so strongly committed to stomping out the genetic slave trade probably helps just a tad where you're concerned, too, doesn't it? I'll admit that. Honor nodded. And frankly, from what Stacy had to say, he's not taking the possibility of Manpower's involvement in what's going on in Talbot, what someone might call calmly. No, I suppose not. Elizabeth leaned back in her armchair, and the tree cat stretched along its top, purred buzzingly as the back of her head pressed against his silken pelt. He reached down, caressing her cheek with one long-fingered true hand, and she reached up to stroke his spine in return. He's not exactly alone in that reaction, is he, though? She continued. No. Honor sighed and scooped Nimitz up. She gave him a hug, then deposited him in her lap, rolled him up on his back, and began to scratch the soft fur of his belly. He let his head fall back, eyes more than half-slitted, and her lips quirked as he purred in delight. In point of fact, Elizabeth's last question was its own form of thundering understatement, and she wondered what the response on Old Tara was like. By now, their newsies had to have picked up the reports coming out of Manticore, and it wouldn't be very long before the first Solarian reporters started flooding through Manticore, trying to get to Spindle and New Tuscany to cover the story. I'm sure you have at least as good a feel for how people are reacting to all this as Stacy does, she pointed out after a moment. Yes and no, Elizabeth replied. Honor looked a question at her, and the queen shrugged. I've got all the opinion polls, all the tracking data, all the mail pouring into Mount Royal, analyses of what's being posted on the public boards, all of that. But she's the one who's been building up her little media empire over the last t year and a half. Let's face it, the newsies are actually better than my so-called professional analysts at figuring out where public opinion is headed. And I'm sure she's also hearing things from her father's friends and business acquaintances as well. For that matter, you move in some fairly rarefied financial circles yourself, Duchess Harrington. Not so much since I went back on active duty, Honor disagreed. Willard and Richard are looking after all of that for me until further notice. Elizabeth snorted, and it was Honor's turn to shrug. What she'd said was accurate enough, but Elizabeth had a point as well. It was true that Willard Neufstyler and Richard Maxwell were basically running her own sprawling, multi-system financial empire at the moment, but she made it a point to stay as abreast of their reports as she did those from Austin Klinkscales, her regent in Harrington Steading, and those reports frequently included their insights into the thinking of the Manticoran business community and, for that matter, of the Grayson business community. At any rate, she went on, Stacy hasn't had her media empire all that long. She's still working on getting everything neatly organized, and I think there are aspects of the business which offend her natural sense of order. But I have to admit, the fact that she's so new to it also means it's all still fresh and interesting to her. So she did bring it up at lunch. Elizabeth said, a bit triumphantly, and Honor chuckled. But then her chuckle faded. Yes, she did. And I'm pretty sure she said basically what your analysts are already telling you. People are worried, Beth. In fact, a lot of them are scared to death. I don't say they're scared as badly as some of them were immediately after the Battle of Manticore, but that still leaves a lot of room for terror, and this is the Solarian League we're talking about. I know. Elizabeth's eyes had darkened. I know, and I wish there'd been some way to avoid dumping it on all of them, but... She broke off with an odd little shake of her head and Honor nodded again. I understand that, but you were right. We had to go public with it, and not just because of our responsibility to tell people the truth. Something like this was bound to break sooner or later 
And if people decided we'd been trying to hide it from them when it did... She let her voice trail off, and Elizabeth grimaced in agreement. Did Stacy have a feel for how her subscribers reacted to the fact that we already sat on the news about what happened to Commodore Chatterjee for almost an entire tea month? The Queen asked after a moment. Some of them are upset about the delay, but she says emails and com calls alike are both running something like eight to one in support of it, and the opinion poll numbers show about the same percentages. Honor shrugged again. Mantikarans have learned a bit about when and how information has to be handled carefully, let's say, in the interest of operational security. You've got a pretty hefty positive balance with most of your subjects on that issue, actually, and I think just about everyone understands that, especially in this case, we have to be wary about inflaming public opinion, and not just here in the Star Kingdom, either. That's my read, too, Elizabeth agreed but I'm still not entirely happy about mentioning the possible manpower connection. She sighed, her expression worried. It's bad enough telling people we're effectively at war with the Solarian League without telling them we think a bunch of nasty genetic slavers may be behind it all. Talk about sounding paranoid. Honor smiled wryly. Yet again, Elizabeth had a point. The notion that any outlaw corporation, however big, powerful, and corrupt it might be, was actually in a position to manipulate the military and foreign policy of something the size of the Solarian League was preposterous on the face of it. Honor herself had been part of the discussion about whether or not to go public with that particular aspect of Michelle Henke's summary of her new Tuscan investigation's conclusions. It really did sound paranoid, or possibly just like the ravings of a lunatic, which wasn't all that much better. But she agreed with Pat Givens and the other analysts over at ONI. Lunatic or not, the evidence was there. I agree some people think it's a little far-fetched, she said after a moment. At the same time, a lot of other people seem to be looking very hard at the possibility Mike's onto something. And to be perfectly frank, I'm just as happy to have that aspect of it out in the public faxes because of the possible out it gives those idiots on Old Terra. If manpower really was behind it, maybe it will occur to them that cleaning their own house and letting their public know they're doing it is one response that might let both of us step back from the brink. If they can legitimately lay the blame on manpower, then maybe they can admit they were manipulated into a false position. They've got to know that if they'll only do that, we'll meet them halfway at the negotiating table. And after what already happened to them in Monica and with Technodyne, surely the groundwork for that kind of response is already in place. Sure it is. And you can add in the fact that they're going to be pissed as hell at manpower when they realize we're right. So they've got all sorts of reasons to climb on board and do exactly what you're suggesting. But they're not going to. Elizabeth's expression was no longer worried. Now it was grim, and Honor frowned a question at her. If they'd been going to be reasonable, they never would have taken better than three weeks just to respond to our first note. Especially when their entire response amounted to telling us they'd look into our allegations and get back to us. Frankly, I'm astounded they managed to leave out the word ridiculous in front of allegations. The Queen shook her head. That's not a very promising start, and it is very typically Solly. They're never going to admit their man was in the wrong, no matter how he got there, if there's any way they can possibly avoid it. And do you really think they're going to want to admit that a multistellar that isn't even based in a League star system and is involved up to its eyebrows in a trade the League's officially outlawed is able to manipulate entire squadrons of their battlecruisers and ships of the wall? She shook her head again, more emphatically. I'm afraid a lot of them would rather go out and pin back the uppity Neobob's ears, no matter how many people get killed along the way, than open any windows into corners of the League's power structure that are that filled with dirty little secrets. I hope you're wrong about that, Honor said quietly, and Elizabeth's lips twitched. I notice you only hope I am, she said. I'd prefer a stronger verb myself, Honor acknowledged, but... But indeed, 
Elizabeth murmured. Then she pushed herself more briskly upright in her chair. Unfortunately, I don't think either of us can afford to treat ourselves to any of those stronger verbs of yours, which, along with thinking about the possibility of past errors, brings me to what I really wanted to ask you about. Four days, Honor said, and Elizabeth chuckled. That obvious, was I? I have been thinking about it a bit myself, you know, Honor replied. The ops plan's been finalized, even if everyone hopes we won't have to use it. Alice Truman's running the fleet through the rehearsal exercises, and I'm just about finished up with my briefings from Sir Anthony, so about four days. You're sure you don't want a couple of more days with the fleet yourself? No. Honor shook her head, then smiled. Actually, I could probably be ready to leave even sooner than that, especially since I'm taking Q, Selleck, and Twoman in with me. But if it's all the same to you, I'm not going anywhere until after I've celebrated Raoul's and Catherine's first Christmas with Hamish and Emily. Of course it's all the same to me. Elizabeth's face softened with a smile of her own, and it was her turn to shake her head. It's still a bit hard sometimes to remember you're a mother now, but I always figured on your at least having Christmas at home before we sent you off. Are your parents going to be there too? And Faith and James, which, by the way, made Lindsay happy when she found out about it. This would have been the first Christmas she hadn't spent with the twins since they were a year old. I'm glad for all of you, Elizabeth said. Then she inhaled deeply. But getting back to business and allowing for your schedule, you're sure about how you want to go about this? I wouldn't go so far as to say I was sure about it, and I'm not going to pretend I'm anything anyone would be tempted to call an expert at something like this either. I just think it's the best shot we've got, and that we can at least be pretty sure of getting their attention. I see. Elizabeth looked at her for several seconds, then snorted. Well, just remember this little jaunt was your idea in the first place. Mind you, now that I've had time to really think about it, I think it's a good idea. Because whether you were right in the beginning or I was, her expression sobered once more, it would be a really, really good idea for us to get at least one forest fire put out. If this entire situation with the League turns out as badly as I am afraid it could, we're not going to need to be dealing with more than one problem at a time. Honor Alexander Harrington stood as James McGinnis ushered the tallish man in the uniform of the Republican Navy into her landing mansion's office. Behind her, beyond the crystal-plast wall and the office balcony, the dark blue waters of Jason Bay were a ruffled carpet under a sky of dramatic clouds and brilliant late-afternoon sunlight, patterned in endless lines of white-crested waves as a storm pushed in from the open sea and Honor supposed that made a fitting allegory in many ways for her relationship with her visitor. Admiral Torville, she said, rising and extending her hand across her desk while Nimitz sat upright on his perch and cocked his head thoughtfully at the Havenite. Admiral Alexander Harrington. Lester Torville reached out to shake the offered hand, and she tasted his own flicker of ironic amusement. His lips twitched in a brief, almost smile under his bushy mustache, and she released his hand to indicate the chair in front of her desk. Please, take a seat. Thank you, he said and sat. Honor settled back into her own chair, propped her elbows on the armrests, and steepled her fingers in front of her chest as she contemplated him. The two of them had, as the newsies might have put it, a history. He was the only Havenite officer to whom Honor had ever been forced to surrender, the man she'd defeated at the Battle of Sidemore in the opening phases of Operation Thunderbolt, and the fleet commander who'd come perilously close to winning the war for the Republic of Haven five months earlier. But, as Andrew always says, close only counts with horseshoes, hand grenades, and tactical nukes, she reminded herself which was true enough, but hadn't prevented the Battle of Manticore from killing better than two million human beings, nor did it change the fact that Honor had demanded the surrender of his intact databases as the price for sparing his surviving super-dreadnoughts. 
She'd been within her right to stipulate whatever terms she chose under the rules of war, yet she'd known when she issued the demand that she was stepping beyond the customary usages of war. It was traditional, and generally expected, that any officer who surrendered his command would purge his computers first— and she was forced to concede she'd had Alistair McKeon do just that with his own data when she'd ordered him to surrender his ship to Tourville. I suppose if I'd been going to be honorable about it, I should have extended the same privilege to him. He certainly thought I should have at any rate. Her lips twitched ever so slightly as she remembered the seething fury which had raged behind his outwardly composed demeanor when they'd finally met face to face after the battle. Nothing could have been more correct or icier during the interview which had formalized his surrender, but he hadn't known about Honor's ability to directly sense the emotions of those about her. He might as well have been bellowing furiously at her as far as any real ability to conceal his feelings was concerned, and a part of her hadn't cared. No, actually, a part of her had taken its own savage satisfaction from his anger— from the way his sense of failure burned so much more bitterly after how agonizingly close to total success he'd come. She wasn't proud of the way she'd felt, not now, but then the deaths of so many men and women she'd known for so long had been too fresh, wounds too recent for a time to have stopped the bleeding. Alistair McKeon had been one of those dead men and women, along with every member of his staff. So had Sebastian Dorville and literally hundreds of others with whom she had served, and the grief and pain of all those deaths had fueled her own rage, just as Tourville's dead had fanned his fury. So I guess it's a good thing military courtesies as iron-bound as it is, she thought. It kept both of us from saying what we really felt long enough for us to stop feeling it which is a good thing, because even then I knew he was a decent man, that he hadn't taken any more pleasure in killing Alistair and all those others than I'd taken in killing Javier Giscard or so many of Genevieve Chin's people. Thank you for coming, Admiral, she said out loud, and this time there was nothing halfway about his smile. I was honored by the invitation, of course, Admiral, he replied with exquisite courtesy, exactly as if there'd been any real question about a prisoner of war's accepting an invitation to dinner from his captor. Nor was it the first such invitation he'd accepted over the past four tea months. This would be the seventh time he'd dined with Honor and her husband and wife. Unlike him, however, Honor was aware it would be the last time they'd be dining together for at least the foreseeable future. I'm sure you were, she told him with a smile of her own. And, of course, even if you weren't, you're far too polite to admit it. Oh, of course, he agreed affably, and Nimitz bleaked the tree cat equivalent of a laugh from his perch. That's enough of that, Nimitz, Torvald told him, wagging a raised forefinger. Just because you can see inside someone's head is no excuse for undermining these polite little social fictions. Nimitz's true hands rose, and Honor glanced over her shoulder at him as they signed nimbly. She gazed at him for a moment, then chuckled and turned back to Torville. He says there's more to see inside some two legs' heads than others. Oh? Torville glowered at the cat. Should I assume he's casting aspersions on the content of any particular two legs' cranium? Nimitz's fingers flickered again, and Honor smiled as she watched them, then glanced at Tourville once more. He says he meant it as a general observation, she said solemnly, but he can't help it if you think it ought to apply to anyone in particular. Oh, he does, does he? Tourville glowered some more, but there was genuine humor in his mind glow. Not that there had been the first time he'd realized the news reports about the tree cat's recently confirmed telepathic abilities were accurate. Honor hadn't blamed him, or any of the other POWs who'd reacted the same way a bit. The thought of being interrogated by a professional, experienced analyst who knew how to put together even the smallest of clues you might unknowingly let slip was bad enough. 
When that professional was assisted by someone who could read your very thoughts, it went from bad to terrifying in record time. Of course, tree cats couldn't really read any human's actual thoughts. The mental frequencies, for want of a better word, were apparently too different. There'd been no way for any of the captured Havenites to know that, however, and every one of them had assumed the worst, initially at least. And in fact, it was bad enough from their perspective as it was. Nimitz and his fellow tree cats might not have been able to read the prisoners' thoughts, but they'd been able to tell from their emotions whenever they were lying or attempting to mislead. And they'd been able to tell when those emotions spiked as the interrogation approached something a POW most desperately wanted to conceal. It hadn't taken very long for most of the captured personnel to figure out that even though a tree cat could guide an interrogator's questioning, it couldn't magically pluck the desired information out of someone else's mind. That didn't keep the cats from providing a devastating advantage, but it did mean that as long as they simply refused to answer, as was their guaranteed right under the Deneb Accords, the furry little lie detectors couldn't dig specific factual information out of them. That wasn't enough to keep at least some of them from bitterly resenting the cat's presence, and a significant handful of those POWs had developed a positive hatred for them, as if their ability to sense someone's emotions was a form of personal violation. The vast majority, however, were more rational about it, and several, including Tourville, who'd had the opportunity to interact with Nimitz years before, when Honor had been his prisoner, were far too fascinated to resent them. Of course, in Tourville's case, the fact that he'd done his dead-level best to see to it that Nimitz's person had been decently and honorably treated during her captivity had guaranteed that Nimitz liked him. And as Honor had observed many times over the five decades they'd spent together, only the most well-armored of curmudgeons could resist Nimitz when the cat set out to be charming and adorable. He'd had Tourville wrapped around his furry little thumb in less than two weeks, despite the still thorny emotions crackling between the Havenite officer and Honor. Within a month, he'd been lying across Tourville's lap and purring blissfully, while the Admiral almost absently stroked his coat during meetings with Honor. Of course, I have to wonder how Lester would react if he knew I can read his emotions just as well as Nimitz can she reflected for far from the first time. I'm sure he didn't mean to imply anything disrespectful, Honor assured Tourville now, and the Havenite snorted. Of course he didn't. The Republican admiral leaned back in his chair and shook his head. Then he cocked that same head at Honor. May I ask what I owe the pleasure of this particular invitation to? Mostly it's a purely social occasion. Anna replied. He raised a skeptical eyebrow, and she smiled. I did say mostly. Yes, you did, didn't you? In fact, I've discovered, if you'll forgive me for saying so, that you're most dangerous when you're being the most honest and frankly candid. Your hapless victim doesn't even notice the siphon going into his brain and sucking out the information you want. His amusement, despite a bitterly tart undertone, was mostly genuine, Honor noted. Well, if I'm going to be frank and disarming, she said, I might as well admit that the thing I'd most like to siphon out of your brain, if I only could, would be the location of Bolt Hole. Tourville didn't quite flinch this time. He had, the first time she'd mentioned that name to him, and she still couldn't decide if that stemmed from the fact that he knew exactly how vital a secret the location of the Republic's largest single shipyard and R&D center was, or if he'd simply been dismayed by the fact that she even knew its code name. In either case, she knew she wasn't going to pry its location out of him, assuming he actually knew what it was. He wasn't an astrogator himself, after all, although he undoubtedly knew enough about it for someone to have put the pieces together and figured out the actual location with his cooperation. Expecting Lester Tourville to cooperate over something like that would be rather like a Sphinxian woodbucks expecting to negotiate a successful compromise with a hungry hexapuma, however, and that was one piece of data which hadn't been anywhere in any of the computers aboard his surrendered ships. 
It once had been, no doubt. They'd confirmed that at least half his surrendered ships had actually been built there, but it had been very carefully and thoroughly deleted since. And exactly why anyone should be surprised by that eludes me, she thought. It's not as if Haven hasn't had plenty of experience in maintaining operational security. Of course, they were going to make sure there was as little critical data as possible stored in the computers of ships heading into a battle like that one. Quite aside from any demands by arrogant, unreasonable flag officers for anyone who wanted to surrender, there was no way to be sure we wouldn't capture one of their wrecks and find out the security fail-safes hadn't scrubbed the computers after all. And only drooling idiots, which manifestly Thomas Theismann, Eloise Pritchard, and Kevin Usher are not, would fail to realize just how critical Bolt Hole's location is. It's not as if we haven't been trying to figure it out ever since the shooting started back up, after all. And I'm sure they know how hard we've been looking, even if we haven't had much luck cracking their security. Of course, we'd have had better luck if we'd still been up against the legislaturalists or the Committee of Public Safety. We don't have anywhere near as many dissidents to work with anymore. Boltol? Tourville repeated, then shrugged. I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't bother trying to lie convincingly, since both of them knew he wouldn't get away with it anyway, and the two of them exchanged wry smiles. Then Honor sobered a bit. To be honest, she said, I'm actually much more interested in any insight you can give me, or are willing to give me, into the Republic's political leadership. Excuse me? Tourville frowned at her. They touched upon the political leaders of the Republic several times in their earlier conversations, but only glancingly. Enough for Honor to discover not only that Operation Beatrice had been planned and mounted only after Manticore had backed out of the summit talks Eloise Pritchard had proposed, but also that Tourville, like every other Havenite POW who'd been interrogated in the presence of a tree cat, genuinely believed it was the Star Kingdom of Manticore which had tampered with their pre-war diplomatic exchanges. The fact that all of them were firmly convinced that was the truth didn't necessarily mean it was, of course, but the fact that someone as senior and as close to Thomas Theismann as Tourville believed it was a sobering indication of how closely the truth was being held on the other side. In fact, they all believe it so strongly that there are times I'm inclined to wonder, she admitted to herself. It wasn't a topic she was prepared to discuss with most of her fellow Mantikrans, even now, but she'd found herself reflecting on the fact that the correspondence in question had been generated by Elaine de Croix as Baron Highridge's foreign secretary. There wasn't much honor, or anyone else who'd ever met Highridge would have put past him, including forging the file copies of diplomatic correspondence to cover his backside, assuming there was any conceivable advantage for him in having been so inflammatory in the first place. Actually, if anyone had asked her as a hypothetical question whether someone with Eloise Pritchard's reputation and Thomas Theismann as a member of her administration or the corrupt politicos of the Highridge government were more likely to have falsified the diplomatic exchanges which had been handed to the news faxes, she would have picked the Highridge team every time. But there were too many permanent undersecretaries and assistant undersecretaries in the foreign office who actually saw the original messages. That's what it keeps coming back to. I've been able to talk to them, too, and every one of them is just as convinced as every one of Lester's people that it was the other side who falsified things. There are things going on, she told Tourville now. I'm not prepared to discuss all of them with you, but there's a pretty good chance that having the best feel I can get for the personalities of people like President Pritchard could be very important to both of our star nations. Lester Tourville sat very still, his eyes narrowing, and Honor tasted the racing speed of the thoughts she couldn't read. She could taste the intensity of his speculation, and also a sudden spike of wary hope. She discovered the first time they'd met that the sharp, cool brain behind that bristling mustache was a poor match for the cowboy persona he'd cultivated for so long. 
Now she waited while he worked his way through the logic chains, and she felt a sudden cold icicle as he realized there were several reasons she might need a feel for the Republic's senior political leaders, and that not all of them were ones he might much care for. Reasons that contained words like surrender demand, for example. I'm not going to ask you to betray any confidences, she went on unhurriedly. And I'll give you my word that anything you tell me will go no further than the two of us. I'm not interrogating you for anyone else at this point, Lester. This is purely for my own information, and I'll also give you my word that my reason for asking for it is to prevent as much bloodshed on either side as I possibly can. He looked at her for several seconds, then inhaled deeply. Before I tell you anything, I have a question of my own. Go ahead and ask, she said calmly. When you demanded my surrender, he said, gazing intently into her eyes, was it a bluff? In what sense? She tilted her head to one side. In two senses, I suppose. Whether or not I would have fired if you hadn't surrendered? That's one of them, he admitted. All right. In that sense, I wasn't bluffing at all, she said levelly. If you hadn't surrendered and accepted my terms in full, I would have opened fire on Second Fleet from beyond any range at which you could have effectively replied, and I would have gone right on firing until whoever was left in command surrendered or every single one of your ships was destroyed. Silence hovered between them for several moments that seemed oddly endless. It was a taut singing silence, a mutual silence built of the understanding of two professional naval officers. And yet, despite its tension, there was no anger in it. Not any more. The anger they'd both felt at the time had long since vanished into something else, and if she'd had to pick a single word to describe what the two of them felt now, it would have been regret. Well, that certainly answers my first question, he said finally, smiling crookedly. And I suppose I'm actually relieved to hear it. Her eyebrows arched, and he snorted. I've always thought I was a pretty good poker player. I would have hated to think I'd misread you quite that badly at the time. I see. She shook her head with a slight smile of her own. But you said there were two senses. Yes. He leaned forward, propping his forearms on his thighs, and his eyes were very sharp. The other bluff I've been wondering about is whether or not you really could have done it from that range. Honor swung her chair from side to side in a small, thoughtful arc while she considered his question. Theoretically, what he was asking edged into territory covered by the Official Secrets Act. On the other hand, it wasn't as if he was going to be emailing the information to the Octagon. Besides, no, she said after no more than two or three heartbeats. I couldn't have, not from that range. Ah. He sat back once more, his crooked smile going even more crooked. Then he inhaled deeply. Part of me really hated to hear that, he told her. Nobody likes finding out he was tricked into surrendering. She opened her mouth to say something, then closed it again, and he chuckled. It was a surprisingly genuine chuckle, and the amusement behind it was just as genuine, she realized. And it was also oddly gentle. You wanted my databases intact, he said. We both know that, but I know what else you were going to say as well. You do? she asked when he paused. Yep. You were going to say you did it to save lives, but you were afraid I might not believe you, weren't you? I wouldn't say I thought you wouldn't believe me, she replied thoughtfully. I guess the real reason was that I was afraid it would sound 
self-serving, or like some sort of self-justification at least. Maybe it would have, but that doesn't change the fact that Second Fleet was completely and utterly screwed. He grimaced. There was no way we were going to get out of the resonant zone and make it into Hyper before you were in range to finish us off. All that was going to happen in the meantime was that more people were going to get killed on both sides without changing the final outcome at all. Honor didn't say anything. There was no need to, and he crossed his legs slowly, his expression thoughtful. All right, he said. With the stipulation that any classified information is off the table... I'll answer your questions. Chapter 3 So you're satisfied with our own security position at the moment, Wesley? Benjamin the Ninth, protector of Grayson, leaned back in his chair, watching the uniformed commander-in-chief of the Grayson Space Navy across his desk. Wesley Matthews looked back at him, his expression a bit surprised, then nodded. Yes, your grace, I am, he said. May I ask if there's some reason you think I shouldn't be? No, not that I think you shouldn't be. On the other hand, I have it on excellent authority that certain questions are likely to be raised in the conclave of Steadholder's New Year session. Matthew's expression went from slightly surprised to definitely sour, and he shook his head in disgusted understanding. The two men sat in Benjamin Mayhew's private working office in Protector's Palace. At the moment, the planet Grayson's seasons were reasonably coordinated with those of mankind's birth world, although they were drifting slowly back out of adjustment, and heavy snow fell outside the palace's protective environmental dome. The larger dome, which Sky Domes of Grayson was currently erecting to protect the entire city of Austin, was still only in its embryonic stages— with its preliminary girder work looming against the darkly clouded sky like white furry tree trunks, or, for those of a less cheerful disposition, the strands of some vast, frosted spiderweb. Outside the palace dome, clearly visible through its transparency from the bookcase-lined office's window, crowds of children cheerfully threw snowballs at one another, erected snowmen, or skittered over the steep, cobbled streets of the old town on sleds. Others shrieked in delight as they rode an assortment of carnival rides on the palace grounds themselves, and vendors of hot popcorn, hot chocolate and tea, and enough cotton candy and other items of questionable dietary value to provide sugar rushes for the next several days could be seen nefariously plying their trade on every corner. What couldn't be clearly seen from Matthew's present seat were the breath masks those children wore— or the fact that their gloves and mittens would have served the safety requirements of hazardous materials workers quite handily. Grayson's high concentrations of heavy metals made even the planet's snow potentially toxic. But that was something Grayson's were used to. Grayson kids took the need to protect themselves against their environment as much for granted as children on other, less unfriendly planets took the need to watch out for traffic crossing busy streets. And at the moment... All of those hordes of children were taking special pleasure in their play because it was a school holiday. In fact, it was a planetary holiday, the protector's birthday. The next best thing to a thousand tea years worth of grace and children had celebrated that same holiday, although for the last thirty tea years or so, they'd been a bit shortchanged compared to most of their predecessors, since Benjamin the Ninth had been born on December the 21st. The schools traditionally shut down for Christmas vacation on December the 18th, so the kids didn't get an extra day away from classwork the way they might have if Benjamin had been thoughtful enough to be born in, say, March or October. That little scheduling faux pas on his part, or more fairly perhaps on his mother's, was part of the reason Benjamin had always insisted on throwing a special party for all the children of the planetary capital and any of their friends who could get there to join them. At the moment, by Matthews' estimate, the school-aged population of the city of Austin had probably risen by at least 40 or 50 percent. 
It was also traditional that the protector did no official business on his birthday, since even he was entitled to at least one vacation day a year. Benjamin, however, was prone to honor that particular tradition in the breach, although he'd been known to use the fact that he was officially off for the day as a cover from time to time. And it would appear this was one of those times. Events were building towards the formal birthday celebration later this evening, but Matthews was among the inner circle who'd been invited to arrive early. He would have found himself in that group anyway, given how long and closely he and Benjamin had worked together, but there had obviously been other reasons this year. The High Admiral regarded his protector thoughtfully. This was Benjamin's 50th birthday, and his hair was streaked progressively more thickly with silver. Not that Matthews was any spring chicken himself. In fact, he was ten tea years older than Benjamin, and his own hair had turned completely white, although, he thought with a certain comfortable vanity, it had remained thankfully thick and luxuriant. But thick or not, we're neither one of us getting any younger, he reflected. It was a thought which had occurred to him more frequently of late, especially when he ran into Manticoran officers half again his age who still looked younger than he did, who were younger, physically speaking at least, and more than a few Grayson officers fell into that same absurdly youthful-looking category now that the first few generations to enter the service since Grayson's alliance with Manticore had made the prolonged therapies generally available were into their late thirties, or like Benjamin's younger brother Michael, already into their early forties. It's only going to get worse, Wesley, he told himself with an inescapable edge of bittersweet envy. It's not their fault, of course. In fact, it's nobody's fault. But there are still a lot of things I'd like to be here to see. He gave himself a mental shake and snorted silently. It wasn't exactly as if he were going to drop dead of old age tomorrow. With modern medicine, he ought to be good for at least another thirty tea years, and Benjamin could probably look forward to another half tea century which had very little to do with the question the protector had just asked him. May I ask exactly which of our esteemed steadholders are likely to be raising the questions in question, Your Grace? Well, I think you can safely assume Travis Mueller's name is going to be found among them. Benjamin's smile was tart. And I expect Jasper Taylor's going to be right beside him, but I understand they found a new frontman, Thomas Guilford. Matthews grimaced. Travis Mueller, Lord Mueller, was the son of the late and, by most Graysons, very unlamented Samuel Mueller, who'd been executed for treason following his involvement in a Masadan plot to assassinate Benjamin and Queen Elizabeth. Jasper Taylor was Steadholder Canseco, whose father had been a close associate of Samuel Mueller, and who'd chosen to continue the traditional alliance between Canseco and Mueller. But Thomas Guilford, Lord Forshane, was a newcomer to that particular mix. He was also quite a few years older than either Mueller or Canseco, and while he'd never been one of the greater admirers of the social and legal changes of the Mayhew Restoration, he'd never associated himself with the Protector's more strident critics. There hadn't been much question about his sentiments, but he'd avoided open confrontations with Benjamin and the solid block of steadholders who supported the sword, and he'd always struck Matthews as less inclined than Mueller to cheerfully sacrifice principle in the name of political pragmatism. When did Forshine decide to sign on with Mueller and friends, Your Grace? That's hard to say, really. Benjamin tipped his swiveled armchair back and swung it gently from side to side. To be fair to him, not that I particularly want to be, you understand. I doubt he was really much inclined in that direction until Highridge tried to screw over every other member of the Alliance. Matthew snorted again, this time out loud. Like Benjamin himself, the High Admiral strongly supported Grayson's membership in the Manticoran Alliance. Not only was he painfully aware of just how much Grayson had profited both technologically and economically from its ties with the Star Kingdom of Manticore, but he was even better aware of the fact that without the intervention of the Royal Manticoran Navy, 
The planet of Grayson would either have been conquered outright by the religious lunatics who'd run Masada, or at best have suffered nuclear or kinetic bombardment from space. At the same time, he had to admit the High Ridge government had proved clearly that the Star Kingdom was far from perfect. In his considered opinion, Screw Over was an extraordinarily pale description of what Baron High Ridge had done to his alliance so called partners. And like many other Graysons, Matthews was firmly of the opinion that High Ridge's idiotic foreign policy had done a great deal to provoke the resumption of hostilities between the Republic of Haven and the Star Kingdom and its allies. As far as the High Admiral was personally concerned, that simply demonstrated once again that idiocy, corruption, and greed were inescapable elements of mankind's fallen nature. Tester knew there'd been more than enough traitors, criminals, corrupt and arrogant steadholders, and outright lunatics in Grayson history. Indeed, the name Mueller came rather forcibly to mind in that connection. And for every man ticker in High Ridge, Matthews had met two or three Hamish Alexanders or Alistair McKeons or Alice Trumans, not to mention having personally met Queen Elizabeth III. And then, of course, there was Honor Alexander Harrington. Given that balance, and how much Manticoran and Grayson blood had been shed side by side in the Alliance's battles, Matthews was prepared to forgive the Star Kingdom for High Ridge's existence. Not all Graysons were, however. Even many of those who remained fierce supporters of Lady Harrington separated her in their own minds from the Star Kingdom. She was one of theirs— a Grayson in her own right, by adoption and shed blood, which insulated her from their anger at the High Ridge government's stupidity, avarice, and arrogance. And the fact that she and High Ridge had been bitter political enemies only made that insulation easier for them. I'm serious, Wesley. Benjamin waved one hand, as if for emphasis. Oh, Forshine's always been a social and religious conservative— not as reactionary as some, thank God, but bad enough. But I'm pretty sure it was the combination of Highridge's foreign policy and Haven's resumption of open hostilities that tipped his support. And, unfortunately, he's not the only one that's true of. May I ask how bad it actually is, Your Grace? Matthews inquired, his eyes narrower. It wasn't the sort of question he usually would have asked, given the Grayson tradition of separation between the military and politics. Senior officers weren't supposed to factor politics into their military thinking, which, of course, was another of those fine theories which consistently came to grief amid the shoals of reality. There was a difference, however, between being aware of the political realities which affected the ability of his Navy to formulate sound strategy or discharge its responsibilities to defend the protectorate of Grayson, and of becoming involved in the formulation of political policy. To be honest, I'm not really certain, Benjamin admitted. Floyd is taking some cautious political soundings, and I expect we'll have a pretty good idea within the next week or so of who else might be inclined in Forshine's direction. Matthews nodded. Floyd Kellerman, Stedholder Magruder, had become Benjamin's chancellor following Henry Prestwick's death in the attempt to assassinate Benjamin and Elizabeth III. He'd also been Prestwick's understudy for the last two years of the old chancellor's tenure, and the Magruders had been Mayhew allies literally for centuries. Lord Magruder hadn't yet developed the intricate web of personal alliances Prestwick had possessed, but he'd already demonstrated formidable abilities as both an administrator and a shrewd politician. Having said that, however, the protector continued, I'm already pretty confident about where the problem is going to come from, and what our problem children, however many of them there turn out to be, are going to want. He shook his head. Some of them wouldn't have supported us sticking with Manticore against Haven this time around if the Protector's own hadn't already been involved at Sidemore. Their position is that Highridge had already violated Manticore's treaty obligations to us by conducting independent negotiations with Haven, 
which amounted to a unilateral abrogation of the alliance. And while we do have a mutual defense treaty outside the formal framework of the overall alliance, one whose terms obligate us to come to one another's support in the event of any attack by an outside party, the Star Kingdom's critics have pointed out that the Republic of Haven did not in fact attack Grayson in Operation Thunderbolt despite our involvement in defending Manticoran territory. The implication being that since High Ridge chose to violate Manticore's solemn treaty obligations to us, along with every other party to the Alliance, there's no reason we should feel legally or morally bound to honor our treaty obligations to them if doing so isn't in the Protectorate's best interests. And, surprise, surprise, the way the Manticorans' expansion into the Talbot sectors brought them into direct collision with the Solarian League has only made the people who are pissed off with Manticore even less happy. And to be honest, I can't really blame anyone for being nervous about finding themselves on the wrong end of a confrontation with the League, especially after the way High Ridge squandered so much of the Star Kingdom's investment in loyalty. Of course, none of our vessels have actually been involved in operations anywhere near Talbot, but we do have personnel serving on Manticoran warships which have been. For that matter, over thirty of our people were killed when that idiot Bing blew up the destroyers they were serving in, which gives the people who worry about what may happen between the League and the Manticorans, and, by extension, with us, two legitimate pieces of ammunition. The Solis may view the participation of our personnel, even aboard someone else's ships, in military operations against the League as meaning we've already decided to back Manticore, and I don't think it would be totally unfair to argue that the people we've already lost were lost in someone else's fight. Mind you, I think it should be obvious to anyone with any sort of realistic appreciation for how frontier security and the League operate that standing up to the Solly should be every independent Neobarb star system's fight. Not everyone's going to agree with me about that, unfortunately, and those who don't will be airing their concern shortly. Which brings me back to my original question for you. How satisfied are you with the system's security? In the short term, completely your grace. Matthews's response was as firm as it was instant. Whatever High Ridge and Janicek might have done, ever since Willie Alexander took over as Prime Minister, especially with Hamish as his first Lord of Admiralty, our channels of communication have been completely opened again. Our R&D people are working directly with theirs, and they've provided us with everything we needed to put Apollo into production here at Yeltsin Star. For that matter, they've delivered over 8,000 of the system defense variant Apollo pods, and they've also handed our intelligence people complete copies of the computer files Countess Goldpeak captured from Bing at New Tuscany, along with specimens of Soli missiles, energy weapons, software systems, the works. For that matter, if we want it, they're more than willing to let us have one of the actual battle cruisers the Countess brought back from New Tuscany so we can examine it personally. So far, we haven't taken them up on that. Our people in Admiral Hempel's shop are already seeing everything, and, frankly, the Montes are probably better at that sort of thing than we are here at home anyway. Based on what we've seen out of the Havenites, I'm confident we could successfully defend this star system against everything the Republic has left. And based on our evaluation of the captured Solarian material, my best estimate is that while the Solis probably could take us in the end, they'd need upwards of a thousand ships of the wall to do it. 
And that's a worst-case estimate, Your Grace. I suspect a more realistic estimate would push their force requirements upward significantly. He shook his head. Given all their other commitments, the amount of their wall of battle that's tucked away in mothballs, and the fact that they'd pretty much have to go through Manticore before they got to us at all, I'm not worried about any known short-term threat. He paused for a moment, as if to let the protector fully absorb his own confidence, then drew a deep breath. In the long term, of course, the Solarian League could pose a very serious threat to the Protectorate. I agree with the Monty's estimate that it would take years for the SLN to get comparable technology into production and deployed. I think some of the individual system defense forces could probably shave some time off of how long it's going to take the SLN in particular, and the League in general, to overcome the sheer inertia of their entrenched bureaucracies. But, as far as I'm aware, none of those SDFs are in anything like the Star Kingdom's, I mean, the Star Empire's League, for that matter— I don't think any of them could come close to matching our combat power for quite a lengthy period. But in the end, assuming the League has the stomach to pay the price in both human and economic terms, there's not much doubt that, barring direct divine intervention, the Sollies could absorb anything we and the Manticorans combined could hand out— and still steamroller us in the end. Benjamin puffed his lips, his eyes worried, and rotated his chair some more. It was very quiet in the office. Quiet enough for Matthews to hear the creaking of the old-fashioned swivel chair, and the High Admiral found himself looking out the window again at the throngs of children. I'd really like for someone to grow up on this planet without having to worry about wars and lunatics, he thought sadly, almost wistfully. I've done my best to keep them safe, but that's not the same thing. I wish I could say I was surprised by anything you've just said, Benjamin said at last, pulling Matthews's eyes back to him. Unfortunately, it's about what I expected to hear— and I don't doubt Mueller and friends, as you call them, have reached about the same conclusions. They already think of us as Manticoran lackeys who put Manticore's interests ahead of Grayson's. That's going to dispose them to take the least optimistic possible view, shall we say, of our long-term strategic position. Nor do I doubt that they're going to be perfectly ready to share their thoughts on the subject with their fellow steadholders. Your Grace, I could... No... You couldn't, Wesley, Benjamin interrupted. The High Admiral looked at him, and the Protector smiled tartly. I'm sure, High Admiral Matthews, that you would never suggest to the Lord Protector that it might be possible for you to prevaricate or even mislead the conclave of Stedholders if you were called to testify before them. Matthews closed his mouth and sat back in his chair, and Benjamin chuckled harshly. Don't think I wouldn't appreciate the offer if you'd ever been so lost to all sense of your legal and moral responsibilities as to make it. But even if I were tempted to encourage you to do any such thing, and even if it wouldn't be both morally and legally wrong, which, granted, aren't always exactly the same things, it would only blow up in our faces in the long run. After all, it's not exactly like it would take a hyperphysicist to realize just how damned big the League is. If we tried to pretend the Sollies couldn't kick our posterior in the long run, we'd only look and sound ridiculous. Or, worse, like we were trying to carry water for the Mantis. So I doubt you'd be able to do much good, in that respect at least. Matthews nodded slowly, but something about the Protector's tone puzzled him. 
He knew it showed in his expression, and Benjamin chuckled again, more naturally, when he saw it. I said I don't want you to mislead anyone about the long-term threat the League could pose, Wesley. I never said I didn't want you to underline your confidence in our short-term security, if you're actually confident about it. Of course, Your Grace. Matthews nodded with no reservations. In fact, even though he'd scrupulously used the phrase any known short-term threat in his response to the protector's question, in his own mind, a better one would have been any conceivable short-term threat. Good, Benjamin nodded back. One thing we scheming autocrats realized early on, High Admiral, is that short-term threats have a far greater tendency to crystallize political factions for or against than long-term ones do. It's the nature of the way human minds work. And if we can get through the next few months, the situation could certainly change. For example, there's Lady Harrington's mission to Haven. Matthews nodded, although he suspected he hadn't succeeded in keeping at least a trace of skepticism out of his expression. As the Grayson Space Navy's uniformed commander, he was one of the handful of people who knew about Honor Alexander Harrington's planned mission to the Republic of Haven. He agreed that it was certainly worth trying, even if he didn't exactly have unbridled optimism about the chances for its success. On the other hand, Lady Harrington had a knack for accomplishing the improbable, so he wasn't prepared to totally rule out the possibility. If we can manage to bury the hatchet with Haven, it should be a major positive factor where the public's morale is concerned, and it would certainly strengthen our hand in the conclave, Benjamin pointed out. Not only that, but if anyone in the Solarian League realizes just how steep our present technological advantage is, and couples that with the fact that we're not being distracted by the Republic anymore— he may just figure out that picking a fight with Manticore is a game that wouldn't be worth the candle. Your Grace, I can't disagree with anything you've just said, Matthew said. On the other hand, you and I both know how Sollys think. Do you really believe there's going to be a sudden, unprecedented outburst of rationality in old Chicago, of all places? I think it's possible, Benjamin replied. I'm not saying I think it's likely, but it is possible. And in some ways, this makes me think about a story my father told me, an old joke about a Persian horse thief. Excuse me, Your Grace? A Persian horse thief. Matthew still looked blank, and Benjamin grinned. Do you know what Persia was? I've heard the word, Matthews admitted cautiously. Something from old Earth history, wasn't it? Persia, Benjamin said, built one of the greatest pre-technic empires back on old Earth. Their king was called the Shah, and the term checkmate in chess comes originally from Shamat, or the king is dead. That's how long ago they were around. Anyway, the story goes that once upon a time, a thief stole the Shah's favorite horse. Unfortunately for him, he was caught trying to get off the palace grounds with it and dragged before the Shah in person. The penalty for stealing any horse was pretty severe, but stealing one of the Shahs was punishable by death, of course. Still, the Shah wanted to see the man who'd had the audacity to try to steal a horse out of the royal stables themselves. So, the Shah's guardsmen brought the thief in, and the Shah said, Didn't you know stealing one of my horses is punishable by death, fellow? And the thief looked at him and said, of course I knew that, Your Majesty, but everyone knows you have the finest horses in all the world, and what horse thief worthy of the name would choose to steal any but the finest? The Shah was amused, but the law was the law, so he said, Give me one reason why I shouldn't have your head chopped off right this minute. The horse thief thought about it for a few moments, then said, 
Well, your majesty, I don't suppose there's any legal reason why you shouldn't, but if you'll spare my life, I'll teach your horse to sing. What? the Shah demanded. You claim you can actually teach my horse to sing? Well, of course I can, the thief replied confidently. I'm not just a common horse thief, after all, your majesty. I don't say it will be easy, but if I can't teach your horse to sing within one year, then you can chop off my head with my blessings. So the Shah thought about it, then nodded. All right, you've got your year. If at the end of that year you haven't taught the horse to sing, though, I warn you, a simple beheading will be the least of your problems. Is that understood? Of course, your majesty, the horse thief replied, and the guards hauled him away. Are you crazy? one of them asked him. No one can teach a horse to sing, and the Shah's going to be even more pissed off when he figures out you lied to him. All you've done is to trade having your head chopped off for being handed over to the torturers. What were you thinking? So the thief looks at him and says, I have a year in which to do it, and in a year the Shah may die, and his successor may choose to spare my life. Or... The horse may die, and I can scarcely be expected to teach a dead horse to sing, and so my life may be spared. Or I may die, in which case it won't matter whether or not the horse learns to sing. And if none of those things happen? the guard demanded. Well, in that case, the thief replied, who knows? Maybe the horse will learn to sing. Matthews chuckled, and the protector's grin broadened. Then it slowly faded, and he let his chair come back upright, laying his forearms on his desk and leaning forward over them. And in some ways, that's where we are, isn't it? He asked. We've been too closely allied with Manticor for too long, and we've already had personnel involved in active combat with the SLN. If the League decides to hammer the Star Kingdom over something that was clearly the League's fault in the first place, what makes anyone think they'll hesitate to hammer any of the uppity Neobarb's uppity Neobarb friends at the same time? What's one more star system when you're already planning on destroying a multi-system empire, with the largest independent merchant marine in the entire galaxy, just because you can't admit one of your own admirals screwed up by the numbers. Matthews looked back at his protector, wishing he could think of an answer to Benjamin's questions. So, that's where we are, the protector repeated quietly. In the long term, unless we're prepared to become another nice, obedient frontier security proxy and go around bashing other Neobarbs for the League, I'm sure they'll decide one of their flag officers should have another unfortunate little accident that gets our Navy trashed along with Manticores before we turn into a threat to them. So all I can see for us to do is the best we can, and hope that somewhere, even in the Solarian League, Someone's going to be bright enough to see the shipwreck coming and try to avoid it. After all, Benjamin grinned again, this time without amusement. The horse really may learn to sing. All right, boys and girls, Commander Michael Carush said. It's official. We can go home now. Hallelujah. Lieutenant Commander Bridget Landry said from her quadrant of his comm display. Not that it hasn't been fun, she continued. Why, I haven't enjoyed myself this much since they fixed that impacted wisdom tooth for me. Karush chuckled. The four destroyers of the Royal Manticoran Navy's Destroyer Division 265.2, known as the Silver Cepheids, had been sitting a light month from Manticore A for two weeks, doing absolutely nothing. Well, that wasn't exactly fair. 
They'd been sitting here maintaining a scrupulous sensor watch, looking for absolutely nothing, and he was hardly surprised by Landry's reaction. No, I'm not, he admitted. But somebody had to do it. And when it comes to perimeter security for the entire star system, better safe than sorry any day, even if it does mean somebody has to be bored as hell. Desdiv 265.2 had been sent to check out what was almost certainly a sensor ghost, but which could just possibly have been an actual hyperfootprint. It was extraordinarily unlikely that anyone would have bothered to make his alpha translation this far out, be his purposes ever so nefarious, since his impeller signature would certainly have been detected long before he could get close enough to the Manticore binary system to accomplish anything. But perimeter security didn't take chances on words like unlikely. When a sensor ghost like this one turned up, it was checked out, quickly and thoroughly. And if the checker-outers didn't find anything immediately upon arrival, they stayed put for the entire two T-weeks SOP required. Which was precisely what the Silver Cepheids had just finished doing. Should I assume, Bridget? Karush said that you have some pressing reason for wanting to head home at this particular moment? Oh, how could you possibly suspect anything of the sort? Lieutenant Commander John Pershing asked from the bridge of HMS Raven, and Lieutenant Commander Julie Chase, CO of HMS Lodestone, chuckled. I take it your senile old skipper is missing something? Karush said mildly. She's got one of those creative archaism thingies, Chase said. That's creative anachronisms, you ignorant lout, Landry corrected with a frown. Are you going off to play dress-up again, Bridget? Karush demanded. Hey, don't you start on me, she told him with a grin. Everyone's got her own hobby, even you. Or was that someone else I saw tying trout flies the other day? At least he eats what he catches, Chase pointed out. Or is it that what catches him eats him? She frowned, then shrugged. Anyway, it's not as silly as all those costumes of yours. Before you go around calling it silly, Julie, Pershing suggested, you might want to reflect on the fact that the Salamander is an honorary member of Bridget's chapter. What? Chase stared at him from her display. You're kidding! Duchess Harrington's part of this silly SCA thing? Well, not really, Landry said. Like John says, it's an honorary membership. One of her uncles is a real bigwig in the society on Beowulf, and he sponsored her back, oh, I don't know, must have been thirty t years ago. I've actually met her at a couple of meetings, though, you know. She took the pistol competition at both of them, as a matter of fact. There you have it, Karush said simply. If it's good enough for the salamander, it's good enough for anyone. So let's not have anyone abusing Bridget over her obby anymore, understand? Even if it is a remarkably silly way for an adult human being to spend her time, at least she's being silly in good company, so there. Landry stuck out her tongue at him and he laughed. Then he looked sideways at Lieutenant Linda Peterson, his astrogator aboard HMS Javelin. Got that course figured for us, Linda? Yes, Skipper, Peterson nodded. Well, in that case, pass it to these other characters, Karish told her. Obviously, we have to get Commander Landry back to Manticore before she turns back into a watermelon or a pumpkin or whatever it was. Commodore Carol Ostby leaned back in the comfortable chair, eyes closed, letting the music flow over him. Old Terran opera had been his favorite form of relaxation for as long as he could remember. He'd even learned French, German, and Italian so he could listen to them in their original languages. Of course, he'd always had a pronounced knack for languages. It was part of the Ostby genome, after all. At this moment, however, he found himself in rather greater need of that relaxation than usual. The seven small ships of his command had been creeping tracelessly around the perimeter of the Manticore binary system for over a T-month, and that wasn't something calculated to make a man feel comfortable. Whatever those idiots in the SLN might think, Erstby and the Mason Alignment Navy had the liveliest possible respect for the capabilities of Manti technology. In this case, though, it was the Manti's turn to be outclassed, or at least taken by surprise. 
If Erstby hadn't been 100% confident of that when Oyster Bay was originally planned, he was now. His cautious prowling about the system had confirmed that even the alignment's assessment of its sensor coverage had fallen badly short of the reality. Any conventional starship would have been detected long ago by the dense, closely integrated, multiply redundant sensor systems he and his personnel had painstakingly plotted. In fact, he was just a little concerned over the possibility that those surveillance systems might still pick up something soon enough to at least blunt Oyster Bay's effectiveness. Stop that, Carol, he told himself, never opening his eyes. Yes, it could happen, but you know it's not very damned likely. You just need something to worry about, don't you? His lips twitched in sour amusement as he acknowledged his own perversity, but at the same time, he was aware that his worrier side was one of the things that made him an effective officer. His subordinates probably got tired of all the contingency planning he insisted upon, yet even they had to admit that it made it unlikely they would truly be taken by surprise when Murphy decided to put in his inevitable appearance. So far, though, that appearance hadn't happened, and Erstby's flagship chameleon and her consorts were past the riskiest part of their entire mission. Their own reconnaissance platforms were the stealthiest the alignment could provide after decades of R&D and more capital investment than he liked to think about, and those platforms hadn't transmitted a single bite of information. They'd made their sweeps on ballistic flight profiles using purely passive sensors, then physically rendezvoused with their motherships to deliver their take. And overall, that take had been satisfying indeed. Passive sensors were less capable than active ones, but the multiple systems each platform mounted compensated for a lot of that. From the numbers of energy sources they'd picked up, it appeared the ships the Mantis currently had under construction weren't as far along in the building process as intelligence had estimated. If they had been, there'd have been more onboard energy sources already up and running. But at least Usby now knew exactly where the orbital yards were, and the external energy sources his platforms had picked up indicated that most of them had projects underway. From the numbers of signatures and the way they clustered, it looked as though more than a few of the yards were at early stages of their construction projects, and he hoped that didn't mean intelligence's estimate of the Mantis' construction times was off. It was hard to be certain, given how cautiously he had to operate— but if all those new projects meant the yards in question had finished their older projects ahead of estimate, and the fact that the Mantis seemed to be sending all their new construction off to Trevor Starr for working up exercises doesn't help either, he admitted sourly. Which was true enough. It didn't help one bit. Still, there was a lot of work going on in those dispersed yards of theirs, and while his estimates on what their space stations were up to were more problematical, he had no doubt there were quite a few ships under construction in those highly capable building slips as well. And we know exactly where they are, he reminded himself. Now it was just a matter of keeping tabs on what their recon platforms had located for them. He'd really have preferred to send the platforms through on another short-range sweep, closer to their actual execution date, but his orders were clear on that. It was more important to preserve the element of surprise than it was to monitor every single detail. And it wasn't as if there had been any effort to conceal the things Erstby and his people were there looking for. People didn't normally try to hide things like orbital shipyards. Even if they'd wanted to, Erstby couldn't imagine how someone would go about doing it nor did they move them around once they were in position. And if anyone did move them, Chameleon and her sisters would be bound to know, given the distant optical watch they were keeping, and the fact that the impeller wedge of any tug that started moving shipyards would certainly be powerful enough to be detected by at least one of the watching scout ships. So all we have to do now is wait, he told himself, listening to the music listening to the voices. One more T-month until we put the guidance platforms in place. That was going to be a little risky, he admitted in the privacy of his own thoughts, but only a little. 
the guidance platforms were even stealthier than his ships. Someone would have to almost literally collide with one of them to spot them, and they'd be positioned well above the system ecliptic where there was no traffic to do the colliding. He would have been happier if the platforms had been a little smaller. He admitted that to himself as well. But delivering targeting information to that many individual missiles in a time window as short as the Oyster Bay Ops plan demanded required a prodigious amount of bandwidth. And despite everything, it was highly likely the Mantis were going to hear something when they started transmitting all that data. Not that it was going to make any difference at that late date, he reflected with grim pleasure. Everything he and his squadron had done for the last three and a half T months all came down to that transmission's handful of seconds, and once it was made, nothing could save the star empire of Manticore. Chapter 4 Have you got a copy of that memo from Admiral Cheng? Captain Dowd Ibn Mamun al Fanudahi asked, poking his head into Captain Irene Teague's office. Which memo? Teague rolled her eyes in an expression she wouldn't have let any other battle fleet officer see. In fact, she wouldn't have let al Fanudahi see it as recently as a month or so ago. Displaying contempt, or at the very least, disrespect for a flag officer was always risky, but even more so when the officer doing the displaying was from Frontier Fleet and the object of the display was from Battle Fleet. And especially when the flag officer in question was the Frontier Fleet officer in question's CO. Unfortunately, Irene Teague had concluded that al Fanudahi had been right all along in his belief the preposterous reports of the Royal Manticoran Navy's superweapons weren't quite so preposterous after all, a point which, in her opinion, had been abundantly proved by what had happened to Joseph Bing at New Tuscany, and a point which apparently continued to elude Chiang Hai Shun, the commanding officer of the Office of Operational Analysis, to which she and al Fanudahi happened to be assigned. The one about that briefing next week, al Fanudahi said. The one for Kingsford and Timar. Oh. Teague frowned, trying to remember which of her voluminous correspondence folders she'd stuffed that particular memo into. Half the crap she filed hadn't even been opened, much less read. No one could possibly keep track of all the memos, letters, conference reports, requests, and just plain garbage floating around the Navy building and its annexes. Not that the originators of all that verbiage felt any compulsion to acknowledge that point. The real reason for most of it was simply to cover their own posteriors, after all, and the excuse that there simply weren't enough hours in the day to read all of it cut no ice when they produced their file copy and waved it under one's nose. She tapped a command, checking an index, then shrugged, tapped another, and snorted. Yeah, here it is. She looked up. You need a copy? Bang one over to my terminal, Alphanudahi replied with a slightly sheepish grin. I don't have a clue where I filed my copy, but what I really needed was to see if Polidoru or one of his reps is supposed to be there. Just a sec. Teague skimmed the memo, then shrugged. No mention of it if they are. I didn't remember one. Alphanudahi grimaced. Not exactly a good sign, wouldn't you say? Probably not, Teague agreed after a moment. On the other hand, maybe it is a good thing. At least this way, if they listen to you at all, he'll have less warning to start covering his arse before someone starts asking him some pointed questions. And just how likely do you really think that is? Not very, she admitted. If Chang had so far failed to grasp the nature of the sausage machine into which the SLN was about to poke its fingers, Admiral Martinos Polidoru, the commanding officer of systems development, was in active denial. The SysDev CO had been one of the masterminds behind the Fleet 2000 initiative, and he was even more convinced of the inevitability of Solarian technological superiority than the majority of his fellow officers. In theory, it was SysDev's responsibility to continually push the parameters, to search constantly for improved technologies and applications. 
Of course, in theory, it was also OPAN's responsibility to analyze and interpret operational data which might identify potential threats. Given that al Udahi's career had been stalled for decades, mostly because he'd tried to do exactly that, it probably wasn't surprising Polydoro's subordinates were unlikely to disagree with him. After all, Teague was one of the very few OPAN analysts who'd come to share al Udahi's concerns, and he'd specifically instructed her to keep her mouth shut about that minor fact. There might be a better chance of getting some of those questions asked if you'd let me sign off on your report, Dowd, she pointed out now. Not enough better to risk burning your credibility right alongside mine. He shook his head. No, it's not time for you to come out into the open yet, Irene. But, Dowd, no. He interrupted her with another headshake. There's not really anything new in Sigby's dispatches, aside from the confirmation their missiles have a range from rest of at least 29 million kilometers at any rate, and that had already been confirmed at Monica, if anyone'd been interested in looking at the reports. He shrugged. Someone's got to keep telling them about it, but they're not going to believe it, no matter what we say, until one of our units gets hammered in a way that's impossible even for someone like Cheng or Polidoru to deny. Everybody's got too much of the not-invented-here syndrome, and they don't want to hear from anyone who disagrees with them. But it's only a matter of time before they find out you've been right all along, she argued. Maybe... And when that happens, do you think they're going to like having been proved wrong? What usually happens to someone like me, someone who's insisted on telling them the sky is falling, is that if it turns out he was right, his superiors are even more strongly motivated to punish him. The last thing they want is to ask the advice of someone who's told them they were idiots after the universe demonstrates they really were idiots. That's why it's important you stay clear of this, when the crop finally hits the fan, you'll be the one who had access to all of my notes and my reports, who's in the best position to be their expert witness on that basis, but who hasn't been pissing them off for as long as they can remember. It's not right, she protested quietly. So? Teak had seen lemons less tart than Alpha Nudahi's smile. You were under the impression someone ever guaranteed life was fair? No, but... Her voice trailed off, and she gave her head an unwilling little toss of understanding. Not agreement, really, but of acceptance. Well, now that that's settled, Alphanudahi said more briskly, I was wondering if you'd had any more thoughts on that question of mine about the difference between their missile pods and tube-launched missiles. About the additional drive system, you mean? Yeah, or even about the additional drive systems, plural. Dowd, I'm on your side here, remember? And I'm willing to grant you that they might be able to squeeze one more drive into a missile body they could shoehorn into a pod, but even I don't see how they could have put in three of the damn things. Don't forget our esteemed colleagues are still arguing they couldn't fit in even two of them, Alpha Nudahi retorted, I agleam with combined mischief, provocation, and genuine concern. If they're wrong about that, then why couldn't you be wrong about drive system number three? Because, she replied with awful patience, there are physical limits not even mantis can get around. Besides, Daud ibn Mamun el Fanudahi leaned his shoulders against the wall of her cubicle and smiled as he prepared to stretch the parameters of her mind once again. Aldona Anisimovna walked briskly down the sumptuously decorated hallway. It wasn't the first time she'd made this walk, but this time she was unaccompanied by the agitated butterflies which had polked around her midsection before. And not just because Kirillos Taliadoros, her personal enhanced bodyguard, walked quietly behind her. His presence was one sign of how monumentally her universe had changed in the last sixteen months, yet it was hardly the only one. Then again, everyone else's universe is about to change too, isn't it? She thought as they neared their destination. And they don't even know it. On the other hand, 
Neither had she on that day sixteen months ago when she and Isabel Bardasano walked into Albrecht Detweiler's office and Anisimovna, for the first time in her life, learned the real truth. They reached the door at the end of the hall, and it slid open at their approach. Another man, who looked like a cousin of Taliodoros's, because, after all, he was one, considered them gravely for a moment, then stepped aside with a gracious little half-bow. Anisimovna nodded back, but the true focus of her attention was the man sitting behind the large office's desk. He was tall, with strong features, and the two younger men sitting at the opposite ends of his desk looked a great deal like him, not surprisingly. Aldona! Albrecht Detweiler smiled at her, standing behind the desk and holding out his hand. I trust you had a pleasant voyage home? Yes, thank you, Albrecht. She shook his hand. Captain Maddox took excellent care of us, and Bolide is a perfectly wonderful yacht, and... She rolled her eyes drolly at him. So speedy. Detweiler chuckled appreciatively, released her hand, and nodded at the chair in front of his desk. Taliodoros and Detweiler's own bodyguard busied themselves pouring out cups of coffee with the same deftness they brought to certain more physical aspects of their duties. Then they withdrew, leaving her with Albrecht and his two sons. I'm glad you appreciate Bolide's speed, Aldona. Benjamin Detweiler set his cup back on its saucer and smiled slightly at her. And we appreciate your using it to get home this quickly. Anisimovna nodded in acknowledgement. The streak drive was yet another thing she hadn't known anything about six months ago. Nor, to be frank, was it something she would have expected out of Mason researchers. Like most of the rest of the galaxy, although for rather different reasons, she'd been inclined to think of her homeworld's R&D community primarily in terms of biological research. Intellectually, she'd known better than most of humanity that the planet of Mesa's scientific and academic communities had never restricted themselves solely to genetics and the biosciences. But even for her, those aspects of Mesa had been far more visible, the things that defined Mesa, just as they defined Beowulf. Well, if it surprised me, I imagine that's a pretty good indication of just how big a surprise it's going to be for everyone else, too, she thought dryly. Which is going to be a very good thing over the next few years. The streak drive represented a fundamental advance in interstellar travel, and there was no indication anyone else was even close to duplicating it. For centuries, the Theta bands had represented an inviolable ceiling for hypercapable ships. Everyone had known it was theoretically possible to go even higher, attain a still higher apparent normal space velocity, yet no one had ever managed to design a ship which could crack the iota wall and survive. Incredible amounts of research had been invested in efforts to do just that, especially in the earlier days of hypertravel, but with a uniform lack of success. In the last few centuries, efforts to beat the iota barrier had waned until the goal had been pretty much abandoned as one of those theoretically possible but practically unobtainable concepts. But the Mason alignment hadn't abandoned it, and finally, after the better part of a hundred T years of dogged research, they'd found the answer. It was in many ways a brute force approach, and it wouldn't have been possible even now without relatively recent advances, whose potential no one else seemed to have noticed, in related fields. And even with those other advances, it had almost doubled the size of conventional hypergenerators, but it worked. Indeed, they'd broken not simply the iota wall, but the capital wall as well. Which meant the voyage from New Tuscany to Mesa, which would have taken anyone else the next best thing to 45 T days, had taken Anisimovna less than 31. Now, Albrecht said, drawing her attention back to him, Benjamin Collin and I have skimmed your report. We'd like to hear it directly from you, though. Of course, she replied. But she paused, then gave her head a tiny shake. Excuse me, Albrecht, but I actually expected to be making this report to Isabel. I'm afraid that won't be possible. It wasn't Albrecht who answered her. It was Colin, and his voice was far harder and harsher than Albrecht's or Benjamin's had been. 
She looked at him, and he gave a sharp, angry shrug. Isabel's dead, Aldona. She was killed about three months ago, along with everyone else in the Gamma Center at the time. Anisimovna's eyes widened in shock. Despite her recent admission to the Mason Alignment's innermost circles, she still had only the vaguest notion of what sort of research had been carried on in the Alignment's various satellite centers. The only thing she'd known about the Gamma Center was that, unlike most of the others, it was right here in the Mesa system, which implied it was also more important than most. May I ask what happened? She more than half expected him to tell her no, since she presumably had no operational need to know. But Isabel had become more than just another of her professional colleagues, and Colin surprised her. We still don't have all the pieces, actually, he admitted. In fact, we never will. We do know someone activated the self-destruct security protocols and who it was. We're still guessing at some of the events leading up to that, but given that Isabel was on her way to take him into custody, we're pretty sure why he activated them. He paused, expression grim, and Anisimovna nodded. If she'd had a choice between pressing a self-destruct button and facing what would be euphemistically described as rigorous questioning, she would have chosen vaporization, too. What we still can't prove is exactly what he was up to before Isabel became suspicious of him. We're sure we figured out his basic intentions, but we've had to do most of the figuring from secondary sources. There aren't any primary sources or witnesses left on our side, aside from the one low-level agent who seems to be the only person to have done everything right. But there's reason to believe the ballroom was involved, at least peripherally. The ballroom knew about the Gamma Center? Astonishment and a sudden pulse of panic startled the question out of her. If the ex-genetic slave terrorists of the ballroom had discovered that much, who knew how much else they might have learned about the alignment? We don't think so. Colin shook his head quickly. We do have a few witnesses from the other side, and based on their testimony and our own investigations, we've confirmed that Zilwicky and Kashat were here on Mesa and almost certainly that the center's head of security made contact with them. Anisimovna knew her eyes were huge, but not even an alpha line could have helped that under these circumstances. Anton Zilwicky and Victor Kashat had been here on Mesa itself? This was getting better and better by the second, wasn't it? None of the evidence suggests they'd come expressly looking for the center, Colin went on reassuringly. We know how the traitor discovered they were here in the first place, so we're confident they didn't come looking to make contact with him, at any rate. It looks like he decided, for reasons of his own, that he wanted to defect, and jumped at the chance when he realized they were here. In fact, we have imagery of him actually meeting Zilwicky. That's what made Isabel suspicious in the first place. Zilwicky hadn't been ID'd from the imagery before she went looking for the defector, but she did know that low-level agent I mentioned had already fingered him as a ballroom peripheral. Unfortunately, the first person he reported that little fact to was the center's chief of security. He smiled thinly at Anisimovna's grimace. Yes, that was convenient for him, wasn't it? He agreed. We think that's what triggered the decision to defect, and it also put him in a position to keep anyone higher up the chain from realizing Zilwicky was on planet. The only thing that screwed him up was the original agent's suspicions when one of his bugs caught them meeting in a Seki restaurant. We were just lucky as hell our man had the gumption and the balls to go directly to Isabel. Unfortunately, lucky is a relative term in this case. Our man didn't know his ballroom peripheral was Anton Zilwicky, so Isabel didn't realize it either. If she had, she would have approached the whole thing differently, but she clearly had no idea how serious the security breach really was, and she decided to handle it personally, quickly, and above all, quietly. Which, however reasonable it may have seemed, was a mistake in this case. When he realized Isabel was coming for him, the defector was able to trigger the charge under the center. He took the whole damned place and all of its on-site records and personnel with him. Not to mention one of the Green Pine's larger commercial towers and everyone inside it when the charge went off in its sub-basement. 
Anisimovna inhaled suddenly, sharply. She might have known the Gamma Center was in the Mesa system, but she'd never guessed it might be located in one of the system capital's bedroom suburbs. The only good points were that it was a Saturday and early, so most of the center's R&D personnel were safely at home, and the defector had apparently set up a fallback position to take out Zilwicky and Kashat in case they stiffed him. He used it, and we are 99.99% sure he managed to kill both of them, even if it did take another nuke to do the job. So they're both dead at least, but not... His jaw muscles tightened and his eyes went terrifyingly cold. Without another ballroom bastard using a nuke on Pine Valley Park on a Saturday morning. Anisimovna's stomach muscles clenched. She knew Colin's family lived just outside Green Pine Central Park. His children played there almost every weekend, and... No, he said more gently as he saw the shock in her eyes. No, Alexis and the kids weren't there, thank God. But most of their friends were. And on a more pragmatic level, we picked up two of the local Seki Zilwicky and Kashat used. This time, his smile was a terrible thing to see. They've been dealt with, but not before they told us everything they ever knew in their lives, and, to give the devil his due, they both insisted Zilwicky and Kashat never intended to nuke the park. In fact, it wasn't their idea either. One of their fellow lunatics apparently went berserk and made the decision on his own. Anisimovna knew she looked shell-shocked, but that was all right. She was shell-shocked. On the other hand, Colin continued, Having three separate nukes go off in green pines on a single day isn't the sort of thing you can cover up. We took the position that we intended to conduct a very thorough investigation before we leveled any charges, which was true enough, but we knew we'd eventually have to go public with some explanation. No one wanted to admit the ballroom could get through to pull something like this, but we decided that was the least of the evils available to us. In fact, once the Seckies confessed, we decided we could charge that Zilwicky was the mastermind behind the whole thing, which, in a way, he was, after all. We considered adding Kashat to the mix, Albrecht said, but he wasn't the kind of public figure Zilwicky was after that expose of Yale Underwoods outed him a couple of years ago, and he managed to keep his involvement with Verdant Vista under the radar horizon. Nobody knows who the hell he was, and we couldn't come up with a plausible way to explain how we knew either. Under the circumstances, we decided that trying to link Haven to it as well would be too much for even the Solly public to take without asking questions, like what two agents from star nations at war with each other were doing on Mesa together, we'd rather not answer. Fortunately, no one in the League expects a bunch of ballroom terrorists to act rationally, and we've been chiseling away at Torch's claim that it's not really a ballroom safe harbor ever since we lost the planet. That made Zilwicky's involvement even juicier. His eyes glittered, and Anisimovna nodded. Once-in-a-lifetime propaganda opportunities like this one were gifts from heaven and she understood the temptation to write it as far as possible. At the same time, she was glad Albrecht had recognized that claiming it as a joint Manticker and Havenite operation would have strained even the League public's credulity to the breaking point. Probably about the only thing that could do that, she thought, but under the circumstances... At any rate, Colin said, resuming the narrator's role, we officially completed our investigation about a week ago, and since neither Zilwicky nor Kashat is around to dispute our version of events, we've announced Zilwicky was responsible for all three explosions, and that the nukes represented a deliberate terror attack launched by the ballroom and the Kingdom of Torch. The fact that Torches declared war on us made that easier, and our PR types, both here and in the League, are pounding away at how it proves any Torch claims to have disavowed terror are bullshit. Once a terrorist, always a terrorist and this attack killed thousands of Sekis and slaves as well. He showed another flash of teeth. Actually, it only got a few hundred of them, but no one off Mesa knows that. And enough Sekis disappeared when the regular security agencies came down on them after Zilwicky and Kashat's little friends confessed that no one in the Seki or slave communities who does know better is going to say a word. 
that's not going to help the ballrooms cause any, even with other slaves. And as far as anyone else is concerned, the whole operation was a deliberate attack on a civilian target with weapons of mass destruction, multiple weapons of mass destruction. We're going to hammer them in the Solly faxes, and having a known agent of Manticore involved in it gives us another club to use on the Mantis as well. There was silence in the office for several seconds. Then Albrecht cleared his throat. I'm afraid that's the reason you won't be making your report to Isabel after all, Aldona, he said. I see. Anisimovna considered asking about the nature of the research which had been carried out in the Gamma Center, yet she considered it neither very hard nor for very long. That was information she clearly had no need to know, but she was glad Isabel had caught the traitor before he'd managed to pass whatever it had been on to anyone else. For that matter, taking out Zilwicky and Kashat was going to hurt the other side badly down the road. And she could appreciate the way the disaster could be used as a public relations weapon against Torch and the ballroom. But the price... I'm sorry, Aldona. She looked up, surprised by the gentleness in Albrecht's voice. She was almost as surprised by that as she was to feel the tears hovering behind her eyes. I know you and Isabel had grown quite close, he said. She was close to me, too. She had her sharp edges, but she was also a very clear-thinking, intellectually honest person. I'm going to miss her, and not just on a professional level. She met his eyes for a second or two, then nodded and inhaled deeply. I imagine she's not the only person we're going to lose now that everything is coming more or less into the open, she said. I imagine not, Albrecht agreed quietly. Then he gave himself a shake and smiled at her. But in the meantime, we have a lot to do, especially since, as you put it, everything is coming more or less into the open. So could you please go on with your report? Of course. She settled back in her chair, forcing her focus back onto the report she'd come here to give in the first place, and cleared her throat. Things went essentially as planned, she began. Bing reacted almost exactly as his profile had indicated he would, and the Mantis cooperated by sending three of their destroyers, not just a single ship. When Giselle blew up, Bing instantly assumed the Mantis had attacked the station and blew all three of them out of space. Personally, I suspect there may actually have been a fourth Manti out there, given how quickly Gold Peak responded. Someone must have told Kumalo and Medusa what happened, at any rate. The turnaround time suggests it had to be either a warship or a dispatch boat, and I'm inclined to wonder if a dispatch boat would have had the capability to monitor and control current-generation Manti recon platforms. No one in Bing's task force or on New Tuscany ever saw any additional mantis, but Gold Peak arrived with detailed sensor information on the entire first incident, and someone must have provided it to her, just as someone must have been there in order to get their response force back so fast. That's actually the part of the operation I'm least satisfied with, she said candidly. I didn't think there was anyone else out there at the time either, and I'd hoped I'd have a little more time to work on tying New Tuscany more securely into our plans. I didn't, so when the Mantis did turn up, New Tuscany pretty much left Bing to sink or swim on his own. She shrugged. He managed to sink quite handily, actually, although I could wish Gold Peak had pushed him under a little more enthusiastically. She settled for blowing up just his flagship, and from everything I could see before Captain Maddox hypered out, it looked as if Sigby was going to comply with all of Gold Peak's demands without further resistance. That's exactly what happened, Benjamin told her. Her eyebrows rose, and he chuckled grimly. The Mantis released their version of what happened at New Tuscany, both incidents, nine days ago. I'm sure it's all over Old Terra by now. According to the Mantis, they got everything from Sigby's secure databases. Oh, my, Anisimovna murmured, and it was Albrecht's turn to chuckle. Exactly, he said cheerfully. 
Hopefully, this whole thing is going to spin out of the Mantis and the Sally's control without any more direct interference on our part, aside from whatever we can milk out of green pines, that is. But if it looks like it's not, we can always start leaking some of that secure information ourselves as well. So far, the Mantis seem to be trying to respect the confidentiality of anything from the databases that doesn't pertain directly to their own problems with the Sollies. I don't know if those arrogant idiots in old Chicago have even noticed that, but I'm sure they'll notice if the Mantis suddenly start leaking all of those embarrassing contingency plans of theirs to the media. That would be discomforting for everyone concerned, wouldn't it? Anisimovna observed with an almost blissful smile. It most certainly would. Of course, so far, it doesn't look like we're going to need to do very much more to fan that particular flame. At the moment, Kolokoltsov and his colleagues don't seem to have missed very many things they could have done wrong. Albrecht's smile was evil. And our good friend Rajampet is performing exactly as expected. And Crandall? Anisimovna asked. We can't be positive yet, Benjamin replied. We couldn't give Ottweiler a streak drive, so it's going to be a while before we hear anything from him. I don't think there's much need to worry about her response, though. Even without our prompting, her own natural inclination would be to attack as soon and hard as possible. And his smile was remarkably like his father's. We happen to know her appreciation of the Mantis technology is every bit as good as Bing's was. Good. Anisimovna made no effort to hide her own satisfaction. Then she frowned. The only thing that still worries me is the fact that there was no way for me to hide my fingerprints. If New Tuscan is looking for some ways to appease Manticore, they're damned well going to have told Goldpeak about our involvement, or as much about it as they know, at any rate. Unfortunately, you're exactly right, Albrecht agreed. They did roll over on us, and the Mantis have broadcast that fact to the galaxy at large. On the other hand, he shrugged, it was a given from the outset that they were going to find out in the end. No one could have done a better job of burying his tracks than you did, so don't worry about it. Besides, he grinned nastily, our people on Old Terror were primed and waiting to heap scorn on the fantastic allegations and wild accusations coming out of Maticor. Obviously, the Mantis are trying to come up with some story any story, to justify their unprovoked attack on Admiral Bing. And people are really going to buy that? Anisimovna couldn't help sounding a bit dubious, and Detweiler gave a crack of laughter. <laughs> You'd be astonished how many Sallies will buy into that, at least long enough to meet our needs. They're accustomed to accepting nonsense about what goes on in The Verge. OFS has been feeding it to them forever, and their newsies are used to swinging the spoon. Their media's been so thoroughly co-opted that at least half their reporters automatically follow the party line. It's almost like some kind of involuntary reflex. And even if John Q. Solly doesn't swallow it this time for some reason, it probably won't matter as long as we just generate enough background noise to give the people making the important decisions the cover and official justification they need. He shook his head again. Like I say, don't worry about it. I'm completely satisfied with your performance out there. Anisimovna smiled back at him and nodded in mingled relief and genuine pleasure. The assignment she'd been handed was one of the most complicated ones she'd ever confronted. It hadn't come off perfectly, but it hadn't had to come off perfectly, and from everything they'd said, it sounded as if the operation had accomplished its goals. And because I am satisfied, Albrecht told her, I'm probably going to be handing you some additional hot potatoes. She looked at him, and he snorted. That's your reward for pulling this one off. Now that we know you can handle the hard ones, we're not going to waste you on the easy ones. And frankly, the fact that we've lost Isabel is going to have us looking harder than ever for capable high-level troubleshooters. I see. She put as much confidence and enthusiasm into her voice as she could, but Albrecht's eyes twinkled at her. Actually, he told her, now that you've reached the center of the onion... You'll find that, in a lot of ways, my bark is worse than my bite. He shook his head, the twinkle in his eyes fading. Don't misunderstand. There are still penalties for people who just plain fuck up. But at the same time, we know the sorts of things we're assigning people to do. And we also know that sometimes Murphy turns up, no matter how carefully you plan or how well you execute. 
so we're not going to automatically punish anyone for failure unless it's abundantly obvious they're the reason for the failure. And judging from the way you've handled this assignment, I don't think that's likely to be happening in your case. I hope not, she replied. And I'll try to make sure it doesn't. I'm sure you will. He smiled at her again, then leaned forward in his chair, crossing his forearms on the edge of the desk in front of him. Now then, he continued more briskly, it's going to be another couple of tea weeks before anyone can officially get here from New Tuscany. That means the Mantis are going to have that much more time to get their version of events out in front of the Sollies. Worse than that, from the Sollies' perspective, it's going to be leaking into the League's media through the wormhole network faster than the government's version of events can spread out from Old Terra. From our perspective, that's a good thing, probably. It would take an old-fashioned miracle for those numbskulls in old Chicago to do the smart thing and offer to negotiate with the Mantis, so I think we can probably count on them to take the ball and run with it where creative reinterpretation, shall we say, of events in New Tuscany is concerned. Despite that, it's entirely possible that there's at least one, possibly even two honest newsies on Old Hera. That could have unfortunate repercussions for the way we want to see this handled. Fortunately, we have people strategically placed throughout the League's media, and especially on Old Terra. What I want you to do now, Aldona, is to sit down with Colin and Franklin. They'll bring along some of our own newspeople, and the three of you will work with them to come up with the most effective way to spin what happened in New Tuscany to suit our needs. Given our allegations about Green Pines, a good-sized chunk of the Sally media is going to be salivating for anything that puts Manticore in a bad light, which should help a lot. And now that you've brought us all that raw sensor data from both incidents, not to mention those nice authentication codes, we can get started on a little creative reinterpretation of our own for the Sollies. I've got a few ideas on how best to go about that myself, but you've demonstrated a genuine talent for this sort of thing, so sit down and see what you can come up with on your own first. Thanks to the streak drive, we've got two weeks to massage the story here on Mesa any way we have to before it could possibly get to us by any normal dispatch boat. I want to use that time as effectively as possible. I understand. Good. And in the meantime, although you really don't have the need to know this, there's going to be another little news story in about two more T-months. There is? Anisimovna glanced around, puzzled by the sudden predatory smiles of all three Detweilers. Oh, there certainly is, Albrecht told her, then waved at Benjamin. Tell her, he said. Well, Aldona, Benjamin said, in about another two months, a little operation we've been working on for some time, one called Oyster Bay, is going to come to fruition. And when it does... January 1922, Post-Diaspora I've got a bad feeling about this. Admiral Patricia Givens, RMN, CO, Office of Naval Intelligence. Chapter 5 Captain J.G. Ginger Lewis was not filled with confidence as she headed down the passageway aboard HMSS Wayland towards Rear Admiral Tina Yeager's office. It wasn't because she felt any worry over her ability to discharge her new duties— it wasn't even because she'd started her career as enlisted without so much as dreaming she might attain her present rank. For that matter, it wasn't even because she'd just been assigned to the Royal Manticoran Navy's primary R&D facility when all her actual experience had been acquired in various engineering departments aboard deployed starships. No, it was because she hadn't seen a single happy face since she'd arrived aboard Wayland half an hour before. Most people, she suspected, would have felt at least a qualm or two at being the new kid just reporting in when something had so obviously hit the rotary air impeller. I wonder if it's just over here in R&D, or if Aubrey and Paolo are about to get the same treatment, she wondered. Then she snorted. Well, even if they are, Paolo has Aubrey to take care of him. The thought made her smile as she remembered Aubrey Wanderman's first deployment, which, by the strangest turn of events, had also been her first deployment. She'd been quite a few years older than him, but they'd completed their naval training school assignments together, and she'd sort of taken him under her wing. 
he'd needed it too. It was hard to remember now how young he'd been, or that it had all happened almost 14 T years ago. Sometimes it seemed like only yesterday, and sometimes it seemed like something that had happened a thousand years ago to someone else entirely. But she remembered how shiny and new he'd been, how disappointed he'd been at being assigned to only a merchant cruiser, until at least he discovered that the captain of the merchant cruiser in question was then-Captain Honor Harrington. Her smile faded just a bit as she remembered the click of bullies and would-be deserters who'd made Aubrey's life a living hell, at least until Captain Harrington had found out about it. And the way she'd found out about it had been when their attempt to murder a certain acting petty officer by the name of Ginger Lewis had failed, and Aubrey, who'd fallen under the influence of Chief Petty Officer Horace Harkness and HMS Wayfarer's Marine Detachment, had beaten their ringleader half to death with his bare hands. She was still a bit surprised she'd survived the sabotaged software of her EVA propulsion pack, and she knew she hadn't emerged from the experience unscarred. Even now, all these years later, she hated going EVA, which unfortunately came the way of the engineering department even more than anyone else. Still, there was a world, a universe of difference, between that once-bullied young man and Senior Chief Petty Officer Aubrey Wanderman. And, she thought a bit enviously, neither he nor Paolo is going to have to report in to someone with the towering seniority of a flag officer. Lucky bastards. Her wool gathering had carried her successfully down the passage to Rear Admiral Yeager's door. Now, however, she bade a regretful farewell to its distraction and stepped through the open door. The yeoman seated behind the desk in the outer office looked up at her, then rose respectfully. Yes, ma'am? Captain Lewis, Ginger replied. I'm reporting aboard, Chief. Yes, ma'am. That would be Delta Department, wouldn't it, ma'am? Yes, it would. Ginger eyed him speculatively. Any flag officer's yeoman worth her salt was going to keep up with the details of her admiral's appointments and concerns. Keeping track of the comings and goings of officers who hadn't even known themselves the day before that they were about to be assigned to Wayland was a bit more impressive than usual, however. I thought so, ma'am. The yeoman's expression didn't actually change by a single millimeter, yet somehow he managed to radiate a sense of overtried patience or perhaps a better word would have been exasperation. Fortunately, none of it seemed to be directed towards Ginger. I'm afraid the Admiral's unavailable at the moment, ma'am, the yeoman continued. And so is Lieutenant Weaver, her flag lieutenant. It's a, an unscheduled meeting with the station commander. Ginger managed to keep her eyes from widening. An unscheduled meeting with Wayland C.O., was it? No wonder she'd sensed a certain tension in the air. I see, Chief Timmons, she said after a moment, reading the yeoman's nameplate. Would it happen we have any idea when Admiral Yeager might be free? Frankly, ma'am, I'm afraid it might be quite some time. Timmons' expression remained admirably grave. That's why I wanted to confirm that you were the officer Delta's been expecting. And, since I am, well, ma'am, I thought in that case you might go down to Delta and report in to Captain Jefferson. He's Delta Division CO. I thought perhaps he might be able to start getting you squared away, and then you could report to the Admiral when she's free again. Do you know, Chief? I think that sounds like a perfectly wonderful idea, Ginger agreed. Well, that was an interesting clusterfuck, wasn't it? Vice Admiral Claudio Faraday, the commanding officer of HMSS Wayland, was known for a certain pithiness. He also had a well-developed sense of humor, although, Tina Yeager noted, there was no trace of it in his voice at the moment. Would it happen, Faraday continued, that tucked away somewhere in your subordinate officer's files, between their voluminous correspondence, their instruction manuals, their schedules, their research notes, their ham sandwiches, and their entertainment chips. They actually possess a copy of this station's emergency evacuation plan? 
He looked back and forth between Jaeger and Rear Admiral Warren Trammell, her counterpart on the fabrication and industrial end of Whalen's operations. Trammell didn't look much happier than Jaeger felt, but neither was foolish enough to answer his question, and Faraday smiled thinly. I only ask, you understand, he continued almost affably, because our recent exercise would seem to indicate that either they don't have a copy of the plan, or else none of them can read, and I hate to think Her Majesty's Navy is entrusting its most important and secure research programs to a bunch of illiterates. Jaeger stirred in her chair, and Faraday's eyes swooped to her. Sir, she said, first, let me say I have no excuse for my department's performance— Second, I'm fully aware my people performed much more poorly than Admiral Trammell's. Oh, don't take all the credit, Admiral, Faraday said with another smile. Your people may have performed more poorly than Admiral Trammell's, but given the underwhelming level of Admiral Trammell's people's performance, I very much doubt that anyone could have performed much more poorly than they did. Sir, Captain Marcus Howell said diffidently, and all three of the flag officers looked in his direction. Aside from Jaegers and Trammell's flag lieutenants, whose massively junior status insulated them from the direct brunt of Admiral Faraday's monumental unhappiness, he was the junior officer in the compartment. He was also, however, Faraday's chief of staff. Yes, Marcus, you have something you'd care to add? Well, sir, I only wanted to observe that this was the first emergency evacuation simulation Wayland's conducted in the last two T years, under the circumstances, it's probably not really all that surprising people were a little rusty. Rusty. Faraday rolled the word across his tongue, then snorted harshly. If we use the term in the sense that a hatch sealed shut by atmospheric oxidation is rusty, I suppose it's appropriate. The smile he bestowed upon Howell should have lowered the temperature in his office by at least three degrees, but then he grimaced. Still, I take your point. He gave himself a shake, then turned his attention back to Jaeger and Trammell. Don't think for a moment that I'm any happier about this than I was ten seconds ago. Still, Marcus does have a point. I'm not a great believer in the theory that extenuating circumstances excuse an officer's failures where his duty is concerned, but I suppose it's a bit early to start kill-hauling people, too— so perhaps we should simply begin all over again from a mutual point of agreement that everyone's performance in the simulation was suboptimal. In fact, Jaeger knew, it had been far, far worse than suboptimal. If she were going to be honest about it, which she really would have preferred avoiding if at all possible, his initial delightfully apt choice of noun had much to recommend it as a factual summation. As Howell had just pointed out, emergency evacuation exercises had not been a priority of Rear Admiral Colombo, Faraday's immediate predecessor. For that matter, they hadn't been a high priority for the station commander before that either. On the other hand, the CO had been a Janicek appointee, and nothing had been very high on his priority list. By contrast, Colombo possessed enormous energy and drive, which helped explain why Admiral Hempel had just recalled him to the capital planet as her second-in-command at Bueps. But, Jaeger admitted, Colombo had been a tech weenie like her. She didn't think he'd ever held a starship command, and he'd been involved in the R&D side for almost 30 T years. He'd been conscientious about the administrative details of his assignment, but his real interest had been down in the labs or over in the fabrication units where prototype pieces of hardware were produced. Sir, she said now, I'm serious about apologizing for my people's performance. Yes, Captain Howell has a point. It's not something we've exercised at. But the truth is, sir, that an awful lot of my people suffer from what I can only call tunnel vision. They're really intensely focused on their projects. Sometimes, to be honest, I'm not sure they're even aware the rest of the universe is out there at all. She shook her head. I know at least one of my division heads, I'd prefer not to say which, heard the evacuation alarm and just turned it off so it wouldn't disturb his train of thought while he and two of his lead researchers were discussing the current problem. I've already, um, counseled him on that decision, but I'm afraid it was fairly typical, which is my fault, not theirs. 
It's your fault, Admiral, in the sense that you're ultimately responsible for the actions of all personnel under your command. That doesn't excuse their actions, or inaction. However, judging by the overall level of performance, I'd have to relieve three-quarters of the officers aboard this station if I were going to hammer everyone who'd screwed up, so we're not going to do that. Faraday paused, letting the silence stretch out, until Tremel took pity on his colleague and broke it. We're not, sir? he asked. No, Admiral, Faraday said. Instead, we're going to fix the problem. I'm afraid it's probably symptomatic of other problems we're going to find, and to be fair, Admiral Jaeger, I can actually understand why a lot of the R&D people think the rest of us are playing silly games that only get in the way of the people, them, doing serious work. From a lot of perspectives, they've got a point, really, when you come right down to it. Jaeger was actually a bit surprised to hear Faraday admit that. Claudio Faraday was about as far removed from Rear Admiral Thomas Colombo as it was possible for a human being to be. He had effectively zero background on the research side. In fact, he was what Admiral Hemphill had taken to calling a shooter, not a researcher, and Jaeger felt positive he would rather have been commanding a battle squadron than babysitting the Navy's brain trust. But that, she was beginning to suspect, might actually be the very reason he'd been chosen for his new assignment. It was more than possible Columbo had been recalled to Buweps not simply because his talents were needed there, but because certain recent events had convinced someone at the Admiralty House that HMSS Wayland needed the talents of someone like Claudio Faraday equally badly. I fully realize I've been aboard for less than one tea week, Faraday continued, and I realize my credentials on the R&D side are substantially weaker even than Admiral Colombo's. But there's a reason we have an emergency evacuation plan. In fact, there's an even better reason for us to have one than for Hephaestus or Vulcan to have one. The same reason, in a lot of ways, that we back all of our data up down on the planetary surface every 12 hours— there is one tiny difference between our data backups and the evac plan, however. He smiled again, a bit less thinly than before. It would be just a bit more difficult to reconstitute the researchers than their research if both of them get blown to bits. The silence was much more intense this time. Four months ago, Jaeger might have been inclined to dismiss Faraday's concerns— but that had been before the Battle of Manticore. We all know the new system defense pods have been deployed to protect Wayland, the vice admiral went on after a moment. For that matter, we all know the peeps got hammered so hard it's not really likely they're going to be poking their noses back into Manticoran space anytime soon. But nobody thought it was very likely they'd do it in the first place either. So, however much it may inconvenience our personnel... I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist we get this little procedural bump smoothed out. I'd appreciate it if you'd make your people aware that I'm not exactly satisfied with their performance in this little simulation. I assure you I'll be making that point to them myself as well. He smiled again. Neither Jaeger nor Tremel would ever have mistaken the expression for a sign of pleasure. What you are not going to tell them, however is that I have something just a little more drastic in mind for them. Simulations are all well and good, and I'm perfectly prepared to use them as training tools. After all, that's what they're intended for. But, as I'm sure you're both aware, it's always been the Navy's policy to conduct live-fire exercises as well as simulations, which is what we're going to do, too. Jaeger managed to keep her dismay from showing although she was fairly certain Faraday knew exactly what she was feeling. Still, she couldn't help a sinking sensation in the pit of her stomach as she thought about the gaping holes the chaos of an actual physical evacuation of the station was going to tear in her R&D schedules. I fully realize, Faraday continued, as if he'd been a sphinxian tree cat reading her mind, that an actual evacuation will have significant repercussions on the station's operations— because I am, this isn't something I'm approaching lightly. It's not something I want to do, it's only something we have to do. And because we not only need to test our actual performance, but convince some of your focused people this is something to take seriously, 
not just something designed to interrupt their work schedules, we're not going to tell them it's coming. We'll go ahead and run the additional simulations. I'm sure they'll expect nothing less out of their new, pissed-off, pain-in-the-ass CEO, and they'll bitch and moan about it with all the creativity of really smart people. I don't care about that as long as they keep it to themselves and don't force me to take note of it. But hopefully, when we hit them with the actual emergency order, when it's not a simple simulation, they'll at least have improved enough for us to get everyone off the station without someone getting killed because he forgot to secure his damned helmet. Captain Anston Fitzgerald tipped back in his chair as Commander Amal Nachaduri stepped into the briefing room with an electronic tablet tucked under his arm. Have a seat, the captain invited, pointing at a chair across the table from his own, and Nachaduri settled into it with a grateful sigh. Fitzgerald smiled and shook his own head. Are you anywhere near a point where you can actually sit down for a couple of hours with a beer? He asked, and Nachaduri chuckled sourly. It had never occurred to the tall, almost albino pale commander that he might find himself the executive officer of one of the Royal Manticoran Navy's most powerful heavy cruisers. He was a communication specialist, and posts like that usually went to officers who'd come up through the tactical track, although that tradition had been rather eroded over the past couple of decades by the Navy's insatiable appetite for experienced personnel. On the other hand, very few XOs had inherited their positions under circumstances quite like his, which had quite a bit to do with his current weariness. By my calculations, it won't be more than another T-year before I can take a break long enough for that, sir, he replied. Ginger was one hell of an engineer, but we're still finding things that managed to get broken somehow. He shrugged. Most of what we're finding now is little crap, of course, None of it's remotely vital. I imagine that's one reason Ginger hadn't already found it and dealt with it before they transferred her out. But I'm still annotating her survey for the yard dogs, and the fact that Bupers is pilfering so enthusiastically isn't helping one damned bit. Fitzgerald nodded in understanding and sympathy. He'd held Nachaduri's position until Hexapuma's return from the Talbot Quadrant. He was intimately familiar with the problems the commander was experiencing and discovering, and the XO's frustration came as no surprise, not least because they'd all anticipated getting the ship into the yard dog's hands so quickly. Fitzgerald's eyes darkened at that thought. Of course, they'd expected that. After all, none of them were psychics, so none of them had realized the Battle of Manticore was going to come roaring out of nowhere only five days after their return. Hexapuma's damages had kept her on the sidelines, a helpless observer, and as incredibly frustrating as that had been at the time, it was probably also the only reason Fitzgerald, Nakchaduri, and the cruiser's entire complement were still alive. That cataclysmic encounter had wreaked havoc on a scale no one had ever truly envisioned. It had also twisted the Navy's neat, methodical schedules into pretzels, and the horrendous personnel losses had quite a bit to do with how Nachaduri had ended up confirmed as Hexapuma's executive officer, too. Well, he said, shaking off the somberness memories of the battle always produced. I've got some good news for once. Rear Admiral Truman says she's finally got a space for us in R&R. She does? Nachaduri straightened, expression brightening. Rear Admiral Margaret Truman a first cousin of the rather more famous Admiral Alice Truman, was the commanding officer of Her Majesty's space station Hephaestus, and HMSS Hephaestus happened to be home to the repair and refit command to which Hexapuma's repair had been assigned. She does indeed. Captain Fonzarelli will have docking instructions for us by tomorrow morning, and the tugs will be ready for us at 0900. That's going to piss Aikawa off. Nakchaduri observed with a grin, and Fitzgerald laughed. I imagine he'll get over it eventually. Besides, he was due for a little leave. Ensign Aikawa Kagiyama had been one of Hexapuma's midshipmen on her previous deployment. In fact, he was the only one still aboard her, or rather assigned to her, since he wasn't on board at the moment. I guess we can always ask Hephaestus to delay our repairs a little longer, long enough for him to get back from Wayland for the big moment, I mean, 
Nagchaduri suggested. The hell we can, Fitzgerald snorted. Not that I don't appreciate the way he looked after me after Monica or anything. I'm sure he'll be disappointed, but if we delay this any longer, just so he can be here for it, his loyal crewmates would probably stuff him out an open airlock. Yeah, but he's fairly popular. They might let him have a helmet first, Nagchaduri replied with an even broader grin. And they might not, too. Fitzgerald shook his head. Now, we'll just let this be his little surprise when he gets back. I hope he's enjoying himself, Nagchaduri said more seriously. He's a good kid. He works hard, and he really came through at Monica. They were all good kids, Fitzgerald agreed. And I'll admit, I worry about him a little. It's not natural for the XO to have to order an ensign to take leave, especially not someone with his record from the island. He has been well-behaved since we got back from Monica, Nagchaduri acknowledged. You don't think he's sick, do you? No, I think it's just losing all his accomplices, Fitzgerald shrugged. With Helen off as the skipper's new flag lieutenant, and with Paolo assigned to Waylon with Ginger, he's sort of at loose ends when it comes to getting into trouble, for which we can all be grateful. That depends. Are we going to get a fresh compliment of Snotty's for him to provide with a suitably horrible example? I doubt it. Fitzgerald shrugged again. Given the fact that we're going to be sitting in a repair dock for the next several months, I imagine they'll be looking for something a bit more active for snotty cruises. Besides, even if we get a fresh batch, he's an ensign now. I think he'd actually feel constrained to set them a good example. Somehow, I find it difficult to wrap my mind around the concept of Aikawa being a good example for anyone. Intentionally, I mean. At least without having Helen around to threaten him if he doesn't. Oh, come now. Fitzgerald waved a chiding finger at the XO. You know perfectly well that Helen never threatened him. Well, not too often, anyway. Only because she didn't have to make it explicit, Nagchaduri countered. One raised eyebrow, and he knew what was coming. Chapter 6 President Eloise Pritchard raked stray strands of platinum-colored hair impatiently from her forehead as she strode into the sub-basement command center. In contrast to her usual understated elegance, she wore a belted robe over her nightgown, and her face was bare of any cosmetics. The head of her personal security team, Sheila Thiessen, followed close behind her. Unlike the president, Thiessen had been on duty when the alert was sounded. Well, not precisely on duty, since her official shift had ended five hours earlier, but she'd still been on site wading through her unending paperwork, and she was her well-groomed, fully clothed, always poised, normal self. Despite which, she thought, the hastily dressed president still managed to make her look drab. In fact, the president always made everyone around her seem somehow smaller than life, especially at moments of crisis. It wasn't anything Pritchard tried to do. It was simply what genetics, experience, and her own inherent presence did for her. Even here, even now, awakened from what had passed for a sound sleep in the months since the twin hammer blows of Javier Giscard's death, then the disastrous Battle of Manticore, Despite the ghosts and sorrow which haunted those striking topaz eyes, that sense of unbreakable resolve and determination was like a cloak laid across her shoulders. Or maybe that's just my imagination, Thiessen told herself. Maybe I just need for her to be unbreakable, especially now. Pritchard crossed quickly to the comfortable chair before her personal command and communication console. She nodded to the only two members of her cabinet who'd so far been able to join her, Tony Nesbitt, the Secretary of Commerce, and Attorney General Dennis Lepique, then settled into her own seat as it adjusted to her body's contours. Nesbitt and Lepique both looked tense, worried. They'd been working late, the only reason they'd been able to make it to the command center this quickly, and both had that aura of end-of-a-really-long-day fatigue but that didn't explain their tight shoulders and facial muscles, the worry in their eyes. Nor were they alone in their tension. 
The command center's uniformed personnel and the scattering of civilian intelligence analysts and aides threaded through their ranks were visibly anxious as they concentrated on their duties. There was something in the air, something just short of outright fear, and Thiessen's bodyguard hackles tried to rise in response. Not that the anxiety level about her came as any sort of surprise. The entire Republic of Haven had been waiting with gnawing apprehension for almost half a tea year for exactly this moment. Pritchard didn't greet her cabinet colleagues by name, only gave them that quick nod and smiled at them, yet her mere presence seemed to evoke some subtle easing of their tension. Thiessen could actually see them relaxing, see that same relaxation reaching out to the people around them, as the president took her place without haste, then settled back, shoulders squared, and turned those topaz eyes to the uniformed man looking down from the huge, smart wall display at one end of the large, cool room. So, Thomas, she said, sounding impossibly composed, what's this all about? Admiral Thomas Theismann, Secretary of War and Chief of Naval Operations for the Republic of Haven, looked back at her from his own command center under the rebuilt octagon a few kilometers away. Given the late hour, Thiessen suspected that Theismann had been in bed until a very short time ago himself. If that was the case, however, no one would have guessed it from his faultless appearance and impeccable uniform. Sorry to disturb you, Madam President, he said. And to be honest, I don't have any idea what it's all about. Pritchard raised one eyebrow. I was under the impression we'd just issued a system-wide red alert, she said, her tone noticeably more astringent than the one in which she normally addressed Theismann. I'm assuming, Admiral, that you had a reason for that? Yes, Madam President, I did. Theismann's expression was peculiar, Thiessen thought. Approximately, the Secretary of War glanced to one side. Thirty-one minutes ago, a force of unidentified starships made their alpha translations ten light minutes outside the system hyperlimit. That puts them roughly twenty-two light minutes from the planet. The gravitic rays detected them when they re-entered normal space, and our original estimate, based on their hyperfootprints, was that we were looking at forty-eight ships of the wall and or Silax, escorted by a dozen or so battlecruisers, a half-dozen Silax, and fifteen or twenty destroyers, they appear to have brought along at least a dozen large freighters as well, most likely ammunition ships. Thiessen felt the blood congeal in her veins. Those had to be Manti ships, and if they were, they had to be armed with the new missile systems which had broken the back of the Republic's attack on the Manticore binary system. The missiles which gave the Royal Manticoran Navy such an advantage in long-range accuracy that they could engage even the Haven system's massive defenses with effective impunity and which were undoubtedly loaded aboard those ammunition ships in enormous numbers. Well, we've wondered where they were ever since the Battle of Manticore, she thought grimly. Now we know. From the calm display, Theismann looked lovely into Pritchard's eyes. Under the circumstances, there didn't seem much doubt about who they belonged to or why they were here, he said. But it's taken us a while to confirm our tentative IDs at this range and it turns out our initial assessments weren't quite correct. I beg your pardon, Pritchard said when he paused. Oh, we were right in at least one respect, Madam President. It is the Manti's Eighth Fleet, and Admiral Harrington is in command, but there's an additional ship, one we hadn't counted on. It's not a warship at all. In fact, it appears to be a private yacht, and it's squawking the transponder code of the G.S. Paul Tankersley. A yacht? Pritchard repeated, in the careful tone someone used when she wasn't entirely certain she wasn't talking to a lunatic. Yes, ma'am, a yacht. A Grayson Registry yacht, owned by Stedholder Harrington. According to the message she's transmitted to us from one Captain George Hardy, the Tankersley skipper, Admiral Harrington is personally aboard her not her fleet flagship. And, Madam President, Captain Hardy has requested permission for his ship to transport the Admiral to Nouveau Paris with a personal message to you from Queen Elizabeth. Eloise Pritchard's eyes widened, and Thiessen sucked in a deep breath of astonishment. She wasn't alone in that reaction either. 
Admiral Harrington is coming here to Nouveau Paris. Is that what you're saying, Tom? Pritchard asked after a moment. Admiral Harrington is coming to Nouveau Paris aboard an unarmed private yacht without first demanding any assurances of safety from us, ma'am, Theismann replied. Then his lips twitched in what might have been a smile under other circumstances. Although, he continued, I have to say, having the rest of Eighth Fleet parked out there is probably intended as a pretty pointed suggestion that it would be a good idea if we didn't let anything untoward happen to her. No, no, I can see that, Pritchard said slowly, and now her eyes were narrow as she frowned in intense speculation. She sat that way for several moments, then looked at Lepique and Nesbitt. Well, she said with a mirthless smile, this is unexpected. Unexpected? Nesbitt barked a laugh. It's a hell of a lot more than that as far as I'm concerned, Madam President, if you'll pardon my language. I have to agree with Tony, Lepique said when Pritchard quirked an eyebrow in his direction. After the Battle of Manticore, after everything else that's happened... His voice trailed off and he shook his head, his expression bemused. Have we replied to Admiral Harrington's request yet, Tom? Pritchard asked, returning her attention to Theismann. Not yet. We only received a message about five minutes ago. I see. Pritchard sat for perhaps another ten seconds, her lips pursed, then inhaled deeply. Under the circumstances, she said then with a faint smile, I'd really prefer not to be recording messages sitting here in my bathrobe. So, Tom, I think we'll just let you handle this stage of things since you look so bright-eyed and spiffy. No doubt we'll need to get Leslie involved later, but for right now, let's leave it a matter between uniformed military personnel. Yes, ma'am. And what would you like me to tell her? Inform her that the Republic of Avon is not only willing to allow her vessel to enter planetary orbit, but that I personally guarantee the safety of her ship, herself, and anyone aboard the... Tankersley, was it? For the duration of her visit with us. Yes, ma'am. And should I discuss those super-dreadnoughts of hers? Let's not be tacky, Admiral. The President's smile grew briefly broader, then it vanished. After all, from Admiral Chin's report, there's not much we could do about them, even if we wanted to, is there? Under the circumstances, if she's prepared to refrain from flourishing them under our noses, I think we ought to be courteous enough to let her do just that. Yes, ma'am. Understood. Good. And while you're doing that, it's time I went and got into shape to present a properly presidential appearance. And I suppose, she smiled at Nesbitt and Lepique, it might not hurt to drag the rest of the cabinet out of bed either. If we have to be up, they might as well have to be too. Admiral Lady Dame Honor Alexander Harrington kept her face calm and her eyes tranquil, as she sat gazing out the viewport of the Havenite shuttle. Only those who knew her very well would have recognized her own anxiety in the slow, metronome-steady twitching of the very end of the tail of the cream and gray tree cat draped across her lap. Captain Spencer Hawk of the Harrington Steadholders Guard, Colonel Andrew LaFollet's hand-picked successor to command her personal security team, was one of those few people. He knew exactly what that twitching tail indicated, and he found himself in profound agreement with Nimitz. If Hawk had been allowed to do this his way, the Steadholder wouldn't have come within three or four light minutes of this planet. Failing that, her entire fleet would have been in orbit around it, and she would have been headed to its surface in an armored skin suit aboard a Royal Manticoran Navy assault shuttle, accompanied not just by her three personal armsmen, but by a full company of battle-armored Royal Manticoran Navy Marines. Preferably as the Manticoran Alliance's military representative for the signing ceremony as she accepted the unconditional surrender of an abjectly defeated Havenite government amid the smoking ruins of the city of Nouveau Paris. Unfortunately, or 
perhaps fortunately, he also knew the Steadholder better than to suggest any such modest modification of her own plans. The Steadholder wasn't one of those people who vented volcanic rage when she was displeased, but it would have taken a hardier soul than Hawks to willingly confront the ice which could core those almond-shaped brown eyes and the calm, reasonable scalpel of that soprano voice as she dissected whatever minor faux pas had drawn one to her attention. Nonsense, he told himself. I'd risk it in a minute if I thought it was really critical. He snorted. Yeah, sure I would. He shook his head. No wonder Colonel La Follet was going gray. He glanced at Corporal Joshua Atkins and Sergeant Clifford McGraw, the other members of the Steadholder's personal detachment. Oddly enough, neither of them looked particularly calm either. There are times, he reflected, when I actually find myself envying one of those armsmen with a cowardly stay-at-home Steadholder to look after. It's got to be easier on the adrenaline levels. Honor needed no physical clues to recognize the tension of her armsmen. Their emotions flooded into her through her empathic sense, and even if they hadn't, she knew all three of them well enough to know what they had to be thinking at this moment. For that matter, she couldn't find it in her to be as irritated with them this time as she'd been upon occasion either. The fact that what was happening was her own idea didn't make her feel any less nervous about it herself. Oh, stop that, she told herself, caressing Nimitz's ears with her flesh-and-blood right hand. Of course you're nervous, but unless you wanted to come in shooting after all, what choice did you have? And at least Pritchard seems to be saying all the right things, or Thomas Theismann saying them for her anyway, so far. That was a good sign. It had to be a good sign. And so she sat still in the comfortable seat, pretending she was unaware of the mesmerized gaze the Havenite flight engineer had turned upon her as he came face to face with the woman even the Havenite newsies called the Salamander and hoped she'd been right about Pritchard and her administration. Eloise Pritchard stood on the shuttle landing pad on the roof of what had once again become Pericard Tower following Thomas Theismann's restoration of the Republic. The massive, 150-year-old tower had borne several other names during People's Republic of Haven's lifetime, including the People's Tower. Or, for that matter, the bitterly ironic one of the Tower of Justice, when it had housed the savagely repressive state security which had supported the rule of Rob Pierre and Oscar Saint-Just. No one truly knew how many people had vanished forever into state sex basement interrogation rooms and holding cells. There'd been more than enough, however, and the grisly charges of torture and secret executions, which the prosecutors had actually been able to prove, had been sufficient to win 137 death sentences. 137 death sentences Eloise Pritchard had personally signed one by one, without a single regret. Pierre himself had preferred other quarters and moved his personal living space to an entirely different location shortly after the Leveler uprising. And given the tower's past associations, a large part of Eloise Pritchard had found herself in rare agreement with the citizen chairman. Yet in the end, and despite some fairly acute personal reservations, not to mention anxiety over possible public misperceptions, she decided to return the presidential residence to its traditional pre-legislaturalist home on the upper floors of Pericard Tower. Some of her advisors had urged against it, but she trusted her instincts more than their timidity. And by and large, the citizens of the restored republic had read her message correctly and remembered that Pericard Tower had been named for Michel Pericard, the first president of the Republic of Haven the woman whose personal vision and drive had led directly to the founding of the Republic, the woman whose guiding hand had written the Constitution Eloise Pritchard, Thomas Theismann, and their allies had dedicated their lives to restoring. The well-worn thoughts ran through her brain, flowing beneath the surface with a soothing familiarity as she watched the Navy shuttle slide into a touchdown. It was escorted by three more shuttles, Assault shuttles, heavily laden with external ordnance, which went into a watchful countergrav hover overhead 
and even more atmospheric steamships orbited alertly, closing all airspace within 15 kilometers of the tower to any civilian traffic as the passenger shuttle settled towards the pad with the crisp professional assurance only to be expected from Thomas Theismann's personal pilot. Lieutenant J.G. Andre Beaupre hadn't been selected as the chief of naval operations' full-time chauffeur at random, so he'd been the logical choice when Theismann decided he needed the very best pilot he could lay hands on to look after their unexpected visitor. And so Thomas damned well should have, given the fact that almost everybody thinks we already tried to assassinate her aboard her own flagship, Pritchard told herself tartly. And even though we know we didn't do it, no one else does. Worse, there have to be enough lunatics in a city the size of Nouveau Paris for someone to make an unofficial effort to kill the woman who's systematically kicked our Navy's ass for as long as anyone can remember. No wonder Thomas opted for such overt security. God knows the last thing we could afford would be for something to happen to Harrington, Alexander Harrington, I mean. No one in the entire galaxy would ever believe it was really an accident. Her mouth twitched sourly with the memory of another accident no one in the galaxy would ever believe had been genuine. The complications left by that particular mishap had a lot to do with why it was so vital to handle this visit with such exquisite care. And maybe, just maybe, actually bring an end to all this butchery after all, she thought almost prayerfully. The shuttle touched down in a smooth whine of power, and Pritchard suppressed an urge to scurry forward as the boarding ladder extended itself to the airlock hatch. Instead, she made herself stand very still, hands clasped behind her. "'You're not the only one feeling nervous, you know,' a voice said very quietly in her right ear, and she glanced sideways at Thomas Theismann. The admiral's brown eyes gleamed with the reflected glitter of the shuttle's running lights, and his lips quirked in a brief smile. "'And what makes you think I'm feeling nervous?' she asked tartly, her voice equally quiet." almost lost in the cool, gusty darkness. The fact that I am, for one thing, and the fact that you've got your hands folded together behind you for another. He snorted softly. You only do that when you can't figure out what else to do with them, and that only happens when you're nervous as hell about something. Oh, thank you, Tom, she said witheringly. Now you've found a fresh way to make me feel awkward and bumptious, just what I needed at a moment like this. Well, if being pissed off at me helps divert you from worrying, then I've fulfilled one of your uniformed minions' proper functions, haven't I? His teeth gleamed in another brief smile, and Pritchard suppressed a burning desire to kick him in the right kneecap. Instead, she contented herself with a mental note to take care of that later, then gave him a topaz glare that promised retribution had merely been deferred and turned back to the shuttle. Theismann's diversion, she discovered, had come at precisely the right moment, which, a corner of her mind reflected, had most certainly not been a simple coincidence. Maybe she'd rescind that broken kneecap after all. Their little side conversation had kept her distracted while the hatch opened, and a very tall, broad-shouldered woman in the uniform of a Manticoran admiral stepped through it. At 175 centimeters, Pritchard was accustomed to being taller than the majority of the women she met, but Alexander Harrington had to be a good seven or eight centimeters taller even than Sheila Thiessen, and Thiessen was five centimeters taller than the president she guarded. The admiral paused for a moment, head raised as if she were scenting the breezy coolness of the early autumn night, and her right hand reached up to stroke the tree cat riding her shoulder. Pritchard was no expert on tree cats. As far as she knew, there were no Havenite experts on the telepathic arboreals, but she'd read everything she could get her hands on about them. Even if she hadn't, she thought, she would have recognized the protectiveness in the way the cat's tail wrapped around the front of his person's throat and if she'd happened to miss Nimitz's attitude, no one could ever have missed the wary watchfulness of the trio of green-uniformed men following at Alexander Harrington's heels. Pritchard had read about them, too, and she could feel Sheila Thiessen's disapproving tension at her back 
as her own bodyguard glared at their holstered pulsers. Thiessen had pitched three kinds of fits when she found out President Pritchard proposed to allow armed retainers of an admiral in the service of a star nation, with which the Republic of Haven happened to be at war, into her presence. In fact, she'd flatly refused to allow it, refused so adamantly Pritchard had more than half feared she and the rest of her detachment would place their own head of state under protective arrest to prevent it. In the end, it had taken a direct order from the Attorney General and Kevin Usher, the director of the Federal Investigation Agency, to overcome her resistance. Pritchard understood Thiessen's reluctance. On the other hand, Alexander Harrington had to be just as aware of how disastrous it would be for something to happen to Pritchard as Pritchard was of how disastrous it would be to allow something to happen to her. What was it Thomas told me they used to call that back on Old Earth? Mutually assured destruction, wasn't it? Well, however stupid it may have sounded, well, however stupid it may actually have been, at least it worked well enough for us to last until we managed to get off the planet. Besides, Harrington's got a pulser built into her left hand, for God's sake. Is Sheila planning to make her check her prosthesis at the door? Leave it in the umbrella stand? She snorted softly, amused by her own thoughts, and Alexander Harrington's head turned in her direction, almost as if the Manticoran had sensed that amusement from clear across the landing pad. For the first time, their eyes met directly in the floodlit night, and Pritchard inhaled deeply. She wondered if she would have had the courage to come all alone to the capital planet of a star nation whose fleet she'd shattered in combat barely sixteen months in the past especially when she had very good reason to feel confident the star nation in question had done its level best to assassinate her a T-year before she'd added that particular log to the fire of its reasons to dislike her. Pritchard liked to think she would have found the nerve under the right circumstances, yet she knew she could never really know the answer to that question. But whether she would have had the courage or not, Alexander Harrington obviously did, and at a time when the Star Kingdom's military advantage over the Republic was so devastating, there was absolutely no need for her to do anything of the sort. Pritchard's amusement faded into something very different, and she stepped forward, extending her hand, as Alexander Harrington led her trio of bodyguards down the boarding stairs. This is an unexpected meeting, Admiral Alexander Harrington. I'm sure it is, Madam President. Alexander Harrington's accent was crisp, her soprano surprisingly sweet for a woman of her size and formidable reputation, and Pritchard had the distinct impression that the hand gripping hers was being very careful about the way it did so. Of course it is, she thought. It wouldn't do for her to absentmindedly crush a few bones at a moment like this. I understand you have a message for me, the president continued out loud. Given the dramatic fashion in which you've come to deliver it, I'm prepared to assume it's an important one. Dramatic, Madam President? Despite herself, Pritchard's eyebrows rose as she heard Alexander Harrington's unmistakable amusement. It wasn't the most diplomatic possible reaction to the Admiral's innocent tone, but under the circumstances, Pritchard couldn't reprimand herself for it too seriously. After all, the Manticorans were just as capable of calculating the local time of day here in Nouveau Paris as her own staffers would have been of calculating the local time in the city of Landing. Let's just say then, Admiral, that your timing's gotten my attention, she said dryly after a moment, as I feel certain it was supposed to. To be honest, I suppose it was, Madam President. There might actually have been a hint of apology in Alexander Harrington's voice, although Pritchard wasn't prepared to bet anything particularly valuable on that possibility. And you're right, of course. It is important. Well, in that case, Admiral, why don't you, and your armsmen, of course, accompany me to my office so you can tell me just what it is? Chapter 7 so, would you prefer we address you as Admiral Alexander Harrington, Admiral Harrington, Duchess Harrington, or Stedholder Harrington? 
Pritchard asked with a slight smile, as she, Honor, Nimitz, and a passel of bodyguards, most of whom seemed to be watching each other with unbounded distrust, rode the lift car from the landing pad down towards the president's official office. There had been too little room, even in a car that size, for any of the other Havenite officials to accompany them, since neither Honor's Armsman nor Sheila Thiessen's presidential security agents had been remotely willing to give up their places to mere cabinet secretaries. It does get a bit complicated at times to be so many different people at once, Honor acknowledged Pritchard's question with an answering smile, which was a bit more crooked than the president's. And not just because of the artificial nerves at the corner of her mouth. Which would you be most comfortable with, Madam President? Well, I have to admit we in the Republic have developed a certain aversion to aristocracies, whether they're acknowledged, like the one in your own star kingdom, or simply de facto, like the legislaturalists here at home. So there'd be at least some mixed emotions, let's say, in using one of your titles of nobility. At the same time, however, we're well aware of your record for a lot of reasons. For a moment, Pritchard's topaz-colored eyes, which Honor had discovered were much more spectacular and expressive in person than they'd appeared in any of the imagery she'd seen, darkened and her mouth tightened. Honor tasted the bleak stab of grief and regret behind that darkness, and her own mouth tightened ever so slightly. When she discussed the Republic's leadership with Lester Tourville, he confirmed that Eighth Fleet had killed Javier Giscard, Pritchard's longtime lover, at the Battle of Lovett. That, in effect, Honor Alexander Harrington had killed him. Her eyes met the President's, and she didn't need her empathic sense to realize both of them saw the knowledge in the other's gaze. Yet there were other things wrapped up in that knowledge as well. Yes, she'd killed Javier Giscard, and she regretted that, but he'd been only one of thousands of Havenites who died in combat against honor or ships under her command over the past two decades, and there'd been nothing personal in his death. That was a distinction both she and Pritchard understood, because both of them, unlike the vast majority of honor's fellow naval officers, had taken lives with their own hands, had killed enemies at close range, when they'd been able to see those enemies' eyes, and when it most definitely was personal. Both of them understood that difference, and the silence hovering between them carried that mutual awareness with it, as well as the undertow of pain and loss no understanding could ever dispel. Then Pritchard cleared her throat. As I say, we're aware of your record, given the fact that you come from good yeoman stock, and earned all of those decadent titles the hard way, we're prepared to use them as a gesture of respect. I see. Honor gazed at the platinum-haired woman. Pritchard was an even more impressive presence face-to-face than she'd anticipated, even after Michelle Henke's reports of her own conversations with the president. The woman carried herself with the assurance of someone who knew exactly who she was, and her emotions— what the tree cats called her mind glow, were those of someone who'd learned that lesson the hard way, paid an enormous price for what her beliefs demanded. Yet, despite the humor in her voice, it was clear she truly did cherish some apprehension about her question, and Honor wondered why. She used Mike's title as Countess Goldpeak, but only after she decided to send Mike home as her envoy. Did she do that as a courtesy, or to specifically emphasize Mike's proximity to the throne, an emphasis she wanted enough to use a title she personally despised? Or is the problem someone else in her cabinet whose reaction she's concerned about? Or could it be she's already looking forward to the press releases, to how they're going to address me for public consumption? Under the circumstances... Honor said after a moment. If you'd be more comfortable with plain old Admiral Alexander Harrington, I'm sure I could put up with that. Thank you. Pritchard gave her another smile, this one somewhat broader. To be perfectly honest, 
I suspect some of my more aggressively egalitarian cabinet members might be genuinely uncomfortable using one of your other titles. She's fishing with that one, Honor decided. Most people wouldn't have suspected anything of the sort, given Pritchard's obvious assurance, but Honor had certain unfair advantages. She wants an indication of whether I want to speak to her in private or whether whatever Beth sent me to say is intended for her entire cabinet. If it would make them feel uncomfortable, then of course we can dispense with it, she assured the president, and suppressed an urge to chuckle as she tasted Pritchard's carefully concealed spike of frustration when her probe was effortlessly and apparently unknowingly deflected. That's very gracious and understanding of you, the Havenite head of state said out loud as the lift slid to a halt and the doors opened. She waved one hand in graceful invitation, and she and Honor started down a tastefully furnished hallway trailed by two satellite-like clumps of bodyguards. Honor could feel the president turning something over in her mind as they walked. Pritchard didn't seem the sort to dither over decisions, and before they'd gone more than a few meters, she glanced at the tall, black-haired woman who was obviously the senior member of her own security team. Sheila, please inform the Secretary of State and the other members of the cabinet that I believe it will be best if Admiral Alexander Harrington and I take the opportunity for a little private conversation before we invite anyone else in. Her nostrils flared, and Honor tasted the amusement threaded through her undeniable anxiety and the fragile undertone of hope. Given the Admiral's dramatic midnight arrival, I'm sure whatever she has to say will be important enough for all of us to discuss eventually. But tell them I want to get my own toes wet first. Of course, Madam President, the bodyguard said, and began speaking very quietly into her personal calm. I trust that arrangement will be satisfactory to you, Admiral? Pritchard continued, glancing up at Honor. Certainly, Honor replied with imperturbable courtesy, but the twinkle of amusement in her own eyes obviously gave her away, and the president snorted again, more loudly, and shook her head. Whatever she'd been about to say, assuming she'd intended to say anything, stayed unspoken, however, as they reached the end of the hall and a powered door slid open. Pritchard gave another of those graceful waves, and Honor stepped obediently through the door first. The office was smaller than she'd anticipated, Despite its obviously expensive and luxurious furnishings, despite the old-fashioned paintings on the walls and the freestanding sculpture in one corner, it had an undeniably intimate air. And it was obviously a working office, not just some place to receive and impress foreign envoys, as the well-used workstation at the antique wooden desk made evident. Given its limited size, it would have been uncomfortably crowded if Pritchard had invited her entire cabinet in, in fact, Honor doubted she could have squeezed that many people into the available space, although the president's decision against inviting even her secretary of state had come as something of a surprise. Please, have a seat, Admiral, Pritchard invited, indicating the comfortable armchairs arranged around a largish coffee table before a huge crystal-plast window, one entire wall of the office, actually, that gave a magnificent view of downtown Nouveau Paris. Honor accepted the invitation, choosing a chair which let her look out at that dramatic vista. She settled into it, lifting Nimitz down from her shoulder to her lap, and despite the tension of the moment and the millions of deaths which had brought her here, she felt an ungrudging admiration for what the people of this planet had accomplished. She knew all about the crumbling infrastructure and ramshackle lack of maintenance this city had suffered under the legislaturalists and she knew about the riots which had erupted in its canyon-like streets following the Pierre coup. She knew about the airstrikes Esther McQueen, Admiral Clusterbomb, had called in to suppress the levelers, and about the hidden nuclear warhead Oscar Saint-Just had detonated under the old octagon to defeat McQueen's own coup attempt. This city had seen literally millions of its citizens die over the last two tea decades, suffered more civilian fatalities than the number of military personnel who died aboard all of the Havenite ships destroyed in the Battle of Manticore combined, yet it had survived. 
not simply survived, but risen with restored, phoenix-like beauty from the debris of neglect and the wreckage of combat. Now, as she gazed out at the gleaming fireflies of air cars, zipping busily past even at this hour, at those stupendous towers, at the lit windows, the fairy dusting of air traffic warning lights, she saw the resurgence of the entire Republic of Haven, recognized the stupendous changes that resurgence had made in virtually every aspect of the lives of the men, women, and children of the Republic, and much of that resurgence, that rebirth of hope and pride and purpose, was the work of the platinum-haired woman settling into a facing armchair while their bodyguards, in turn, settled into wary watchfulness around them. Yes, a lot of it was her work, Anna reminded herself, one hand stroking Nimitz's fluffy pelt while the reassuring buzz of his almost subsonic purr vibrated into her. But she's also the one who declared war this time around, the one who launched Thunderbolt as a sneak attack, and the one who sent Tourville and Shin off to attack the home system. Admire her all you want, Honor, but never forget this is a dangerous, dangerous woman. And don't let your own hopes lead you into any overly optimistic assumptions about her or what she truly wants, either. May I offer you refreshment, Admiral? No, thank you, Madam President. I'm fine. If you're certain, Pritchard said with a slight twinkle. Honor arched one eyebrow and the President chuckled. We've amassed rather a complete dossier on you, Admiral. The Meyerdahl first wave, I believe. Fair enough. Honor acknowledged the reference to her genetically enhanced musculature and the demands of the metabolism which supported it. And I genuinely appreciate the offer, but my steward fed me before he let me off the ship. Ah, that would be the formidable Mr. McGuinness. I see Officer Cachat and Director Usher. Oh, I'm sorry, that would be Director Trajan, wouldn't it? Really have compiled a thorough file on me, Madam President, Honor observed politely. Touché, Pritchard said, leaning back in her chair. But then her brief moment of amusement faded, and her face grew serious. If you won't allow me to offer you refreshments, however, Admiral, would you care to tell me precisely what it is the Queen of Manticore sent you to accomplish? Of course, Madam President. Honor settled back in her own chair, her flesh-and-blood hand still moving ever so gently on Nimitz's silken coat, and her own expression mirrored Pritchard's seriousness. My queen has sent me as her personal envoy, she said. I have a formal recorded message for you from her as well, but essentially it's simply to inform you that I'm authorized to speak for her as her messenger and her plenipotentiary. Pritchard never twitched a muscle, but Honor tasted the sudden flare of combined hope and consternation which exploded through the president as she reacted to that last word. Obviously, even now, Pritchard hadn't anticipated that Honor was not simply Elizabeth III's envoy and messenger, but her direct personal representative, empowered to actually negotiate with the Republic of Haven. The possibility of negotiations explained the president's hope, Honor realized. Just as the disastrous military situation her star nation faced— and the possibility that Elizabeth's idea of negotiating might consist of a demand for unconditional surrender explained the consternation. Her Majesty and I fully realize there are enormous areas of disagreement and distrust between the Star Empire and the Republic, Honor continued in that same measured tone. I don't propose to get into them tonight. Frankly, I don't see any way we'd be remotely likely to settle those disputes without long, difficult conversations. Despite that, I believe most of our pre-war differences could probably be disposed of by compromises between reasonable people, assuming the issue of our disputed diplomatic correspondence can be resolved. As I say, I have no intention or desire to stray into that territory this evening, however. Instead, 
I want to address something that will very probably pose much more severe difficulties for any serious talks between our two star nations. And that, Madam President, is the number of people who have died since the Republic of Haven resumed hostilities without warning or notification. She paused, watching Pritchard's expression and tasting the President's emotions. The Havenite hadn't much cared for her last sentence, but that was all right with honor. Honor Alexander Harrington had never seen herself as a diplomat, never imagined she might end up chosen for such a mission, yet there was no point trying to dance around this particular issue. And she'd offered Pritchard at least an olive leaf, if not a branch, with the phrase resumed hostilities. As Pritchard had pointed out to her Congress when she requested a formal declaration of war, no formal peace had ever been concluded between the then-star Kingdom of Manticore and the Republic of Haven. And while Honor wasn't prepared to say so, she knew as well as Pritchard that the lack of a peace treaty had been far more the fault of the High Ridge government than of the Pritchard administration. She wasn't prepared to agree that High Ridge's cynical political maneuvering and sheer stupidity justified Pritchard's decision, but it had certainly contributed to it. And despite the surprise nature of Thomas Theismann's Operation Thunderbolt, it had been launched against a target with which the Republic was still legally at war. Just as long as she doesn't decide we're willing to let her off the hook for actually pulling the trigger, Anna reflected coldly, we'll meet her part way, acknowledge there were serious mistakes, blunders, from our side as well, and that we were still technically at war, but she's going to have to acknowledge the Republic's war guilt, and not just for this war, if this is going to go anywhere, and she'd better understand that from the beginning. Her Majesty fully realizes the Republic's total casualties have been much higher than the Star Empire's since fighting resumed, she continued after a handful of seconds. At the same time, the Republic's total population is also much larger than the Star Empire's, which means our fatalities, as a percentage of our population, have been many times as great as yours. And even laying aside the purely human cost, the economic and property damages have been staggering for both sides, while the tonnage of warships which have been destroyed may well equal that of every other declared war in human history. This struggle between our star nations began 18 T years ago, 22 T years if you count from the People's Republic's attack on the Basilisk Terminus of the Wormhole Junction, and despite the position in which we find ourselves today, even the most rabid Havenite patriot must be aware by now that, despite all of public information's propaganda to the contrary, the original conflict between us began as a direct consequence of the People's Republic's aggression, not the Star Empire's. But, because we saw that aggression coming, our military buildup to resist it began 40 T years before even the attack on Basilisk. So, for all intents and purposes, our nations have been at war, or preparing for war, for over 60 T years, which means we've been actively fighting one another, or preparing to fight one another, since I was roughly 4 T years old. In a very real sense, my star empire's been at war, hot or cold, against Havenite aggression, in one form or another, for my entire life. Madam President, and I'm scarcely alone in having that life experience or the attitudes that come with it. After that long, after that much mutual hostility and active bloodletting, either side can easily find any number of justifications for distrusting or hating the other. But there are two significant differences between this point in the struggle between Manticore and Haven and almost any other point, Madam President. The first of those differences is that we are no longer dealing with the People's Republic. Your new government has claimed your primary purpose is the complete restoration of the old Republic of Haven, and I accept that claim's validity. But you've also chosen, unfortunately, for whatever combination of reasons, to resume the war between Haven and Manticore, which leads many, indeed most Manticorans, to doubt there is any true difference between you and the legislaturalists or the Committee of Public Safety. I hope and believe they're wrong. 
that this Havenite regime does care how many of its citizens are killed fighting its wars, that it does want to safeguard the enormous progress it's made, recovering from generations of misrule and domestic political brutality, and that it does feel some sense of responsibility to see as few as possible of its people, military or civilian, killed, rather than simply feeding them into the furnace of political ambition and spinal reflex aggression. Which brings us to the second significant difference. To be blunt, and as I have no doubt you and Admiral Theismann realize, just as Queen Elizabeth does, the Star Empire's present military advantage is even more overwhelming than it was at the time of the Admiral's coup against Saint-Just. We can, if we choose to do so, drive this war through to a decisive, unambiguous military victory. We can destroy your fleets from beyond any range at which they can effectively counterattack. We can destroy the infrastructure of your star systems, one by one, and for all of the undoubted courage and determination of your naval personnel, they can't stop us. They can only die trying, which I, for one, have no doubt they would do with the utmost gallantry. She looked directly into Eloise Pritchard's tawny eyes, watching their expressionless depths even as she tasted the combination of fear, frustration, and desperation concealed behind them. There are those in the Star Empire who would prefer, in no small part because of that history I just mentioned, to do exactly that, she said flatly. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't admit Her Majesty is strongly inclined in that direction herself. If, as I assume you have, you've had access to internal securities and state security secret files, I'm sure you understand why Queen Elizabeth personally hates Haven and distrusts all Havenites with every fiber of her being. I suspect just about anyone would feel that way about a star nation which murdered her father, murdered her uncle, her cousin, and her prime minister, and attempted to murder her. Pritchard said nothing, only nodded slightly in acknowledgment of Honor's point, but Honor tasted a confusing whirlpool of emotion within the president. Obviously, Pritchard had learned about the assassinations, including King Rogers, before Honor told her, and equally obviously she wasn't surprised someone with Elizabeth's fiery disposition would find it impossible to forget such offenses. Yet there was a strand of personal regret as well. An understanding that someone as wounded as Elizabeth had every right to her fury, and a sense of sorrow that so much pain had been inflicted. Immediately following the Battle of Manticore, Anna resumed, our own losses were severe enough to preclude our launching any fresh offensives. I'm sure your own analysts reached that conclusion as well. Now, however, our new construction and our repair of damaged units have reached a point at which we can detach sufficient vessels to launch decisive attacks on your star systems without exposing our own system to attack. And, to be brutally frank, the situation in the Talbot Quadrant is nowhere near as close to resolved as we believed it was. She paused again, tasting Pritchard's reaction to that revelation. The Havenite president would have been more than human if she hadn't experienced a surge of hope that Manticore's possible preoccupation elsewhere would work in Haven's favor. Yet there was also an even sharper strand of wariness, and Honor suppressed a desire to smile sardonically. She and her political advisors had discussed whether or not she should raise that particular point with Pritchard. Now, tasting the other woman's mind glow, she knew she'd been right. Pritchard was too smart not to see the possible downside for Haven as well. Still, I might as well make certain we're both on the same page. We continue to hope for a diplomatic resolution in and around Talbot, she said but I won't pretend we're confident of achieving one. Failure to do so will obviously have potentially serious repercussions for the Star Empire, of course. I'm sure you and your advisors are as well aware of that as anyone in Manticore. But you need to be aware of this as well. She held Pritchard's gaze with her own. The threat of a direct conflict with the Solarian League is one we simply cannot ignore. Obviously, it's also one of the reasons we're seeking to compose our disagreements with the Republic. 
Any star nation would be insane to want to fight the Solarian League under any circumstances, but only one which was stupid as well as insane would want to fight the League and anyone else simultaneously. At the same time, I'm sure your own analysts have come to some of the same conclusions we have where the Solarians' warfighting technology is concerned. In case they haven't, I can tell you that what's happened so far has confirmed to us that the SLN is considerably inferior technologically at this time to either the Star Empire or the Republic. Obviously, something the size of the Solarian League has plenty of potential to overcome tech disadvantages, but our best estimate is that even if they were ready to begin putting new weapon systems into production tomorrow, we'd still be looking at a period of at least three to five years of crushing superiority over anything they could throw at us. The reason I'm telling you this is that you need to understand that while we don't want to fight the League, we're a long way from regarding a war against the Sollies as tantamount to a sentence of death. But we're not prepared to fight the Solarians at the same time Someone whose technology is as close to equal to ours as yours is comes at us from behind. So, as we see it, we have two options where the Republic is concerned. One, and in many ways the less risky of them from our perspective, would be to use that technological superiority I spoke about a few minutes ago to destroy your infrastructure in order to compel your unconditional surrender. In fact, one month ago, I was instructed to do just that, beginning with this very star system. It was very, very quiet in Eloise Pritchard's office. The emotions of the president's bodyguards were a background of taut anxiety and anger restrained by discipline, yet Honor scarcely noticed that. Her attention and Nimitz's were focused unwaveringly upon Pritchard. But those instructions were modified, Madam President, she said softly. Not rescinded, but modified. Her Majesty's been convinced to at least consider the possibility that the Republic of Haven truly isn't the People's Republic any longer. That it was not, in fact, responsible for the assassination of Admiral Webster on Old Earth, or for the attempted assassination of Queen Berry on Torch. To be honest, she remains far from convinced of either of those possibilities, but at least she recognizes them as possibilities. And even if it turns out the Republic was responsible, she's prepared to acknowledge that killing still more millions of your citizens and military personnel, destroying still more trillions of dollars' worth of orbital infrastructure, may be a disproportionate response to the Republic's guilt. In short, Madam President, the Queen is tired of killing people. So, she's authorized me to deliver this message to you. The Star Empire of Manticore is prepared to negotiate a mutually acceptable end to the state of war between it and the Republic of Haven. The President didn't even twitch a muscle. Her self-control was enormous, Honor thought which it had no doubt had to be for her and Javier Giscard to survive under the eternally suspicious, paranoid eye of a megalomaniac like Oscar Saint-Just for so many years. She might have been carved from stone, yet her sudden burst of incredulous joy, leashed by discipline and wariness, was like a silent explosion to Honor's empathic sense. However eager she might be for an end to the fighting, this woman was no fool. She knew how difficult negotiations might prove, and she was as aware as Honor herself of how many bloody years of hostility, anger, and hatred lay between the Star Empire and her own Star Nation. No one in Manticore expects that to be an easy task, even assuming that, in fact, the Republic wasn't responsible for the assassinations which led Her Majesty to reject the summit you had proposed. Nonetheless, her Majesty is prepared to make a best-effort, good-faith attempt to do just that, and I've been authorized to begin that negotiating process for her and for the Star Empire. At the same time, however, Her Majesty has instructed me to tell you she is not prepared to stretch these negotiations out indefinitely. Given what I just told you about the situation in Talbot, I'm sure you understand why, and I fully realize that you here in Nouveau Paris feel with what I recognize as good reason, 
that it wasn't the Republic of Haven which failed to negotiate in good faith following the overthrow of the Saint-Just regime. Her Majesty was opposed to the stance of the High Ridge government at the time, but the peculiarities of our constitutional system prevented her from simply removing him and replacing him with someone more responsive to the duties and responsibilities of his office. And frankly, no one in Manticore had any reason to believe his intransigence, arrogance, and ambition would contribute to an active resumption of the war between Haven and the Star Empire. She, like virtually all Manticorans, regarded the situation primarily as a domestic political struggle, one which might have diplomatic implications, but certainly not as one likely to spin out of control into an active resumption of the war. Under those circumstances, she was unprepared to provoke a constitutional crisis to remove him, rather than waiting until that same ambition and arrogance led to his inevitable, eventual fall from office. I have no doubt that as president you've experienced similar difficulties of your own. Despite all her own self-discipline and focus, Honor nearly blinked at the sudden white-hot explosion of mingled fury, frustration, and something which tasted remarkably like guilt that roared up inside Eloise Pritchard with her final sentence. It was, in some ways, an even stronger emotional spike than the president had shown when she realized Elizabeth was willing to negotiate after all, and it puzzled on her almost as much as it surprised her. Most of all, because it didn't seem to be directed at Manticore or High Ridge, it seemed to be aimed somewhere else entirely, and a corner of Honor's mind whirred with speculation as it considered the hours of political briefings which had preceded her departure for the Haven system, and occupied much of the voyage, for that matter. But she couldn't allow herself to be distracted, and so she continued, her voice as level as before. Her Majesty deeply regrets her inability to call High Ridge to heal, and she's prepared to acknowledge the Star Empire's fault in that respect. Nonetheless, she and the current Grantville government are firmly resolved to move forward with a prompt resolution of this conflict. If it can be resolved over the negotiating table, the Star Empire of Manticore is prepared to be as reasonable as circumstances permit in order to achieve that end. As an indication of that, I've been instructed to tell you that the only two points which the Star Empire will insist must be publicly and acceptably addressed in any peace settlement are the question of precisely who falsified the diplomatic correspondence between our two star nations and why, and a public acknowledgement of who actually resumed hostilities. The question of reparations must also be placed on the table, although the final resolution of that question may be open to a later round of negotiations. It is not, however, the Star Empire's intention to insist upon cripplingly punitive terms, and Her Majesty hopes it will prove possible to completely regularize relations, commercial, scientific, and educational, as well as diplomatic, between our Star Nations as part of the same negotiating process. Manticore desires not simply an end to the killing, Madam President, but a beginning to a peaceful, mutually advantageous relationship with Haven based upon mutual respect, mutual interests, and, ultimately at least, mutual friendship. If, however, it proves impossible to negotiate an end to hostilities in what Her Majesty considers a reasonable period of time— the offer to negotiate will be withdrawn. Honor met Pritchard's gaze squarely, and her voice was unflinching. No one in the galaxy would regret that outcome more than I would, Madam President. It's my duty, however, to inform you that if it happens, the Star Empire will resume active operations, and if that happens, the Royal Manticoran Navy will destroy your star nation's navy and its orbital industry, one star system at a time, until your administration or its successor unconditionally surrenders. Speaking for myself as an individual, and not for my star empire or my queen, I implore you to accept Her Majesty's proposal. I've killed too many of your people over the last twenty T years, and your people have killed too many of mine. 
she felt Javier Giscard's death between them, just as she felt Alistair McKeon's and Raoul Corvosier's and Jamie Candless's and so many others, and she finished very, very softly. Don't make me kill any more, Madam President. Please. Chapter 8 Well? Eloise Pritchard looked around the table at her assembled cabinet. They sat in their normal meeting room, surrounded by a seamless panoramic 360-degree view from a combination of true windows and smart wall projections of the city of Nouveau Paris. The sun was barely above the horizon, with a lingering tinge of early dawn redness, and none of her secretaries or their aides looked especially well-rested. I think it's certainly dramatic, Henrietta Barloy replied after a moment. The Secretary of Technology, like Tony Nesbitt at Commerce, had been one of the late, distinctly unlamented Arnold Giancola's supporters. Like Giancola's other allies within the cabinet, her horror appeared to have been completely genuine when Pritchard revealed the near certainty that Giancola, as the previous Secretary of State, was the one who'd actually manipulated the diplomatic correspondence which had led the Republic to resume military operations. The President had no doubt their reactions had been genuine, but that didn't change the fact that Barloy and Nesbitt remained the two cabinet secretaries who continued to nourish the greatest suspicion, not to mention resentment and hatred where the Star Empire of Manticore was concerned. Despite which, as far as Pritchard could tell, Barloy's response was more a throwaway remark, sparring for time than anything resembling the notion that Haven should reject the opportunity. Traumatic is one way to put it all right. Stan Gregory, the Secretary of Urban Affairs, agreed wryly. He was one of the secretaries who'd been out of the city last night. In fact, he'd been on the opposite side of the planet, and he'd been up and traveling for the better part of three hours to make this early morning meeting, which didn't keep him from looking brighter-eyed and much more chipper than Pritchard herself felt at the moment. Dropping in on you literally in the middle of the night was a pretty flamboyant statement in its own right, Madam President, he continued. The only question in my mind is whether it was all lights and mirrors, or whether Admiral Alexander Harrington simply wanted to make sure she had your attention. Personally, I think it was a case of gratuitous flamboyance, let's say. Rachel Hanriot's tone could have dehumidified an ocean, despite the fact that the Treasury Secretary was one of Pritchard's staunchest allies. I'm not saying she's not here in a legitimate effort to negotiate, understand, but the entire way she's made her appearance, unannounced, no preliminary diplomacy at all, backed up by her entire fleet, arriving on the literal stroke of midnight in an unarmed civilian yacht and requesting planetary clearance. Her voice trailed off and she shook her head, and Dennis Lepique snorted in amusement. Glad to it as flamboyance or not, Rachel, the attorney general said. It certainly did get our attention, didn't it? And frankly, given the way things have gone ever since Arnold got himself killed, I'm in favor of anything that moves us closer to ending the shooting before everything we've managed to accomplish gets blasted back to the Stone Age. So if Alexander Harrington wanted to come in here naked, riding on the back of an older elephant and twirling flaming batons in each hand, I'd still be delighted to see her. I have to go along with Dennis, Assuming the offer's sincere and not just window dressing designed to put Manticore into a favorable diplomatic light before they yanked the rug out from under us anyway, Sandra Staunton said. The Secretary of Biosciences looked troubled, her eyes worried. She'd been another Giancola supporter, and, like Nesbitt and Barloy, she continued to cherish more than a little suspicion where the Star Empire was concerned. Given how Elizabeth reacted to the Webster assassination and the attempt on Torch, and with the Battle of Manticore added to her list of reasons I hate Haven on top of that, this entire out-of-the-blue offer of some sort of last-minute reprieve just rings a little false to me. Or maybe what I'm trying to say is that it seems way too good to be true. I know what you mean, Sandy. Tony Nesbitt's expression was almost equally troubled, and his tone was subdued, but he also shook his head. I know what you mean, but I just can't see any reason they'd bother. Not after what they did to us at Manticore. 
He looked rather pointedly at Thomas Theismann, and the Secretary of War returned his gaze levelly. I fully realize Operation Beatrice failed to achieve what we'd hoped to achieve, Tony, Pritchard said. And I also fully realize the decision to authorize it was mine. Nesbitt looked at her instead of Theismann, and her topaz gaze met his without flinching. Under the circumstances, and given the intelligence appreciations available to both the Navy and the FIS at the time, I'd make the same call today, too. We weren't the ones who'd cancelled the summit meeting and resumed military operations, and I fully agreed with Thomas that the only real option they'd left us, since they'd broken off negotiations and wouldn't even talk to us about any other possible solution, was to try to achieve outright military victory before they got their new weapon system fully deployed. As nearly as we can tell, we were almost right, too. None of which changes the fact that we were wrong, and that I authorized what turned out to be the worst military defeat our star nation has ever suffered. There was silence in the cabinet room. Describing the Battle of Manticore as the worst military defeat the Republic of Haven or the People's Republic of Haven had ever suffered, in a single engagement at least, while accurate, was definitely a case of understatement. Nor had Pritchard tried to conceal the scope of the disaster. Some details remained classified, but she'd refused to change her policy of telling the Republic citizens the truth or abandon the transparency she'd adopted in place of the old Office of Public Information's propaganda, deception, and outright lies. Some of her political allies had argued with her about that hard because they'd anticipated a furious reaction born of frustration, fear, and a betrayed sense of desperation. And to some extent, they'd been right. Indeed, there'd been calls, some of them infuriated, for Pritchard's resignation once the public realized the magnitude of the Navy's losses. She'd rejected them for several reasons. All of her cabinet secretaries knew at least one of those reasons was a fear that Giancola's unprovable treason would come out in the aftermath of any resignation on her part, with potentially disastrous consequences not just for the war effort, but for the very future of the Constitution all of them had fought so hard to restore. Yet they also knew that particular reason had been distinctly secondary in her thinking. The most important factor had been that the President of the Republic was not simply its first minister. Under the Constitution, Pritchard was no mere prime minister, able to resign her office and allow some other party or political leader to form a new government, whenever a policy or decision proved unfortunate. For better or worse, for the remainder of her term, she was the Republic's head of state. Despite all the criticism she'd taken, all the vicious attacks opposition political leaders, many of them longtime Giancola allies, had launched, she'd refused to abandon that constitutional principle, and all the muttered threats of impeachment over one trumped-up charge or another— had foundered upon the fact that a clear majority of the Republic's voters and their representatives still trusted her more than they trusted anyone else. Which, unfortunately, wasn't remotely the same thing as saying they still trusted her judgment as much as they once had. And that, of course, was another factor she had to bear in mind where any sort of negotiations with Manticore might be concerned. And where any admission of what Giancola had done might be concerned as well which was going to make things distinctly sticky, given that it was one of the two points upon which the Manticorans were going to demand concessions. I doubt very much, she continued in that same level voice, that anyone in this room or anywhere on the face of this planet could possibly regret the outcome of the Battle of Manticore more than I do. But you do have a point, Tony. After what happened there... And given the fact that there's no reason they can't do the same thing to us again whenever they choose to, which, I assure you, Admiral Alexander Harrington didn't hesitate to point out to me, in the most pleasant possible way, of course, I see little point in their attempting some sort of negotiating table treachery. And unlike the rest of you, except for Tom, of course, I've actually met the woman now. She's impressive in a lot of ways— I don't think she's got the typical politician's mindset, either. Meaning what, Madame President? Leslie Montreux asked, her eyes narrowing slightly. 
Meaning, I think this is the last woman in the universe I'd pick to sell someone a lie, Pritchard said flatly. I don't think she'd accept the job in the first place, and even if she did, she wouldn't be very good at it. I'd have to say that's always been my impression of her, Madam President, Theismann said quietly. And everything the Foreign Intelligence Service has been able to pick up about her suggests exactly the same thing, Lepic put in. Which doesn't mean she couldn't be used to sell us a lie anyway, Nesbitt pointed out. If whoever sent her lied to her, or at least kept her in the dark about what they really had in mind, she might very well think she was telling us the truth the entire time. Ha! <laughs> Pritchard's sudden laugh caused Nesbitt to sit back in his chair, eyebrows rising. The president went on laughing for a moment or two, then shook her head apologetically. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tony, she told the Commerce Secretary, her expression contrite. I'm not laughing at you, really. It's just that, well, trust me on this one. Even if all the wild rumors about Tricat's ability to tell when someone's lying are nonsense, this isn't a woman I try to lie to, and Javier and I lied with the galaxy's best under state sec. I have to tell you that I had the distinct impression that she could see right inside my skull and watch the little wheels going round and round. She shook her head again. I don't think anyone could sell her a bill of goods that would get her out here to play Judas Goat without her knowledge. Pardon me for saying this, Madam President, Walter Sanderson, the Secretary of the Interior, said slowly, but... I have the distinct impression you actually like her. Sanderson sounded as if he felt betrayed by his own suspicion, and Pritchard cocked her head, lips pursed, as she considered what he'd said. Then she shrugged. I wouldn't go quite that far, Walter. Not yet, anyway. But I'll admit that, under other circumstances, I think I would like her— Mind you, I'm not going to let her sell me any air cars without having my own mechanic check them out first. But when you come down to it, one of the first rules of diplomacy is picking effective diplomats. Diplomats who can convince other people to trust them, even like them. It's what they call producing good chemistry at the conference table. I know she's not a diplomat by training, but Montecor has a long tradition of using senior naval officers as ambassadors and negotiators. It's paid off for them surprisingly well over the years, and I'm sure that was part of their thinking in choosing her. But I also think it goes deeper than that. Deeper, ma'am? Montro asked. I think they chose her because she wanted to be chosen, Pritchard said simply. She looked across at Theismann. Now that I've had a chance to actually meet her, Tom, I'm more convinced than ever that your notion of inviting her to the summit we proposed was a very good one. Wilhelm's analysts got it right, too, I think. Of everyone in Elizabeth's inner circle, she probably is the closest thing we've got to a friend. Friend? <laughs> Nesbitt snorted harshly. I said the closest thing we've got to a friend, Tony. I don't think anyone could accuse her of being a peep sympathizer, and God knows this woman's not going to hesitate to go right on blowing our starships out of space if these negotiations don't succeed. But she genuinely doesn't want to, and I don't think she feels any need to insist on unduly punitive terms either. Nesbitt glanced around at his fellow cabinet secretaries, then turned back to Pritchard. With all due respect, Madam President, he said, I have a sneaking suspicion you've already made up your mind what we're going to do. I wouldn't put it quite that way myself, she replied. What I've made my mind up about is that we're going to have to negotiate with them, and that unless their terms are totally outrageous, this is probably the best opportunity we're going to get to survive— and I'm not talking about the personal survival of the people in this room, either. I'm talking about the survival of the Republic of Haven and of the Constitution. If we ride this one down in flames, we won't just be taking thousands, possibly millions of more lives with us. Her eyes were cold, her voice grim. We'll be taking everything we've fought for with us. All of it. 
everything we've done, everything we've tried to do, everything we've wanted to accomplish for the Republic since the day Tom shot Saint-Just will go down with us. I'm not prepared to see that happen without doing everything I can to avoid it first. Silence fell once more. A silence that agreed with her analysis, yet remained intensely wary, even frightened of what she proposed to do to avoid the outcome she'd predicted. But there was more than wariness or fear in the wordless, intense glances being exchanged around that table, Pritchard realized. Even for those like Nesbitt and Barloy, who most disliked and distrusted Manticore, there was a blazing core of hope as well. The hope that an eleventh-hour reprieve was possible after all. How does Admiral Alexander Harrington propose to conduct the negotiations, Madam President? Montreux asked after several moments. I think she's willing to leave that largely up to us. Pritchard's voice was back to normal, and she shrugged. I'd say she has firm instructions, but my impression is that when she describes herself as Elizabeth's plenipotentiary, she is serious. However firm her instructions may be, I think Elizabeth chose her because she trusts her, not just her honesty, but her judgment. You already know the points she's told us have to be addressed. The fact that she singled those points out suggests, to me at least, that everything else is truly negotiable, or at least that Manticore's position on those other points isn't set in stone ahead of time. That whole matter of our pre-war correspondence is going to be a bear for reasons all of us understand perfectly well, but outside of those two specific areas, I think she's perfectly willing to hear our proposals and respond to them. But she hasn't made any suggestions at all about protocol? Montreux pressed. It was clear to Pritchard that the Secretary of State was seeking clarification, not objecting, and she shook her head. No, she hasn't said a word about protocol, delegation sizes, or anything else. Not yet, anyway. Mind you, I don't doubt for a minute that if we came up with a suggestion she didn't like, she wouldn't hesitate to let us know. Somehow, I have the impression she's not exactly timid. Something like a cross between a snort and a laugh sounded from Thomas Theismann's general direction, and Lepique raised one hand to hide a smile. I don't think I'd choose just that adjective to describe her either, Madam President, Montreux said dryly. But the reason I asked the question doesn't really have that much to do with her. No? Pritchard gazed at her for a moment, then nodded. I see where you're going, I think. But to be honest, I'm not certain I agree with you. One or two of the others looked puzzled, while others were slowly nodding in understanding of their own. I'd like to keep this as small and non-adversarial as we can manage, Leslie. The last thing we need is to turn this into some sort of dog-and-pony show that bogs down. I don't think for a minute that Alexander Harrington was blowing smoke when she said Elizabeth's unwilling to let negotiations stretch out forever. Neither do I, Montreux acknowledged, but her expression never wavered. And like you, I'd like to keep the negotiating team small enough and sufficiently focused to move quickly. In fact, I'd really like to handle as much of this as possible one-on-one -on -one between her and myself as Secretary of State, or, failing that, between her and you as the Republic's head of state. But if we do that, getting any agreement or treaty we manage to come up with approved by Congress is going to be a lot harder. The puzzled expressions were changing into something else, and frowns were breaking out here and there. Somewhat to Pritchard's surprise, one of the darkest and least happy frowns belonged to Tony Nesbitt. I take your point, Leslie, he said. But inviting the administration's political opponents to sit in on this, and that is what you had in mind, isn't it? Montreux nodded, and he shrugged. As I say, inviting the opposition to sit in on, even participate in, the negotiating process strikes me as a recipe for disaster in a lot of ways. Despite herself, one of Pritchard's eyebrows rose. Nesbitt saw it and barked a laugh which contained very few traces of anything someone might have called humor. Oh, don't get me wrong, Madam President. 
I'm probably as close to an outright member of the opposition as you've got sitting in this cabinet, and I think you're well aware of exactly how little trust I'm prepared to place in anyone from Manticore. But compared to some of the other operators out there, I might as well be your blood brother. I don't like to admit it, but a lot of them are probably as self-serving as Arnold turned out to be, and about as trustworthy. A flicker of genuine pain, the pain of someone who'd been betrayed and used by someone he'd trusted, flashed across the Commerce Secretary's expression, but his voice never wavered. However I might feel about Manticore, you and Admiral Theismann are right about how desperate our military position is— and if this is the one chance we've got to survive on anything approaching acceptable terms, I don't want some political grandstander, or even worse, someone who'd prefer to see negotiations fail because he thinks he can improve his personal position or deep-six the Constitution in the aftermath of military defeat, to screw it up. And if we get far enough to actually start dealing with the matter of who did what to whose mail before the war, it's likely to be just a bit awkward tiptoeing around someone who'd be perfectly willing to leak it to the newsies for any advantage it might give him. I find myself in agreement with Tony, Rachel Hanriot said after a moment. But even so, I'm afraid Leslie has a point. There's got to be someone involved in these negotiations who isn't one of us. I'd prefer for it to be someone who's opposed to us as a matter of principle, assuming we can find anyone like that, but the bottom line is that we've got to include someone from outside the administration or its supporters, whatever their motives for being there might be. Someone to play the role of watchdog for all those people, especially in Congress, who don't like us or oppose us, or who simply question our competence after the collapse of the summit talks and what happened at the Battle of Manticore. This can't be the work of a single party or a single clique, not anything anyone could portray as having been negotiated in a dark little room somewhere, if we expect congressional approval. And to be honest, I think we have a moral obligation to give our opponents at least some input into negotiating what we hope will be a treaty with enormous implications for every man, woman, and child in the Republic. It's not just our Republic, whatever offices we hold, and I don't think we can afford to let ourselves forget that. Wonderful. Walter Sanderson shook his head. I can see this is going to turn into a perfectly delightful exercise in statesmanship. I can hardly think of anything I'd rather do, except possibly donate one of my testicles to science without anesthetic. Pritchard chuckled. One or two of Sanderson's colleagues found his occasional descents into indelicacy inappropriate in a cabinet secretary, the president, on the other hand, rather treasured them. They had a way of bringing people firmly back to earth. Given what you've just said, she told him with a smile, I think we'll all be just as happy if we keep you personally as far away as possible from the negotiating table, Walter. Thank God, he said feelingly. Nonetheless, Pritchard went on in a voice tinged with more than a little regret, I think you and Rachel have a point, Leslie. Tony, I'm as reluctant as you are to include any negotiators whose motivations are suspect, and your point about the correspondence issue is particularly well taken. In fact, it's the part of this which makes me the most nervous, if I'm going to be honest. But they're still right. If we don't include someone from outside the administration, we're going to have a hell of a fight in Congress afterward— even if Rachel didn't have a point of her own about that moral responsibility of ours. And to the brutally frank, I think we'll have a better chance of surviving even if we end up having to air some of our political dirty linen in front of Admiral Alexander Harrington, if it lets us move forward with at least a modicum of multi-party support, than we will if we find ourselves in a protracted struggle to get whatever terms we work out ratified. The last thing we need is to have any of those people in Manticore who already don't trust us decide that this time around we're being Irish and deliberately stringing things out rather than acting in good faith. Chapter 9 What's the current status of Bogey 2, Utaco? 
No change in course or heading, sir. Lieutenant Commander Utako Schreiber, Operations Officer of Task Group 2.2, Mason Alignment Navy, replied. She looked over her shoulder at Commodore Roderick Sung, the task group CO who'd just stepped back onto MANS Apparition's tiny flag bridge and raised one eyebrow very slightly. Sung noted the eyebrow and suppressed an uncharacteristic urge to snap at her for it. He managed to conquer the temptation without ever allowing it to show in his own expression, and the fact that Schreiber was probably the best ops officer he'd ever worked with, despite her junior rank, helped. Her willingness to think for herself was the reason he'd handpicked her from a sizable pool of candidates when Benjamin Detweiler handed him this prong of Oyster Bay, after all. And the fact that he'd worked hard to establish the relationship of mutual trust and respect, which let a subordinate ask that sort of silent question, helped even more. All the same, a tiny part of him did want to rip her head off, not because of anything she'd done, but because of the tension building steadily in the vicinity of his stomach. Thank you, he said out loud instead as he crossed to his own command chair and settled back into it. At least I've demonstrated my imperturbability by taking a break to hit the head, he reflected mordantly. Unless, of course, Utako and the others decide I only went because the damned Graysons are worrying the piss out of me. That second thought surprised a quiet snort of amusement out of him, and he was amazed how much better that made him feel. Of course, there was a galaxy of difference between better and anything he would describe as good. Up until the past twelve hours or so, Sung's part of Operation Oyster Bay had gone without a hitch, so he supposed he really shouldn't complain too loudly, even in the privacy of his own mind, when Murphy put in his inevitable appearance. The advantages of technology and heredity were all well and good, but the universe remained a slave to probability theory. The alignment strategists had made a conscientious effort to keep that point in mind from the very beginning, as had the planners of this particular mission. In fact, both Sung's orders and every pre-op briefing had stressed that concern, yet he doubted his superiors would look kindly on the man who blew Oyster Bay, whatever the circumstances. He frowned down at his small repeater plot, watching the red icons of the Grayson Space Navy cruiser squadron. Just my luck to wander into the middle of some kind of training exercise, he thought glumly. Although I'd like to know what the hell they think they're doing exercising clear up here. Damned untidy of them. Oyster Bay's operational planners had taken advantage of the tendency for local shipping to restrict itself largely to the plane of a star system's ecliptic. Virtually all the real estate in which human beings were interested lay along the ecliptic after all. Local traffic was seldom concerned with anything much above or below it, and ships arriving out of hyper almost invariably arrived in the same plane, since that generally offered the shortest normal space flight path to whatever destination had brought them to the system as well, not to mention imposing a small but significantly lower amount of wear and tear on their alpha nodes. So even though defensive planners routinely placed surveillance platforms to cover the polar regions, there wasn't usually very much shipping in those areas. In this instance, however, for reasons best known to itself, and, of course, Murphy, the GSN had elected to send an entire squadron of what looked like their version of the Mantis Saganami C-Class heavy cruisers out to play, halfway to the hyperlimit and due north of Yeltsin Star. It wouldn't have pissed Sung off so much if they hadn't decided to do it at this particular moment. Well, and in this particular spot. The other five ships of his task group were headed to meet Apparition for their last scheduled rendezvous, and unless Bogey 2 changed vector, it was going to pass within less than five light minutes of the rendezvous point. And considerably closer than that to Apparition's course as she headed towards that rendezvous. He propped his elbows on his command chair's armrests and leaned back, lips pursed as he considered the situation. One of the problems the mission planners had been forced to address was the simple fact that a star system was an enormous volume for only six ships to scout, however sophisticated their sensors or their remote platforms were, and however stealthy they themselves might be. At least it was if the objective was to keep anyone on the other side from suspecting the scouting was in progress. 
He'd studied every available scrap about the Mantis' operations against Haven, and he'd been impressed by their reconnaissance platform's apparent ability to operate virtually at will without being intercepted by the Havenites. Unfortunately, if Sung's presence was ever noted at all, whether anyone managed to actually intercept him or not, Oyster Bay was probably blown, which meant the Mantis' task had been rather easier than his own. He never doubted that he could have evaded the local sensor net well enough to prevent it from pinning down the actual locations of any of his units, even if it managed to detect their simple presence. Unfortunately, the object was for the Graysons to never even know he was here in the first place. The Manti scout forces, by and large, hadn't been particularly concerned about the possibility that the Havenites might realize they were being scouted, since there was nothing they could have done to prevent it, and it wasn't exactly as if they didn't already know someone was at war with them. But if the Graysons figured out that someone, anyone, was roaming about their star system before the very last moment, they could probably substantially blunt Oyster Bay's success. They'd still get hurt, probably badly, but Oyster Bay was supposed to be decisive, not just painful. Bearing all of that in mind, the operational planners had ruled out any extensive comm transmissions between the widely dispersed units of Sung's task group. Even the most tightly focused transmissions were much more likely to be detected than the scout ships themselves, which was why the ops plan included periodic rendezvous points for the scouts to exchange information at very short range using low-powered whisker lasers. Once all their sensor data had been collected, organized, and analyzed, Apparition would know what to tell the guidance platforms. But without those rendezvous, Sung's flagship wouldn't have the data in the first place, and that would be unacceptable. Unlike some of the more fiery of the alignment's zealots, Roderick Sung felt no personal animosity towards any of the normals who were about to discover they were outmoded. However naive and foolish he might find their faith in the random combination of genes— and however committed he might be to overcoming the obstacles that foolishness created, he didn't blame any of them personally for it. Well, aside from those sanctimonious prigs on Beowulf, of course. But his lack of personal animus didn't lessen his determination to succeed, and at this particular moment, all he really wanted was for a spontaneous black hole to appear out of nowhere and eat every one of those blasted cruisers. Should we alter course, sir? The Commodore looked up at the quiet question. Commander Travis Tsao, his chief of staff, stood at his shoulder and nodded towards the plot by Sung's right knee. Bogey 2 is going to pass within two light minutes of our base course at closest approach, Tsao pointed out, still in that quiet voice. A point, Travis, Sung replied with a thin smile, of which I was already aware. I know that, sir. Sal was normally a bit stiffer than Schreiber, but he'd known Sung even longer, and he returned the Commodore's smile wryly. On the other hand, part of my job is to bring little things like that to your attention, just in case you understand. True. Sung nodded, glanced back down at the plot, then drew a deep breath. We'll hold our course, he said then. Without even the spider up, we should be nothing but a nice, quiet hole in space, as far as they're concerned. And frankly, they're already so close, I'd just as soon leave the spider down. I know they're not supposed to be able to detect it, but... He let his voice trail off, and Sal nodded. At the moment, Apparition was moving on a purely ballistic course, with every active sensor shut down. And as Sung had just pointed out, that, coupled with all the manifold stealth features built into the scout ship, ought to make her more than simply invisible. The only real problem with that analysis hung on the single word ought, since if that assumption turned out to be inaccurate, apparition would stand precisely zero probability of surviving. The Ghost-class ships had no offensive armament at all. They were designed to do precisely what apparition was doing at this moment— and there was no point pretending they'd be able to fight their way out of trouble if the other side managed to find them in the first place. So they'd been equipped with every stealth system, the fertile imaginations of Anastasia Chernevsky and the rest of the MAN's R&D establishment had been able to devise, packed into the smallest possible platform, and if that meant sacrificing armament, so be it. 
Even their anti-missile defenses represented little more than a token gesture, and everyone aboard Apparition was thoroughly aware of that fact. On the other hand, Chernivsky and her people are very, very good at their jobs, Sung reminded himself. A huge chunk of Apparition's available tonnage had been eaten up by the spider's triple keels, and another sizable chunk had been dedicated to her enormously capable sensor suite. Habitability had also loomed as a major factor in her designer's minds, since the ghosts were going to be deployed on long-endurance missions. But the architects had accepted some significant compromises, even in that regard, in favor of knitting the most effective possible cloak of invisibility. Unlike the starships of most navies, the MAN scouts hadn't settled for simple, smart paint. Other ships could control and reconfigure their paint at will, transforming their hulls, or portions of those hulls, into whatever they needed at any given moment, from nearly perfectly reflective surfaces to black bodies. The ghost's capabilities, however, went much further than that. Instead of the relatively simple-minded nanotech of most ships' paint, the surface of Apparition's hull was capable of mimicking effectively any portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Her passive sensors detected any incoming radiation, from infrared through cosmic rays, and her computers mapped the data onto her hull, where her extraordinarily capable nannies reproduced it. In effect, anyone looking at Apparition when her stealth was fully engaged would see whatever the sensors exactly opposite his viewpoint saw, as if the entire ship were a single sheet of crystalplast. That was the theory, at least. And in this case, what theory predicted and reality achieved were remarkably close together. It wasn't perfect, of course. The system's greatest weakness was that it couldn't give complete coverage. Like any stealth system, it still had to deal with things like waste heat, for example. Current technology could recapture and use an enormous percentage of that heat, but not all of it. And what they couldn't capture still had to go somewhere— and like other Navy stealth systems, the MANs dealt with that by radiating that heat away from known enemy sensors. Modern stealth fields could do a lot to minimize even heat signatures, but nothing could completely eliminate them, and stealth fields themselves were detectable at extremely short ranges, so any ship remained vulnerable to detection by a sufficiently sensitive sensor on exactly the right or wrong bearing. In this instance, though, they knew right where the Graysons were. That meant they could adjust for maximum stealthiness against that particular threat bearing, and as part of his training, Sung had personally tried to detect a ghost with the MAN's very best passive sensors. Even knowing exactly where the ship was, it had been all but impossible to pick her out of the background radiation of space, so he wasn't unduly concerned that Bogey 2 would detect apparition with shipboard systems as long as she remained completely covert. He was less confident that the spider drive would pass unnoticed at such an absurdly short range, however. Chernevsky's people assured him detection was exceedingly unlikely, that it had taken them the better part of two T years to develop their own detectors, even knowing what they were looking for, and that those detectors were still far from anything anyone would ever call reliable. But Sung had no desire to be the one who proved their optimism had been misplaced. Even the spider had a footprint, after all, even if it wasn't something anyone else would have associated with a drive system. All it would take was for someone to notice an anomalous reading and be conscientious enough, or, for that matter, bored enough, to spend a little time trying to figure out what it was. And the fact that the spider's signature flares as it comes up only makes that more likely, he reflected. The odds against anyone spotting it would still be enormous, but even so, they'd be a hell of a lot worse than the chance of anyone aboard Bogey 2 noticing us if we just keep quietly coasting along. At the same time, he knew exactly why Sao had asked his question. However difficult a sensor target they might be for Bogey 2 shipboard systems, the rules would change abruptly if the Grayson cruiser decided to deploy her own recon platforms. If she were to do that, and if the platforms got a good close-range look at the aspect apparition was keeping turned away from their mothership, the chance of detection went from abysmally low to terrifyingly high in very short order. 
which meant what Sung was really doing was betting that the odds of the Graysons choosing to deploy recon platforms were lower than the odds of her shipboard systems detecting the spider's activation flare if he maneuvered to avoid her. Of course, even if we did try to crab away from her, it wouldn't help a whole hell of a lot if she decided to launch platforms. All we'd really manage to do would be to move her target a bit farther away from her, and there's a reason they call remote platforms remote, Rod. No, he'd play the odds, and he knew it was the right decision, however little comfort that might be if Murphy did decide to take an even more active hand. I wonder if Ostby and Omolchenko are having this much fun wandering around Manticore, he thought dryly. I know no one ever promised it would be easy, and I've always enjoyed a hand of poker as much as the next man, but this is getting ridiculous. Roderick Sung settled himself even more comfortably in his command chair and waited to see exactly what sort of cards Murphy had chosen to deal this time. Chapter 10 Honor Alexander Harrington hoped she looked less nervous than she felt as she and the rest of the Manticoran delegation followed Alicia Hampton, Secretary of State Montrose's personal aide, down the short hallway on the 200th floor of the Nouveau Paris Plaza Falls Hotel. The Plaza Falls had been the showplace hotel of the Republic of Haven's capital city for almost two tea centuries, and the legislaturalists had been careful to preserve it intact when they created the People's Republic of Haven. It had served to house important visitors, Salarian diplomats, and of course newsies being presented with the Office of Public Information's view of the galaxy, businessmen being wooed as potential investors, off-world black marketeers applying the needs of those same legislaturalists, heads of state who were being invited to request Havenite protection as a cheaper alternative to outright conquest, or various high-priced courtesans being kept in the style to which they had become accustomed. The Committee of Public Safety, for all its other faults, had been far less inclined towards that particular sort of personal corruption. Rob Pierre, Cordelia Ransom, and their fellows had hardly been immune to their own forms of empire-building and hypocrisy, but they'd seen no reason to follow in the legislaturalists' footsteps where the Plaza Falls was concerned. Indeed, the hotel had been regarded by the mob as a concrete symbol of the legislaturalists' regime, which explained why it had been thoroughly vandalized during the early days of Rob Pierre's coup. Nor was that the only indignity it had suffered, since the committee had actually encouraged its progressive looting, using it as a sort of whipping boy whenever the mob threatened to become dangerously rowdy. The sheer size of the hotel had meant looting it wasn't a simple afternoon's work, so it had made a useful diversion for quite some time. In the end, even something with 220 floors had eventually run out of things to steal, break, or deface, and, fortunately perhaps, a ceramicrete tower was remarkably non-flammable. Several individual rooms and one complete floor had been burned out by particularly persistent arsonists, but by and large the Plaza Falls had survived, more or less. The picked-clean carcass had been allowed to molder away, ignored by any of the committee's public works projects. It had sat empty and completely ignored, and most people had written it off as something to be eventually demolished and replaced. But demolishing a tower that size was no trivial task, even for a counter-gravity civilization, and to everyone's considerable surprise, the privatization incentives Tony Nesbitt and Rachel Hanrio had put together after Theismann's coup had attracted a pool of investors who were actually interested in salvaging the structure instead. More than that, they'd honestly believed the Plaza Falls could be restored to its former glory as a piece of living history and a profit-making enterprise that underscored the rebirth of the Republic as a whole. Despite their enthusiasm, the project had been bound to run into more difficulties than any sane person would have willingly confronted, but they'd been thoroughly committed by the time they figured that out. In fact, failure of the project would have spelled complete and total ruin for most of the backers by that point. And so they dug in, tackled each difficulty as it arose, and to everyone's surprise, quite probably their own more than anyone else's, they'd actually succeeded. 
It hadn't been easy, but the result of their labors really had turned into an emblem of the Republic's economic renaissance. And even though Haven remained a relatively poor star nation, by Mantikran standards at least, its resurgent entrepreneurial class was robust enough to turn the Plaza Falls into a genuine moneymaker. Not at the levels its renovators had hoped for, perhaps, but with enough cash flow to show a modest, honor suspected a very modest, profit after covering the various loan payments and operating expenses. At the rates they're charging, it certainly wouldn't show much of a profit in the Star Empire, she thought, following their guide. But the cost of living's a lot lower here in the Republic, even now. I hate to think what kind of trouble they'd have hiring a staff this devoted back in landing at the sort of salaries they're paying here. For that matter, these days they couldn't get a staff this qualified back on Grayson this cheaply either. Fortunately for the Plaza Falls owners, they weren't on Manticore or Grayson, however, and she had to admit that they and Eloise Pritchard's government had done the visiting Manticoran delegation proud. She stepped into the combination conference room and suite Pritchard had designated for their informal talks, and the president rose from her place at one end of the hand-polished, genuine wood conference table. The rest of the Havenite delegation followed suit, and Pritchard smiled at honor. Good morning, Admiral. Madam President, Anna responded with a small half-bow. Please allow me to introduce my colleagues. Of course, Madam President. Thank you. Pritchard smiled exactly as if someone in that room might actually have no idea who somebody, anybody, else was. In fact, Honor knew every member of Pritchard's delegation had been as carefully briefed on every member of her delegation as her delegation had been about Pritchard's delegation. Formal protocol and polite pretenses, she thought, reaching up to touch Nimitz's ears as she felt his shared amusement in the back of her brain. You've just gotta love them, or somebody must at least. After all, if people weren't addicted to this kind of horse manure, it would have been junk piled centuries ago. But let's be fair, Honor. It does serve a purpose sometimes, and the Navy's just as bad, maybe even worse. Of course, you've already met Secretary of State Montreux, Pritchard told her. And you already know Secretary of War Theismann. I don't believe, however, that you've actually been introduced to Mr. Nesbitt, my Secretary of Commerce. No, I haven't. Honor acknowledged, reaching out to shake Nesbitt's hand. She'd been sampling the Havenite's emotions from the moment she stepped through the door, and Nesbitt's were... interesting. She'd already concluded that Pritchard was as determined as she was to reach some sort of negotiated settlement. Leslie Montrose's mind glow tasted as determined as Pritchard's, although there was more caution and less optimism to keep that determination company. Thomas Theismann was a solid, unflappable presence with a granite tenacity and a solid integrity that reminded Honor almost painfully of Alistair McKeon. She wasn't surprised by that, even though she'd never really had the opportunity before to taste his emotions. The first time they'd met, after the Battle of Blackbird, she hadn't yet developed her own empathic capabilities. And the second time they'd met, she'd been a little too preoccupied with her own imminent death to pay his mind glow a great deal of attention. Now, she finally had the opportunity to repair that omission and the confirmation that he at least truly was the man she'd hoped and believed he was reinforced her own optimism, slightly at least. But Nesbitt was different. Although he smiled pleasantly, his dislike hit her like a hammer. The good news was that it wasn't personally directed at her, Unfortunately, the good news was also the bad news in his case. In many ways, she would have preferred to have him take her in personal dislike rather than radiate his anger at and profound distrust of anything Manticoran so strongly. Of course, he was about her own age, so everything she'd said to Pritchard about her own lifelong experience of mutual hostility between their star nations held true for him as well. And however unhappy he might have been to see her, and however clearly he resented the fact that the Republic needed to negotiate an end to hostilities, 
he also radiated his own version of Pritchard's determination to succeed. And there was something else as well. An odd little something she couldn't quite lay a mental finger on. It was almost as though he were ashamed of something. That wasn't exactly the right word, but she didn't know what the right word was. Yet whatever it was, or wherever it came from, it actually reinforced both his anger and his determination to achieve some sort of settlement. Admiral Alexander Harrington, he said just a bit gruffly, but he also returned her handshake firmly. Mr. Nesbitt, she murmured in reply. Leslie and Tony are here not only as representatives of the cabinet, but as representatives of two of our larger political parties, Pritchard explained. When I organized my cabinet originally, it seemed pretty clear we were going to need the support of all parties if we were going to make the Constitution work. Because of that, I deliberately chose secretaries from several different parties, and Leslie is a New Democrat, while Tony's a corporate conservative. She smiled dryly. I'm quite certain you've been sufficiently well briefed on our political calculus here in Paris to understand just how lively meetings can be when these two sit in on them. Montro and Nesbitt both smiled, and Honor smiled back, although she suspected Pritchard was actually understating things. As I explained in my memo, the president continued, I've decided, with your consent, to invite some additional representatives from Congress to participate in these talks as well. Of course, Madam President. Honor nodded, despite the fact that she really wished Pritchard hadn't done anything of the sort. She would have much preferred to keep these talks as small and private, as close to one-on-one -on -one with Pritchard as she could. At the same time, she was pretty sure she understood the president's logic. And given the fractiousness of Havenite politics and the fact that selling anything short of victory to Congress and the Havenite people was likely to prove a challenging task, she couldn't really disagree with Pritchard either. It's an imperfect galaxy, Honor, she told herself tartly. Deal with it. Allow me to introduce Senator Samson McGuire, Pritchard said, indicating the man next to Nesbitt. McGuire was a smallish, wiry man, a good twenty centimeters shorter than Honor. In fact, he was shorter than Pritchard or Leslie Montreux, for that matter. He also had gunmetal gray hair, a great beak of a nose, blue eyes, bushy eyebrows, and a powerful chin. They were sharp, those eyes, and they glittered with a sort of perpetual challenge. From the way they narrowed as he shook her hand, she wasn't able to decide whether in her case the challenge was because she was a Manticoran, and therefore the enemy, or simply because she was so much taller than he was. For that matter, it could have been both. According to the best briefing Sir Anthony Langtree's staff in the Foreign Office had been able to provide, McGuire was not one of the Star Empire's greater admirers. For that matter, his new conservative party was widely regarded as one of the natural homes for Havenite firebrands with personal axes to grind with the Star Empire. Which is one reason we're so happy to have Montro as Secretary of State instead of that jackass Giancola, she thought dryly. I'm sorry anyone had to get killed in a traffic accident, but the truth is that dropping him out of the equation has to be a good thing for everyone concerned. In fact, I have to wonder what a smart cookie like Pritchard was thinking putting a new conservative into that cabinet post in the first place. Not, she admitted, that our ending up with High Ridge as Prime Minister and DeCroix as Foreign Secretary was any better, but at least Elizabeth didn't have much choice about it. Senator McGuire's the chairman of the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, Pritchard continued. She tilted her head to one side, watching Honor's expression closely, as if trying to determine how much Honor already knew about the senator. He's here in his capacity as chairman, but also as a representative of the new conservative party. Senator, Honor said, reaching out to shake his hand. Admiral, he made no particular effort to inject any warmth into the single word, and his handshake was more than a little perfunctory. Still, if Honor was parsing his emotions correctly, 
He had no more illusions about the Republic's disastrous military position than anyone else did. And this, Pritchard said, turning to a dark-haired, green-eyed woman about thirty T years younger than Honor, is Senator Ninon Bourchet. She's the senior-ranking constitutional progressive member of Senator McGuire's committee. Senator Bourchier? Honor acknowledged and tried not to smile. Bourchier was quite attractive, although nowhere near as striking as Pritchard herself, and she had a bright, almost girlish smile. A smile, in fact, which went rather poorly with the coolly watchful brain behind those guileless jade eyes. There was more than a touch of the predator to Bourchier, although it wasn't in any sense as if she had an active taste for cruelty or violence. No, this was simply someone who was perpetually poised to note and respond to any threat or opportunity with instant decisive action, and of someone who thought very directly in terms of clearly recognized priorities and responsibilities. As a matter of fact, her mind glow tasted a lot like that of a tree cat, Honor decided, which wasn't especially surprising, since, like Pritchard, Bourchier had been a dedicated member of the Aprilist movement. In fact, O and I had confirmed that she'd been personally responsible for at least seven assassinations, and she'd also been one of the civilian cell leaders who'd not only somehow survived Oscar Saint-Just's best efforts to root out dissidents, but also rallied in support of Theismann's coup in the critical hours immediately after the SS commander's date with mortality. And these days, she was an influential member of Pritchard's own constitutional progressive party as well. I've been looking forward to meeting you, Admiral, Bourchier said, gripping Honor's hand firmly, and Honor's urge to smile threatened to break free for just a moment. Bourchier's greeting sounded almost gushy, but behind its surface froth, that needle-clawed tree cat was watching, measuring, evaluating Honor with that predator's poise. Really? Honor said. I hope our efforts won't be disappointing. So do I, Bourchier said. As do we all, Pritchard cut in smoothly and gestured to a moderately tall, he was only five or six centimeters shorter than Honor, fair-haired, brown-eyed man who was clearly the youngest person present. He was also the most elegantly tailored, and she felt Nimitz resisting the urge to sneeze as he smelled the fair-haired man's expensive cologne. The Honorable Gerald Younger, Admiral Alexander Harrington, Pritchard said, and Honor nodded to him. Mr. Younger is a member of our House of Representatives, Pritchard continued. Like Senator McGuire, he's also a new conservative, and while he's not its chairman, he sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Admiral Alexander Harrington, Younger said with a white-toothed smile. Representative Younger? she replied, and carefully did not wipe the palm of her hand on her trousers when Younger released it. Despite his sleek grooming, he radiated a sort of arrogant ambition and predatory narcissism that made even McGuire seem positively philanthropic. And this, Admiral Alexander Harrington, Pritchard said, turning to the final Havenite representative present, is Chief Justice Jeffrey Tullingham. He's here more in an advisory role than anything else, but I felt it would probably be a good idea to have him available if any legal issues or precedents should happen to raise their heads during our talks. That strikes me as an excellent idea, Madam President, Honor said, at least partly truthfully, extending her hand to Tullingham. It's an honor to meet you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Admiral. He smiled at her, and she smiled back, fully aware, though it was possible he wasn't, that both those smiles were equally false. He wasn't at all pleased to see her here, which was fair enough, perhaps, or at least reciprocal, since even though Honor agreed with Pritchard that having a legal expert's perspective on the talks was probably a good idea, she wished this particular legal expert were far, far away from them. Technically, as the senior member of the Havenite Supreme Court, Tullingham was supposed to be above partisan issues. In fact, although Manticoran intelligence still knew little about his history prior to his appointment to the court, 
His mind glow strongly suggested that he was even more closely aligned with McGuire's and Younger's new conservatives than the analysts had suspected. And despite a carefully cultivated air of nonpartisan detachment, the taste of his personal ambition and basic untrustworthiness came through in her empathic sensitivity even more clearly than Younger's had. And isn't he just a lovely choice to head the court that has the power of judicial review over every law their Congress passes? She managed not to shake her head, but it wasn't easy. From Pritchard's emotions when she introduced him, she obviously has a pretty fair idea what's going on inside him. So how many dead bodies did he have to threaten to exhume or personally plant to get named to the Supreme Court in the first place? Well, his impact on Havenite law wasn't her problem, thank God. On the other hand, his impact on the negotiations very well could be. Unless she could talk Senator Bourchier into carrying out just one last little assassination. She shook free of that thought, although from the taste of Bourchier's mind glow when she looked at Tullingham, she'd probably agree in a heartbeat, and waved at the other three members of her own delegation. As you can see, Madam President, Foreign Secretary Langtree decided it would be a good idea to send along at least a few professionals to keep me out of trouble as well. Allow me to introduce Permanent Undersecretary Sir Barnabas Q, Special Envoy Carissa Mulcahy, Baroness Selleck, and Assistant Undersecretary the Honorable Voito Tuominen. And this is my personal aide, Lieutenant Valdemar Tumel. Polite murmurs of recognition came back from the Havenite side of the table, although Honor sensed a few spikes of irritation when she used Mulcahy's title. Well, that was too bad. She didn't intend to rub anyone's nose in the fact that Manticore had an hereditary aristocracy and rewarded merit with admission into it, but she wasn't going to spend all of her time here pussyfooting around tender Havenite sensibilities either. Even with her three assistants, her delegation was considerably smaller than Pritchard's, but it ought to be big enough. And it was a darn good thing they were here. She'd spent most of the voyage between Manticore and Haven, discovering just how grateful she was for the three seasoned professionals Langtree had sent along. Q was the oldest of the trio, with silver hair, sharp brown eyes, a ruddy complexion, and a nose almost as powerful as McGuire's. Twomanin was shortish, but very broad-shouldered. He'd always been known as something of a maverick within the ranks of the foreign office, and he was as aggressively commoner as Klaus Hauptmann. Actually, despite the fact that he'd been born on Sphinx, not Griffin, his personality reminded her strongly of Anton Zilwicky's in many ways, although he was a considerably more driven sort, without Zilwicky's granite methodical patience. Countess Selleck was the youngest of the three. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and attractive in an understated sort of way, she was the intelligence specialist of the Manticoran delegation. She reminded Honor rather strongly of Alice Truman, and not just in a physical sense. Lieutenant Tumel was actually the one she'd found most difficult to fit smoothly into place, although that wasn't even remotely his fault. The brown-haired, brown-eyed lieutenant was an extraordinarily competent young man with enormous potential— yet she felt a lingering guilt at having accepted him as Timothy Mears's replacement. Even now, she knew, she continued to hold him more or less at arm's length, as if really accepting him would somehow be a betrayal of Mears's memory, or as if she were afraid letting him get too close to her would lead to his death as well. No one, she noticed, offered to introduce the members of Pritchard's security detachment or her own armsmen, not that anyone was unaware of their presence. In fact, Honor was more than a little amused by the fact that Pritchard's detachment was all but invisible to the Havenites, from long familiarity, while the same thing was true for her armsmen from the Manticoran side of the room, yet both sides were acutely aware of the presence of the other side's armed retainers. And then there was Nimitz, quite possibly the deadliest armed retainer of them all, Certainly he was, on a kilo-for-kilo kilo basis at any rate, and it was obvious from the taste of the Havenite's mind glows that every one of these people had been briefed on the reports of the tree cat's intelligence, telepathic abilities, and lethality. Just as it was equally obvious that several of them, who rejoiced in names like McGuire, Younger, and Tullingham, 
cherished profound reservations about allowing him within a kilometer of this conference room. In fact, McGuire was so unhappy that Honor had to wonder how Pritchard had managed to twist his arm hard enough to get him here at all. With the formal greetings and introductions disposed of, Pritchard waved at the conference table with its neatly arranged data ports, old-fashioned blotters, and carafes of ice water. The chairs around it, in keeping with the Plaza Falls' venerable lineage, were unpowered, but that didn't prevent them from being almost sinfully comfortable as the delegates settled into them. Pritchard had seated her own delegation with its back to the suite's outer wall of windows, and Honor felt a flicker of gratitude for the President's thoughtfulness as she parked Nimitz on the back of her own chair. Then she seated herself and gazed out through the crystoplast behind Pritchard and her colleagues, while the other members of her own team plugged personal mini-comps into the data ports and unobtrusively tested their firewalls and security fences. Nouveau Paris had been built in the foothills of the Limoges Mountains, the coastal range that marked the southwest edge of the continent of Rochambeau, where it met the Vere Ocean. The city's pastel-colored towers rose high into the heavens, but despite their height, and for that matter, the sheer size and population of the city itself, the towering peaks of the Limoges Range still managed to put them into proportion— to remind the people living in them that a planet was a very large place. Like most cities designed and planned by a gravitic civilization's engineers, Nouveau Paris incorporated green belts, parks, and tree-shaded pedestrian plazas. It also boasted spectacular beaches along its westernmost suburbs, but the heart of the original city had been built around the confluence of the Garonne River and the Rhone River, and from her place at the table, she looked almost directly down to where those two broad streams merged, less than half a kilometer before they plunged over the 80-meter, horseshoe-shaped drop of Frontenac Falls in a boiling smother of foam, spray, and mist. Below the falls, which had given the Plaza Falls its name, the imposing width of the Frontenac estuary rolled far more tranquilly to the Vere, dotted with pleasure boats, which were themselves yet another emblem of the Republic of Haven's renaissance. It was impressive, even from the suite's imposing height. She gazed at the city, the rivers, and the falls for several seconds, then turned her attention politely to Pritchard. The president looked around the table, obviously checking to be certain everyone was settled, then squared her own shoulders and looked back at Honor. It's occurred to me, Admiral Alexander Harrington, that this is probably a case of the less formality, the better. We've already tried the formal diplomatic waltz, with position papers and diplomatic notes moving back and forth before we started shooting at each other again, and we're all only too well aware of where that ended up. Since your queen's been willing to send you to us under such untrammeled conditions— I'd like to maintain as much informality as possible this time around, in hopes of achieving a somewhat more satisfactory outcome. I do have a certain structure in mind, but with your agreement, I'd prefer to allow frank discussion among all the participants, instead of the standard procedure where you and I, or you and Leslie, simply repeat our formal positions to one another over and over, while everyone else sits back, watches, and tries valiantly to stay awake. I think I could live with that, Madam President, Anna replied, feeling the slight smile she couldn't totally suppress dance around her lips. Good. In that case, I thought that since you've come all this way to deliver Queen Elizabeth's message— I'd ask you to repeat it for all of us, and after you've done that, I would appreciate it if you would sketch out for us, in broad and general strokes, of course, a preliminary presentation of the Star Kingdom, I'm sorry, the Star Empire's view of what might constitute the terms of a sensible peace settlement. That sounds reasonable, Honor agreed, sternly telling the butterflies in her stomach to stop fluttering. Odd how much more unnerving this was than the mere prospect of facing an enemy wall of battle. She settled further back into her chair, feeling Nimitz's warm, silken presence against the back of her head, and drew a deep breath. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, she began, I'll begin by being blunt, and I hope no one will be offended by my candor. 
Please remember that despite any titles I may have acquired or any diplomatic accreditation Queen Elizabeth may have trusted me with, I'm basically a yeoman-born naval officer, not a trained diplomat. If I seem to be overly direct, please understand no discourtesy is intended. They gazed back at her, all of them from behind the impassive facades of experienced politicians, and she considered inviting them to just relax and check their poker faces at the door. It wasn't as if those well-trained expressions were doing them any good against someone as capable of reading the emotions behind them as any tree cat. And anything she missed, Nimitz wouldn't when they compared notes later. Still, judging by the way they taste, Pritchard, Theismann, and Montreux, at the very least, already know that as well as Maguire and Tullingham do. Interesting that none of them have made a point of their knowledge, though. As I've already told President Pritchard, both my queen and I are fully aware that the view of who's truly responsible for the conflict between our two star nations isn't the same from Manticore and Haven. I've also already conceded to President Pritchard that the High Ridge government must bear its share of the blame for the diplomatic failure which led to the resumption of hostilities between our star nations. I think, however, that no one in Nouveau Paris, any more than anyone in Landing, can deny that the Republic of Haven actually fired the first shots of this round when it launched Operation Thunderbolt. I'm confident the decision to do so was not lightly taken, and I don't doubt for a moment that you felt, rightly or wrongly, both that you were justified and that it was the best of the several bad options available to you. But the fact remains that Manticore didn't start the shooting in any of our conflicts with Haven. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to a crossroads. I know some of you blame the Star Empire for all that's happened. I assure you, there are more than sufficient people in the Star Empire who blame the Republic for all that's happened. And the truth, of course, is that both sides must bear their own share of the responsibility. Yet at this moment, the Star Empire's military advantage is, quite frankly, overwhelming. They weren't liking what they were hearing. That much was painfully obvious to her empathic sense, despite their impassive control of their faces. But she also tasted the bleak awareness that what she'd just said was self-evidently true. It was strongest from Pritchard and Theismann, but she tasted a surprisingly strong flare of the same awareness from Nesbitt. Montreux and Bourchier clearly recognized the same unpalatable truth, but there was something different less personal about their recognition than honor tasted in Nesbitt's. Younger, on the other hand, seemed to be one of those people who were constitutionally incapable of accepting the very possibility of failure. It was as if he was able to intellectually recognize that Apollo gave the Manticoran alliance a huge military advantage, yet unable to accept the corollary that he could no longer game his way to the outcome he wanted. McGuire and Tullingham, unlike Younger, clearly did recognize how severely the tectonic shift in military power limited their options, but that didn't mean they were prepared to give up. She suspected they'd be willing to bow to the inevitable in the end, but only after they'd cut the best personal deals they could. Well, they're welcome to cut all the domestic political deals they want to, she thought grimly. The simple truth, she continued, is that it's now within the power of the Royal Manticoran Navy to systematically reduce the orbital infrastructure of every star system of the Republic to rubble. Her voice was quiet, yet she felt them flinching from her words as if they'd been fists. You can't stop us, however courageous or determined Admiral Theismann's men and women may be, even with the advantages of the missile defense system— Moriarty, I believe you call it, Admiral Foraker devised before the Battle of Salone, as we demonstrated at Lovett. A fresh stab of pain ripped through Pritchard, and it was Honor's turn to flinch internally in combined sympathy and guilt. Guilt not so much for having killed Javier Giscard as for the way in which killing him had wounded Eloise Pritchard as well. There are those in the Star Empire she went on, allowing no trace of her awareness of Pritchard's pain to color her own expression or tone, who would prefer to do just that, who think it's time for us to use our advantage to completely destroy your fleet 
along with all the casualties that would entail, and then to turn the entire republic into one huge junkyard unless you surrender unconditionally to the Star Empire and the Manticoran Alliance. And if you do surrender, to impose whatever domestic changes and limitations may be necessary to prevent you from ever again threatening the Star Empire or Queen Elizabeth's subjects. She paused, letting her words sink home, tasting their anger, their apprehension, their resentment and frustration. Yet even now, hope continued to flicker, made even stronger in many ways by simple desperation. By the fact that there had to be some end less terrible than the total destruction of all they'd fought and struggled to build and accomplish. I would be lying to you, ladies and gentlemen, she resumed finally, if I didn't admit that the Manticorans who would prefer to see the final and permanent destruction of the Republic of Haven probably outnumber those who would prefer any other outcome. And I'm sure there are any number of Havenites who feel exactly the same way about the Star Empire after so many years of warfare and destruction. But vengeance begets vengeance. Her voice was soft, her brown, almond-shaped eyes very level as they swept the faces of the Havenites. Destruction can be a final solution only when that destruction is complete and total, when there's no one left on the other side, will never be anyone left on the other side to seek their own vengeance. Surely history offers endless examples of that basic, unpalatable truth. Rome had peace with Carthage back on Old Terra in the end, but only when Carthage had been not simply defeated, but totally destroyed. And no one in the Star Empire is foolish enough to believe we can totally destroy the Republic of Haven. Whatever we do... Wherever the Star Empire and the Republic go from this point, there will still be people on both sides who identify themselves as Manticoran or Havenite and remember what the other side did to them, and no military advantage lasts forever. Admiral Theismann and Admiral Foraker demonstrated that quite clearly two or three T years ago, and I assure you that we in the Star Empire learned the lesson well. Something like an echo of bleak satisfaction quivered around the Havenite side of the table at her admission, and she met Theismann's gaze, then nodded very slightly to him. So the position of the Star Empire, ladies and gentlemen, she told them, is that it's ultimately in the best interests of both Manticore and Haven to end this, to end it now with as little additional bloodshed, as little additional destruction, as little additional grounds for us to hate one another and seek vengeance upon one another as possible. My queen doesn't expect that to be easy. She doesn't expect it to happen quickly, but the truth is that it's a simple problem. Solving it may not be simple, yet if we can agree on the unacceptability of failure, it's a solution we can achieve, one we must achieve, because if we fail to, then all that will remain are more of those bad options that have brought us to this pass in the first place. And if all that remain are bad options, then Her Majesty's government and military forces will choose the option most likely to preclude Havens threatening the Star Empire again for as many decades as possible. She looked around the conference table again, sampling the whirlwind emotions behind those outwardly calm and attentive faces, and shook her head slowly. I personally believe, both as an officer in Her Majesty's service and as a private citizen, that that would be a disaster, that it would only sow the seeds of still another cycle of bloodshed and killing in the fullness of time, none of which means it won't happen anyway if we fail to find some other solution, that I won't carry out my own orders to make it happen. So it's up to us, all of us, Manticoran and Havenite, to decide which outcome we can achieve. And my own belief, ladies and gentlemen, is that we owe it not only to all the people who may die in the future, but to those who have already died, to all our dead, Manticoran, Grayson, Andermani, and Havenite, to choose the right outcome. Chapter 11 Good morning, Michael. 
the very black-skinned woman said from Rear Admiral Michael Overstegen's comm display. Morning, milady. Overstegen drawled and smiled slightly as her eyes narrowed. His chosen form of address was perfectly appropriate, even courteous, no matter how much he knew it irritated Vice Admiral Gloria Michelle Samantha Evelyn Hankey, Countess Goldpeak, especially in that upper-crust languid accent. Of course, the fact that she knew he knew it irritated her only made it even more amusing. Serves her right, he thought. All those years, she managed to avoid admitting she was only half a dozen or so heartbeats away from the throne. Not anymore, milady countess. It wasn't that Overstegen had anything other than the highest respect for Michelle Hankey. It was just that she'd always been so aggressive in stamping on anything that even looked like the operation of nepotism on her behalf. Oh, if she'd been incompetent, or even only marginally competent, he'd have agreed with her. The use of family influence in support of self-interest and mediocrity, or worse, was the single greatest weakness of an aristocratic system— and Overstegen had studied more than enough history to admit it. But every social system had weaknesses of one sort or another, and the Manticoran system was an aristocratic one. Making that system work required a recognition of social responsibility on the part of those at its apex, and Overstegen had no patience with those, like his own miserable excuse for an uncle, Michael Janvier, the Baron of High Ridge, who saw their lofty births solely in terms of their own advantage, but it also required the effective use of the advantages of birth and position to promote merit. To see to it that those who were capable of discharging their responsibilities and willing to do so received the preference to let them get on with it. He was willing to concede that the entire system disproportionately favored those who enjoyed the patronage and family influence in question, and that was unfortunate. One of those weaknesses every system had— but he wasn't going to pretend he didn't see those advantages as a rightful possession of those who met their obligations under it, including, especially, the enormous obligation to see to it that those advantages were employed on behalf of others, in support of the entire society which provided them, not simply for their own personal benefit, or the sort of short-sighted class selfishness of which aristocrats like his uncle, or, for that matter, his own father, were altogether too often guilty. In particular, one of the responsibilities of any naval officer was to identify and groom his own successors, and Overstegen saw no reason he shouldn't use his influence to nurture the careers of capable subordinates, be they ever so commonly born. It wasn't as if being born into the aristocracy magically guaranteed some sort of innate superiority— and one of the greater strengths of the Manticoran system from its inception had been the relative ease with which capable commoners could find themselves elevated to its aristocracy. Mike ought to recognize that if anyone does, he reflected, given that her best friend in the galaxy is also the most spectacular example I can think of of how it works. When it works, of course. Be fair, Michael. It doesn't always, and you know it as well as Mike does. What can I do for you this fine morning? He inquired genially, and she shook her head at him. I was going to invite you to observe a little command simulation over here aboard Artie in a couple of days, she said, using the nickname which had been bestowed upon HMS Artemis by her flagship's crew. But given how feisty you're obviously feeling, I've changed my mind. Instead, she smiled nastily. I think you'd better join me for lunch so we can discuss the Defender's role. You've just inspired me to let you play System Defense Force CO in our little exercise instead of Shulamit. I'd hate to be quoted on this, milady, but that sounds just a mite... I don't know... vengeful, perhaps? Why, yes, I believe it does, Admiral Overstegen... And speaking as one decadent, effete aristocrat to another, isn't vengefulness one of our hallmark traits? I believe it is, he agreed with a chuckle. I'm glad it amuses you, Admiral, she said cheerfully. And I hope you'll go right on feeling equally amused when it turns out the other side has Mark 23's too this time. Why do I have the impression you just this minute decided to add that particular wrinkle to the sim, milady? 
because you have a nasty, suspicious mind and know me entirely too well. But look at it this way. It's bound to be a very enlightening experience for you. She smiled sweetly at him. I'll expect you at 0130, Admiral. Don't be late. Michelle terminated the connection and tipped back in her flag bridge chair, shaking her head wryly. Are you really going to give the aggressor force Mark 23s, ma'am? A voice asked, and Michelle looked over her shoulder at Captain Cynthia Lecter, 10th Fleet's chief of staff. I'm not only going to give the op force Mark 23, Cindy, she said with a wicked smile. I'm probably going to give it Apollo, too. Lecter winced. The current iteration of the Mark 23 multi-drive missile carried the most destructive warhead in service with any Navy, and it carried it farther and faster than any missile in service with any Navy outside what was still called the Haven Sector. That was a sufficiently significant advantage for most people to be going on with, she supposed, but when the faster-than-light command and control link of the Apollo system was incorporated into the mix, the combination went far beyond simply devastating. You don't think that might be a little bit of overkill, ma'am? The chief of staff asked after a moment. I certainly hope it will, Michelle replied tartly. He deserves worse, actually. Well, maybe not deserves, but I can't think of a word that comes closer. Besides, it'll be good for him. Put a little hiccup in that unbroken string of 4 simulations he's reeled off since he got here. After all, she finished, lifting her nose with a slight but audible sniff, it's one of a commanding officer's responsibilities to remind her subordinates from time to time of their own mortality. You manage to sound so virtuous when you say that, ma'am, Lecter observed. And you can actually keep a straight face, too. I think that's even more remarkable. Why, thank you, Captain Lecter, Michelle beamed benignly and raised one hand in a gesture of blessing which would have done her distant cousin Robert Telmachy, the Archbishop of Manticore, proud. And now, why don't you sit down with Dominica, Max, and Bill to see just how devious the three of you can be in putting all of those unfair advantages into effect? Aye, aye, ma'am, Lecter acknowledged, and headed off towards the tactical section, where Commander Dominica Adenauer was discussing something with Lieutenant Commander Maxwell Tersteeg, Michelle's staff electronic warfare officer. Michelle watched her go, and wondered if Cindy had figured out the other reason she was thinking about giving the Op Force Apollo. They weren't going to find a more capable system defense CO than Michael Overstegen, and she badly wanted to see how well the Royal Manticoran Navy's Apollo, in the hands of one Vice Admiral Goldpeak and her staff, could do, while someone with all the Royal Manticoran Navy's warfighting technology short of Apollo pulled out all the stops against her. Her own smile faded at the thought. None of her ships currently had Apollo, nor did they have the Keyhole 2 platforms to make use of the FTL telemetry link, even if they'd had the Apollo birds themselves. But unless she missed her guess, that was going to change very soon now. I hope to hell it is anyway, she reflected grimly. And when it does, we damned well better have figured out how to use it as effectively as possible. That bastard Bing may have been a complete and utter incompetent, as well as an asshole, but not all Sollies can be that idiotic. She settled back, contemplating the main plot with eyes that didn't see it at all while she reflected on the last three tea months. Somehow, when she'd just been setting out on her naval career, it had never occurred to her she might find herself in a situation like this one. Even now, it seemed impossible that so much could have happened in so short a period, and she wished she knew more about what was going on back home. Be glad of what you do know, girl, she told herself sternly. At least Beth approved of your actions. Cousin or not, she could have recalled you as the sacrificial goat. In fact, I'm sure a lot of people think that's exactly what she should have done. The four-week communications loop between the Spindle System, the capital of the newly organized Talbot Quadrant of the Star Empire of Manticore, and the Manticoran Binary System was the kind of communications delay any interstellar naval officer had to learn to live with. It was also the reason most successful navies simply assumed flag officers on distant stations were going to have to make their own decisions. There just wasn't time for them to communicate with their governments, 
even though everyone recognized that the decisions they made might have significant consequences for their star nation's foreign policy. But however well-established that state of affairs might be, the potential consequences for Michelle Hankey this time around were rather more significant than usual. More significant than usual. My, what a fine euphemistic turn of phrase, Mike, she thought sourly. It didn't seem possible that it was one day short of two months since she'd destroyed a Solarian League battlecruiser with all hands. She hadn't wanted to do it, but Admiral Joseph Bing hadn't left her much in the way of options. And if she was going to be honest, a part of her was intensely satisfied that the drooling idiot hadn't. If he'd been reasonable, if he'd had a single functioning brain cell and he'd stood down his ships, as she'd demanded, until the events of the so-called First Battle of New Tuscany could be adequately investigated, he and his flagship's entire crew would still be alive, and that satisfied part of her would have considered that a suboptimal outcome. The arrogant bastard had slaughtered every man and woman aboard three of Michelle's destroyers without so much as calling on them to surrender first, and she wasn't going to pretend, especially to herself, that she was sorry he'd paid the price for all those murders. The disciplined professional flag officer in her would have preferred for him and his flagship's crew to be alive, and she tried hard to achieve that outcome, but only because no sane Queen's officer wanted to contemplate the prospect of a genuine war against the Solarian League, especially not while the war against Haven was still unresolved. But Elizabeth, Baron Grantville, Earl Whitehaven, and Sir Thomas Caparelli had all approved her actions in the strongest possible language. She suspected that at least some of that approval's firmness had been intended for public consumption, both at home in Manticore and in the Solarian League. Word of the battle, accompanied by at least excerpts of Elizabeth's official dispatch to her, approving her actions, had reached Old Terra herself via the Beowulf terminus of the Manticoran Wormhole Junction a month ago now. Michelle had no doubt Elizabeth, William Alexander, and Sir Anthony Langtry had given careful thought to how best to break the news to the Sollies. Unfortunately, best didn't necessarily equate to a good way to tell them. In fact, Michelle had direct evidence that they weren't even remotely the same thing. The first wave of Solarian newsies had reached Spindle via the junction nine days earlier, and they'd arrived in a feeding frenzy. Although Michelle herself had managed to avoid them by taking refuge in her genuine responsibilities as 10th Fleet's commanding officer. She'd retreated to her orbiting flagship and hidden behind operational security, and several hundred kilometers of airless vacuum and Artemis's marine detachment to keep the pack from pursuing her. Augustus Kumalo, Baroness Medusa, Prime Minister Alcazar, and Minister of War Kreitzman had been less fortunate in that regard. Michelle might have been forced to put in appearances at no less than four formal news conferences, but her military and political superiors found themselves under continual siege by Solarian reporters who verged from the incredulous to the indignant to the outraged and didn't seem particularly concerned about who knew it. From her own daily briefings, it was evident that the flow of newsies, Manticoran as well as Solarian, was only growing. And just to make her happiness complete— the insufferable gadflies were bringing their own reports of the Solarian League's reaction to what had happened along with them. Well, the old Terran reaction, at least, she corrected herself. But the version of the truth expounded on old Terra, and the reaction to it on old Terra, always played a hugely disproportionate part in the League's policies. And it was evident that old Terra and the deeply entrenched bureaucracies headquartered there were not reacting well. She reminded herself that all of her information about events on the League's capital world was at least three tea weeks old. She supposed it was remotely possible something resembling sanity had actually reared its ugly head by now, and she just hadn't heard about it yet. But as of the last statements by Prime Minister Guley, Foreign Minister Roelas y Valiente, and Defense Minister Takitomo, which had so far reached Spindle, the League's official position was that it was awaiting independent confirmation of the Star Empire of Manticore's very serious allegations, and considering appropriate responses to the Royal Manticoran Navy's destruction of SLNS Jean Bart and her entire crew.
While Roelas y Valiente had deeply deplored any loss of life suffered in the first alleged incident between units of the Solarian League Navy and the Royal Manticoran Navy in the neutral system of New Tuscany, his government had, of course, been unable to make any formal response to the Star Empire's protest and demand for explanations at that time. The Solarian League would equally, of course, respond appropriately as soon as there'd been time for reliable and impartial reports of both the alleged incidents to reach Old Terra. In the meantime, the Solarian League sincerely regretted its inability to respond directly to the purported facts of the alleged incidents. And however deeply the foreign minister might have deplored any loss of life, he'd been very careful to point out that even by Manticoran accounts, the Solarian League had lost far more lives than Manticore had, and that that Solarian loss of life had occurred only after what would appear to be the hasty response of a perhaps overly aggressive Manticoran flag officer to initial reports of a purported incident which had not at that time been independently confirmed for her. All of which had clearly amounted to telling the Star Empire to run along and play until the grown ups in the League had had an opportunity to find out what had really happened and decided upon appropriate penalties for the rambunctious children whose overly aggressive response was actually responsible for it. On the surface, waiting for independent confirmation sounded very judicial and correct, but Michelle, unlike the vast number of Solarians, listening to the public statements of the men and women who theoretically governed them, knew the League government already had Evelyn Sigby's official report on what had happened in both the New Tuscany incidents. The fact that the people who supposedly ran that government were still referring to what they knew from their own flag officer's report was the truth as allegations was scarcely encouraging. And the fact that they were considering appropriate responses to Jean Bart's destruction by an overly aggressive Manticoran flag officer, and not addressing even the possibility of appropriate responses to Joseph Bing's murder of three Manticoran destroyers and their entire ship's companies, struck her as even less promising. At the very least, as far as she could see, all of that was a depressing indication that the idiots calling the shots behind the smokescreen of their elected superiors were still treating this all as business as usual. And if that really was their attitude. At least the fact that Manticore was inside the Solly's communications loop meant Old Terra had found out about Admiral Bing's unexpected demise even before Lorcan Verrocchio had. In theory, at least, Verrocchio, as the Office of Frontier Security's commissioner in the Madras sector, was being superior, but pinning down exactly who was really in charge of what could get a bit slippery once the Sollies' dueling bureaucracies got into the act. That was always true, especially out here in The Verge, and from her own experience with Joseph Bing, it might be even truer than usual this time around. It was entirely possible that everything which had happened in New Tuscany, and even his decision to move his command there in the first place, had been his own half-assed idea. Which doesn't mean Verrocchio was exactly an innocent bystander, she reminded herself. He sure as hell wasn't last time around, anyway. And even if it was Albing's idea, this time, Verrocchio had to sign off on it under the Sollies' own regulations, officially at least. And then there's always the manpower connection, isn't there? She frowned and suppressed an almost overpowering temptation to gnaw on her fingernails. Her mother had always told her that was a particularly unbecoming nervous mannerism. More to the point, though, as far as Michelle was concerned, she doubted her staff and her flagship's officers would be especially reassured by the sight of their commanding officers sitting around chewing on her fingernails while she worried. That thought elicited a quiet snort of amusement, and she ran back through the timing. It was obvious Elizabeth had reacted as promptly and forcefully as Michelle had expected. Additional dispatches had arrived since her initial approval of Michelle's actions, along with the influx of journalists of every stripe and inclination, and it was evident to Michelle that very few people back home had appreciated the patronizing tone Roy Lassi Valiente and Goulet had adopted in the Solarian's so-called responses to Elizabeth's notes. She also doubted it had surprised anyone, however, since it was so infuriatingly typical of the League's arrogance. 
When the first of the Solarian news crews reached Spindle, it had been obvious there was already plenty of blood in the water as far as they were concerned, even though they'd headed out for the Talbot Quadrant before the League had gotten around to issuing a formal press release about what had happened to Jean Bart. They'd arrived armed with the Manticoran reports of events, but that wasn't the same thing by a long chalk and the Solarian accounts and editorials which had accompanied the follow-on wave that had departed after the official League statements, such as they were and what there was of them, were filled with mingled indignation, anger, outrage, and alarm, but didn't seem to contain very much in the way of reasoned response. Michelle knew it wasn't fair to expect anything else out of them, given the fact that all of this had come at them cold. Not yet, at any rate— and so far, none of the fact stories from the League which had reached Spindle had contained a single solid fact provided by any official Solarian source. Every official statement the Sully Newsies had to go on was coming from Manticore, and even without the ingrained arrogance the League's reporters shared in full with their fellow citizens, it wouldn't have been reasonable for them to accept the Manticoran version without a healthy dose of skepticism. At the same time, though, it seemed glaringly evident that the majority of the Sali media's talking heads and pundits were being fed carefully crafted leaks from inside the league bureaucracy and the SLN. Manticore's competing talking heads and pundits weren't being leaked additional information, but that was mainly because there was no need to. They were basing their analyses on the facts available in the public record, courtesy of the Star Empire of Manticore, which, unlike the Sali leaks, had the at least theoretical advantage of actually being the truth as well. Not that many of Altera's journalists and editorialists seemed aware of that minor distinction. It was all looking even messier than Michelle had feared it might, but at least the Manticoran version was being thoroughly aired, and for that matter, she knew the Manticoran version was actually spreading throughout the League faster than the so-called response emerging from old Chicago. The Star Empire's commanding position in the wormhole networks could move things other than cargo ships, she thought grimly. At the same time Elizabeth had dispatched her second diplomatic note to Old Terra, the Admiralty had issued an advisory to all Manticoran shipping, alerting the Star Empire's innumerable merchant skippers to the suddenly looming crisis. It would take weeks for that advisory to reach all of them, but given the geometry of the wormhole network, it was still likely it would reach almost all of them before instructions from the League reached the majority of its local naval commanders. And along with the open advisory for the Murchies, the same dispatch boats had carried secret instructions to every RMN station commander and the senior officer of every RMN escort force, and those instructions had been a formal war warning. Michelle devoutly hoped it was a warning about a war which would never move beyond the realm of unrealized possibility, but if it did, the Royal Manticoran Navy's officers' orders were clear. If they or any Manticoran merchant ship in their areas of responsibility were attacked, they were to respond with any level of force necessary to defeat that attack, no matter who the attackers might be. In the meantime, they were also instructed to expedite the return of Manticoran merchant shipping to Manticore-dominated space, despite the fact that the withdrawal of those merchant ships from their customary runs might well escalate the sense of crisis and confrontation. And, Michelle felt unhappily certain, office lights were burning late at Admiralty House while Thomas Caparelli and his colleagues worked on contingency plans, just in case the entire situation went straight to hell. For that matter, little though she cared for the thought, it was entirely possible the penny had officially dropped back home by now. But even if the Star Empire had received a formal response from the League, even if the League had announced it would pursue the military option instead of negotiating, Michelle hadn't heard anything about it yet. All of which meant she was still very much on her own, despite all the government's approval of her previous actions and assurances of its future support. She'd received at least some reinforcements. She'd short-stopped the four SELACs of Carrier Division 7.1 on her own authority when Rear Admiral Stephen Enderby turned up in Spindle. Enderby had expected to deliver his LACs to Prairie, Celebrant, and Nuncio, then head home for another load, and the LAC crews had expected nothing more challenging than a little piracy suppression. That, obviously, had changed. 
Enderby had been more than willing to accept his new orders, and his embarked lax had been busy practicing for a somewhat more demanding role. She expected her decision to retain them for Tenth Fleet to be approved, as soon as the official paperwork could catch up, and the arrival of another division of Saiganami Seas had been a pleasant surprise, in more ways than one, given its commanding officer. For that matter, still more weight of metal was in the pipeline, although the original plans for the Talbot Quadrant were still recovering from the shock of the Battle of Manticore. In a lot of ways, given Enderby's diversion, she was better off at the moment than she would have been under the initial plan, but that might turn out to be remarkably cold comfort if there was any truth to the New Tuscan's reports that major Solarian reinforcements had already been deployed to the Madras sector as well. Well, you've got orders for dealing with that too, don't you? She asked herself. Of course, they're basically to use your own discretion. It's nice to know the folks back home think so highly of your judgment, I suppose, but still. She inhaled deeply. Baroness Medusa, the Talbot Quadrant's imperial governor, had dispatched her own note directly to Myers, at the same time Michelle had departed for New Tuscany and Joseph Bing's date with several hundred laserheads. It must have reached Verrocchio two tea weeks ago, and she wondered what sort of response he'd made. You'll be finding out soon enough, girl, she told herself grimly. But even if he dashed off a response the instant reprise got there with O'Shaughnessy, it couldn't get back here for another tea week. And one thing solid bureaucrats aren't is impetuous about putting their necks on any potential chopping blocks. So even if he didn't have a thing to do with anything that's happened, however unlikely that is, I doubt he's going to have been a lot faster out of the blocks than Roela y Valiente was. She remembered the old proverb that said, Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It was remarkably little comfort at the moment. She had absolute confidence in her command's ability to defeat any attack Frontier Fleet might launch against Spindle. They'd have to transfer in scores of additional battle cruisers if they hoped to have any chance against her own Nikes, Saganami Seas, Enderby Sealax, and the flat pack missile pods aboard her ammunition ships. In fact, she doubted Frontier Fleet had enough battlecruisers anywhere this side of Sol itself to take Spindle, even if they could send every one of them to call on her, and battlecruisers were the heaviest ships Frontier Fleet had. But Battle Fleet was another matter, and if the new Tuscans had been right about Solly's super dreadnoughts at Macintosh. She gave an internal headshake and scolded herself once again. If there were Solly ships of the wall in the vicinity, she'd just have to deal with that when she got confirmation, which, of course, was one reason she'd assigned Overstegen to defend against Mark 23s. She might relent and pull Apollo back out of the equation, but she doubted it, because the purpose wasn't really to smack Michael, no matter how much he deserved it for being such a smartass, and no matter how much she would enjoy doing exactly that, for that matter. No, the purpose was to force one of the best tacticians she knew to pull out all the stops in defense of the spindle system. Seeing how well her own staff did against a truly capable Mark 23-equipped opponent would have been desirable enough in its own right, yet that was actually secondary as far as she was concerned. She was confident of her own tactical ability, but there was always something new for even the best tactician to learn, and Michelle Hankey had never been too proud to admit that. She'd be watching Rear Admiral Overstegen closely, and not just to evaluate his performance. If he came up with something that suggested tactical wrinkles to her, she'd pounce on them in a heartbeat, because she might need them altogether too soon, and badly. Chapter 12 May I help you, Lieutenant? The exquisitely tailored Mater D didn't sound as if he really expected to be able to assist two such junior officers, who'd undoubtedly strayed into his establishment by mistake. Oh, yes, please. We're here to join Lieutenant Archer, Abigail Hearns told him. Um, we may be a few minutes early, I'm afraid. She managed, Ensign Helen Zilwicky observed, to sound very earnest. 
possibly even a little nervous at intruding into such elegant surroundings, but very determined. And the fact that her father could have bought the entire Sigourney's Fine Restaurant's chain out of pocket change wasn't particularly in evidence either. The fact that she was third-generation prolong and looked considerably younger than her already very young age, especially to eyes not yet accustomed to the latest generations of prolong, undoubtedly helped. Yet she clearly possessed a fair degree of thespian talent as well. The maitre d' was obviously convinced she'd escaped from a high school, probably a lower-class high school, given her soft, slow grace and accent, for the afternoon at least. His expression of politely sophisticated attentiveness didn't actually change a millimeter, but Helen had the distinct impression of an internal wince. Ah, Lieutenant Archer, he repeated. Of course, if you'll come this way, please. He set sail across the intimately lit main dining room sea of linen-draped tables, and Abigail and Helen bobbed along in his wake like a pair of dinghies. They crossed to a low archway on the opposite side of the big room, then followed him down two shallow steps into a dining room with quite a different, though no less expensive, flavor. The floor had turned into artfully worn bricks. The walls, also of brick, had a rough, deliberately unfinished look, and the ceiling was supported by heavy wooden beams. Well, by what looked like wooden beams, Helen thought, although they probably weren't all that impressive to someone like Abigail, who'd grown up in a thoroughly renovated medieval pile of stone over 600 years old, one which really did have massive age-blackened beams, a front gate fit to sneer at battering rams, converted firing slits for windows, and fireplaces the size of a destroyer's boat bay. Two people were seated at one of the dark wooden tables, one of them, a snub-nosed, green-eyed officer in the uniform of a Royal Manticoran Navy lieutenant, looked up and waved as he saw them. His companion, a stunningly attractive blonde, turned her head when he waved and smiled as she, too, saw the newcomers. Thank you, Abigail told the maitre d' politely, and he murmured something back, then turned and departed with what in less eminent personage might have been described as relieved haste. You know... Abigail said as she and Helen crossed to the table. You really should be ashamed of the way you deliberately offend that poor man's sensibilities, Gwen. Personally, Helen was reminded rather forcefully of the old saying about pots and kettles, given Abigail's simpering performance for the same maitre d', but she nobly forbore saying so. Me? Lieutenant Gervais went in Irwin Neville Archer's expression was one of utter innocence. How could you possibly suggest such a thing, Miss Owens? Because I know you? Is it my fault nobody on this restaurant's entire staff has bothered to inquire into the exalted pedigrees of its patrons? Gervais demanded. If you're going to blame anyone, blame her. He pointed across the table at the blonde, who promptly smacked the offending hand. It's not polite to point, she told him in a buzzsaw-like accent. Even we brutish lower-class Dresdeners know that much. Maybe not, but that doesn't make it untrue, does it? He shot back. I didn't say it did. Helga Boltitz, Defense Minister Henry Kreitzman's personal aide, replied and smiled at the newcomers. Hello, Abigail, and you too, Ellen. Hi, Helga, Abigail responded, and Helen nodded her own acknowledgement of the greeting as she seated herself beside Helga. Abigail settled into the remaining chair, facing Helen across the table, and looked up as their waiter appeared. He took their drink orders, handed them menus, and disappeared, and she cocked her head at Gervais as she opened the elegant two-centimeter-thick binder. Helga may have put you up to it, and I can't say I blame her, she said. This has to be the snootiest restaurant I've ever eaten in, and trust me, Daddy's taken me to some really snooty places not to mention the way they fawn over a steadholder or his family. But you're the one who's taking such a perverse enjoyment over thinking about how these people are going to react when they find out the truth. What truth would that be? Gervais inquired more innocently yet. You mean the fact that I'm a cousin, of some sort anyway, of the Queen, or that Eleanor's sister is the Queen of Torch? 
Or that your own humble father is Stedholder Owens? That's exactly what she means, you twit, Helga told him, blue eyes glinting with amusement, and leaned across the table to whack him gently on the head. And much as I'm going to enjoy it when they do find out, don't think I don't remember how you did exactly the same thing to me. I never misled you in any way, he said virtuously. Oh, no? If I hadn't looked you up in Clark's peerage, you never would have told me, would you? Oh, I imagine I'd have gotten around to it eventually, he said, and his voice was considerably softer than it had been. He smiled at her, and she smiled back, gave his right hand a pat where it lay on the table between them, then settled back in her chair. If anyone had suggested to Helga Boltitz eight months ago that she might find herself comfortable with, or actually liking, someone from a background of wealth and privilege, she would have laughed. The idea that someone from Dresden, that sinkhole of hard scrabble, lower class, grub for a living poverty, could have anything in common with someone from such stratospheric origins would have been ludicrous. And, if she were going to be honest, that was still true where the majority of the Talbot Quadrant's homegrown oligarchs were concerned. More than that, she felt entirely confident she was going to run into Manticorans who were just as arrogant and supercilious as she'd always imagined they'd be. But Gervais Archer had challenged her preconceptions, gently but also firmly, and in the process convinced her that there were at least some exceptions to the rule which explained how she found herself sitting at this table in such monumentally well-connected company. Personally, Helen said, my only regret is that I probably won't be here when they do find out. At 21, she was the youngest of the quartet, as well as the most junior in rank. And she was also the non-Dresdener who came closest to sharing Helga's attitudes where aristocrats and oligarchs were concerned. Not surprisingly, given the fact that she'd been born on Griffin and raised by a Griffin Highlander, who'd proceeded to take up with the closest thing to a rabble-rousing anarchist the Manticoran peerage had ever produced when Helen was barely 13 years old. If you really want to see their reaction, I suppose you could tell them yourself this afternoon, Abigail pointed out. Oh, no way, Helen chuckled. I might want to be here to see it, but the longer it takes them to figure it out, the more irritated they're going to be when they finally do. Abigail shook her head. She'd spent more time on Manticore than she had back home on Grayson over the last nine or ten T years, but despite the undeniable, mischievous enjoyment she'd felt when dissembling for the Mater D, there were times when she still found her Manticoran friend's attitude towards their own aristocracy peculiar. As Gervais had pointed out, her father was a stedholder, and the deepest longings of the most hard-boiled member of Manticore's conservative association were but pale shadows of the reality of a stedholder's authority within his steading. The term absolute monarch fell comfortably short of that reality, although supreme autocrat was probably headed in the right direction. As a result of her own birth and childhood, she had remarkably few illusions about the foibles and shortcomings of the nobly born. Yet she was also the product of a harsh and unforgiving planet and a profoundly traditional society, one whose deference and rules of behavior were based deep in the bedrock of survival's imperatives. She still found the irreverent, almost fondly mocking attitude of so many Manticorans towards their own aristocracy unsettling. In that respect, she was even more like Helga than Helen was, she thought. Hostility, antagonism, even hatred, though she could understand, when those born to positions of power abuse that power rather than meeting its responsibilities. The sort of self-deprecating amusement someone like Gwen Archer displayed, on the other hand, didn't fit itself comfortably into her own core concepts, even though she'd seen exactly the same attitude out of dozens of other Manticorans who were at least as well-born as he was. I guess you can take the girl off of Grayson, but you can't take the Grayson out of the girl, she thought. It wasn't the first time that thought had crossed her mind. And it won't be the last, either, she reflected tartly. She started to say something else, then paused as their drinks arrived and the waiter took their orders.
He disappeared once more, and she sipped iced tea, something she'd had trouble finding in Mantikoran restaurants, then lowered her glass. Leaving aside the ignoble, although I'll grant you entertaining contemplation of the coronaries certain to follow the discovery of our despicable charade, I shall now turn this conversation in a more sober-minded and serious direction. Good luck with that, Helen murmured. As I was about to ask, Abigail continued, giving her younger friend a ferocious glare, How are things going dirtside, Helga? As frantically as ever, Helga grimaced, took a sip from her own beer stein, then sighed. I guess it's inevitable. Unfortunately, it's only going to get worse. I don't think anyone in the entire quadrant's ever seen this many dispatch boats in orbit around a single planet before. All three of her listeners grimaced back at her in understanding. I don't suppose we can really blame them, she went on. Even if I do want to shoot the next newsy I see on sight. But exactly how they expect Minister Kreitzman to get anything done when they keep hounding him for statements and background interviews is more than I can imagine. One of the less pleasant consequences of an open society, Gervais said, rather more philosophically than he felt. Exactly, Abigail agreed, then smiled unpleasantly. Although I'd like to see the newsy back home on Grayson who thought he could get away with hounding Daddy. Well, fair's fair, Helen said judiciously. They all looked at her, and she shrugged. Maybe it's because I've spent so much time watching Kathy Montaigne maneuver back home, but it occurs to me that having Thimble crawling with nosies may be the best thing that could happen. Just how do you mean that? Gervais asked. In the wrong tone, the question could have been dismissive, especially given the difference in their ages and relative seniority. As it was, he sounded genuinely curious, and she shrugged again. Politics is all about perceptions and understandings. I realize Kathy's mainly involved in domestic politics right now, but the same basic principle applies in interstellar diplomacy. If you control the terms of the debate, the advantage is all on your side. You can't make somebody on the other side make the decision you want. But you've got a much better chance of gating her to do that if she's got to defend her position in the public mind instead of you having to defend your position. Controlling the information, and especially the public perception of that information, is one of the best ways to limit her options to the ones most favorable to your own needs. Don't forget, if the Sollies want a formal declaration of war, all it takes is one veto by a full member star system to stop them. That's a pretty significant prize for a PR campaign to go after. And at the moment, the way we want to control the debate is simply to tell the truth about what happened at New Tuscany, right? Gervais nodded, and she shrugged a third time. Well, if all the newsies in the universe are here in Spindle getting our side of the story looking at the sensor data we've released and interviewing our people, that's what's going to be being reported back on Altera. They can try to spin it any way they want, but the basic message getting sent back to all those Sollies, even by their own newsies, is going to be built on what they're finding out out here from us. That's more or less what Minister Kreitzman says, Helga admitted although he's prone to use some pretty colorful adjectives to describe the newsies in question. I think Lady Goldpeak would agree, too, even if she is doing her dead-level best to stay as far away from them as possible, Gervais said, and Abigail and Helen nodded. As Michelle Hankey's flag lieutenant, he was in a far better position to form that kind of judgment than either of them were. What about Sir Ivers? Helga asked. Helen, who was Sir Ivar's Terakov's flag lieutenant, raised both eyebrows at her, and Helga snorted. He may be only a Commodore, Ellen, but everybody in the quadrant knows how long he spent in the diplomatic service before he went back into uniform. Besides, Mr. Van Dort and the rest of the Prime Minister's cabinet all have enormous respect for him. We haven't actually discussed it, Helen replied after a moment. On the other hand, 
He's passed up at least half a dozen opportunities I can think of to hide aboard the Jimmy Boy to avoid interviews. So I'd say he was doing his bit to shape public opinion. Gervaise grinned as she used the crew's nickname for HMS Quentin St. James. The brand new Saganami C Class heavy cruiser had been in commission for barely five months, yet she'd had her official nickname almost before the commissioning ceremonies concluded. Most ships wouldn't have managed the transition that quickly, but in Quentin St. James's case, things were a bit different. Her name was on the RMN's list of honor, to be kept in permanent commission, and the nickname was the same one which had been applied to the first Quentin St. James the better part of two tea centuries ago. And if Jimmy Boy was a youngster, she was scarcely alone in that. In fact, aside from Admiral Kumalo's ancient super-dreadnought flagship Hercules, there wasn't a single ship heavier than a light cruiser in Admiral Goldpeak's 10th Fleet, which was even a full year old yet. Indeed, most of the destroyers were no older than Quentin St. James and her sisters. Well, Helga said after a moment, I imagine the minister will go right on doing his bit, too. Don't expect him to like it, though. Some things are more likely than others, Helen agreed. Then she snorted. What? Abigail asked. Nothing. Abigail looked skeptical, and Helen chuckled. All right. I was just thinking about how the first newsie to shove his microphone in Daddy's face would make out. I'm sure Daddy would be sorry afterwards. He'd probably even insist on paying the medical bills himself. I wondered where you got that physically violent disposition of yours, Gervais said blandly. I am not physically violent. Oh, no. He did his best to look down his longitude-challenged nose at her. You may recall that I was sent over to Quentin St. James with that note from Lady Goldpeak to the Commodore last week. She looked at him suspiciously, then nodded. Well, I just happened to wander by the gym while I was there, and I saw you throwing people around the mat with gay abandon. I wasn't, she protested with a gurgle of laughter. You most certainly were. One of your henchmen told me you were using something called the Flying Mare's Warhammer of Doom, Destruction, and Despair. Called the what? Helga looked at Helen in disbelief. It's not called any such thing and you know it, Helen accused, doing her best to glare at Gervais. I don't know about that, he said virtuously. That's what I was told it was called. Okay, Abigail said. Now you've got to tell us what it's really called, Helen. The way he's mangled it, even I don't know which one it was. Well, try to sort it out. I'm guessing, and that's all it is you understand, that it was probably a combination of the flying mare, the hand hammer, and maybe the scythe of destruction. And that's supposed to be better than what he just said? Abigail looked at her in disbelief. Abigail herself had become proficient in coup de vitesse, but she'd never trained in Helen's chosen Neue Stil Handgemenge. Coup de vitesse doesn't even have names for most of its moves, but if it did, it wouldn't have those. Look, don't blame me, Helen replied. The people who worked this stuff out in the first place named the moves, not me. According to Master Tai, they were influenced by some old entertainment recordings, something called movies. Oh, Tester, Abigail shook her head. Forget I said a thing. What? Helen looked confused and Abigail snorted. Up until Lady Harrington did some research back home in Manticore, I think she even queried the library computers in Beowulf and on Old Terra, as a matter of fact. Nobody on Grayson had ever actually seen the movies our ancestors apparently based their notions of swordplay on. Now, unfortunately, we have. And fairness requires that I admit most of the samurai movies were at least as silly as anything the Neue Stil people could have been watching. Well, my ancestors certainly never indulged in anything that foolish, Gervais said with an air of unbearable superiority. What a bet, Abigail inquired with a dangerous smile. Why, he asked distrustfully. 
Because, if I remember correctly, your ancestors came from old North America, from the Western Hemisphere at least, just like mine did. And? And, while Lady Harrington was doing her research on samurai movies, she got some cross-hits to something called cowboy movies, so she brought them along too. In fact, she got her uncle and his friends in the SCA involved in putting together a movie festival in Harrington Steading. Quite a few of those movies were made in a place called Hollywood, which also happens to have been in old North America. Some of them were actually darned good, but others... She shuddered. Trust me, your ancestors and mine apparently had erratic artistic standards, let's say. That's all very interesting, I'm sure, Gervais said briskly. But it's leading us astray from the truly important focus we ought to be maintaining on current events. In other words, Helga told Abigail, he's losing the argument, so he's changing the rules. Maybe he is, Helen said. No, scratch that. He definitely is. Still, he may have a point. It's not like any of us are going to be in a position to make any earth-shattering decisions, but between us, we're working for several people who will be. Under the circumstances, I don't think it would hurt a bit for us to share notes. Nothing confidential, but the kind of general background stuff that might let me answer one of the Commodore's questions without his having to get hold of someone in Minister Kreitzman's office or someone on Lady Goldpeak's staff, for instance. That's actually a very good point, Gervais said, much more seriously, nodding at her in approval, and she felt a glow of satisfaction. She was preposterously young and junior for her current assignment, but at least she seemed to be figuring out how to make herself useful. I agree, Abigail said, although as the tactical officer aboard one of the new Roland-class destroyers, she was the only person at the table who wasn't a flag lieutenant or someone's personal aide, and gave Helen a smile. Well, in that case, Gervais said, have you guys heard about what Lady Goldpeak is planning to do to Admiral Overstegen? It's time, Admiral, Felicidad Kolstad said. I know, Admiral Topolev of the Mason Alignment Navy replied. He sat once more upon MANS Mako's flag bridge. Beyond the flagship's hull, 14 more ships of Task Group 1.1 kept perfect formation upon her, and the brilliant beacon of Manticore A blazed before them. They were only one light week from that star now, and they decelerated to only 20% of light speed. This was the point for which they'd been headed ever since leaving Mesa, four T months before. Now it was time to do what they'd come here to do. Begin deployment, he said, and the enormous hatches opened and the pods began to spill free. The six units of Task Group 1.2 were elsewhere, under Rear Admiral Lydia Popnikitas, closing on Manticore B. They wouldn't be deploying their pods just yet, not until they'd reached their own pre-selected launch point. Topolev wished he'd had more ships to commit to that prong of the attack, but the decision to move up Oyster Bay had dictated the available resources, and this prong had to be decisive. Besides, there were fewer targets in the Manticore B subsystem anyway, and the planners had had to come up with the eight additional Shark-class ships for Admiral Colenso's Task Group 2.1's Grayson operation from somewhere. It'll be enough, he told himself, watching as the pods disappeared steadily behind his decelerating starships, vanishing into the endless dark between the stars. It'll be enough, and in about five weeks, the Mantis are going to get a late Christmas present they'll never forget. Chapter 13 Audrey O'Hanrahan reached for the acceptance key as her comm played the 1812 overture. She especially liked the version she'd used for her attention signal, which had been recorded using real, if exceedingly archaic, canon. She had a fondness for archaisms. In fact, she was a member of the Society for Creative Anachronisms here in Old Chicago. 
Besides, the exuberance of her chosen attention signal suited her persona as one of the Solarian League's foremost muckraking journalists. Investigative journalism of the bare-knuckled, no-holds-barred, take-no-prisoner style O'Hanrahan practiced was considerably less lucrative than other possible media careers, or at least it was for serious journalists. There was always a market for the sensationalist investigative reporter who was willing to shoulder the task of providing an incredibly jaded public with fresh, outrageous titillation. O'Hanrahan, however, had always avoided that particular branch of the human race's third oldest profession. The daughter and granddaughter of respected journalists, she'd proven she took her own repertorial responsibilities seriously from the very beginning, and she'd quickly gained a reputation as one of those rare birds, a newsie whose sources were always rock solid, who genuinely attempted to cover her stories fairly, and who never backed away from a fight. She'd picked a lot of those fights with the cheerfulness of a David singling out Goliaths, and she'd always been an equal opportunity stone slinger. Her pieces had skewered the bureaucratic reality behind the representative facade of the Solarian League for years, and she'd never hesitated to denounce the sweetheart deals the Office of Frontier Security was fond of cutting with Solarian transstellars. Just to be fair, she'd done more than a few stories about the close and lucrative connections so many senior members of the Renaissance Association maintained, with the very power structure it was officially so devoted to reforming from the ground up as well. And she'd done a series on the supposedly outlawed genetic slave trade, which was so devastating, and had named enough specific names, that there were persistent rumors manpower had put a sizable bounty on her head. She'd also been one of the first Solarian journalists to report the Manticoran allegations of what had happened at Monica, and although she was no Manticoran apologist, she'd made it clear to her viewers and readers that the waters in Monica were very murky indeed. And as Amandine Corvisart showed the Solarian news media the overwhelming evidence of manpower's and Technodyne's involvement, she'd reported that too. The Solarian establishment hadn't exactly lined up to thank her for her efforts, but that was all right with O'Hanrahan and her producers. She was only 53 T years old, a mere babe in a prolonged society, and if the market for old-fashioned investigative reporting was limited, it still existed. In fact, even a relatively small niche market in the League's media amounted to literally billions of subscribers— and O'Hanrahan's hard-earned reputation for integrity meant that, despite her relative youth, she stood at the very apex of her particular niche. Not only that, but even those members of the establishment who most disliked her habit of turning over rocks they'd prefer remained safely mired in the mud paid attention to what she said. They knew as well as anyone else that if they read it in an O'Hanrahan article— or viewed it in an O'Hanrahan cast, it was going to be as accurate and as thoroughly verified as was humanly possible. She'd made occasional mistakes, but they could have been easily counted on the fingers of one hand, and she'd always been quick to admit them and to correct them as promptly as possible. Now, as she touched the acceptance key, the image of a man sprang into life in the hollow display above her desk, and she frowned. Baltazar Juppé was scarcely one of her muckraking colleagues. He was nine or ten T years older than she was, and influential in his own way, as a financial analyst and reporter. It was a specialist's beat, in many ways as specialized a niche as O'Hanrahan's, if larger, and it was just as well Juppé's audience was so focused. Human prejudice was still human prejudice— which meant people automatically extended more respect and benefit of the doubt to those fortunate souls who were physically attractive, especially when they had intelligence and charisma to go with that attractiveness. And where O'Hanrahan was auburn-haired, with crystal blue eyes, elegant bone structure, a graceful carriage, and an understated but rich figure, Juppé's brown hair always hovered on the edge of going out of control— his brown eyes were muddy, and he was, at best, pleasantly ugly. Although they ran into one another occasionally, they were hardly what one could have called boon companions. They belonged to many of the same professional organizations, and they often found themselves covering the same story, if from very different perspectives, 
Given the corruption and graft, which gathered like cesspool silt wherever the League's financial structure intersected with the permanent bureaucracies. For example, they'd both covered the Monica story, although Juppé had scarcely shared O'Hanrahan's take on the incident. Of course, he'd always been a vocal critic of the extent to which Manticore and its merchant marine had penetrated the League's economy. So it was probably inevitable that he'd be more skeptical of the Manticoran claims and evidence. Hi, Audrey, he said brightly, and her frown deepened. To what do I owe the putative pleasure of this conversation? She responded with a marked lack of enthusiasm. I'm hurt. He placed one hand on his chest, in the approximate region where most non-newsies kept their hearts, and concentrated on looking as innocent as he could. In fact, I'm devastated. I can't believe you're that unhappy to see me when I come bearing gifts. Isn't there a proverb about being wary of newsies bearing gifts? There probably is, except where you're concerned, he agreed cheerfully. And if there isn't one, there ought to be. But in this case, I really thought you'd like to know. Know what? She asked suspiciously. That I've finally gotten my hands on an independent account of what happened in New Tuscany, he replied. And his voice and expression alike were suddenly much more serious. You have? O'Hanrahan sat up straighter in her chair, blue eyes narrowing with undisguised suspicion. From where? From who? And why are you calling me about it? You really are a muckraker, aren't you? Juppé smiled crookedly. It hasn't hit the public channels yet, and it probably won't for at least another day or so, but as you know, I've got plenty of contacts in the business community. He paused, one eyebrow raised, until she nodded impatiently. Well, he continued then, those sources include one of the VPs for operations over at Brinks Fargo, and he just happened to mention to me that one of his dispatch boats, just in from Visigoth, had a somewhat different version of events in New Tuscany. From Visigoth? She repeated, then grimaced. You mean Mesa, don't you? Well, yeah, in a way, he acknowledged. Not in the way you mean, though. The way I mean? In the the miserable minions of those wretched Mason outlaw corporations, deliberately slanted and twisted sort of way. I don't automatically discount every single news report that comes out of Mesa, Baltazar. Maybe not automatically, but with remarkable consistency, he shot back. Which owes more to the self-serving, highly creative version of events the so-called Mason journalistic community presents with such depressing frequency than it does to any inherent unreasonableness on my part. I notice you're not all over the Green Pine story, and there's independent corroboration of that one, Juppé pointed out a bit nastily, and her blue eyes narrowed. There's been corroboration of the explosions for months, she retorted. And if you followed my stories, you'd know I covered them then. And for that matter, I suggested at the time that it was likely there was ballroom involvement. I still think that's probably the case, but I find it highly suspect and convenient for certain parties that the Masons' in-depth investigation has revealed, surprise, surprise, that a notorious Manticran operative was involved. She rolled her eyes. Give me a break, Baltazar. Well, Zilwicky may be from Manticore, but he's been in bed with the ballroom for years, literally since he took up with that Looney Tune rabble rouser Montagna, Juppé reposted. And don't forget, his daughter's queen of torch, plenty of room for him to have gone completely rogue there. Maybe if he was a complete lunatic, or just plain stupid enough to pull something like that, O'Hanrahan retorted. I checked his available public bio, including that in-depth report what's-his-name Underwood did on him as soon as Mesa's version hit the data channels. I'll admit the man's scary as hell if you go after someone he cares about, but he's no homicidal maniac. In fact, his more spectacular accomplishments all seem to have been defensive, not offensive. You come after him or his, and all bets are off. 
Otherwise, he's not especially bloodthirsty. And he's for damn sure smart enough to know what nuking a public park full of kids would do to public support for his daughter's new kingdom. For that matter, the whole damned galaxy knows what he'll do if someone goes after one of his kids. You really think someone with that kind of resume would sign off on killing hundreds or thousands of someone else's kids? She shook her head again. Which am I supposed to believe? The public record of someone like Zilwicky? Or the kind of self-serving, fabricated, made-up-out-of-whole-cloth kind of independent journalism that comes out of Mendel? From the look in her eye, it was evident which side of that contradiction she favored, even if a huge segment of the Solarian media had chosen the other one. While it was true the Solarian League's official position, as enunciated by education and information, refused to rush to judgment on the spectacular Mason claims that Manticore, or at least Manticoran proxies, had been behind the Green Pines' atrocity, Unnamed sources within the League bureaucracy had been far less circumspect, and O'Hanrahan and Juppé both knew exactly who those unnamed sources were. So did the rest of the League's media, which had been obediently baying on the appropriate trail of Manticoran involvement from day one. Which, as Juppé knew full well, had absolutely no bearing on O'Hanrahan's categorization of the original story. Much as I hate to admit it, given how much impact Mesa sometimes has on the business community here in the League, he said. I can't really argue with that characterization of a lot of what comes out of their newsies. Mind you, I really am less convinced than you seem to be that Anton Zilwicky's such a choir boy that he wouldn't be involved in something like Green Pines, but that's beside the point this time. He made a brushing aside gesture. This story isn't from Mesa, it's straight from New Tuscany. It only came through Mesa because that was the shortest route to Old Terra that didn't go through Manti-controlled space. O'Hanrahan cocked her head, her eyes boring into his. Are you seriously suggesting that whoever dispatched this mysterious story from New Tuscany was actually frightened of what the Manticorans might do if they found out about it? She demanded in obvious disbelief. As to that, I'm not the best witness. Juppé shrugged. I don't cover politics and the military and frontier security the way you do, except where they impinge on the financial markets. You and I both know a lot of the financial biggies are major players in OFS's private little preserves out in the verge, but my personal focus is a lot more on banking and the stock exchange, so I don't really have the background to evaluate this whole thing, but I do know that according to my friend and to the courier, they really, really wanted to avoid going through any manty wormholes. Why? Her eyes were narrower than ever, burning with intensity, and he shrugged again. Probably because this isn't really a story at all. It's a dispatch from someone in the New Tuscan government to one of his contacts here on Old Terra, and it's not for public release, not immediately at any rate. Then why send it? I tracked the courier down and asked that very question, as a matter of fact. Got the answer, too, for a price. He grimaced. Cost me the next best thing to five months' street money, too. And I hope like hell my editor's going to decide it was worth it instead of sticking my personal account for the charges. And to be honest, I don't think I'd have gotten it even then if the man hadn't been so unhappy with his boss's instructions. And why was he so unhappy? Her tone was skeptical. Because the person he's supposed to deliver it to is over at the Office of Naval Intelligence, but his immediate boss, somebody in the new Tuscan government, I couldn't get him to tell me who, but I figure it's got to be somebody from their security services, doesn't want the Navy to go public with it, Juppé said. They want it in official hands because it doesn't track with the Mantis version of the story, but they're asking the Navy to keep things quiet until Frontier Fleet can get reinforcements deployed to protect them from the Mantis. According to the Mantis, they don't have any big quarrel with New Tuscany, O'Hanrahan pointed out. They've never accused the New Tuscans of firing on their ships. I know, but like I say, this stuff doesn't match what Manticore's been saying. In fact, the courier let me copy what's supposed to be the New Tuscan Navy's raw sensor records of the initial incident. 
and according to those records, the Manti ships were not only light cruisers instead of destroyers, but they fired first before Admiral Bing opened fire on them. What? O'Hanrahan stared at Juppé, and the financial reporter looked back at her as she frowned in concentration. That's ridiculous, she said finally. The Mantis wouldn't be that stupid. Besides, what would be the point? Is this mysterious courier claiming the Mantis are crazy enough to deliberately provoke an incident with the Solarian Navy? As far as I know, he's not claiming anything one way or the other, Juppé replied. He's just delivering the dispatch and the scan records, and as I understand it, they are certified copies of the official data. He grimaced. Hell, maybe the Mantis have known all along that it was their man who screwed up, and they've been working on proving it was the League because they figure the only way to avoid getting hammered is to put the blame on the other side. Oh, sure. O'Hanrahan's irony was withering. I can just see someone in the Manti government being stupid enough to think they'd get away with something like that. I was just offering one possible theory, he pointed out. Still, I have to say that if there's any truth to Mesa's allegations about Zilwicky and Green Pines, the Mantis don't seem to be playing with a full deck these days. In fact, I think out of control might not be a bad way to describe them. And for that matter, weren't you one of the people who pointed out just how stupid, what's his name, High Bridge was in the lead up to this fresh war of theirs? That was High Ridge, she corrected but her tone was almost absent. She frowned again, clearly thinking hard, and then her eyes refocused, boring into his once more. I'm not about to jump at the first set of counter-allegations to come along, especially when they're coming from, through, at least, someplace like Mesa. So why bring this red-hot scoop to me? Her suspicion clearly hadn't abated in the least, and he shrugged yet again. Because I trust you, he said, and she blinked. Come again? Look, he said, you know me, and you know how it works. If this is an accurate report, if it's true, the Mantis position is going to go belly up as soon as it's verified, especially given what Mace is already saying about Green Pines. And if that happens, the markets are going to go crazy, or maybe I should say crazier, as soon as the implications for the Star Empire and its domination of the wormhole net sink in. I mean, let's face it. If the Mantis did fake the censored data they sent with their diplomatic note, if this is another instance of what the Havenites say they were doing all along under what's-his-name, and they've killed the entire crew of a Solarian battlecruiser when they know the original incident was their own fault, all hell's going to be out for noon— and Green Pines is only going to squirt more hydrogen into the fire. The SLN's going to pound their miserable little star nation into wreckage, and that's going to have enormous consequences where the wormholes are concerned. There'll be fortunes, large fortunes, to be made if something like that happens. And, she encouraged when he paused, and I'm an analyst, not just a reporter. If I peg this one right, if I'm the first one or one of the first two or three on the net to advise investors to dump Manti-backed securities and stock issues to reevaluate their positions in shipping, I'll make a killing. I'll admit it, that's what I'm thinking about. Well, that and the fact that it won't hurt my stature as a reporter one bit if people remember I'm the one who broke the story on the financial side. And, she demanded again, and I'm not equipped to evaluate it he admitted, displaying frustration of his own at last. Especially not given the fact that this one's got a strictly limited shelf life. Frontier Fleet's going to want to run its own evaluations and check it against what it got from the Mantis. We both know that. And then, if it holds up, the guys at the top are going to need to get together, decide whether or not they want to release it right away, or confront the Mantis with it privately. I guess they could go either way, but I'm willing to bet that as soon as they're confident the data's accurate, they'll go public, whatever the new Tuscans want. That doesn't give me a very wide window if I want to break it first. But in the meantime, 
I don't know whether or not to trust the info either, and if I do and I'm wrong, I'll be finished. You've got the background and the contacts to verify this one hell of a lot better than I can, and you've worked with most of them long enough that they'll keep their mouths shut until you break the story, if they know you're working on it. So what I'm offering here is a quid pro quo. I've got my copy of the original message and of the sensor data. I'm prepared to hand it over to you, to share it with you, and to share credit for breaking the story if it turns out there's something to it. What do you say? Audrey O'Hanrahan regarded him intently for several endless seconds, and it was obvious what she was thinking behind her frown. As he himself had said, it wasn't as if either of them didn't know how the game was played. The old saw about scratching one another's backs was well known among journalists, and Juppé's offer actually made a lot of sense. As he said, he didn't begin to have the sources she did when it came to verifying something like this. All right, she said finally. I'm not going to make any commitments before I've actually seen the stuff. Send it over and I'll take a look, and if it looks to me like there might be something to it, I'll run it by some people I know and get back to you. Get back to me before you go public with it, you mean, right? You've got my word I won't break the story, assuming there is a story, without talking to you first. And, she added in a more grudging tone, I'll coordinate with you. Do you want a shared byline or just simultaneous reports? Actually, he smiled crookedly, I think I'd prefer simultaneous reports instead of looking like either of us is riding on the other's coattails. After all, how often does a columns of numbers guy like me get to something this big independently as quickly as someone like you? If that's the way you want it, it'll work for me, assuming, as I say, there's something to it, and assuming you don't want me to sit on it for more than a couple of hours after I get verification. No problem there. He shook his head. I'm already working up two different versions of the story, one version that breaks the expose of the Manti chicanery, and one version that warns everyone not to be taken in by this obviously fraudulent attempt to discredit them. I'll have both of them ready to go by the time you can get back to me. Fine. Then have that stuff hand-delivered to me ASAP. Done, Juppé agreed. Clear. He killed the connection, then leaned back in his own chair, clasped his hands behind his head, and smiled up at the ceiling. The truth was, he thought, the official New Tuscan scan records were going to pass any test anyone cared to perform. He didn't know who'd obtained the authentication codes, but he could make a pretty fair guess that it had been the same person who'd coordinated the entire operation. Of course, they could have been grabbed considerably earlier. That might even explain why New Tuscany had been used in the first place. Cracking that kind of authentication from the outside was always a horrific chore, even when the hackers in charge of it were up against purely homegrown verge-level computer security. The best way to obtain it was good old-fashioned bribery, which had been a Mason specialty for centuries. It didn't really matter, though. What mattered was that they had the records, which didn't show what the Mantis records showed and those records were about to be authenticated by no less than Audrey O'Hanrahan. He could have gone to any of half a dozen of her colleagues, many of whom had hard-won reputations of almost equal stature and almost equally good sources. Any one of them could have broken the story, and he was quite positive every one of them would have, assuming the records proved out. But there were several reasons to hand it to O'Hanrahan, as his instructions had made perfectly clear— and only one of them, though an important one, was the fact that she was probably the most respected single investigative reporter in the entire Solarian League, certainly the most respected on Old Terra. It's all been worth it, he thought, still smiling at the ceiling above him. Every minute of it, for this moment. There'd been many times when Baltazar Choupé had longed for a different assignment, any different assignment, Building his personal professional cover had been no challenge at all for a product of a mason gamoline, but that very fact had been part of the problem. His greatest enemy, the worst threat to his security, had been his own boredom. 
He'd known since adolescence that he had a far greater chance of being activated than either of his parents, and definitely more than his grandparents had had when they first moved to Old Terra to begin building his in-depth cover. But even though recent events suggested that the purpose for which the Juppé family had been planted here so long ago was approaching fruition, he hadn't really anticipated being activated this way for at least another several T years. Now he had been, and he thought fondly of the recording he'd made of his conversation with O'Hanrahan. It probably wasn't the only record of it, of course. He knew she had one. And despite all of the guarantees of privacy built into the League Constitution, an enormous amount of public and private surveillance went on, especially here in Old Chicago. It was entirely possible, even probable, that somewhere in the bowels of the gendarmerie, someone had decided keeping tabs on Audrey O'Hanrahan's comm traffic would be a good idea. It would certainly make plenty of sense from their perspective, given how often and how deeply she'd embarrassed the solid bureaucracies with her reporting. But that was fine with Juppé. In this case, the more records the better, since they would make it abundantly clear to any impartial observer that he'd done his very best to verify the story which had come so unexpectedly into his hands. And they would make it equally abundantly clear that O'Hanrahan hadn't known a thing about it until he'd brought it to her attention not to mention the fact that she was no knee-jerk anti-Manti, and that she'd been suspicious as hell when she heard about his scoop. And establishing those points was, after all, the exact reason he'd screened her in the first place, instead of simply very quietly delivering the information to her in person. Just as Juppé had frequently longed for something more exciting to do, he'd experienced more than a few pangs of jealousy where reporters like O'Hanrahan were concerned. The public admiration she received would have been reason enough for that, he supposed, but her life had also been so much more exciting than his. She'd traveled all over the League in pursuit of her investigations, and her admirers respected her as much for her sheer brilliance and force of will— her ability to burrow through even the most impenetrable smoke screens and most carefully crafted cover stories as for her integrity. Even more, perhaps, he'd envied how much she'd obviously enjoyed her work. But what he hadn't known until this very day, because he'd had no need to know, was that just as his own career and public persona, hers, too, had been a mask she showed the rest of the galaxy— and now that he knew the truth, and despite the envy that still lingered, Juppé admitted to himself that he doubted he could have matched her bravura performance. Gamma line or no, there was no way he could have equaled the performance of an alpha line like the O'Hanrahan genotype. Chapter 14 Ms. Montaigne has arrived, Your Majesty. Elizabeth Winton looked up from the HD she'd been watching and suppressed a flare of severe and irrational irritation. After all, Mount Royal Palace Chamberlains were chosen for their positions in no small part because of their ability to radiate calm in the midst of crisis, so it was scarcely fair of her to want to throttle this one for sounding precisely that way, she thought. The reflection was very little comfort on a morning like this, however, when all she wanted was someone anyone upon whom to work out her frustrations. She heard Ariel's soft sound of mingled amusement, agreement, and echoes of her own anger, and she admitted dismay from his perch beside her desk. Thank you, Martin. Her own voice sounded just as calm and prosaic as the Chamberlain, she noted. Show her in, please. Of course, Your Majesty. The Chamberlain bowed and withdrew and Elizabeth darted a glance of combined affection and exasperation at the cat, then looked back down at the patently outraged talking head on the recorded Solarian newscast playing on her HD. I cannot believe this crap, even out of those Mesa bastards, she thought. Oh, we were already afraid the ballroom was involved, and I guess I'm no different from anyone else about having mixed feelings about that. I mean, hell... All the civilian fatalities combined aren't a spit in the wind compared to what manpower's done to its slaves over the centuries. 
For that matter, you could nuke half the damned planet and not catch up with manpower's kill numbers. But nuclear weapons on a civilian target? Even low-yield civilian demo charges? She shuddered internally. Intellectually, she knew, the distinction between nuclear weapons and other equally destructive attacks was not only logically flawed, but downright silly. And it wasn't as if nukes hadn't been used against plenty of other civilian targets over the last couple of millennia. For that matter, Honor Alexander Harrington, her own cousin Michelle, and other naval officers just like them routinely detonated multi-megaton nuclear devices in combat. But emotionally, Green Pines still represented a tremendous escalation, the crossing of a line the ballroom, for all its ferocity, had always avoided in the past. Which is what's going to make the new Mason line so damnably effective with Solis who already distrust or despise the ballroom, or don't like the Star Empire very much. For herself, she would have been more likely to buy a used air car from Michael Janvier or Oscar Saint-Just's ghost than to believe a single word that came out of the Mesa system. Still, she was forced to concede, the Mason version of their impartial investigation's conclusions hung together, if one could only ignore the source. There might be a few problems with the timing when it came to selling Green Pines as an act of bloody vengeance, but the Solarian public had become accustomed to editing unfortunate little continuity errors out of the propaganda stream. Besides, Mesa had actually found a way to make the timing work for it. The attack on Green Pines had occurred five days before the abortive attack on Torch, by what everyone, with a working brain at least, realized had been Mason proxies. Torch, Erewhon, and Governor Oroville Baregos's Maya Sector administration were still playing the details of exactly how that attack had been stopped close to their collective vest, but there wasn't much doubt the attackers had been the mercenary state sec remnants manpower had recruited since the Theismann coup. Judging from Admiral Luis Rozak's losses, and according to Elizabeth's classified office of naval intelligence reports, those losses had been far higher than Rozak or Borregos had publicly admitted. Those mercenaries must have been substantially reinforced. They'd certainly turned up with several times the firepower anyone at O&I had anticipated they might possess. I wonder whether that assumption on our part comes under the heading of reasonable, complacent, or downright stupid, she thought. After Monica, we damned well ought to have realized manpower or Mesa, or whoever's really orchestrating things, had more military resources than we'd ever thought before. On the other hand, I don't suppose the analysts ought to be too severely faulted for not expecting them to provide presumably traceable ex-Soli battlecruisers to state-sick lunatics who'd been recruited in the first place as disposable and deniable cat's paws. Worse, Pat Givens's people at ONI have a pretty solid count on how many state sex starships actually ran for it after the coup. Admiral Caporelli based his threat assessment on the numbers we knew about, or we'd never have expected Rozak and Torch to deal with it on their own. We're all just damned lucky they managed to pull it off after all. She thought about her niece, Ruth, and what would have happened to her if Luis Rosak's men and women had been unwilling to pay the price demanded of them, and shuddered. Obviously, there is at least one batch of Solis who cut against the stereotype, isn't there, Beth? She thought. On the other hand, if Pat and Hamish are right, maybe they aren't going to be Solis all that much longer— and Torches and Erewhon's willingness to help cover exactly whose navy lost what stopping the attack suggests all sorts of interesting possibilities about their relationships with Borregos too, when you think about it. I wonder if that idiot Kolokoltsov even suspects what may be cooking away in that direction. But whatever might or might not transpire in the Maya sector, and despite any threat assessment errors which might have come home to roost for Admiral Rozak and his people, the fact remained that Mesa had neatly factored its own failed attack on Torch into its new propaganda offensive. After all, its mouthpieces had pointed out, the Kingdom of Torch had declared war on the Mesa system, and a huge chunk of the Kingdom of Torch's military and government leadership had long-standing personal ties to the Audubon Ballroom. 
Obviously, Torch had figured out the Mason attack was coming well in advance, since it had formally requested Rozak's assistance under the provisions of its treaty with the Solarian League. It hadn't, but no one outside the immediate vicinity knew that, or was likely to believe it. So the Mason argument that Torch had orchestrated the Green Pines attack through the direct ballroom links it had officially severed, as an act of government-sponsored terrorism in retaliation for a legitimate attack by conventional military forces on a belligerent star nation, had a dangerous, dangerous plausibility. Especially for anyone who was already inclined to distrust an outlaw regime midwifed in blood and massacre by that same terrorist organization. Which also explains why the ballroom finally crossed the line into using weapons of mass destruction against civilian targets, at least according to the gospel according to Mesa, Elizabeth thought grimly. Torch's formal declaration of war represents a whole new level in the genetic slave's battle with manpower and Mesa. Effectively, it's a major escalation in kind, so why shouldn't they have escalated the weapons they're willing to use as well? especially if they truly believed, wrongly of course, manpower intended to genocide their own homeworld. Never mind the fact that they're supposed to have killed thousands of their fellow genetic slaves and Mason Seckies at the same time. And never mind the fact that if they could get to Green Pines, they could almost certainly have gotten to dozens of far more militarily and industrially significant targets instead. Every right-thinking, process-oriented, comfortably insulated, moralistic cretin of a Solly knows they're terrorists, they think in terroristic terms, and they'd far rather kill civilians in a blind, frenzied orgy of vengeance than actually accomplish anything. God forbid anyone should think of them as human beings trying to survive with some tattered fragment of dignity and freedom. She realized she was grinding her teeth and stopped herself. And, she reminded herself again, the fabrication Mesa had woven really did have a damning plausibility. For that matter, Elizabeth couldn't shake her own strong suspicion that... Her thoughts hiccuped as her office door opened once more. Ms. Montagna, Your Majesty, the Chamberlain announced. Thank you, Martin, Elizabeth said once more, and rose behind her desk as Catherine Montagna crossed the carpet towards her. Montaigne had changed even less than Elizabeth, physically at least, over the decades since their close adolescent friendship foundered on the rocks of Montaigne's strident principles. Even now, despite the way their relationship had cooled over those same decades, Elizabeth Winton, the woman, continued to regard Montaigne as a friend, even though Montaigne's involvement with a legally prescribed terrorist organization continued to prevent Elizabeth Winton, the queen, from officially acknowledging that friendship. It couldn't have been any other way, given all the thorny difficulties Montaigne's effective endorsement of the aforesaid legally prescribed terrorist organization created where the Manticoran political calculus was concerned. Especially since the ex-Countess of the Tor had become the leader of what remained of the Manticoran Liberal Party. And those difficulties just got one hell of a lot thornier, Elizabeth thought sourly not just where domestic politics are concerned either. Kathy, the queen said, extending her hand across the desk. Your Majesty, Montaigne replied as she shook the proffered hand, and Elizabeth snorted mentally. No one had ever accused Catherine Montaigne of chutzpah deficiency, but she was clearly on her best behavior this morning. Despite the other woman's lifetime of experience in the public eye, Elizabeth could see wariness and worry in her eyes and the formality of her greeting suggested Montaigne was aware of just how thin the ice underfoot had become. Well, of course she is. She may be a lunatic, and it's for damn sure God forgot to install anything remotely resembling reverse gear when he assembled her, but she's also one of the smartest people in the old Star Kingdom, even if she does take a perverse pleasure in pretending otherwise. I'm sorry my invitation didn't come under more pleasant circumstances, Elizabeth said out loud, pointing at a waiting armchair when Montaigne released her hand, and the ex-countess's lips twitched ever so slightly. So am I, she said. Unfortunately, Elizabeth continued, sitting back down in her own chair, I didn't have much choice, as I'm sure you'd already deduced. 
Oh, you might say that. Montaigne's expression was sour. I've been under siege by newsies of every possible description since this broke. Of course you have, and it's going to get one hell of a lot worse before it gets better, assuming it ever does get better, Elizabeth said. She waited until Montaigne settled into the armchair, then shook her head. Kathy, what the hell were you people thinking? The Queen didn't need a tree cat's empathic sense to recognize Montaigne's sudden flash of anger. Part of Elizabeth sympathized with the other woman. Most of her didn't give much of a damn, though. Whatever else, Montaigne had voluntarily associated herself with some of the bloodiest terrorists, or freedom fighters, depending upon one's perspective, in the history of mankind. Choosing to do something like that was bound to result in the occasional minor social unpleasantness, Elizabeth thought trenchantly. The good news was that Montaigne had always understood that, and it was evident she'd anticipated that question, or one very much like it, from the moment she received Elizabeth's invitation. I assume you're talking about Green Pines, she said. No, I'm talking about Jack's decision to assault the beanstalk. Elizabeth said caustically. Of course I'm talking about green pines. I'm afraid, Montaigne replied, with a degree of calm remarkable even in a politician of her experience, that at this moment you know just as much about what actually happened in green pines as I do. Oh, cut the crap, Kathy, Elizabeth snorted disgustedly. According to Mesa, not only was the ballroom up to its ass in this entire thing, but so was one Anton Zilwicky. You do remember him, don't you? Yes, I do. Montaigne's calm slipped for a moment, and the three words came out flat, hard, and challenging. Then she shook herself. Yes, I do, she repeated in a more normal tone. But all I can tell you is that, to the best of my knowledge, he wasn't involved in this at all. Elizabeth looked at her incredulously, and Montaigne shrugged. It's the truth, Beth. And I suppose you're going to tell me the ballroom wasn't involved to the best of your knowledge either? I don't know. That's the truth, Montaigne insisted more forcefully as Elizabeth rolled her eyes. I'm not telling you they weren't. I'm only saying I don't know one way or the other. Well, would you like to propose another villain for the piece? Elizabeth demanded. Somebody else who hates Mesa enough to set off multiple nuclear explosions in one of its capital suburbs? Personally, I think the idea would appeal to most people who've ever had to deal with the sick bastards. Montaigne returned levelly, her eyes as unflinching as her voice. In answer to what you're actually asking, however, I have to admit the ballroom, or possibly some secky ballroom wannabe, has to be the most likely culprit. Beyond that, I genuinely can't tell you anything about who actually did it. I can say, though, that the last time I was on Torch, and for that matter, the last time Anton and I spoke, no one on Torch, and sure as hell not Anton, was even contemplating anything like this. And you're confident your good friend and general all-around philanthropist Jeremy X would have told you if he'd been planning this kind of operation? Actually, yes, Montaigne shrugged. I won't pretend my having plausible deniability about ballroom ops hasn't come in handy from time to time. For that matter, I won't pretend I haven't outright lied about whether or not the ballroom was behind something, or whether or not I had prior knowledge of the atrocity du jour. But now that he and Webb du Havel, and your own niece for that matter, have finally given the galaxy's genetic slaves a genuine homeworld of their own, you think he'd be crazy enough to plan something like this? Something that had to play into Mesa's hands this way? Don't be stupid, Beth. If he'd had even a clue something like this might happen, he'd have stopped it if he'd had to personally shoot the people planning it. And if he couldn't stop it, he'd sure as hell have discussed it with me, if only because he'd recognize what kind of damage control was going to be necessary. The ex-countess looked disgusted by her monarch's obtuseness, and Elizabeth gritted her teeth. Then she made herself sit back. Look, she said. I know the ballroom's never been as monolithic as the public thinks, or, for that matter, as monolithic as people like Jeremy and you like to pretend. 
I know it's riddled with splinter factions, and no one ever knows when a charismatic leader's going to take some chunk of the official organization with him on his own little crusade. But the bottom line is that someone nuked Green Pines, and the way it was done is sure as hell consistent with the ballroom's modus operandi, aside from the nuclear element, at least. Assuming the reports out of Mesa are accurate, then yes, I'd have to agree with that. Montaigne acknowledged in that same unflinching tone. But you're right about the ballroom's occasional internal divisions. For that matter, I'd have to admit some of the action leaders who'd accepted Jeremy's leadership before Torch became independent are royally pissed off with him now for betraying the armed struggle when he went legit. At least some of them think he's sold out in return for open political power. Most of them just think he's wrong. She shrugged. Either way, though, they're hardly likely to run potential operations by him for approval. Or material support? Torch has made its position on actively supporting strikes like this crystal clear, Elizabeth. You've heard what they've said as well as I have, and I promise you, they mean it. Like I say, Jeremy's not stupid enough not to see all the downsides of something like this. Elizabeth tipped back her chair, regarding her guest with narrow eyes and scant cheerfulness. There was a certain brittleness to the office's silence. Then the queen raised an eyebrow and pointed an index finger at Montaigne. You've been talking in generalities, Cathy, she said shrewdly. Why aren't you being more specific about how you know Captain Zilwicky wasn't involved in this? Because, Montaigne began firmly, then paused. To Elizabeth's astonishment, the other woman's face crumpled suddenly, and Montaigne drew a deep, ragged breath. Because, she resumed, they've specifically linked Anton with this, and I don't think they just picked his name at random. Oh, I know how vulnerable our relationship makes me, and by extension, the Liberal Party and the entire Star Empire, where something like this is concerned— but making that link in their propaganda is more sophisticated than Mesa's ever bothered to be before. I'm not saying it doesn't make sense from their perspective, because both of us know it does. I'm just afraid that it didn't occur to them out of the clear blue sky. She had her voice under iron control, but Elizabeth had known her for far too long to be fooled. There was more than simple pain in her eyes. There was something very like terror and the Queen of Manticore felt the personal concern of friendship go to war with the cold-blooded detachment her position as a head of state demanded of her. "'Tell me, Cathy,' she said, and her own voice was softer. "'Beth,' Montaigne looked her squarely in the eye, "'I swear to you on my own immortal soul that Anton Zilwicky would never, never sign off on nuking a public park full of kids,' anybody's kids, for God's sake, in the middle of a town. He'd die first. Ask anyone who knows him. But having said that, he was on Mesa, and I'm afraid the Masons know he was. That that's the reason they decided to pin this on him by name, and not just on Torch and the ballroom in general. And... Her voice broke off, and Elizabeth felt her own eyes widen. You think they caught him, she said gently. Yes. No! Montaigne shook her head, her expression showing an uncertainty and misery she would never have allowed herself to display in public. I don't know, she admitted after a moment. I haven't spoken to him in almost sixteen months, not since June. He and someone else were headed for Mesa— I know they got there because we got a report from them through a secure conduit in late August, but we haven't heard a word from them since. He was on Mesa? Elizabeth stared at her, stunned by the notion that Zilwicky had voluntarily walked into that snake pit. What in God's name was he thinking? Montaigne drew a deep breath, visibly forcing herself back under control. Then she sat for several seconds, considering the queen with an edge of calculation. All right, Elizabeth. Truth time, she said finally. Six months ago, you weren't exactly rational about the possibility that anyone besides Haven could have been behind Admiral Webster's assassination or the attack on Torch. 
I'm sorry, but it's true, and you know it, don't you? Brown eyes locked with blue, tension hovering between them for a dozen heartbeats. Then Elizabeth nodded grudgingly. As a matter of fact, I'm still not convinced, not by a long chalk, that Haven wasn't involved, she acknowledged. At the same time, I've been forced to admit there are other possibilities. For that matter, I've even been forced to concede my own anti-Haven prejudices probably help account for at least some of my suspicion where Pritchard is concerned. Thank you. Montaigne's eyes softened. I know you, Beth, so I know how hard it was for you to admit that. But at the same time, Torch in the Ballroom had pretty compelling evidence that whatever might have been the case with Admiral Webster, Haven wasn't involved in the attack on Barry and Torch, which suggested someone else had to be, and that led in turn to their taking a very hard look at Mesa. You just admitted your anti-Haven prejudices might predispose you to assume Pritchard was behind it. Well, fair's fair, and I'll admit that our prejudices naturally predispose us to feel the same way about manpower. But there was more to it, and a lot of that more came from Anton and Ruth, not the ballroom. What kind of more? Elizabeth asked, frowning intently. Well, the first thing was that we knew, and I mean knew Beth with absolute gold-plated certainty, Haven hadn't been involved in the torch operation. And the more Ruth and Anton modeled Manpower's behavior in Monica, the less its actions looked like those of any plausible transteller, even of a renegade outlaw transteller. They were more like something a star nation would have been doing. Elizabeth nodded slowly, her eyes narrow. She recalled Michelle Hankey's suggestion to the same effect after she'd broken Joseph Bing's new Tuscany operation. It had seemed preposterous, but both O&I and SIS had come, at least tentatively, to the conclusion Michelle was onto something. As of yet, no one had any idea exactly what she was onto, unfortunately. Assuming it was manpower, or Mesa, assuming there's even as much difference between the two as we thought there was, the attack seemed to fit in neatly with Manpower's obvious ambitions in Talbot. In fact, they seemed to imply that everyone was still just scratching the surface of what those ambitions might really be. And frankly, Torture's position as an at least semi-official ally of the Star Empire, the Republic, Erewhon, and the Solarian League, or the Maya Sector at least, had Anton and Jeremy wondering just how many birds Manpower was trying to hit with a single stone. Now, whose name, I wonder, did she just substitute Jeremy's for? Elizabeth thought. She considered pressing the point, but not very hard. Under the circumstances, they decided someone needed to take a good hard look at manpower from inside the belly of the beast, as it were. They didn't have a specific action plan beyond getting inside Mesa's reach. They wanted to be close enough to be hands-on, able to follow up leads directly instead of being weeks or even months of communications time from the investigation. I think they were probably thinking in terms of setting up a permanent surveillance op, if they could figure out a way to pull it off. But mostly, they were looking for proof of manpower's involvement in Webster's assassination and the attack on Barry. She paused with the look of a woman deciding against mentioning something else, and despite her focused intensity, Elizabeth smiled ever so slightly. Unwantedly tactful of you, Kathy. Don't want to come right out and say, and they wanted that proof to be good enough it could convince even you to think logically about other candidates, Elizabeth. Now do you? At any rate, Montaigne went on more briskly, the one thing they weren't going to do was link up with any official ballroom cells on Mesa. We have reason to believe, especially in light of a few recent discoveries, that any ballroom cell on the planet is likely to be compromised. So there's zero possibility Anton or any of his people were involved in any ballroom operation against Green Pines. They were there expressly to keep a low profile. The information they were after, especially if it confirmed their suspicions, was far more important than any attack could have been, and they were avoiding contact with any known ballroom operative. Elizabeth's eyes had narrowed again. Now she leaned back and cocked her head to one side. Would it make this any simpler for you, Kathy? She asked almost whimsically, 
if you just went ahead and said Anton and Agent Cachat instead of being so diplomatic? It was Montaigne's eyes turned to narrow, and the queen chuckled, albeit a bit sourly. I assure you, I've read the reports on just exactly how Torch came into being with a certain closeness. And I've had direct reports from Ruth, too, you know. She's done her best to be tactful, let's say, but it's been obvious Agent Cachat's still something of a fixture on Torch, and for that matter, that he and Captain Zilwicky have formed some sort of at least semi-permanent partnership. It would make it simpler, as a matter of fact, Montaigne said slowly. And since this seems to be cards on the table time, I suppose I should go ahead and admit that the reason I hadn't already brought Victor up is that I wasn't certain it wouldn't prejudice you against anything I had to say. I'm a good and expert hater, Kathy, Elizabeth said dryly. Reports to the contrary notwithstanding, however, I'm not really clinically insane. I won't pretend I'm happy to hear about shared skullduggery, hobnobbing, and mutual admiration societies between someone who used to be one of my own spies and someone who's still currently spying for a star nation I happen to be at war with. But if politics make strange bedfellows, I suppose it's only reasonable war should do the same. In fact, one of my closer associates made that point to me a bit forcefully not so long ago. Really? Montaigne's eyebrows arched, and Elizabeth could almost see the wheels and the gears going around in her brain. But then the ex-countess gave herself a visible shake. Anyway, she said, Victor was the reason we knew Haven hadn't ordered the torch attack, or at least that no official Havenite intelligence organ was behind it, since he would have been the one tasked to carry it out if Pritchard had sanctioned it. And you're right about the kind of partnership he and Anton have evolved. As a matter of fact, the way their abilities complement one another makes both of them even more effective. Victor has an absolute gift for improvisation, whereas Anton has a matching gift for methodical analysis and forethought. If anyone was going to be able to pry the truth out of that fucking cesspool, it was going to be them. Her nostrils flared, then she paused again, lips tightening. But you haven't heard from them in almost five months, Elizabeth said gently. No, Montaigne admitted softly. We haven't heard from them. We haven't heard from the people responsible for transporting them in and out, and we haven't heard from the Biological Survey Corps either. Whoa! Elizabeth straightened suddenly in her chair. Beowulf was involved in this too? She half glared at Montaigne. Tell me, was there anybody in the entire galaxy who wasn't sneaking around behind my back to keep me from getting my dander up? Well, Montaigne admitted, smiling crookedly despite her own obvious deep concern. Actually, beyond a certain amount of Erwanese assistance, that's just about everybody, I think. Oh, you think, do you? I can't be absolutely certain, of course. I mean, what with Torch and all the others, it was something of a multinational effort. I see. Elizabeth sat back once more, then shook her head. You don't think having so many cooks stirring the soup could have anything to do with whatever obviously went wrong, do you? I think it's possible, Montaigne acknowledged. On the other hand, the way Anton and Victor normally operate, it's unlikely anybody but them really knew enough to seriously compromise the operation. Still, she drooped visibly again. You're right. Something did obviously go wrong. I can't believe Mesa just decided to include Anton in their version of what happened, and that means something blew somewhere— what we don't know is exactly what blew and how serious the consequences were. But... But this long without any word suggests the consequences could have been pretty damn serious, Elizabeth finished softly for her. Exactly. Montaigne drew a deep breath. On the other hand, Mesa hasn't produced his body or mentioned Victor or Haven or taken the opportunity to take a swipe at Beowulf for its involvement, 
that suggests it didn't blow completely. I know, despite her best efforts, her voice wavered, there can be advantages to simply disappearing someone and letting her side sweat the potential consequences in ignorance. And given how we seem to have been underestimating or at least misreading Mesa's role in this and its possible sophistication, it's possible they recognized that accusing Haven and Beowulf of involvement as well would be too much of a good thing, too much for even Solly public opinion to swallow. But I keep coming back to the fact that if they could actually prove Anton was on Mesa, it would have been the absolute clincher for this fairy tale about his being involved in the attack. So if they didn't offer that proof, it seems unlikely they had it in the first place, Elizabeth said. Exactly, Montaigne said again, then chuckled. What? I was just thinking, the ex-countess said. You always did have that habit of finishing thoughts for me when we were kids. Mostly because someone as scatterbrained as you needed someone to tidy up around the edges, Elizabeth retorted. Maybe. Montaigne's humor faded. Anyway, that's where we are. Anton was on Mesa about the time the nukes went off. I can't prove he wasn't involved, but if Mesa could prove he was, the bastards would have done it by now. So either he's on his way home and his transportation arrangements have hit a bump, or else... Her voice trailed off, and this time Elizabeth felt no temptation at all to complete her thought for her. I understand, the queen said instead. She tipped her chair back, rocking it slightly while she thought hard for the better part of a minute. Then she let it come back upright. I understand, she repeated. Unfortunately, nothing you've just told me really helps, does it? As you say, we can't prove Captain Zilwicky, and by implication, Torch and the Star Empire weren't involved. In fact, going public with the fact that he was on Mesa at all would be the worst thing we could possibly do at this point. But I'm afraid that's going to make things rough on you, Kathy. I know. Montana grimaced. You're going to have to take the position that the Star Empire wasn't involved, and along the way, you're going to have to point out that even assuming Anton was involved, he's no longer an ONI agent. Ever since he took up with that notorious incendiary and public shill for terrorism, Montaigne, He's been establishing his own links to the abolitionist movement and, yes, probably to those ballroom terrorists. Under those circumstances, clearly neither you personally nor the Star Empire is in any position to comment one way or the other on what he may have been responsible for since going rogue that way. I'm afraid that's exactly what we're going to have to do, Elizabeth acknowledged. And when some frigging newsy pounces on his personal relationship with you— the very best I'm going to be able to do is no comment and a recommendation they discuss that with you, not me. And they're going to come after the firebrand rabble-rouser with everything they've got, Montaigne sighed. Well, it won't be the first time, and with just a little luck, they'll give me the opportunity to get in a few solid counterpunches of my own. The idiots usually do. But it's going to make problems for your liberals, too, Elizabeth pointed out. If, when, this turns as ugly as I think it's going to do, Willie and I are both going to find ourselves forced to hold you at arm's length, at best. And that doesn't even consider the fact that at least someone inside the party is going to see this as an opportunity to boot you out of the leader's position. If that happens, it happens. Montaigne's tone was philosophical. The flinty light in her eyes suggested that anyone who wanted a fight was going to get one. In fact, Elizabeth thought, the other woman was probably looking forward to it as a distraction from her personal fears. I'm sorry, the queen said quietly. Their eyes met once more, and this time Elizabeth's sad smile was that of an old friend, not a monarch. I've always been ambivalent about the ballroom, she continued. For personal reasons, in part, I understand all about asymmetrical warfare, but assassinations and terrorist attacks cut just a little too close to home for me, 
I'm not hypocritical enough to condemn the ballroom for fighting back in the only way it's ever been able to, but I'm afraid that's not the same thing as saying I approve of it. But whether I approve or not, I've always admired the sheer guts it takes to get down into the blood and the mud with something like manpower. And despite our own political differences, Kathy, I've always actually admired you for being willing to openly acknowledge your support for the people willing to fight back the only way they can, whatever the rest of the galaxy may think about it. That means quite a bit to me, Beth. Montaigne's voice was as quiet as Elizabeth's had been. Mind you, I know it's not going to change anything about our political stances, but it does mean a lot. Good. Elizabeth's smile grew broader. And now, if I could ask you for a personal favor in my persona as Queen of Manticore? What sort of favor? Montaigne's tone and expression were both wary, and Elizabeth chuckled. Don't worry, I wasn't setting you up for a sucker punch by telling you what a wonderful, fearless person you are, Kathy. She shook her head. No, what I was thinking about is that this news is going to hit the Haven system in about a week and a half, and I shudder to think about the impact it's going to have on Duchess Harrington's negotiations with the Pritchard administration. I'm sure it's going to have repercussions with all of our allies, of course, and thank God we at least consulted with them— unlike a certain ex-prime minister, before we opened negotiations this time around, but I'm more concerned about Haven's reaction. So what I would deeply appreciate your doing would be writing up what you've just told me, or as much of it as you feel you could share with Duchess Harrington at least, for me to send her as deep background. You want me to tell the Duchess Anton was actually on Mesa? There was something a bit odd about Montaigne's tone, Elizabeth thought, but the queen simply shrugged and nodded. Among other things, it would help a lot if she had that kind of information in the back of her brain. And I believe the two of you know one another, don't you? Fairly well, actually, Montaigne acknowledged. Since I came home to Manticore, that is. Well, in that case... I probably don't have to tell you she has an ironclad sense of honor, Elizabeth said. In fact, sometimes I think her parents must have had precognition or something when they picked her first name. At any rate, I assure you she'd never even consider divulging anything you may tell her without your specific permission. If you're confident of her discretion, Montaigne said in that same peculiar tone, that's good enough for me. She smiled. I'll go ahead and write it up for you, and I'm sure she won't say a word about it to anyone. Chapter 15 Alpha translation in two hours, sir. Thank you, Simon. Lieutenant Commander Lewis Denton had been perfectly aware of that fact, but procedure mandated the astrogator's report just in case he'd somehow failed to notice. He smiled at the familiar thought, but the smile was brief, and it vanished quickly as he glanced at the civilian in the assistant tactical officer's chair. Gregor O'Shaughnessy was doing a less-than-perfect job of concealing his tension, but Denton didn't blame him for that. Besides, it wasn't as if his own surface appearance of calm was fooling anyone, even if the rules of the game required everyone, including him, to pretend it was. He glanced at the date-time display. Seventy-four T-days had passed, by the clocks of the universe at large, since HMS Reprise had departed from Spindle for the Meyer system, the headquarters of the Office of Frontier Security in the Madras sector. Of course, it hadn't been that long for Reprise's crew, given that they'd spent virtually all of it hurtling through hyperspace at 70% of light speed. But they'd still been gone for just over 53 T-days, even by their own clocks, and the return leg of their lengthy voyage had seemed far, far longer than the outbound leg. More coffee, ma'am? Michelle Henke looked up at the murmured question and nodded agreement. Master Steward Billingsley filled her cup, checked quickly around the table, topped off Michael Overstegen's cup, and withdrew. 
Michelle watched him go with a smile, then returned her attention to the officers around the conference table in HMS Artemis's flag briefing room. You were saying, Michael? I was saying, milady, that finding myself up against Apollo seemed like just a tiny bit of overkill. He smiled at her, and although it would have taken someone who knew him very well, Michelle recognized the twinkle deep in his eyes. Not every subordinate flag officer who'd been so thoroughly, one might almost, she admitted, say, shamelessly blindsided by a weapon system the other side shouldn't have possessed would have found the experience amusing. Fortunately, Overstegen at least had a sense of humor. To be honest, it seemed that way to me, too. She quirked a smile of her own at him. I didn't do it just to be nasty, though. I mean, I did do it to be nasty, but that wasn't the only reason I did it. This time, there was a general mutter of laughter, and Overstegen's hand twitched in the gesture of a fencing master acknowledging a touch. The other reason I did it, though, she continued more seriously, was that I wanted an opportunity to see someone, a live flesh and blood someone, not an AI-administered simulation, respond to Apollo. I couldn't find anyone here in Tenth Fleet who wouldn't realize what was happening as soon as she saw it, but I could at least set up a situation in which she, or in this case, he, didn't know it was coming ahead of time. And is your lab rat permitted to ask how he performed? He inquired genially. Not bad at all for someone who lost 85% of his total command, she reassured him, and another chuckle ran around the squadron and division commanders seated at the table with them. Actually, sir, Sir Ivar's Tarakov said, I thought it was even more impressive that you managed to take out three of the op forces super dreadnoughts in return. More than one head nodded in agreement, and Overstegen shrugged. I remembered reading your report from Monica, he said. You might say I had a proprietary interest in your acting tack officer's performance. I was impressed by the way you used your Ghost Rider platforms to reduce the telemetry lag for your Mark 16s. Didn't seem to me there was any reason I couldn't do the same thing with the Mark 23s. He shrugged. It's not as good as Apollo, but it's a lot better than nothing. You're right about that, Michelle agreed. And by the way, the dispatch boat which arrived this morning had several interesting items aboard. The latest news faxes from home and from old Terra, among other things. She made a face and Overstegen snorted harshly. In addition to that inspiring reading and viewing material, however... There were two additional items which I think you'll all find interesting. One or two people sat up straighter, and she saw several sets of eyes narrow in speculation. The first is that we should be receiving an entire battle squadron of Apollo-capable Imperators in about three weeks. The reaction of almost explosive relief which swept around the table was all she could have asked for. There was a bit of a glitch in the deployment order, and their ammunition ships will be here a week or so before they are. There were quite a few smiles now, and she smiled back. Actually, the missile ships were originally scheduled to arrive two weeks after the Wallers, she continued, but the squadrons we were supposed to get under that deployment plan wound up going somewhere else, so we had to wait until their replacements finished working up. She paused again, and Commodore Shulamit Onassis, the CO of Battlecruiser Division 106.2, frowned thoughtfully. I know that cat in the celery patch look, ma'am, she said after a moment. Why do I sense there's another shoe hanging in midair somewhere? Well, I guess it might be because there is, Michelle admitted cheerfully. She had everyone's full attention again, she observed and glanced at Cruiser Division 96.1's commanding officer from the corner of one eye. It seems that although somehow the Newsies haven't picked up on it yet, the reason our original reinforcing squadrons went somewhere else is that Duchess Harrington and Eighth Fleet have gone somewhere else as well. To the Haven system, as a matter of fact. The youthful senior-grade captain she'd been watching stiffened, and there was a sudden and complete silence. Her own smile slid into something much more serious, but she shook her head. No, 
she said. She wasn't planning on attacking the system. In fact, unless something went very wrong, about three weeks ago, she delivered a personal message from the Queen to President Pritchard. Apparently, our discoveries about manpower's involvement out here in New Tuscany have inspired a certain rethinking of who might actually have been behind Admiral Webster's assassination and the attack on Queen Barry. On that basis, she drew a deep breath and looked around the table. And in light of the worsening situation with the Solarian League, Her Majesty has decided to pursue a negotiated settlement with the Republic after all, and she's chosen Duchess Harrington as her lead negotiator. My God, Captain S.G. Prescott Tremaine, crew div 96.1 CO, murmured. Michelle turned her head to look at him fully, and he shook his head, like a man shaking off a stiff right cross, then gave her a crooked smile. You were certainly right when you said you had a couple of things we might be interested in, ma'am. I thought that would probably be true, Scotty, she said with a grin. In fact, I should probably go ahead and admit I saved that particular little tidbit until I could watch your expression. Most of the others chuckled at that one. Scotty Tremaine had been one of Honor Alexander Harrington's protégés ever since her deployment to Basilisk Station aboard the old light cruiser Fearless. Michelle wondered if he'd been as surprised as she was when she discovered that the Admiralty, in its infinite wisdom, hadn't merely transferred him from the Lack community, where he'd not only made a considerable name for himself, but actually survived the Battle of Manticore, but chosen to give a new-minted captain of the list such a plum assignment. Once she'd had time to think about it, however, she realized exactly why they'd done it. Even in a Navy expanding as rapidly as the RMN, a flag officer had to have at least some experience in command of conventional starships, and aside from a brief stint in the Elysian Space Navy during the escape from Cerberus, where admittedly he'd performed extremely well, Scotty didn't have any. Obviously, Lucian Cortez had decided to rectify that situation, even if giving him a division of Saganami Seas had to have stepped on the toes of quite a few captains, or even commodores, with considerably more seniority. And they damned well gave him the right flagship, too, she reflected, remembering how tears had prickled at the backs of her eyes when she first saw the name HMS Alistair McKeon listed in the Admiralty Dispatch, announcing Crew Div 96.1's assignment to 10th Fleet. She didn't know what the ship's original name had been supposed to be, but she understood exactly why she'd been renamed after the Battle of Manticore, and why Tremaine had chosen her as his flagship. Well, I hope my reaction was up to your expectations, ma'am, he told her now, his smile less crooked than it had been. Oh, I suppose it was, if you really like that stunned ox look, Michelle allowed. Then it was her turn to shake her own head. Not, I ought to admit, that you looked any more stunned than I felt when the dispatch got here. I imagine that's pretty much true for all of us. Amen, Rear Admiral Natalie Manning said softly. Manning commanded the second division of Overstegen's Battlecruiser Squadron 108. She had a narrow, intense face, brown eyes, and close-cropped hair, and the Admiralty wasn't picking Nike-class divisional COs at random. In fact, aside from the shape of her face and her height, she reminded Michelle of a younger, harder-edged Honor Alexander Harrington in a great many ways. Now Manning smiled briefly at her, but there was a hint of alum behind that smile, and Michelle arched an inquiring eyebrow. I was just thinking, ma'am, Manning said. After the last few months, I can't help feeling just a bit apprehensive when things suddenly start going so well. I know what you mean, Michelle acknowledged. At the same time, let's not get too carried away with doom and gloom. Mind you, I'd rather be a little overly pessimistic than too optimistic, but it's always possible things really are about to get better, you know. Maybe I shouldn't have been quite so quick to discourage Manning's pessimism, Michelle thought, 37 hours later. She was back in the same briefing room, but this time accompanied only by Overstegen, Terakov, Cynthia Lecter, Commander Tom Pope, Terakov's chief of staff, and Commander Martin Culpepper, Overstegen's chief of staff. 
It was not only a considerably smaller gathering, but a much less cheerful one. Terakov and Overstegen had come aboard Artemis for supper and to discuss the most recent news from Manticore, and their after-dinner coffee and brandy had been rudely interrupted by the burst-transmitted message they'd just finished viewing. I really, really hate finding out how many alligators are still in that swamp we're trying to drain, she said, and Overstegen chuckled harshly. I've always admired your gift with words, my lady. In this case, however, I can't help wondering if it's not really a question of how many hexapumas there are in the underbrush. As usual, he had a point, Michelle reflected, wishing she could recapture some of the confidence she'd felt after the post-exercise debrief. Unfortunately, she couldn't, and she shuddered internally as she considered the one-two punch which had just landed here in the spindle system. Personally, Michelle Hankey wouldn't have believed water was wet if the information had come from Mesa, but she was unhappily aware that quite a few Solarians failed to share her feelings in that regard. Those people were going to believe Mesa's version of the Green Pines affair, and the linkage between the calculated ballroom atrocity and a known Manticoran spy was going to resonate painfully with the people who already hated the Star Empire. That much was evident just from the Sally Newsy's strident questioning. News of the Mason shocked discovery of Manticoran involvement in the attack had reached Spindle less than 14 hours ago, and 10th Fleet's public information officers had already been deluged with literally scores of requests and demands for an interview with one Admiral Countess Goldpeak. As if I could possibly know one damned thing they don't know. Jesus! Is a lobotomy a requirement for a job in the Sali media? She realized she was trying to grind her teeth together and stopped herself. Actually, she reminded herself, the newsy feeding frenzy was probably understandable, however stupid. They had to be frantic for any official Manticoran response. In fact, she hated to think what it must be like for Baroness Medusa's and Prime Minister Alcazar's official spokesman right now and she had to admit Mesa's fabrication really did have a certain damning plausibility. Until, that was, they inserted Anton Zilwicky into the mix. Michelle had met Anton Zilwicky. More than that, she'd known him and his wife well before Helen Zilwicky's death, back when they'd both been serving officers of the Royal Manticoran Navy. She never doubted Zilwicky possessed the ruthlessness to accept collateral civilian casualties to take out a critical target, but the man she knew would never, not in a thousand years, have set out deliberately to execute a terrorist attack and kill thousands of civilians purely to make a statement. Even if he'd become afflicted with the sort of moral gangrene which could have accepted such an act in the first place, he was far too smart for that. The man who was effectively Kathy Montaigne's husband had to be only too well aware of how politically suicidal it would have been. Gilded the lily just a bit too richly there, you bastards, she thought now. For anyone who knows Anton or Montaigne, at least. Which, unfortunately, is an awfully small sample of the human race compared to the people who don't know either of them. She grimaced, then made herself draw a deep breath and step back. There wasn't a damned thing she or anyone else in the Talbot Quadrant could do on that front. For that matter... Anything that needed to be done about it fell legitimately to Prime Minister Alcazar and Governor Medusa. What Michelle had to worry about, as the commander of Tenth Fleet, was the second thunderbolt, which had come slicing out of the cloudless heavens exactly 13 hours and 12 minutes after the dispatch boat from Manticore delivered its bad news. It would seem, she said dryly, that our worst-case estimate was too optimistic— I could have sworn the new Tuscan said Anisimovna told them Admiral Crandall only had about 60 ships of the wall. Well, we already knew Anisimovna wasn't the most honest person in the universe, Terakov pointed out dryly. Granted, but if she was going to lie, I would have expected her to overstate the numbers, not understate them. I think that's what all of us would have expected, Mum, Lecter said. Michelle's chief of staff was still functioning as her staff intelligence officer as well, and now she grimaced sourly. I certainly didn't expect them to have this many ships, and neither did Ambrose Chandler 
or anyone in Defence Minister Kreitzman's office, and none of us expected them to already be in Myers before reprise even got there with Baroness Medusa's and Prime Minister Alcazar's note. Michelle nodded in glum agreement and looked back at Lieutenant Commander Denton's strength estimate. Seventy-one super dreadnoughts, sixteen battle cruisers, twelve heavy cruisers, twenty-three light cruisers, and eighteen destroyers. A total of a hundred and forty warships, accompanied by at least twenty-nine supply and support ships. Upwards of half a billion tons of combat ships deployed all the way forward to a podunk frontier security sector on the backside of nowhere. Until this very moment, she realized, even as she dutifully made plans to deal with the possible threat of Solarian ships of the wall, she hadn't truly believed a corporation like Manpower could possibly have the capacity to get that sort of combat power moved around like checkers on a board. Now she knew it did, and the thought sent an icy chill through her veins, because if they could pull off something like this, what couldn't they pull off if they put their mind to it? She drew a deep breath and ran her mind over her own order of battle. Fourteen Nike-class battlecruisers, eight Saganami Sea-class heavy cruisers, four Hydro-class Sealax, five Roland-class destroyers, and a handful of obsolescent starships like Denton's Reprise and Victoria Saunders' Hercules. Of course, she also had right on 400 lax, but they'd have to go deep into the Sally's weapons envelope to engage. So what it really came down to was her 27 hyper-capable warships, the Hydras had no business at all in ship-to-ship combat, against Crandall's 140. She was outnumbered by better than 5 to 1 in hulls, and despite the fact that Manticoran ship types were bigger and more powerful on a class-for-class basis, the tonnage differential was almost 13 to 1. Of course, if she counted the lax, she had another 12 million or so tons, but even that only brought it down to around 10 to 1. And as far as anyone in Myers knew, she had only the ship she'd taken to New Tuscany without Overstegen's eight Nikes. If the people who set this up picked Crandall for her role as carefully as they picked Bing for his, she's bound to believe she's got an overwhelming force advantage, especially if she assumes we haven't reinforced since New Tuscany, she said out loud. To my way of thinking, it'd take an uncommonly stupid flag officer, even for a Solly, to make that kind of assumption, Overstegen replied. And what, may I ask, have the Sollies done lately to make you think they haven't handpicked the flag officers out here for stupidity? Michelle asked tartly. Nothing, he conceded disgustedly. It just offends my sense of the way things are supposed to be, I suppose. I'd expect better thinking than that out of a plate of cottage cheese. I can't say I disagree, Terakov said, but fair's fair. There might actually be a little logic on her side. Michelle and Overstegen both looked at him, and he chuckled sourly. I did say a little logic, he pointed out. And that logic would be? Michelle asked. If she assumes all of this came at us as cold as it came at her, although assuming it did come at her cold could constitute an unwarranted supposition— She could have been involved in this thing up to her eyebrows from the very beginning. Then she probably assumes we didn't have any idea she might even be in the area. After all, when was the last time any of us can remember seeing battle fleet ships of the wall putting time on their nodes clear out here in the verge? That's true enough, ma'am, Lecter put in. And for that matter, as far as we know, Bing didn't know she was out here. There was nothing in any of the databases we captured to suggest she might be. So if she wasn't aware Anisimovna had mentioned her to the New Tuscans, she could very well believe that the first we knew about even the possibility of her presence is Reprise's scouting report. And she also can't have any way of knowing what's going on in the Fox's Bacchanal Terra or in Manticore, Terakov continued. So, whatever she does, assuming she does anything, she's going to be acting on her own, in the dark, with no hard information at all on enemy ship strengths or the diplomatic situation. Are you suggesting a Sally Admiral's going to just sit in Myers, waiting for orders from home after what happened in New Tuscany? 
Michelle asked skeptically. I'm suggesting that any reasonably prudent, rational flag officer in that situation would proceed cautiously, Terikov replied, then bared his teeth in something which bore only a passing relationship to a smile. Of course, what we're actually talking about is a solid flag officer, so no, I don't think that's what she's likely to do. Besides, we've all read their contingency plans from Bing's files. Michelle's mouth tightened. It wasn't as if the SLN's contingency planning had come as a surprise, although she suspected the League would be most unhappy if the Star Empire chose to publicize some of its juicier details. There was Case Fabius, for example, which authorized frontier security commissioners to arrange frontier fleet peacekeeping operations, which accidentally destroyed any locally owned orbital infrastructure within any protectorate star system whose local authorities proved unable to maintain order, meaning they'd been unable to induce the owners in question to sell to the transstellars OFS had decided would control their economies henceforth. Or Case Buccaneer, which actually authorized Frontier Security to use Frontier Fleet units, suitably disguised, of course, as pirates, complete with vanished merchant ships whose crews were never seen again, to provoke crises in targeted verge systems in order to justify OFS intervention to preserve order and public safety. All that was sufficiently interesting reading, but she knew what Terikoff was referring to. Bing's files had also confirmed something O and I had suspected for a long time. In the almost inconceivable event that some neobarb star nation, or possibly some rogue OFS sector governor, attacked the Solarian League, or chose to forcibly resist OFS aggression, although that wasn't specifically spelled out, of course, the SLN had evolved a simple, straightforward strategy. Frontier Fleet, which possessed nothing heavier than a battlecruiser, would screen the frontiers and attempt to slow down any invaders or commerce raiders, while Battle Fleet assembled an overwhelmingly powerful force and headed directly towards the home system of the Troublemaker, which it would then proceed to reduce to wreckage and transform into yet another OFS protectorate. I see where you're going with that, sir, Commander Pope said. At the same time, not even a Solly Admiral could think she'd get through the Lynx Terminus with less than 80 of the wall. For that matter, we've had a couple of squadrons based there ever since Monica, and there's been enough Solly traffic through the Terminus by now that they have to know the forts are virtually all online by now. I wasn't actually thinking about trying to go directly after the home system, Terikov said. No, you were thinking she's likely to see Spindle as the Talbot Quadrant's home system, Overstegen said. That's exactly what I'm thinking, Terikov agreed, and Michelle nodded. We can always hope something resembling sanity could break out in Myers, she said. There's no way we can count on that, though. And I think that's especially true, given how carefully the people who planned all this seem to have chosen their cat's paws. So, starting right now, we're going to plan for the worst. She drew a deep breath and sat back in her chair. Gwen, she said, looking at Lieutenant Archer, I want you to have Bill make certain Admiral Kamalo and Baroness Medusa have both seen Commander Denton's report. I'm sure they'll want to sit down with him and Mr. O'Shaughnessy as soon as they're within a reasonable two-way FTL range of Thimble, but see to it that they have all the information we have ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. As soon as you've done that, tell Vicky I'll want dispatch boats sent to every system in the quadrant. Ask her to contact Captain Shoop and start looking at the boat's availability. First priority is Captain Connor at Tillerman, then Montana. He gets a complete copy of Denton's report and data, and I want to put together a personal message for him before the dispatch boat pulls out. Yes, ma'am. Gervais nodded, although he knew as well as she did that if Admiral Crandall had decided to respond forcefully, Jerome Connor's pair of Nikes at Tillerman had probably already found out the hard way. Michelle knew exactly what he was thinking and smiled tightly at him. The fact that he was right didn't change her responsibility to warn Connor as quickly as possible. In addition, she went on, when Bill makes sure Admiral Kumalo and Baroness Medusa are up to speed, tell the Admiral that unless he disagrees, I propose to send reprise direct to Manticore 
to inform the Admiralty both of what she discovered at Myers and that I am presently anticipating an attack in force on Spindle. An almost physical chill went through the briefing room as she said the words out loud, and she straightened her shoulders. Inform the Admiral that I intend to get reprise on her way within thirty minutes of her arrival in Thimble Planetary Orbit. Even Terakov looked a little startled at that, and she bared her teeth. If Crandall thinks Reprise got a good look at her task force, and if she is inclined to launch an attack, she's going to move as quickly as she can. We have to assume she could be here literally within hours, and if she's decided to head directly for the Lynx Terminus instead, it'll take her only one more T-day to get there than it would to get here. We may all agree that would be a stupid thing for her to do, but that doesn't mean she won't do it. For that matter, we can't really afford to assume the ships Reprise saw are the only ones they have. What if she's got a squadron or two sitting in reserve at McIntosh? We're already looking at more than Anisimovna told the New Tuscans about, so I don't think it would be a very good idea to think small. Terakov and Overstegen nodded soberly, and she turned back to Gervais. Go ahead and get Bill started on that, Gwen. Then come straight back here. I think it's going to be a long night. Yes, ma'am, Gervais said for the third time and headed for the door. In the meantime, gentlemen, Michelle resumed, I believe it's time the three of us started thinking as deviously as possible. If I were Crandall, and if I meant to go stomp on a bunch of neobarbs, I'd have my wall in motion within 24 hours, max. She may not feel that way, though. She may figure she's got enough of a firepower advantage she can afford to take a little longer make sure she's dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's in her ops plan before she breaks orbit. Personally, given that the passage time is over a T-month, I do my operational planning en route, ma'am, Terakov said. So would I, she agreed. And that's what I'm going to assume she's done. But even though we're going to plan for the worst, I can at least hope for the best— and the best in this case would be her taking long enough for our Imperator battle squadrons to get here before she does, or for their Apollo pods to get here at least, no? I would certainly agree with that, Overstegen acknowledged with a small smile. And when she does get here, assuming, of course, that she's coming, I want to accomplish four things. First, I want her to underestimate our actual combat power as badly as possible, I realize she's almost certainly already doing that, but let's encourage the tendency in every way we can. Second, I'd like to push her to keep her as much off balance mentally as possible. In a lot of ways, the madder she is, the less likely she is to be thinking very clearly, and that's probably about the best we can hope for. She's not going to head for spindle and strength unless she's already got blood in her eye, which means it's unlikely... Hell, the next best thing to it, impossible, that she's planning on presenting any sort of terms or demands Baroness Medusa and Prime Minister Alcazar are remotely likely to accept. So if push is going to come to shove anyway, I'd just as soon have her making angry decisions instead of good ones. She looked at her two subordinate flag officers, and Overstegen cocked his head and pursed his lips thoughtfully, then nodded. Third, she continued after a moment, and although I realize it's going to sound a little strange after what I just said about pushing her, I'd be just as happy to stall for as long as possible. If Baroness Medusa can get her to burn a day or two in negotiations before anyone actually pulls a trigger, so much the better. Is that really very likely, ma'am? Commander Culpepper asked dubiously. Especially if she's underestimating the odds and we've managed to piss her off on top of it? If I may, ma'am, Terakov said. Michelle nodded, and Terakov looked at Overstegen's chief of staff. What it comes down to, Marty, he said, is how much Crandall thinks she can get for nothing. If the Baroness can convince her there's even a possibility she might surrender the system without firing a shot, she's likely to be willing to spend at least a little while talking before she starts shooting. And I'm pretty sure that with a little thought, we ought to be able to... Irritate her significantly, let's say, while simultaneously reminding her that sooner or later she's going to have to justify her actions to her military and civilian superiors. 
However belligerent she may be feeling, and however angry she may be, she's got to know it'll look a lot better in the faxes if she can report she's controlled the situation without any more fighting. And she's more likely to feel that way if she does decide she's got a crushing tactical superiority, Overstegen added. She's already going to be assuming exactly that whatever we do, so there's no point trying to convince her she should just turn around and go home while she's still in one piece, which suggests the Admiral here has a point. No matter how pissed off she is, there's probably a damned good chance we can keep her talking long enough to convince her superiors, or the newsies at least, that she tried real hard to talk us into surrendering like nice, timid little neobobs, before she had no choice but to blow us all to kingdom come. That's what I hope, but Marty's got a point that it could also work the other way, Michelle pointed out. If she feels confident she can punch right through anything in front of her, that may actually make her more impatient, especially if she was already feeling the need to inflict a little punishment as revenge for what happened to Jean Bart even before we started pushing back at her. Her expression was grim. Don't overlook that probability. We've bloodied the SLN's nose, and we've done it very publicly. I'd say it's a lot more likely than not that what she really wants is to hammer us so hard no other Neobarb Navy is ever going to dare to follow our example. Wonderful, Lecter muttered, and Michelle surprised herself with a bark of laughter. Trust me, Cindy, if that is the way she's thinking, she's in for a rude awakening. I'd really prefer to stall, as I said, in the hope the Admiralty's managed to expedite our reinforcements and they come over the Alpha Wall in the proverbial nick of time. I'm not going to hold my breath counting on that, though, and I'm not going to delay a single minute if it looks like they mean to keep right on coming. Which brings me to the fourth thing I want to be certain we accomplish. She paused, and silence hovered for a second or two until Overstegen broke it. And that fourth thing would be what, milady? he asked. The instant any Sally warship crosses the spindle hyperlimit inbound, Michelle Henke said flatly, the gloves come off. There won't be any preliminary surrender demands this time, and despite whatever Admiral Crandall may be thinking, we're not going to be thinking in terms of a fighting retreat either. I think it's about time we find out just how accurate our assumptions about Battlefleet's combat capability really are. Chapter 16 I suppose the first thing to worry about is whether or not it's true, Sir Barnabas Q said. Q sat with Baroness Selleck and Voido Tuominen at the conference table behind Honor as she stood gazing out over the thundering cataract of Frontenac Falls. She stood with her hands clasped behind her, Nimitz sitting very still on her shoulder, and her brown eyes were bleak. It isn't, she said flatly. Her foreign office advisors glanced at one another, then turned as one to look at that ramrod straight spine, those calmly clasped hands. Your Grace, I'll be the first to admit that neither Manpower nor Mesa have ever been noted for truth in advertising, Twomanin said after a moment. This seems a little audacious even for them to be manufacturing out of whole cloth, though, and... It isn't true she repeated in that same flat tone. She turned away from the window, facing them. But for Nimitz's slightly flattened ears and slowly twitching tail, the civilians might have made the mistake of assuming she was as calm as she looked, and she smiled sardonically as she tasted their emotions, sensed the way they were settling back into their chairs. Hugh, especially, seemed to be searching for the most diplomatic possible way to point out that she couldn't know that, and she looked directly at him. A lot of things could happen in the galaxy, Sir Barnabas, she told him. A lot of things I never would have expected. But one thing that isn't going to happen, that couldn't happen, would be for Anton Zilwicky to deliberately nuke a park full of kids in some sort of demented terrorist attack. Trust me, I know the man. Nimitz knows the man. She reached up to caress the tree cat's ears gently. 
and that man is utterly incapable of doing something like that. But, Baroness Selleck began, then stopped, and Honor snorted harshly. I don't doubt he was on Mesa, she said. In fact, I have reason to believe he was. What it looks like to me, and I'd really like to be wrong about it, is that Mesa figured out he'd been on planet and decided to add him to the mix when they came up with their cover story for whatever actually happened. She decided again not to mention the personal message from Catherine Montagna, which had accompanied the official dispatch from Mount Royal Palace. Or even more to the point, that she'd already known Zilwicky and Victor Cachat were bound for Mesa even before the Battle of Lovett. The other three glanced at one another, considering what she'd just said, then looked back at her. You think they captured him when he was there, Your Grace? Selleck asked quietly, and Honor shook her head. No, she said softly. They didn't capture him. If they had, they'd have produced him, or at least his body, to substantiate their charges, instead of claiming he was caught in his own explosions. But I don't like the fact that no one's heard from him since Green Pines. If he got off-planet at all, he should have been home long since. So I am afraid they may finally have managed to kill him. Nimitz made a soft, protesting sound of pain, and she stroked his ears again. As she'd said, unlike the civilians sitting around the table, she'd known Anton Zilwicky. In fact, she'd come to know him and Kathy Montagna very well indeed since their return to the old Star Kingdom following the manpower affair in old Chicago. She and George Reynolds, her staff intelligence officer, had worked very closely, if very much under the table, with both of them, and her own credentials with the Audubon Ballroom had been part of the reason Zilwicky had been so prepared to share information with her. Excuse me, Your Grace, but would you happen to know why he was on Mesa? Twomenin asked. She cocked her head at him, and he shrugged. I don't really expect Pritchard or most of the members of her cabinet to be lining up to take Mesa's word for what happened, he said. I can think of a few of her congressional negotiators who'd be likely to believe anything, officially at least, if they thought it would strengthen their bargaining position, though. Even without that, there's the media to worry about, and Havenite newsies aren't all that fond of the Star Empire to begin with. So if there's another side to this, something we could lay out to buttress the notion that it wasn't Zilwicky or Torch... He let his voice trail off, and Honor snorted again, even more harshly than before. First, she said, how I know he was on Mesa is privileged information. Information that has operational intelligence implications, for that matter. So, no, I don't intend to whisper it into a newsie's ear. Second, I'd think that if I suddenly announced to the media that I just happened to know why Captain Zilwicky was on Mesa— and that I promise it wasn't to set off a nuclear device in a public park on Saturday morning, it's going to sound just a little suspicious. Like the sort of thing someone trying desperately to discredit the truth might come up with on an especially stupid day. And third, Voito, I don't think anyone willing to believe something like this coming from a source like Mesa in the first place is going to change her mind whatever anyone says— or not at least without irrefutable physical proof that Mesa lied. I gonna see that, Twomenin acknowledged with a grimace. Sorry, Your Grace, I guess I'm just looking for a straw to grasp. I don't blame you. Honor turned back to the window, looking down on the boat-dotted estuary, wishing she were down there in one of her sloops herself. And I don't doubt this is going to complicate our job here in Nouveau Paris as well. To be honest, though, I'm a lot more worried about its potential impact on Sali public opinion and what it may encourage Kolokoltsov and those other idiots in old Chicago to do. Twomenin nodded unhappily behind her and wondered if one reason he himself was focusing so intensely on the situation here in the Republic of Haven was expressly to avoid thinking about how old Chicago might have reacted to the same news. It was ironic that Manticore had received the reportage of the Mason allegations about Green Pines before anyone on Old Earth had. 
By now, though, the sensational charges were racing outward to all the interstellar community of man, and God only knew how that was likely to impact on the Solarian public's view of the Star Empire. The one thing Twominen was prepared to bet on was that it wasn't going to help. I agree that the way the League reacts to this is ultimately likely to be a lot more significant as far as the Star Empire's concerned, Your Grace, Selick said. Unfortunately, there's not anything we can do about that. So I think Barnabas and Voito are right to be considering anything we might be able to do to mitigate the impact here in the Republic. She shrugged. Voito is right about people like Younger and Maguire. I've been quietly developing some additional information sources since we got here, and the more I find out about Younger, the more revolting he turns out to be. I'm still not sure exactly how the internal dynamics of the new conservatives lay out, but I'm coming to the conclusion he's a much more important player than we'd assumed before we left Manticore. If there's anyone on Pritchard's side of the table who's likely to try to use something like this, it's younger. But how can he use it, Carissa? Q asked. I realize the media's going to have a field day, whatever we do. And God knows there's enough anti-Manti sentiment here in the Republic already for these allegations to generate even more public unhappiness with the fact that their government's negotiating with us at all. But having said all of that, it's the only game in town. The bottom line is that Pritchett and her people have to be even more determined than we are to keep us from blowing up their capital star system. Really? Honor turned her head, looking over her shoulder at him. In that case, why don't we already have an agreement? She asked reasonably. Carissa's exactly right about Younger, and I wouldn't be too sure McGuire doesn't fall into the same category. But everything about Younger's mind glow... She reached up to Nimitz again, suggesting, not entirely accurately, where her certainty about the Havenite's emotions came from suggests that he really doesn't care what happens to the rest of the universe as long as he gets what he wants. Or, to put it another way, he's absolutely convinced he's going to be able to make things come out the way he wants them to, and he's prepared to do whatever it takes to accomplish that. She grimaced. His and Maguire's obstructionism isn't just about getting the best terms they possibly can for the Republic. They're looking to cut their own domestic deals improve their own positions here in Nouveau Paris, and Younger would blow up the negotiations in a heartbeat if he believed it would further his own political ambitions. I'm less afraid of his managing to completely sabotage the talks, Your Grace, Selick said, than I am about his stretching them out, or trying to, at any rate. From what I've seen of him, I think he's calculating that the worse things get between us and the Sollies, the more likely we are to accept his terms in order to get some kind of a treaty so we can deal with the League without worrying about having the Republic on our back. That would be fatally stupid of him, Q said. I don't think he really believes the Queen, I mean the Empress, is willing to pull the trigger on the entire Republic if we don't get a formal treaty in time, Barnabas, Twomenin said heavily. And even if he does believe we'll do that in the end, he doesn't think it's going to happen tomorrow, Honor agreed. As far as he's concerned, he's still playing for time, and the time's still there to be played for. And let's face it, to some extent, he's right. Her Majesty's not going to turn the Navy loose on Haven's infrastructure any sooner than she thinks she absolutely has to. If she were going to do that, she wouldn't have sent us to negotiate in the first place. And I think I just won't mention how hard it was to bring her to that position, Honor added mentally. The problem is that no matter how much time he thinks he has, we don't have an unlimited supply of it, and this is only going to make that worse. So what I'm really worried about is that he's going to miscalculate with unhappy consequences for everyone involved. I agree, Selick nodded firmly. The question is how we keep him from doing that. I don't know we can do anything directly with him, Anna replied. On the other hand, President Pritchard's obviously had a lot of experience dealing with him domestically. So I think the logical move 
is for me to have a private little conversation with her to make her aware of our concerns. Good afternoon, Admiral Alexander Harrington. Eloise Pritchard stood, reaching across her desk to shake Honor's hand as Angela Rousseau escorted her into the presidential office. Good afternoon, Madam President, Honor replied, and suppressed a smile as Sheila Thiessen nodded a bit brusquely to Spencer Hawk. After two and a half weeks, the two bodyguards and paranoiacs in chief had achieved a firm mutual respect. In fact, they were actually beginning to like one another, a little at least, although neither of them would have been willing to admit it to a living soul. Thank you for making time for me so promptly, she continued out loud as she settled into what had become her customary chair here in Pritchard's office. Nimitz flowed down into her lap and curled up there, grass-green eyes watching the president alertly, and Pritchard smiled. Right off the top of my head, Admiral, I can't think of anyone who has a higher priority where making time is concerned, she said dryly. I suppose not, Honor acknowledged with a faint answering smile. Now that you're here, can I offer you some refreshment? The president inquired. Mr. Bellardinelli has some more of those chocolate chip cookies you like so much, hidden away in his desk drawer, you know. She smiled conspiratorially, and Honor chuckled. But she also shook her head, smile fading, and Pritchard let her chair come fully back upright. Well, in that case, the president said, I believe you said you had something confidential you needed to discuss? That's true, Madam President. Honor glanced at Thiessen, then back at Pritchard. I'm going to assume Miss Thiessen is as deeply in your confidence as Captain Hawk is in mine. Her tone made the statement a polite question, and Pritchard nodded. I thought so, Honor said. On the other hand, you might want to switch off the recorders for this conversation. She smiled again, thinly. I'm sure your office has to be at least as thoroughly wired for sound as Queen Elizabeth's. Normally that wouldn't bother me. But what I'm here to discuss has intelligence operational implications. Implications for your operations, not Manticore's. Pritchard's eyebrows arched. Then she glanced at Thiessen. Her senior bodyguard looked less than enthralled by Honor's request, but she made no overt objection. Leave your personal recorder on, Sheila, the president directed. If it turns out we need to make this part of the official record after the fact... We can download it from yours. She looked back at Honor. Would that be satisfactory, Admiral? Perfectly satisfactory from my perspective, Madam President. Honor shrugged. I doubt very much that anything I'm about to tell you is going to have repercussions for the Star Empire's intel operations. I have to admit you've managed to pique my interest... Pritchard said as Thiessen quietly shut down all of the other pickups in her office. And I suppose I should admit that piquing your interest was at least partly what I was after, Honor acknowledged. So now that you've done it, what was it you wanted to say? The president's mind glow was tinged with rather more wariness than was evident in her expression or her tone, Honor noted. I wanted to address the allegations coming out of Mesa about the Green Pines atrocity, Honor said, and tasted Pritchard's surprise. Obviously, the president hadn't expected her to go there. Specifically, Honor continued, the charges that Captain Zilwicky was on Mesa as a ballroom operative specifically to set up the explosions as an act of terrorism— or at least as an act of what they call asymmetrical warfare against someone he and the Kingdom of Torch believed were planning a genocidal attack on Congo. I realize there's a certain surface persuasiveness to their version of what happened, especially given the captain's long-term relationship with Catherine Montaigne, his daughter's status as Queen of Torch, and the fact that he's made very little secret of his sympathy for the ballroom. Despite that, I'm absolutely confident that Mesa's version of what happened is a complete fabrication. She paused and Pritchard frowned. 
I'm no more likely than the next woman to believe anything Mesa says, Admiral, the President said. Nonetheless, I'm a little at a loss as to how this has operational implications for our intelligence. In that case, Madam President, I think you should probably sit down with Director Trajan and ask him where Special Officer Kashat is right now. Despite decades of political and clandestine experience, Pritchard stiffened visibly, and Honor tasted the spike of surprise tinged with apprehension, and what tasted for all the world like a hint of exasperation, which went through the president. Special Officer Kasha, did you say? From Pritchard's tone, it was clear she was simply playing the game as the rules required, rather than that she actually expected honor to be diverted. Yes, Madam President, Special Officer Kashat. You know, the Havenite agent who's probably more responsible than anyone else for the fact of Torch's independence in the first place? The fellow who's been hobnobbing with Captain Zilwicky, Queen Barry, and Ruth Winton for the last couple of years? The one who's your agent in charge for the Erewhon sector? That Special Officer Kashat. Pritchard winced ever so slightly, then sighed. I suppose I should be getting used to having you trot out things like that, Admiral, she said resignedly. On the other hand, aside from the evidence that you know far more about our intelligence community than I really wish you did, I still don't see exactly how this ties in with green bands. Actually, it's fairly simple, Anna replied. According to Mesa, Captain Zilwicky went to Green Pines as a ballroom operative for the specific purpose of using nuclear explosives against civilian targets. I'm sure your own analysts can tell you that Anton Zilwicky was probably the last person in the galaxy who would have signed off on that sort of operation, no matter what justification he thought he had. In addition, however, you should be aware that before Captain Zilwicky departed for Mesa, and yes, he was on planet. He stopped by my flagship at Trevor Star to discuss the Webster assassination and the attack on Torch with me. At which time, her eyes bored suddenly into Pritchard's across the president's desk, he was accompanied by Special Officer Kashat. What? This time, astonishment startled the question out of Pritchard, and Sheila Thiessen stiffened in shock behind the president. Both women stared at Honor for several seconds before Pritchard shook herself. Let me get this straight, she said in an odd, half-exasperated, half-resigned tone, raising her right hand, index finger extended. You're telling me the intelligence officer in charge of all of my spying operations in the Aero One sector entered a closed Manticoran star system and actually went aboard a Manticoran admiral's flagship? Yes. Honor smiled. I had the impression Special Officer Kashat's methods are just a bit unorthodox, perhaps. A bit? Pritchard snorted and rolled her eyes. Since you've had the dubious pleasure of meeting him, Admiral, I might as well admit I'm usually undecided between pinning a medal on him and shooting him. And I see I am going to have to have a little discussion with Director Trajan about his current whereabouts. Although, to be fair to the director, I doubt very much that Kashat bothered to inform him about his agenda before he went herring off to Trevor Star. Not, mind you, that anyone's disapproval of his travel plans would have slowed him down for a minute. I see you have met him personally, Honor observed dryly. Oh, yes, Admiral. Oh, yes. I have indeed had that pleasure. I'm glad, since that probably means you're going to be readier to believe what I'm about to tell you. Where Victor Kasha is concerned? Please, Admiral. I'm prepared to believe just about anything when he's involved. Well, Honor said, suppressing an urge to chuckle. As I say, he and Captain Zilwicky came to visit me back in April. In fact, they came for the specific purpose of assuring me that they, both of them, 
were certain the Republic was not involved in the attack on Queen Barry and Princess Ruth. Her tone had become far more serious, and Pritchard's nostrils flared. Given the flavor of Special Officer Kashat's mind glow, Honor continued, stroking Nimitz, I had no choice but to accept that he genuinely believed that. In fact, I have to admit I was deeply impressed by his personal courage in coming to tell me so. She looked into Pritchard's eyes again. He was fully prepared to suicide, Madam President. Indeed, he expected to suicide after delivering his message to me, because he was pretty sure I wasn't going to allow him off my flagship afterward. But you did, Pritchard said softly, and it wasn't a question. Yes, I did, Honor acknowledged, and gave her head a little toss. To be honest, it never occurred to me not to. He deserved better. And even more importantly, perhaps, I not only believed he was telling me the truth, I agreed with his analysis of what had probably happened. Thiessen's eyes narrowed, but Pritchard only cocked her head. And that analysis was? That barring the possibility of some sort of unauthorized rogue operation, the Republic had had nothing to do with the torch attack, Honor said flatly. And by extension, that Admiral Webster's assassination almost certainly hadn't been sanctioned by your administration either, which, in my opinion, made manpower the most likely culprit. Then why didn't you... Pritchard began with an obviously involuntary flash of anger. I did. Honor's voice was even flatter. I discussed my meeting and my conclusions with, well, let's say at the highest level of the government. Unfortunately, by then events were already in motion, and frankly, all I could really tell anyone was that Special Officer Kashat believed the Republic hadn't been involved. I think you'll agree that despite my own belief that he was right, that scarcely constituted proof. Pritchard settled back, gazing at Honor for several seconds, then drew a deep breath. No, she acknowledged. No, I don't suppose it did, but, oh, Admiral, how I wish someone had listened to you. I do too, Madam President, Honor said softly. Brown eyes met Topaz, both dark with sorrow for all the men and women who had died after that meeting. I do too, Anna repeated more briskly after a moment. But the real reason I've brought this up at this point is that Captain Zilwicky and Special Officer Kashat did believe manpower and possibly even the Mason system government were directly implicated in the attacks. In addition, our own intelligence agencies have been steadily turning up evidence that there is more going on where manpower and Mesa are concerned than anyone's previously assumed. Captain Zilwicky and Special Officer Kashat intended to find out what that something more was, and according to what I believe to be an unimpeachable source, Catherine Montaigne, in point of fact, the two of them jointly were headed for Mesa. Together? Pritchard, Honor noted, didn't sound particularly incredulous. Together, Honor nodded. Which means that while Captain Zilwicky was on Mesa, a point of which the Masons obviously became aware, he was definitely not there on a ballroom terrorist operation. Given the various peculiarities where Torch is concerned, I think it's very likely the ballroom was involved in getting them onto Mesa in the first place and it's entirely possible that what happened in Green Pines was actually a ballroom operation or the result of one. The last thing Captain Zilwicky or Special Officer Kashat would have wanted would have been to compromise their own mission by becoming involved in a major terrorist strike, however, so any involvement they may have had must have been peripheral. Accidental, really. I can see that. Pritchard nodded slowly, and Anna reminded herself that, unlike most heads of state, the president had once been a senior commander in a clandestine resistance movement. That undoubtedly helped when it came to grasping the underlying logic of covert operations. I don't know for certain why Mesa's made no mention of Special Officer Kashat, Honor said. It may be they aren't aware he was even present. More probably, the Star Empires, who they really want to damage with this at the moment. 
explaining that intelligence operatives of two star nations who've been at war with one another for over 20 years just decided on a whim to join forces with the ballroom would probably be a bit much even for the Sali public's credulity. The best case possibility, of course, would be that they weren't aware of his presence and that he actually managed somehow to escape. And Captain Zilwicky? Pritchard asked gently. And I very much doubt Captain Zilwicky did. Honor made no effort to hide her pain at that thought. They wouldn't have handed this to the media, especially not with the assertion that he was killed in one of his own explosions, unless they knew he was dead. I'm deeply and sincerely sorry to hear that, Pritchard said, and Honor tasted the truth of her statement in her mind glow. The important point, Madam President, Honor said, is that I think you can see from what I've just told you that everything Mesa's claiming is a fabrication. There are probably nuggets of truth buried in it, but I doubt we'll ever know what they actually were. From my perspective, the immediate and critical point is to keep this from sidetracking our negotiations. I don't doubt it presents opportunities for self-interested parties to go fishing in troubled waters. She carefully did not mention any specific names. But it would be very unfortunate if someone managed to derail these talks. In particular, if Mesa's allegations play into the situation between the Star Empire and the Solarian League in a way that heightens tensions still further or even leads to additional military action, Queen Elizabeth's flexibility where a negotiated settlement is concerned is likely to be compromised. She saw the understanding in Pritchard's eyes, tasted it in the President's mind glow, but she knew it had to be said out loud as well. It may well be that at least part of Mesa's objective is to do just that, Madam President. Manpower certainly has as much reason to hate the Republic as it does to hate the Star Empire. I could readily believe that someone in Mendel saw this as an opportunity to force the Star Empire's hand where military operations against the Republic are concerned, as well as a means to provoke an open war between us and the League. And I think, she gazed into Pritchard's eyes again, that it would be a tragedy if they succeeded. Chapter 17 I have to agree with Duchess Harrington, Thomas Theismann said as the imagery from Sheila Thiessen's personal recorder came to an end. He tipped back in his chair, eyes pensive. It would be a tragedy. Especially if she's telling the truth, Leslie Montreux agreed. Of course, that's one of the major rubs, isn't it? Is she telling the truth? The Secretary of State shrugged. It all hangs together, and I'm inclined to think she is, but you have to admit, Tom, it would be very convenient from her perspective if we bought into this notion that Mesa's version of Green Pines is a completely fabricated effort at disinformation. You're right, Pritchard acknowledged and looked at Dennis Lepeak. The Attorney General had been sitting there with a peculiar expression while the imagery replayed, and now she crooked an eyebrow at him. Why is it, Dennis, she asked shrewdly, that you don't seem any more astonished than you do to hear Duchess Arrington's version of one of your senior intelligence officers' perambulations about the galaxy? Because I'm not, Le Peak admitted in tones of profound resignation. Wait a minute. Theismann looked at the Attorney General, who also ran the Republic's civilian intelligence services, in obvious surprise. You're telling me you really didn't even know where Kashat was? I mean, he really did take himself off to a Manti flagship in the middle of a war without even mentioning the possibility he might do something like that? Forgive me, but isn't he the man in charge of all FIS operations in Erewhon and Congo? Yes. Lepique sighed. And no, he didn't mention anything of the sort to me. Of course, I didn't know we didn't know where he was until this afternoon. Not until Eloise asked me to verify Duchess Arrington's story, at any rate. For all I know, or all I can prove anyway, he might have been ambushed and devoured by space hamsters. The Attorney General's expression was that of a man whose patience had been profoundly tried. 
and I'm fairly confident no one in Wilhelm's shop's been covering up for him either. No one knew where he'd gone, not even Kevin. Montreux had joined the Secretary of War in looking at Le Peak in disbelief. Pritchard, on the other hand, only sat back in her chair with the air of a woman confronting the inevitable. And how long has this state of affairs obtained? Theisman asked politely. I mean, in the Navy, we like to have our station commanders and our task force commanders report in occasionally, just so we've got some notion of what they're up to, you understand. Very funny, Lepic said sourly. Then he looked at Pritchard. You know Kevin's been rubbing off on Kashar from the very beginning. By now, I don't know which of them's the bigger loose warhead. If it weren't for the fact the two of them keep producing miracles, I'd fire both of them, if only to get rid of the anxiety quotient. I often felt that way about Kevin when we were in the resistance, Pritchard admitted. But as you say, both our pet lunatics have that annoying habit of coming through in the crunch. On the other hand, I believe you are about to tell Tom how long Kashat's been incommunicado? Actually, I was trying to avoid telling him, Lepic admitted and smiled even more sourly. The truth is that it tracks entirely too well with what Alexander Harrington's had to say. Our last report from him is over sixty months old. What? Montrose sat abruptly upright. One of your station chiefs has been missing for six months and you don't have a clue where he's gone? I know it sounds ridiculous, Lepique said more than a little defensively. In fact, I asked Wilhelm very much that same question this afternoon. He says he hadn't mentioned it to me because he couldn't have told me anything very much, since he didn't know very much. I'm inclined to believe that's the truth, mostly. Actually, though, I think a lot of the reason he kept his mouth shut was that he was hoping Kasha would turn back up again before anyone asked where he was. The Attorney General shrugged. In a lot of ways, I can't fault Wilhelm's thinking. After all, he's the FIS's director. Kasha reports to him, not me, and as a general rule, I don't even try to keep up with Wilhelm's operations unless they develop specific important intelligence that's brought to my attention. And as Wilhelm pointed out, it's not as if this were the first time Kashat's just dropped off the radar, and he's always produced results when it's happened in the past. But if someone else has gotten their hands on him, Dennis, isn't he in a position to do enormous damage? Theisman asked very seriously. Yes and no. Lepic replied. First of all, I think, as Duchess Harrington's description of her conversation with him indicates, it would be extraordinarily difficult for someone to take him alive to start with. And second, I doubt anyone would get anything out of Victor Kasha under duress, even if they did manage to capture him. I don't know if you've ever met the man, Tom, but believe me, he's about as scary as they come. Think of Kevin Usher with less of a sense of humor, just as much principle a lot closer to the surface, and even more focus. Theisman obviously found that description more than a little disturbing, and this time Lepique's smile held a glimmer of amusement. On the other hand, no one's going to rely on even Kasha's ability to resist rigorous interrogation forever. His assistant station chief in Erewhon is Special Officer Sharon Justice. She's acting as Special Officer in charge until Kasha gets back, and Wilhelm tells me that on Kasha's specific instructions, one of her first acts as SOIC was to change all communication protocols. Somebody might be able to get the identities of at least some of his sources out of him. I doubt it, frankly, but anything is possible. But I don't think anyone's likely to be able to compromise his entire network with Justice in charge. Justice, she was one of the state sec officers involved in that business at La Martine, wasn't she? Pritchard said thoughtfully. She was, Lepique agreed. Which means she's going to feel a powerful sense of personal loyalty to Kasha, Pritchard pointed out. She does, Lepique nodded. 
On the other hand, everything Kershat's accomplished out there has been done on the basis of personal relationships. The attorney general shrugged. I won't pretend I don't wish the man could operate at least a little more by the book, but no one can argue with his results, or the fact that he's probably got more penetration, at second hand perhaps, but still penetration, into the mantis than anyone else we've got, given his relationship with Ruth Winton and Anton Zilwicky. Not to mention the fact that he's damned near personally responsible for the existence of Torch. I know. That's why I took him away from Kevin and gave him to Wilhelm, Pritchard said. On the other hand, it does sound like what little we do know corroborates Duchess Harrington's version of events. I think so. Lepique agreed with the air of a man who didn't really want to admit any such thing. At any rate, Gachat's last report did say he'd concluded that since we weren't involved in the attempt on Queenberry, it had to have been someone else, and that the someone else in question had motives which were obviously inimical to the Republic. He'd reached that conclusion, I might add, even before we'd learned here in Nouveau Paris that the attempt had been made. By the time his report reached Wilhelm, he'd already pulled the plug, handed over to justice, and disappeared. As in disappeared aboard a Manticoran flagship at Treverstar, with a suicide device in his pocket just in case, you mean? That sort of disappeared? Yes, Madam President, Lepique said a bit more formally than was his wont. Pritchard gazed at him for several seconds, swinging her chair gently from side to side. Then she snorted. My, 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 she murmured with a crooked smile. Only Victor Kasha. Now that Kevin's out of the field anyway. You're telling us, Montreux said, speaking with the careful precision of someone determined to make certain they really had heard correctly, that one of FIS's station chiefs really went with a known Manticoran intelligence operative to a star system the Mantis have declared a closed military reservation for a personal conversation with the commanding officer of their 8th fleet before the Battle of Lovett, and then went off on a completely unauthorized operation to Mesa, which apparently ran right into the middle of whatever really happened at Green Pines? Lepique only nodded, and Montrose sat back in her chair with an expression of utter disbelief. Actually, it makes sense, you know, Theismann said thoughtfully after a moment. Makes sense, Montreux repeated incredulously. From what I know of Kashad, although I hasten to admit it's all second or third hand since I've never met him personally, he spends a lot of time operating by intuition. In fact, any way you look at it, a huge part of those successes Dennis was just talking about have resulted from a combination of that intuition with the personal contacts and relationships he's established. And you've met Alexander Harrington now, Leslie. If you were going to reach out to a highly placed member of an enemy star nation's political and military establishment because you were convinced someone was trying to sabotage peace talks between us and them, could you think of a better person to risk contacting? Montrose started to reply, then stopped, visibly thought for a moment or two, and shook her head, almost against her will. I'm willing to bet that was pretty much Kasha's analysis, Lepique agreed with a nod. And if it was, it obviously worked, given Duchess Harrington's evident attitude towards the negotiations. Not only that, but it set up the situation in which she brought us her version of what really happened on Mesa. His three listeners looked at one another with suddenly thoughtful expressions. You know, Dennis, Theismann said in a gentler tone, if he's been out of contact this long, the most likely reason is that he and Zilwicky were both killed on Mesa. I do know, Lepique admitted. On the other hand, this is Victor Kasha we're talking about, and he and Zilwicky are both, or at least were both, very competent operators. They almost certainly built firebreaks into and between their covers, whatever they were on Mesa, not to mention multiple escape strategies. 
So it really is possible Zilwicky could have gone down without Mesa's ever realizing Kershaw was there. And if the two of them were deep enough under, especially somewhere as far away as the Mesa system, three or four months or even longer, isn't all that long a lag in communications. Not from a covert viewpoint, at least. I don't know about Manticore or the ballroom, but we don't have any established conduits between here and Mesa. So his communications would have been circuitous at the very least, and probably a lot less than secure. And don't forget, it's been less than four months since Green Pines. If he did avoid capture, he might have been forced to lie low on the planet for quite a while before he could work out a way to get back out again. And if that's the case, he damned well wouldn't have trusted any conduit he could jury-rig to get reports back to us just so we wouldn't worry about him. For all I know, he's on his way home right this minute. Theisman looked doubtful, and Montreux looked downright skeptical. Pritchard, on the other hand, had considerably more hands-on experience in the worlds of espionage and covert operations than either of them did. Besides, she thought, Lepique had a point— it was Victor Cachat they were talking about, and that young man had demonstrated a remarkable talent for survival, even under the most unpromising circumstances. All right, she said, leaning forward and folding her forearms on her desk. I'm with you, Dennis, in wishing we knew something about what happened to Cachat. There's nothing we can do about that, though, and I think we're pretty much in agreement that what we do know from our end effectively confirms what Duchess Harrington's told us. She looked around at her advisor's faces, and one by one, they nodded. In that case, the president continued, I think it behooves us to pay close attention to her warning about Elizabeth's patience and the, how did she put it, the flexibility of Manticore's options, I don't know that I buy into the notion that this was deliberately aimed at Manticore and Haven alike, that Mesa wants Manticore to trash the Republic before the League trashes Manticore. I think it's at least remotely possible, though. More to the point, it doesn't matter if that's what they're trying to do, if that's what they end up doing anyway. So I think it's up to us to make sure our own problem children at the negotiating table don't decide to try to take advantage of this. And exactly how do you propose to do that, Madam President? Theisman asked skeptically. Actually, Pritchard said with a chilling smile, I don't plan to say a word to them about it. No? There was no disguising the anxiety in Dennis Lepique's voice, nor any indication that the Attorney General had tried very hard to disguise it. It's called plausible deniability, Dennis, she replied with that same shark-like smile. I'd love to simply march all of them in at Pulsar Point to sign on the dotted line, but I'm afraid if I tried that, Younger, at least, would call my bluff. So I can't just shut him up every time he starts throwing up those roadblocks of his. That's part of the political process, unfortunately, and we don't need to be setting any iron fist precedents for repressing political opponents. Despite that, however, I think I can bring myself to compromise my sense of political moral responsibility far enough to keep him from using this roadblock, at least. How? This time the question came from Theismann. By using our lunatic who hasn't gone missing, Pritchard chuckled coldly. Everyone knows Kevin Usher is a total loose cannon. I'm pretty sure that if he called Younger and Maguire, let's say, in for confidential, in-depth briefings, and was very careful to speak to both of them off the record, with no embarrassing recordings, and no inconvenient witnesses to misconstrue anything he might say, he could convince them it would be unwise to use these unfortunate and obviously groundless allegations out of Mesa for partisan political advantage. Threaten them with a uh, direct action, you mean? 
Unlike Le Peak, Theismann seemed to have no particular qualms with the notion, and Pritchard's smile turned almost seraphic. Oh, no, Tom. She shook her head and clucked her tongue reprovingly. Kevin never threatens. He only predicts probable outcomes from time to time. The humor disappeared from her smile as the shark surfaced once more. He doesn't do it all that often, but when he does, the president of the Republic of Haven finished, he's never wrong. February 1922, Post-Diaspora The Solarian League can't accept something like this, not out of some frigging little pissant navy out beyond the verge, no matter what kind of provocation they may think they have. If we let them get away with this, God only knows who's going to try something stupid next. Fleet Admiral Sandra Crandall, SLN Chapter 18 Well, this is a fine kettle of fish. Excuse me, another fine kettle of fish. Elizabeth Winton's tone was almost whimsical. Her expression was anything but. Her brown eyes were dark, radiating anger, determination, and not a little bit of fear, and the tree cat stretched across her lap, instead of the back of her chair this time, was very, very still. It's not exactly a complete surprise, Hamish Alexander Harrington, the Earl of Whitehaven, pointed out. No, the Queen agreed although the confirmation that this Anisimovna understated the number of super-dreadnoughts rattling around the verge probably comes under that heading. I doubt anyone's likely to disagree with that, Your Majesty, Sir Anthony Langtree said dryly. And I doubt anyone in this room thinks discovering they're really out there is going to make things any better, William Alexander, Baron Grantville, pointed out. That depends entirely on what sort of officers in command of them, Admiral Sir Thomas Caparelli, the first space lord of the Royal Manticora Navy, told the Prime Minister. If this Crandall has the brains of a fruit fly, she'll stay where she is and try to keep things from spinning any further out of control until she knows exactly what happened at New Tuscany and she's had time to seek guidance from home. And just what leads you to assume any Solarian flag officer sent to the Madras sector is going to have two brain cells to rub together, Sir Thomas? Elizabeth asked acidly. I'm willing to concede that there might be one or two frontier fleet commodores who were already in the area who could seal their own shoes without printed instructions. But if the officer in command of those ships was sent out under the same master plan that sent Bing, she's either a complete and total idiot who needs help wiping drool off her chin, and God knows the Solarian League's got enough of them to go around, or else she's in manpower's pocket. In the first case, she's going to react as if Mike's fleet is a nail and she's a hammer, out of blind, unthinking spinal reflex. In the second case, she's going to react as if Mike's fleet is a nail and she's a hammer because that's what manpower's paying her to do. From the perspective of the nail, I don't think it makes a lot of difference. Whitehaven winced mentally at the Queen's succinct biting analysis, less because of the tone in which it was delivered than because of its accuracy. Of course, there was one little problem with her analogy. In this case, though, he pointed out aloud, the hammer doesn't have a clue what it's about to let itself in for. Or, at least, if it does, it's going to be a lot less eager to start banging away. How realistic is it to hope this Crandall realizes how big her disadvantage really is? Grantville asked. If I knew the answer to that one, Willie, we wouldn't need all of Pat Givens' boys and girls over at O&I his brother replied. Anyone who looks at what Mike did at New Tuscany with an open, unprejudiced mind is going to realize just how outclassed he and his ships were. Unfortunately, if she moved out immediately after Reprise spotted her in Myers, she won't have had time to hear anything about Second New Tuscany. And even if she waited long enough to hear from the dispatch boat that got away from Mike, 
she'd have to be able to make the leap from what happened to a single battle cruiser to what could happen to an entire fleet of super dreadnoughts. As Her Majesty has just pointed out, it's unlikely anyone manpower's recruited for this command is going to be all that interested in looking at the data. And even if she is, I suspect she's still too likely to figure her super dreadnoughts are a hell of a lot tougher than any battle cruiser ever built. And that they're enough tougher she doesn't have to worry about any slick little tricks mere battle cruisers might try against them? Grantville finished the thought for him with a question. Pretty much, Caporelli agreed. More than that, she may hope we haven't been able to reinforce. In that case, she's going to want to move quickly before we do send in additional units. Do you agree with Mike's assessment about their probable targeting priorities, Sir Thomas? Elizabeth asked, her fingers caressing Ariel's ears. Judging from what we've seen of their contingency planning, from the databases she captured at New Tuscany, I'd say yes, Your Majesty. The First Space Lord grimaced. If it weren't for the wormhole, I'd be positive they were going to jump straight at Spindle. Given the importance of the Link's terminus, though, it's pretty much a coin toss. I don't see them splitting up and going after individual star systems in the Quadrant until after they've nailed Tenth Fleet. Not assuming Crandall knows what happened at New Tuscany, at any rate. But the idea of seizing the Terminus, holding it to keep us from reinforcing while simultaneously forcing Admiral Goldpeak to come to them if she wants to reopen her line of communications, would have to appeal to a Sully strategist. I wish it would, Whitehaven muttered, and Caporelli barked a laugh of harsh agreement. Hamish is right about that, Your Majesty, he said. We've got all but one of the forts fully online now, and we've got Apollo system defense birds deployed in depth to cover them. In fact, we were planning on recalling Jessup Blaine from Lynx to refit his pod layers with Keyhole 2 and Apollo. So you and Hamish are both confident the Lynx terminus could hold off 71 super dreadnoughts if it had to? Your Majesty, at the risk of sounding immodest, the only real question would be how long it took us to blow all 71 of them out of space. Those forts were designed to hold that terminus without any outside support against the attack of 250 of our own pre-Apollo podnots. Now that they have Apollo, their defense capabilities been multiplied many times. We still aren't sure by exactly how much but it's got to be at least a factor of four. Then Admiral Blaine could... Elizabeth began. Admiral Blaine already has, Your Majesty, Caporelli interrupted. I sent his new orders before I started over to the palace. If he hasn't already departed for Spindle, he'll be underway within the hour. And even though he doesn't have Apollo... His command would still eat those solely super dreadnoughts for lunch. And there's one other bit of good news to go with that one. Admiral Goldpeak's Apollo ammunition ships are almost 48 hours ahead of the last schedule update she's received. Elizabeth relaxed visibly, but Ariel raised his head and glanced at Whitehaven a moment before the Earl cleared his throat. The quiet sound drew the Queen's attention too, and an eyebrow rose. What Tom just said is completely accurate, Your Majesty, he said, and I unreservedly support both his analysis and his instructions to Admiral Blaine. The problem is that it's unlikely Blaine could arrive at Spindle before the Sollies do, assuming they come straight from Myers. So if they do decide to move against Mike, she's going to have to take them on with what she has. And even if the Apollo pods get there in time, she doesn't have Keyhole 2 or pod layers. And if they hit Mike without Blaine and before the ammunition ships get there, what are her chances? Elizabeth asked quietly. 
From what I've seen of the tech readouts from their battle cruisers' databases, Caparelli replied for the Earl after a moment, and assuming the count on Crandall's SDs is accurate, and Admiral Goldpeak fights as smart as she's always fought before, I'd say her chances range from about even to fairly good. There's no way she could survive in energy range of that many super dreadnoughts. I don't care what class they are, but I very seriously doubt that any Solarian super dreadnoughts going to survive to close to energy range. Their missile armaments are light, even by our pre-pod standards, and from our examination of the battle cruisers' counter missiles and those Halo decoy platforms of theirs, they still don't have a clue what the new missile threat environment really is. For that matter, assuming the stats we've pulled out of the computers are really accurate, which, to be honest, in some instances I find a little difficult to believe. At least two-thirds of their reserve fleets still equipped with autocannon point defense, not lasers. You're joking, Langtree said, his expression eloquent of disbelief. No, I'm not. Caparelli shook his head for added emphasis. As I say, it's hard to believe, but that's what the data says. In fact, it looks to Pat's analysts as if they've only just recently really started to become aware of the increased missile threat. From the reports we've had from Second Congo, at least someone in the league's been experimenting with extended-range ship killers. But whatever Mesa may have told Luft and his lunatics, there's no evidence the one doing the experimenting is the SLN. They're upgrading their current generation anti-ship missiles, but only marginally, and according to our captured data from Bing, the improvements are to seekers and EW capabilities, not range. Defensively, there's some information in the data about something called Aegis, which is supposed to be a major advance in missile defense. As nearly as we can tell, though, what it really amounts to is ripping out a couple of broadside energy mounts, replacing them with additional counter-missile fire control and telemetry links, and then using main missile tubes to launch additional canisters of counter-missiles. It's going to thicken their counter-missile fire, but only at the expense of taking several ship-killer missiles out of an already light broadside. And to make things worse from their perspective, their counter-missiles themselves aren't as good as ours. The fire control software we've been looking at was several generations out of date, by our standards, at the start of the last war with Haven. And even on the ships where they've converted the autocannon to laser clusters, they don't appear to have increased the number of point defense stations appreciably. He shook his head again, his eyes bleak with satisfaction. I don't doubt that they've increased their anti-missile capability from what it used to be, Tony, he said. And it's going to take more missiles to kill their ships than it would have before they did it. But the end result's going to be the same, and if Admiral Goldpeak doesn't have Apollo, she's got at least four missile colliers stuffed full of Mark 23 flatpacks. Her shipboard magazines are full of Mark 16s, mostly with the new laser heads, and every one of her Nikes has Keyhole 1. Trust me, if this surly Admiral's stupid enough to ram her head into spindle, Admiral Goldpeak will give her the mother of all migraines. She may not be able to keep Crandall from taking control of the planet's orbitals if she's willing to suck up the losses involved, but she'll be damned lucky if she has 10% of her ships left when 10th Fleet runs out of ammo. Which will only make this mess even messier from a diplomatic standpoint, Langtree pointed out, especially with this new story O'Hanrahan broke. Oh, thank you, Tony, Grantville snorted. I could have gone all week without thinking about that one. It was a master stroke, wasn't it? Elizabeth said sourly. If there's one newsie in the entire Solarian League no one could ever accuse of being in manpower's pocket, it's Audrey O'Hanrahan. 
In fact, the way she was beating up on frontier security, manpower, and technodyne over Monica only gives this new scoop of hers even more impact. I still don't understand how they did it. Whitehaven shook his head. It's obvious from her past accomplishments that she's got contacts that should have spotted any forged data, no matter how well it was done. So how did they manage to fool her this time around? Well, Pat's own analysts have all confirmed that the data she's using in her reports carries what appear to be genuine New Tuscan Navy security and ID codes, Caparelli said. It may have been doctored. In fact, we know what parts of it were, and we're trying to figure out how to demonstrate that fact. But it certainly looks like the official record of what happened. And to be fair to O'Hanrahan, she's never claimed that she's been able to confirm the accuracy of the data on the chips, only that all of her informed sources agree it came directly from the New Tuscans, and that it's been certified by the New Tuscan Navy, unlike the data we've supplied. Which only makes it worse in a lot of ways, Langtree observed. She's not the one beating the drums, just the one who handed them the drumsticks. In fact, in the last faxes I've seen from old Terra, she's actually protesting pretty vehemently that other newsies and talking heads are reading a lot more into her story than she ever meant for them to. So she's got good intentions. Great, Whitehaven said dourly. If I recall correctly, Pandora wasn't all that successful at stuffing things back into the box either. Fair enough, Langtree agreed. On the other hand, I detect Malachi Abruzzi's hand in all this as well. But there's no way this is going to stand up in the end, Elizabeth protested. Too many people in New Tuscany know what really happened. Not to mention the fact that we've already got the New Tuscan Navy's sensor records for the period involved, complete with all the same security and ID codes and time chops, and the real records don't begin to match the ones someone handed her. With all due respect, Your Majesty, Langtree said, we have exactly the same kind of evidence and substantiation where our pre-war diplomatic correspondence with Haven is concerned. In fact, I have to wonder if our little disagreement with the peeps isn't what suggested this particular ploy to manpower, or to Mesa, for that matter. The foreign secretary grimaced. It's almost like some kind of perfect storm, isn't it? First, Mesa drops green pines on us, and then O'Hanrahan, of all people, gives us the follow-up punch with this cock-and-bull story from New Tuscany. I think it was deliberately orchestrated, Whitehaven said grimly. Both stories came out of, or at least through, Mesa, after all. I'll lay you any odds you like that the whole business about dispatches from New Tuscany is a complete fabrication. Somebody in Mesa planned this very carefully, and I'll also bet you they deliberately set O'Hanrahan up to front for them exactly because she's always been so careful to be as accurate as possible. And the fact that she was one of the few Solly Newsies questioning their version of Green Pines and demanding hard evidence to back up their claims only makes her even more damaging on this story since no one in the galaxy could possibly accuse her of carrying water for Mesa in the past. The Earl shook his head. Playing her this way was probably a little risky from their perspective, but look at how it's paid off for them. And even if the truth is staring them right in the eye, people like Abruzzi and Quatermain and Kolokoltsev are capable of projecting perfect candor while they look the other way. Grantville added. They'll swear the version that suits their purposes is the truth, despite any evidence to the contrary, and figure that when the smoke clears and it turns out they were wrong, they'll get away with it by saying, oops. After all, it was an honest mistake, wasn't it? He grinned savagely, and his tone was viciously sarcastic as he went on. I can hear them now. 
We're so sorry that our very best efforts to sort out the facts went awry, but in the meantime, we just happened to have conquered a small, insignificant star nation called Manticore. It's all very unfortunate, but there it is, and you can't pour the spilled milk back into the glass, you know. So we'll just have to set up an interim government under the auspices of Frontier Security, only until the Mantis get back on their feet and can elect a properly democratic government on the best Solarian pattern, so that misunderstandings like this don't arise in the future, of course. We'd never dream of interfering with their right of self-determination beyond that. Cross our hearts. I suppose you're right, Elizabeth said drearily. And if Sir Anthony's right about Abruzzi and their Ministry of Information's involvement in pushing this story, it sounds as if that's exactly what they're deciding to do. It's what they're preparing the groundwork to do, at any rate, Your Majesty, Langtry agreed quietly. And if those super-dreadnoughts at Myers actually do attack Spindle— then, especially against this backdrop of O'Hanrahan's story, they're almost certainly going to decide they're in too deep to back out, Whitehaven added. In that case, it's probably a good thing I finally listened to Honor. Elizabeth drew a sharp breath, then shook herself and smiled. It was a tense smile, and no one would ever have described it as a happy one, but there was no panic in it. It looks like we're about to get a chance to see how sound her strategic prescription for fighting the Solarian League really is. And if we are, then it'll be a damned good idea to get the Republic of Haven off our backs while we do it. Do you suppose I ought to make that point to her when we send her her copy of Mike's dispatch? The smile turned almost whimsical with the last sentence, and Whitehaven chuckled. Trust me, Your Majesty. My wife's actually quite a bright woman. I'm pretty sure she'll figure that out on her own. Fleet Admiral Sandra Crandall had never been a good woman to disappoint. She was a big woman with a hard, determined face, and what one thankfully anonymous subordinate had once described as the disposition of a grizzly bear with hemorrhoids trying to pass pine cones. In fact, Commander Hago Shavarshian thought, that had been a gross libel against grizzly bears. Shavarshian was in a better position than most to appreciate that, since he had the dubious good fortune of having been added to Crandall's staff as a last-moment afterthought. Apparently, it had occurred to her only after she decided to go to war against the Royal Manticoran Navy that it might perhaps be a good idea to have a staff intelligence officer who actually knew something about local conditions, which was how Commander Shavarshian found himself the single frontier fleet officer attached to a fleet whose staff, like every one of its senior squadron and division commanders, consisted otherwise solely of battle fleet officers, all of whom outranked him and all of whom seemed to be competing to see who could agree most vehemently with their admiral. Those thoughts floated through the back of Shavarshian's brain as he stood behind the briefing officer's podium while Crandall and the other members of her staff settled down around the long briefing room table aboard SLNS Joseph Buckley. All right, Crandall growled once they were seated. Let's get to it. Yes, ma'am. Shavarshian squared his shoulders and put on his best professional expression, although everyone in the briefing room knew he'd received no fresh data in the 35 days since they'd left Myers. That, unfortunately, wasn't what Crandall wanted to hear about. As you know, ma'am, he continued briskly, Admiral Wu Yang's people and I have continued our study of Admiral Sigby's new Tuscany dispatches. We've combined their contents with all the information available to Frontier Fleet's analysts as well, of course, and I've compiled a report of all our observations and conclusions. I've mailed copies of it to all of you, which should be waiting in your in-baskets, but for the most part, unfortunately, I'm forced to say we really don't have any startling new insights since my last report. I'm afraid we've pretty much mined out the available ore, Admiral. I wish I could offer you something more than that, but anything else would be pure speculation at best. But you stand by this nonsense about the Mantis missile ranges? 
Vice Admiral Pepe Bautista, Crandall's chief of staff, asked skeptically. Bautista's manner was more often than not caustic, even with his fellow battle fleet officers, if they were junior to him. He clearly saw no reason to restrain his natural abrasiveness where a mere frontier fleet commander was concerned. Exactly which nonsense would that be, sir? Shavarshian inquired as politely as possible. I find it hard enough to credit Gruner's report that the Mantis opened fire on Jean Bart from 40 million kilometers out. He grimaced. I'd like to see at least some reliable sensor data before I jump onto that bandwagon. But even granting that's correct, are you seriously suggesting they may have even more range? Sir, I'd like to have better data myself, Shavarshian acknowledged, and that much was completely sincere. Lieutenant Aloysius Gruner was the commanding officer of Dispatch Boat 17702, the only unit of Joseph Bing's ill-fated command to escape before Bing's death and Sigby's surrender. Gruner had been sent off very early in the confrontation, which explained how he'd evaded the Mantis to bring back the news of the catastrophe in the first place. Apparently, Admiral Bing, in yet another dazzling display of incompetence, had seen no reason even to order his other courier boats to bring up their nodes, which meant they'd all still been sitting in orbit when Sigby surrendered. They were fortunate the one boat he had ordered to get underway had still been close enough to receive Sigby's burst-transmitted final dispatch, the one which had announced Jean Bart's destruction and her own surrender, but there'd been no time for her to send DB-17702 detailed tactical reports or sensor data on the Mantis' weapons. And through no fault of Gruner's, he couldn't provide that information either, since courier boats' sensor suites weren't what anyone might call sophisticated. Although he'd been able to tell them what had happened, more or less, they had virtually no hard information on how the Mantis had made it happen. Additional information might well have been sent to Myers by now, but if so, it was still somewhere in the pipeline astern of Task Force 496. Of course it is, Shavarshian thought bitingly. Anything else would actually have suggested there was at least a smidgen of competence somewhere among the people running this clusterfuck. At the same time, Lieutenant Gruner was there, he continued out loud. He saw what actually happened, and even if we don't have the kind of data I'd prefer, he was very emphatic about the engagement range. Nothing in Sigby's dispatch suggests he was wrong, either. And given the geometry of the engagement, 40 million kilometers at launch equates to something on the order of 29 or 30 million kilometers from rest. Now, nothing we have, not even those big system defense missiles Technodyne deployed to Monica, have that kind of range, that kind of powered endurance. But 30 million clicks from rest would work out pretty close to the consecutive endurance for two missile drives at the observed acceleration. So the only conclusion I can come up with is that they must really have gone ahead and put multiple drives into their missiles. And if they've put in enough drives to give them a powered envelope of 30 million kilometers, I just think it might be wiser to consider the possibility that they might have even more range than that. His tone could not have been more respectful or non-confrontational, but he'd seen Bautista's jaw tighten at the reference to Monica. Not, Shavarshian felt confident, so much at the reminder of the Technodyne missile's enhanced range, as at the fact that the Mantis missiles had outranged even them. Which, of course, was the reason Shavarshian had mentioned it. Bautista started to open his mouth angrily, but Vice Admiral Uyang Jingwei, Crandall's operations officer, spoke up before he could. I'm disinclined to think they could have a great deal more range, Pepe, but Commander Shavarshian is right— it's a possibility we have to bear in mind. Yes, it is, Crandall agreed, although she manifestly didn't like doing so. All the same, she continued, it really doesn't matter in the long run. Assuming Gruner's observations and Sigby's report were accurate at all, we already knew we were going to be outranged by at least some of these people's missiles. On the other hand, I agree with Sigby, and with you, Commander, that no missile big enough to do that could be fired from missile tubes the size of the ones we've actually observed aboard even those big-ass Manti battlecruisers, so they had to come from pods. She shrugged. 
Like the woman herself, it was a ponderous movement, without grace, yet imbued with a self-aware sense of power. But whether they came from pods or missile tubes, they can't have the fire control links to coordinate enough of them to swamp the task force's point defense, and their accuracy at such extended ranges, assuming they actually have even more range, has to be poor. I know some of them will get through. We'll take damage. Hell, we may even lose a ship or two. But there's no way they're going to stop a solid wall of battle this size by just chucking missiles at it. And I'm not going to let them bluff me into going easy on them because of some kind of imagined super weapon they've got. She snorted in contempt, and her eyes were harder than ever. By now, that damn destroyer of theirs must have gotten back to Spindle. I imagine that once they all got done crapping their skin suits, they sent home for reinforcements. But after the reaming they got from the Havenites, they can't have much left to reinforce with. So we're just going to turn up and be their worst nightmare, and we're going to do it right now. I understand your thinking, ma'am, Uyang said. And I agree we need to move quickly, but it's one of my responsibilities to see to it that we don't get hurt any worse than we can help while we pin their ears back the way they've got coming. And just between you and me, I'm not all that fond of surprises, even from Neobarbs. Uyang rolled her eyes drolly with the last phrase, and Crandall chuckled. At least, that was what Shavarshian thought the sound was. It was difficult sometimes to differentiate between the Admiral's snorts of contempt and snorts of amusement. In fact, the commander wasn't certain there was a difference. At the same time, he had to admire Uyang's technique. The operations officer was the closest thing to an ally he had on Crandall's staff, and he rather thought she shared some of the suspicions which kept him awake at night. For example, there was that nagging question of exactly how someone like Joseph Bing, a battle fleet officer with limitless contempt for Frontier Fleet, had ended up in command of the Frontier Fleet Task Force he'd led so disastrously to New Tuscany. Given the involvement of manpower and technodyne in what had happened in Monica, and knowing some of the dirty little secrets he wasn't supposed to know about Commissioner Verrocchio and Vice Commissioner Hongbo, Shavarshian had a pretty fair idea of who'd been pulling strings behind the scenes to bring that about. Which brought him to the even more nagging question of exactly how Admiral Crandall had chosen the remote hinterlands of the Madras sector for her exercise winter forage. He was willing to admit the distance from any of Battlefleet's lavish bases in the core and shell made the sector a reasonable place to evaluate the logistic train's ability to sustain a force of Battlefleet wallers for the duration of an extended campaign. On the other hand, they could have done the same thing within a couple of dozen light years of the Sol system itself if they'd wanted to pick one of the thoroughly useless unsettled star systems in the vicinity and just park there but even granting that Battlefleet had decided it just had to actually deploy its evaluation fleet, hundreds of light years from anywhere in particular, in the first Battlefleet deployment to the Verge in more than division strength in the better part of a century, it still struck him as peculiar that Sandra Crandall should have chosen this particular spot at this particular time to carry out an exercise which had been discussed off and on for decades. And one possible explanation for the peculiarity lay in the fact that someone had obviously had the juice to get Bing assigned out here and get him to agree to the assignment. If they could accomplish that outright impossibility, Hago Shavarshian didn't see any reason they couldn't accomplish the mere implausibility of getting Crandall out here for winter forage. He didn't care for that explanation at all, which unfortunately made it no less likely. But it did leave him with another burning question— how deep inside Manpower's pocket was Sandra Crandall? Shavarshian hadn't been a Frontier Fleet intelligence officer for the last 15 T years without learning how things happened here in the Verge. So the fact that Manpower had an understanding with Verrocchio and Hongbo had come as no surprise. He was surprised by Manpower's apparent reach inside Battlefleet and the SLN in general, but it wasn't that much of a stretch from the arrangements he'd already known about so he could more or less handle the concept of individual battlefleet admirals taking marching orders from manpower. 
he'd come to the conclusion that Bing, at least, had been more in the nature of a ballistic projectile than a guided missile, however. Certainly, no one with any sense would have relied upon his competence to accomplish any task more complicated than robbing a candy store. If he'd been running an operation that sent Joseph Bing out here, it would have been only because he anticipated that the man's sheer stupidity and bigotry would steer him into doing pretty much exactly what he'd actually done. He certainly wouldn't have taken the chance of explaining his real objectives to him, and he would never have relied upon the man's non-existent competence when it came to achieving those objectives. At first, Shavarshian had assumed Manpower had been as confident of Bing's ability to smash the Mantis as Bing himself had been. On that basis, his initial conclusion had been that New Tuscany represented the failure of their plans. But then he'd started thinking about Crandall's presence. If they'd been confident Bing could handle the job— why go to the undoubted expense, and probably the risk, of getting 70-plus ships of the wall assigned for backup? That sounded more as if they'd expected Bing to get reamed, which, after all, was precisely what had happened. Assuming all of that was true, the question which had taken on a certain pressing significance for Hago Shavarshian since his unexpected staff reassignment was what they expected to happen to Crandall's command. Was Bing supposed to provide the pretext while Crandall provided the club? Or was Crandall simply Bing written larger? Was she supposed to get reamed as well? And was she aware of how her, call them patrons, expected and wanted things to turn out? Or was she another ballistic projectile launched on her way in the confident expectation that she would follow her preordained trajectory to whatever end they had in mind? If, in fact, Crandall was intentionally cooperating with manpower, it seemed pretty clear Ouyang Jingwei wasn't part of the program. Bautista was basically another Bing, as far as Shavarshian could tell, but Ouyang obviously had functioning synapses and a forebrain larger than an olive. In fact, it was the operations officer who'd convinced Crandall that she had to at least attempt a negotiated outcome instead of simply opening fire the minute she crossed the hyperlimit. Bautista had all but accused Ouyang of cowardice, and Crandall clearly hadn't cared for the note of moderation, but Ouyang was at least as good at managing her admiral as she was at carrying out training simulations. And the fact that it took this fat-ass task force a solid week to get underway probably helped, the commander thought sourly from behind his expressionless face. Not even Crandall can argue that we're going to have the advantage of surprise when we arrive. He'd heard about Crandall's tirade in Verrocchio's office, complete with her vow to be underway for Spindle within 48 hours. Unfortunately, the real-life lethargy of Battlefleet's stimulus and response cycle had gotten in her way. Welcome to reality, Admiral Crandall, he thought even more sourly. I hope it doesn't bite your ass as hard as I'm afraid it will, given that my ass is likely to get bitten right along with yours. Chapter 19 all right, Daryl, Sandra Crandall said grimly. I suppose it's time. Let's go ahead and talk to these people. Yes, ma'am, Captain Daryl Chatfield, her staff communications officer, replied, and turned to the attention light at his flag deck station, which had been blinking for a studiously ignored 45 minutes. Task Group 496, Solarian League Navy, lay just outside the 22 light minute hyperlimit of the geo star known as Spindle. The planet of Flax, the capital of both the star system and the Talbot quadrant itself, lay nine light minutes inside the limit, well beyond the range of any shipboard weapon. Which didn't change the fact that TF-496 was in flagrant violation of the territorial limit recognized by centuries of interstellar law. No government could have expected to actually police every cubic light second of a sphere 12 light hours across, yet warships were still legally required to respond to the challenges and requests for identification of any star nation once they crossed its 12-hour limit. They were also legally required to acknowledge and obey any lawful instructions they received from that star nation, even if the star nation in question were some dinky little single system in the back of beyond. 
They were normally granted at least some leeway in exactly how quickly they responded, but they were still supposed to honor their legal obligations in a reasonably timely fashion. Which was precisely the reason Sandra Crandall had waited a carefully considered three-quarters of an hour before deigning to respond to the Manticoran's challenges, Commander Shavarshin reflected. Not to mention the reason she'd decided to conduct her first contact with them from such an extended range. She could say all she wanted in her official report about remaining far enough out to respect the spindle hyperlimit in order to preclude any avoidable incidents, but the real reason was to make the mantis sweat during the nine-minute transmission lag each way. Conducting any sort of official conversation with that kind of delay built in between exchanges came under the heading of calculated insult. Additional calculated insult, given her refusal even to identify herself as legally required, and she hadn't bothered to hide her enjoyment of the thought, at least in her private meetings with her senior staffers. After all, he thought, it would never do to have these neobarbs thinking we take them seriously, would it? He shook his head mentally. I think she'll take it as a personal failure if she misses a single opportunity to piss one of them off. And if she finds out she has missed one, I'm sure she'll go back and... His thoughts broke off rather abruptly, and his lips twitched with a sudden and utterly inappropriate desire to grin as a shortish, slender man with thinning gray hair appeared on the master comm display. Instead of the cringing, perspiring poor devil Crandall had expected to discover bending anxiously over his comm, imploring her to respond to his terrified communications, please, while he waited for the looming Solarian juggernaut to take note of his wretched existence, the man on the display wasn't even looking into his own pickup. Instead, he was angled two-thirds of the way away from his terminal, tipped back in his chair, heels propped on the seat of another chair, which had been turned to face him, while he gazed calmly at the book reader in his lap. A book reader which was aligned, not, Shavarshin suspected, just coincidentally, so that a sharp-eyed observer could look over his shoulder and recognize a novel about the psychically gifted detective Garrett Randall by the highly popular Darcy Lord. The man on the display went right on looking at his book reader, hit the page advance, then twitched as somebody outside the field of his own pickup hissed something in what had to be a carefully audible stage whisper. He glanced over his shoulder at his own display, then straightened, bookmarked his place, turned to face the comm, pressed a button to terminate what had obviously been a purely automated repeating challenge, and smiled brightly. Well, there you are, he said cheerfully. For a moment, Shavarshian cherished the hope apoplexy might carry Crandall off. Her demise would have to improve the situation, although, he reminded himself conscientiously, that might be wishful thinking on his part. Admiral Duniki Laszlo, Batrun 196's CO, her second in command, was no great prize and no mental giant either. Still, watching Crandall froth at the mouth and collapse in convulsions would have afforded the Frontier Fleet commander no end of personal satisfaction. His hopes were disappointed, however. I am Admiral Sandra Crandall, Solarian League Navy, she grated. I see. The man on the display nodded politely, 18 minutes later. And I'm Gregor O'Shaughnessy of Governor Medusa's staff, what can I do for you this afternoon, Admiral? He asked the question cheerfully enough, but as soon as he had, he nodded equally cheerfully to the pickup, turned back to the other chair, put his feet back up in it, and switched his book reader back on. Which made a sort of sense, if not exactly polite sense, given the two-way lag. After all, he had to do something while he waited. Unfortunately, Crandall didn't seem to feel that way about it. For just a moment, she resembled an old earth bulldog who couldn't understand why the house cat draped along the sunny windowsill was completely unfazed by her own threatening presence on the other side of the crystoplast, and her blood pressure had to be attaining interesting levels as O'Shaughnessy did to her precisely what she'd intended to do to him. Then she gave herself an almost visible mental shake and leaned closer to her own terminal. I'm here in response to your Navy's unprovoked aggression against the Solarian League, 
she told O'Shaughnessy icily. There must be some mistake, Admiral, he replied in a calm, reasonable tone, looking back up from his novel again after the inevitable delay, which did not, Shavarshan thought, add to Admiral Crandall's sunny cheerfulness. There hasn't been any unprovoked aggression against the Solarian citizens of which I'm aware. I'm referring, as you know perfectly well, to the deliberate and unprovoked destruction of the battlecruiser Jean Bart with all hands in the new Tuscany system two and a half months ago. She half snapped, then slashed one finger at Chatfield. The comm officer cut the visual from her end and she turned her chair to face Bautista. This bastard's just asking for it, Pepe, she snarled, still watching the Manticoran perusing his novel. Which will only make it even more satisfying when he finally gets it, the chief of staff replied. Crandall grunted and looked at Ouyang. I don't think this brainstorm about negotiating is going to work out very well, Jingwei. It wasn't quite a snarl this time, although it remained closer to that than to a mere growl. Probably not, ma'am, the operations officer acknowledged. On the other hand, it was never for their benefit, was it? No, but that doesn't make it any more enjoyable. Well, ma'am, at least it's giving us plenty of time to take a look at what they've got in orbit around the planet, Ouyang pointed out. That's worthwhile in its own right, I think. I suppose so, Crandall admitted irritably. What do they have, Jingwei? Bautista inquired, and Shavarshan wondered briefly if the chief of staff was deliberately trying to divert Crandall's ire from the Manticorans. But the question flitted through his brain and away again as quickly as it had come. If anyone aboard Joseph Buckley was even more pissed off at the Mantis than Crandall, that person was Vice Admiral Pepe Bautista. Unless we want to take the remotes in close enough the Mantis may pick them up and nail them, we're not going to get really good resolution. Ouyang replied. We are picking up a super dreadnought and a squadron, well, eight anyway, of those big heavy cruisers or small battle cruisers or whatever of theirs, but I'm pretty sure that isn't everything they've got. Why? Crandall sounded at least a bit calmer as she focused on Ouyang's report. We've got some fairly persistent sensor ghosts, the ops officer told her. They're just a bit too localized and just a shade too strong for me to believe the platforms are manufacturing them. The Mantis EW capabilities are supposed to be quite good, so I'm willing to bet at least some of those sensor ghosts are actually stealth units. Makes sense, ma'am, Bautista offered. They probably want to keep us guessing about their actual strength. He snorted harshly. Maybe they think they can pull off some sort of ambush. On the other hand, they might just be trying to make us worry about where the rest of their ships are, Ouyang pointed out. The chief of staff frowned and she shrugged. Until we actually turned up, they couldn't have been confident about what kind of strength we'd have. They may have expected a considerably smaller force and figured we'd be leery of pressing on when the rest of their fleet might turn up behind us at any moment. Shavarshan started to open his mouth, then closed it, then drew a deep breath and opened it again. Is it possible, he asked in a carefully neutral tone, that what they're really trying to do is to convince us they're even weaker than they actually are in order to make us overconfident? He knew even before the question was out of his mouth that the majority of his audience was going to find the very idea preposterous. For that matter, he didn't really expect it to be true himself. Unfortunately, suggesting possibly overlooked answers to questions was one of an intelligence officer's functions. Crandall and Bautista, however, didn't seem to appreciate that minor fact. In fact, they both looked at him in obvious disbelief that even a frontier fleet officer could have offered such a ludicrous suggestion. We've got 71 ships of the wall, Commander, the chief of staff said after a moment in an elaborately patient tone. The last thing these people want to do is actually fight us. They know as well as we do that any battle would be a very short, very unhappy experience for them. Under the circumstances, 
The last thing they'd want would be to make us even more confident than we already are. Don't you think they'd be more interested in encouraging us to feel cautious? Shavarshian's jaw tightened. It was hardly a surprise, however. He'd known how Bautista would react before he ever spoke. That, unfortunately, hadn't relieved him of his responsibility to do the speaking in question. But then, to his surprise, someone else spoke up. Actually, Pepe, Uyang Jingwei said, Commander Shavarshan may have a point. The chief of staff looked at her incredulously, and she shrugged. Not in the way you're thinking. As you say, they can't want to fight us, but they may have orders to do just that. And I suggest all of us bear in mind that this particular batch of neobarbs has been fighting a war for the better part of 20 T years. And um, that experience is somehow supposed to make battle cruisers and heavy cruisers capable of taking on super dreadnoughts? Bautista demanded. I didn't say that, Uyang replied coolly. What I'm suggesting is that whether they want to fight us or not, there probably aren't a whole lot of shy and retiring Manti flag officers these days. Hell, look at what this gold peak's already done. So if they've got orders to fight, I expect they'll follow them. And in that case, it's entirely possible they'd want us to underestimate their strength. It might not help them a lot, but when the odds are this bad, I'd play for any edge I could find if I were in their place. I see your point, Jingwei, Crandall acknowledged. But... Excuse me, ma'am, Captain Chatfield said. Two minutes to the Manti's response. Thank you, Daryl. Crandall nodded to him, then looked back at Bautista and Uyang. There may be something to this, Pepe. At any rate, let's not automatically assume there isn't. I want you and Jingwei to give me an analysis based on the possibility that all of her sensor ghosts are those big-ass battle cruisers and another based on the possibility that all of them are super dreadnoughts that managed to get here from Matacor faster than we got here from Myers. Understood? Yes, ma'am, Bautista acknowledged, although it was evident to Shavarshan that he continued to put very little credence in the suggestion. Crandall turned back to face the comm display and composed her features just as O'Shaughnessy nodded from it. Oh, I'm perfectly well aware of what happened in New Tuscany, of course, Admiral, O'Shaughnessy said with an affable smile. Then his eyes narrowed and his voice hardened ever so slightly. I'm just not aware of any unprovoked aggression on the Star Empire's part. He looked out of the display at her for another heartbeat, then deliberately cocked his chair back and returned his attention to his novel. Crandall seemed to swell visibly, and Shavarshan closed his eyes. He wasn't especially fond of Mantis himself, but he had to admire the skill with which O'Shaughnessy had planted his picador's dart. On the other hand, he also had to wonder what the lunatic thought he was doing, baiting the CO of such a powerful force. Unless you wish me to move immediately upon your pathetic little planet, I advise you to stop splitting semantic hairs, Mr. O'Shaughnessy. Crandall said, as if underlining Shavarshan's last thought, and her expression was as ugly as her tone. You know damned well why I'm here. I'm afraid that since I'm not a mind reader, and since you haven't bothered to respond to any of our earlier communication attempts, I really don't have a clue as to the reasons for this visit, O'Shaughnessy told her coolly, 18 minutes later, looking up from his reader once more. Perhaps the foreign ministry protocolists back in old Chicago will be able to figure it out for me when they play back the recording of your edifying conversation, which will undoubtedly be attached to Her Majesty's next note to Prime Minister Guley. Crandall twitched as if he'd tossed a glass of ice water over her, and her face turned a full shade darker at his none-too-subtle reminder that whatever her ultimate intentions might be, this was at least theoretically an exchange between official representatives of two sovereign star nations. Very well, Mr. O'Shaughnessy, she said with icy precision. In order to avoid any misunderstandings, any additional misunderstandings, I should say, I would like to speak to Governor Medusa personally. She slashed her finger at Chatfield again, 
bringing up Joseph Buckley's wallpaper in place of her own image. Then she went a step further, pressing the stud that cut off the Manticoran's video feed as well, and glared at the blank display. No one offered any theories this time, as the Admiral sat stolidly and silently in her command chair. Bautista, Uyang, and Uyang's assistants were poring over the take from the remote reconnaissance platforms, and Traversian suspected they were just as happy to have something else to do while their admiral fulminated. He wished he did. In fact, he punched up his own threat analysis files and sat earnestly and obviously studying the already thoroughly studied and overstudied data. The minutes dragged by until Chatfield cleared his throat. One minute to the Mantis response, ma'am, he said in an extraordinarily neutral tone. Turn it back on, Crandall growled, and the display came back to life. O'Shaughnessy had been reading his book again until Crandall's demand to speak to Medusa actually reached him nine minutes earlier. Now he looked up. I see. He gazed at her for a moment, then nodded. I'll see if the governor's available, he said, and his image was replaced by the Star Empire of Manticore's coat of arms. The silence on Joseph Buckley's flag bridge was intense, as this time the Mantis turned on their wallpaper. As the single frontier fleet outsider present, what Shavarshan felt was mainly dark, bitter amusement as he sensed the conflicting tides within Crandall's staffers. They were only too well aware of her fury, and most of them obviously wanted to express their own anger to show how deeply they agreed with her, but at the same time, a countervailing survival instinct left them hesitant to launch into a flood of vituperation at O'Shaughnessy's arrogance for fear of drawing Crandall's ire down upon themselves when her frustration lashed out at the nearest target of opportunity. It was an interesting dilemma, he reflected, since their silence might also be construed as an effort to avoid any suggestion that O'Shaughnessy had just humiliated Crandall by putting her in her place. He was just making a mental bet with himself that Bautista would be driven to speak before Uyang when the Manticoran wallpaper disappeared and a smallish woman with dark, alert, almond-shaped eyes appeared on the master display in its place. He recognized Dame Estelle Matsuko, Baroness Medusa, from his file imagery, and she looked remarkably composed. But there was something about the glitter in those dark eyes. Not a woman to take lightly, Shavarshan decided. Particularly not after the exchanges between O'Shaughnessy and Crandall. In fact, her obvious self-control only made her more dangerous— and if anger sparkled in the depth of those eyes, there was no more sign of fear than there had been in O'Shaughnessy's as far as he could see. Indeed, she looked much too much like the matador, advancing into the ring only after her picadores had well and truly galled the bull. Which, given that she was clearly not an idiot and had to be aware of the minor fact that she had nine obviously hostile squadrons of ships of the wall, Deliberately violating her star system's territoriality made Hago Shavarshian extremely nervous. Good afternoon, Admiral Crandall, she said frostily. What can I do for the Solarian League Navy? You can begin by surrendering the person of the flag officer who murdered Admiral Joseph Bing and 3,000 other Solarian military personnel, Crandall said flatly. After that, we can discuss the surrender of every warship involved in that incident and the matter of reparations to both the Solarian League and to the survivors of our murdered spacers. This time, neither party was prepared to retreat behind its wallpaper. Personally, Shavarshan thought that was fairly foolish, given that they couldn't reduce the awkward intervals between exchanges even if they'd wanted to. Yet if it was arguably foolish for Medusa, it was much more obviously foolish for Crandall. She was an admiral in the Solarian League Navy, a battle fleet admiral, on what she'd intended from the beginning to be a punitive expedition, and there she sat, locking eyes, uselessly, with a calm image which was nine minutes old by the time she even saw it. The image of the official representative of the star nation of Neo-Barbarians she'd set out to chastise. I see, Medusa said finally. And you think I'm going to submit to your demands because... 
she cocked her head slightly and raised polite eyebrows. Unless you're considerably more foolish than I believe, Crandall's tone made it obvious no one could be more foolish than she believed Medusa was. The nine squadrons of ships of the wall just outside your hyperlimit should suggest at least one reason. Yet another endless interval dragged past. Then Medusa nodded calmly. Which means I should assume this enumeration of warships is intended to communicate the threat that you're prepared to commit yet more acts of deliberate aggression against the Star Empire of Manticore? Which means I am prepared to embrace whatever means are necessary to safeguard the sovereignty of the Solarian League as every Solarian flag officer's standing orders require, Crandall retorted. It was remarkable, Shavarshan thought, still studiously pondering the facts and figures on his own display, how an eighteen-minute wait between exchanges undeniably robbed threats of immediacy and power while simultaneously distilling the pure essence of anger behind them. First of all, Admiral Crandall, Medusa said calmly after the inevitable delay, no one's transgressed against the sovereignty of the Solarian League. We've simply taken exception to the massacre of our ships and our personnel, and insisted that the man responsible for that massacre answer to the applicable provisions of interstellar law, Interstellar law, I might add, which has been formally recognized and codified by the Solarian League in several solemn treaties. Admiral Goldpeak gave Admiral Bing every opportunity to avoid any additional violence, and when he refused to take any of them, she fired on only one of his ships, the one he happened to be aboard at the moment, to be precise, when she could just as easily have fired on all of them, she also ceased fire and extended yet another opportunity to avoid bloodshed, further bloodshed, after Admiral Bing's demise. Crandall's expression was livid, but Medusa continued in that same tone of deadly calm. Secondly, she said, we happen to be in possession of the file copies from Admiral Sigby's flagship of both her own and Admiral Bing's standing orders, which I presume must have been at least generally similar to your own. Oddly enough, there's nothing in them about committing blatant acts of war against sovereign star nations. Aside from little things like Case Buccaneer, that is, but we won't go into that particular contingency plan at this point. Unless you insist on discussing Frontier Fleet, OFS, piracy, and disappeared merchant ships officially and on the record, of course. Her dark eyes glittered, and Shavarshan inhaled sharply as the Manticoran's steely smile challenged Crandall to press her on that point in an official exchange both sides knew was being recorded. I make this point only to clarify the fact that we're well aware you're acting at the present moment on your own authority, Medusa continued after a moment. Mind you, I'm equally well aware that one of the functions of a flag officer this far from her star nation's capital is to do precisely that in moments of crisis. However, you would do well to consider that in this instance, the Star Empire of Manticore has already communicated formally with the Solarian League on all Terra about both New Tuscan incidents. I am in receipt of copies of the League's official responses to those communiques, should you care to view them. And if you would care to avail yourself of the Link's terminus, we would be quite happy to send your own dispatches directly to Old Chicago, should you wish to seek guidance from your superiors before we have another of those misunderstandings, I believe you called them? I suspect those superiors might not be entirely pleased if some avoidable misunderstanding on your own part leads to a further regrettable escalation of the tensions between the Solarian League and the Star Empire. From the corner of his eye, Shavarshian saw Ouyang Jingwei purse her lips as that salvo went home. Medusa's confirmation that Manticore had not simply captured Sigby's databases, but hacked their most secure files was bad enough. The Manticoran's pointed suggestion that she knew far more about the League's official reaction to New Tuscany than Crandall possibly could had been even worse. 
Whether Bautista and Crandall were prepared to face the implications or not, Ouyang clearly recognized the diplomatic minefield Task Force 496 was about to enter. And just as clearly, she understood that no naval officer's connections were so good she couldn't be thrown to the wolves if she screwed up too egregiously. Crandall, fortunately for her blood pressure, if not for anything else, was too busy glaring at Medusa to notice the ops officer's expression. It was perhaps less fortunate that she was so totally infuriated that she also completely ignored Medusa's offer to put her into direct communication with her superiors on Old Terra. Clearly, the Baroness was telling her it wasn't too late to take a deep breath and back down under cover of the diplomatic smokescreen of seeking guidance from above. It was a pity Crandall wasn't paying attention. I have no intention of sitting here for a solid T month while you and your star empire redeploy your own warships, Madam Governor, the Admiral said coldly. My standing orders require what I believe my standing orders require, and the terms I've already stated are the minimum I'm prepared to accept. And then she sat there again, glaring at Medusa's image, while rage and fury fermented inside her. And if I should happen to reject your minimum terms? Shavarshan couldn't decide whether the ever-so-slight curl of Medusa's lip was deliberate or an involuntary response which had escaped her formidable self-control. In either case, the unstated contempt came through quite nicely. In that case, Governor, Crandall responded, I will advance upon the inhabited planet of your star system, I will engage and destroy every military starship in the system, and after I've done that, I'll land marines on your planet and secure control of it in the name of the Solarian League until an appropriate civilian administration can be set up by the Office of Frontier Security, and I feel confident Frontier Security will continue to administer this world and every other planet of your so-called Talbot Quadrant until such time as the Solarian League's just requirements for accountability and redress are fully satisfied. She paused very briefly, her smile thin and cold, as she deliberately raised the stakes. Then she continued in that same cold voice. I'm prepared to give you the opportunity to comply with my reasonable demands without further loss of life or destruction, but the Solarian League Navy doesn't intend to permit an act of war against the League to pass unanswered. I have no doubt you have indeed been in communication with the League. I also have no doubt of where my own duty lies, however. Because I have no desire to see additional avoidable bloodshed, I will give you precisely three T-days from the moment my ships made their alpha translations to accept my terms, If you do not do so within that time, I will cross the limit and proceed exactly as I've described, and the consequences of that will rest upon your shoulders. In the meantime, I'm uninterested in any further communications of yours, unless it is for the purpose of accepting my terms. Good day, Governor. She stabbed a button, and the display went blank. All right, Clement. Carol Ostby said quietly. Let's not stub our toes at this point, okay? Yes, sir. Commander Clement Foreman, Ostby's operations officer, smiled tautly at him on MANS Chameleon's cramped flag bridge. The scout ship had reached her rendezvous with Ghost and Wraith as all three of them crept ever so cautiously towards the final deployment point. This was, in many ways, the riskiest moment of their entire mission, and the tension on the flag bridge could have been carved with a blade. Foreman considered his displays for a moment, then keyed his mic. All emplacement teams, this is control, he said. Proceed. Absolutely nothing changed on the flag bridge itself, yet Ostby felt an almost tangible release as the order was finally given, which was about as irrational as responses came, he supposed. The scout ships themselves were extraordinarily stealthy, and the arrays they were about to emplace were equally so, which meant they were actually entering the moment of maximum danger as they deployed their work parties with the tools and equipment necessary for their task, 
since those tools and that equipment, while still very hard to detect, were considerably less stealthy. And still, however unreasonable it might be, there was that sense of relief, not relaxation, only relief, as they actually set about it at last. He watched his own displays, listening over his earbug as progress reports flowed into Flagbridge. He knew perfectly well that it wasn't really taking as long as it felt like it was taking, just as he knew how critical it was that they take the time to be sure it was done right. But whatever he might know intellectually, it didn't feel that way. He looked at the date-time display and a fresh sense of confidence swept through him. His people had trained far too hard, mastered their duties far too completely to screw up now. They would fail neither him nor the alignment, and in another fifteen days, the entire galaxy would know that as well as he did. Chapter 20 All right, Jacquemina, Sandra Crandall said flatly. These people have just run out of time. Yes, ma'am. Captain Jacquemina van Hoytz, SLNS Joseph Buckley's commanding officer, nodded from the small display on Crandall's flag bridge. The admiral looked over her shoulder at Bautista and Uyang, and both of them nodded as well. Shavarshan thought Uyang's nod seemed less cheerful than Bautista's, although that could have been his imagination. But whatever the ops officer might be feeling, it didn't matter. Not anymore. As Crandall had just observed, the Manti's time had run out, and she wasn't wasting any effort on additional attempts to communicate. Nor was she demonstrating a great deal of finesse, although the intelligence officer supposed there wasn't much point being fancy when you were a sledgehammer and your target was an egg. He'd helped Uyang work on her analysis of the sensor ghosts her recon platforms had been picking up, and he'd come to the conclusion that the operations officer was correct. Those ghosts really were there, although it had proven impossible to wring any details out of the frustratingly vague data. Apparently, the reports about the efficacy of Manticoran stealth systems had actually understated the case, which didn't make Shavarshan a lot happier when he reflected on all the other reports which had been so confidently dismissed by naval intelligence at the same time. And to add insult to injury, it seemed the ops officer's fears about the Manti's ability to pick up their recon platforms had been well-founded. They tried getting in close enough for a better look, and each time their platforms had been detected, localized, and killed before they could get close enough to penetrate their target stealth. He wasn't at all certain Solarian sensors could have locked them up that well, but from Uyang's reaction, he suspected it would have been at best a toss-up. On the other hand, there were only ten of those ghosts. Even if every one of them was a super dreadnought, Crandall's force still outnumbered the enemy by a margin of almost seven to one, and even if every single story about Manticoran capabilities proved accurate, those were still crushing odds. And if, as seemed much more likely, they were simply more of those outsized battlecruisers, Bautista's confident expectation of a rapid, devastating victory was amply justified. Shavarshan wondered if he was the only one who felt dismay at that prospect. He'd continued to hope the Mantis might recognize the insanity of taking on the entire Solarian League. Both sides had painted themselves thoroughly into corners, yet he'd hoped, almost prayed, that Medusa would recognize she was dealing with a maniac, that Crandall really would destroy every single Manticoran ship in the star system unless the Manticoran governor gave her what she wanted. But it would appear Medusa was just as done talking as Crandall. Despite the horrific odds, she'd declined to take the only escape available to her uniformed men and women, and now Hago Shavarshian was going to be an unwilling party to their massacre. That was bad enough, yet what was going to happen when word of this reached the capital system of the Star Empire of Manticore would be even worse? When the SLN did come face to face with a true Manticoran battle fleet, when Manti Super Dreadnoughts squared off against their Solarian counterparts in anything remotely resembling even numbers, the carnage was going to be incredible. Whatever Crandall and Bautista thought, he knew better, and so did Uyang Jingwei. 
and the inevitability of the league's final victory was going to be very cold consolation to the mothers and fathers and wives and husbands and children of the thousands of people who were going to be killed first. It was like watching helplessly from an orbiting satellite as an Airbus loaded with schoolchildren plummeted directly towards a mountainside, and even though none of it had been his decision, he felt contaminated, unclean, as the eagerness of Crandall, Bautista, and the others like them flowed about him. At least it should be fairly quick, he thought grimly, as the battle boards at Uyang Station flickered from the amber of standby to the unblinking blood red of readiness. Then he grimaced at his own reflection. Sure, it'll be quick, and isn't it a hell of a thing when that's the best I can think of? So much for any last-minute outbreak of sanity on their side. Captain Loretta Shoup looked up from her displays and wondered if Augustus Kumalo was as aware as she was of how calm his voice sounded. She glanced at his profile as he studied the icons in HMS Hercules's flag bridge master plot, and the calmness of his expression, the steadiness of his eyes, were not the surprise they once would have been. He's grown, she thought with a possessive pride, whose fierceness did surprise her a bit, even now. He's no happier about this than anyone else, but if there's a gram of hesitation anywhere in him, I can't see it. Well, Kumalo said with more than a little regret, I suppose it's time. He raised his voice slightly. Communications, pass the word to Tristam. Instruct Commander Kaplan to execute Paul Revere. Then contact Commodore Terakov and inform him that Code Yankee is now in effect. Captain Saunders? He looked down at the command chair comm display tied into Hercules's command deck. Tactical command is passing to Commodore Terakov at this time. Yes, sir, Victoria Saunders replied, and he sat back in his chair. Much as it galled him to admit it, Quentin St. James's fire control was far better suited to manage modern missile fire than his aged flagship's antiquated systems. He'd actually considered shifting his flag in order to exercise tactical command himself, and a part of him wished he had even now. But efficiency was more important than getting his own combat command ticket punched, and Augustus Kumalo was too self-honest to pretend he was in Ivar's Terakov's league as a combat commander. Signal from Hercules, ma'am, Lieutenant Wanda O'Reilly announced. Execute Paul Revere. Acknowledged, Naomi Kaplan replied. O'Reilly was the closest thing HMS Tristam's officer compliment had to a genuine problem child, but there was no trace of her occasional petulance in that crisp report. Kaplan gave her a nod of approval, then looked at Abigail Hearns. Is your sense of data fully updated, Guns? We're just finishing an update from Commodore Tarakov now, ma'am, Abigail replied, watching the waterfall graphic rising steadily on one of her side displays. Estimate 15 seconds to complete the upload. Very well. Kaplan turned to Lieutenant Hosea Simpkins, her astrogator, and, like Abigail, one of her Grayson officers. Astro, unless tactical's update hits a glitch, execute Paul Revere in 25 seconds. Aye, aye, ma'am. Execute Paul Revere in 25 seconds from now. Tristam disappeared from normal space 40 light minutes outside the spindle hyper limit without fuss or bother. Unlike the translation from hyperspace into normal space, a stationary upward translation left no betraying footprint behind, and she materialized almost exactly where she was supposed to be in the Alpha Bands. Fleet challenge, ma'am, O'Reilly announced. Reply, Kaplan ordered calmly. Replying, aye, ma'am, the comm officer acknowledged and triggered Tristam's transponder code. That transponder had been locked down for fairly obvious reasons while the destroyer hid outside Crandall's massive task force. And while Kaplan didn't really anticipate any itchy trigger fingers among the rest of 10th Fleet's tactical officers, she still felt a profound sense of relief when HMS Artemis acknowledged her identity. 
Unlike Sandra Crandall, Naomi Kaplan had an excellent appreciation of just how much firepower was waiting for her. Very well, guns, she said, once Tristram's right to be there had been confirmed. Send the data. Aye, aye, ma'am, sending now. Lord, what an arrogant bitch, Michelle Henke said quietly, standing between Domenica Adenauer and Cynthia Lecter as the three of them studied the data Tristram had just transmitted to Artemis. And this is a surprise because... Lecter asked equally quietly, and Michelle snorted in bitter amusement. More a case of a confirmation I didn't really want, she acknowledged. I did think she might at least inform the governor her time limit had officially expired, though. With all due respect, ma'am, I don't see where it makes much difference. Lecter twitched her shoulder slightly. It's obvious the same people who picked Bing also picked her, and whether she's here as a knowing cat's paw or got selected because she's just as stupid as he was, we all knew what she was here for from the outset. Michelle nodded, and Cindy was right. She had known why Crandall was here, and all of her own planning had been predicated on that knowledge. Yet that didn't diminish the undeniable flicker of fury she felt as she contemplated Crandall's dismissive arrogance. No, that's not being quite fair to yourself, girl, she thought. Sure, part of you is pissed off because even though the overconfident idiot is doing exactly what you predicted when you made your own plans, exactly what you want her to do if she's stupid enough to attack in the first place, you resent being taken so lightly. Because it's part and parcel of the kind of arrogance you've seen out of so many sollies, but what really pisses you off is that she doesn't give a single solitary damn about all the people she's about to get killed. Of course, her lips skinned back in a hexapuma's hunting snarl. At the moment, she's thoroughly convinced that none of the people in question are going to be hers. And she doesn't know she took long enough getting here for the Apollo pods to beat her either. Her smile turned even thinner and colder for a moment as she contemplated how the arrival of those pods had changed her initial defensive planning. But then she put that reflection aside and concentrated on the data in front of her. There hadn't been any changes she could see, although a few additional details had been added to the initial report HMS Ivano had delivered three days ago. Mostly little stuff, like additional data on individual ships' electronic and gravitic emissions. As she'd expected, the various destroyers' emission signatures varied widely, which wasn't surprising given how much the Rampart and War Harvest classes had been refitted over their lifetimes. The heavier ships' emissions were much closer to their book profiles, though. Hercules's CIC had easily tagged the individual units of Rear Admiral Gordon Nelson's battlecruiser squadron, since they'd lifted his ship's electronic fingerprints out of the data they'd captured from Bing's task force. And although they didn't have hard individual IDs on the other battlecruiser squadron, it was obvious all of them were Nevadas. There was an impressive uniformity among the super dreadnoughts as well. All but seven of them were scientist-class ships, and all seven of the others were members of the Vega class, which were basically only repeat scientists with a couple of additional missile tubes in each broadside. By the standards of the pre-war Royal Manticoran Navy, they weren't that bad a design, although the first of the scientists had been built long enough ago that they'd still been equipped with projectile-firing point defense systems— at least all of these ships seem to have been upgraded to laser clusters since, judging from the detailed passive scans Augustus Kumalo's Ghost Rider platforms had pulled in. And it was painfully obvious that even now, the Sollies didn't begin to grasp just how capable and stealthy the Ghost Rider recon drones actually were. To be sure, the really close passes had been purely ballistic, with no active emissions to betray their presence, but even so, they shouldn't have been able to get in close enough to literally read ships' names off their hulls without someone noticing something. Don't complain, she told herself firmly, and considered the armament readouts on Crandall's ships. The scientists were 6.8 million ton units with 32 missile tubes, 24 lasers, and 26 grazers in each broadside. 
That was a heavier, or at least more numerous, energy broadside than any modern Manticoran or Grayson super dreadnought would have mounted. On the other hand, they had only 16 counter-missile tubes and 32 point defense stations in each broadside, whereas Artemis, although technically only a battle cruiser, had 32 CM tubes and 30 much heavier and much more capable point defense clusters. Even the Saganami Seas had 20 tubes and 24 clusters in each broadside, and given the fact that Michelle Hankey had absolutely no intention of straying into energy range of her opponents, that imbalance was just likely to prove fatal for Admiral Sandra Crandall. Stay out of energy range, hell, Michelle thought astringently. I'm going to stay clear out of her missile envelope, too. I wonder if Crandall's superstitious, she mused. Adnauer looked up from the plot and raised one eyebrow, and Michelle chuckled coldly. You didn't recognize her flagship's name, Dominica? The ops officer shook her head, and it was Lecter's turn to chuckle. This is the sixth Joseph Buckley they've built, she said. And I've got to wonder why even Sollies haven't learned from that much history. It hasn't been exactly the luckiest name in the SLN's history. Well, fair's fair, Cindy. Michelle pointed out. They didn't name any of them for the luckiest scientist in history, either. Is that your understatement for the day, ma'am? Lecter asked, and this time Adnauer chuckled, too, as the name finally clicked for her as well. Dr. Joseph Buckley had been a major figure in the development of the original impeller drive on Beowulf in the 13th century. Unhappily, he hadn't been one of the more fortunate figures— He'd been a critical part of the original development team in 1246, but he'd had a reputation among his peers even then for being as erratic as he was brilliant, and he'd been determined to prove it was accurate. Although Adrian Warshawski was to develop the Warshawski sale only 27 years later, Buckley had been too impatient to wait around. Instead, he'd insisted that with the proper adjustment, the impeller wedge itself could be safely inserted into a hyperspace gravity wave. Although several of his contemporaries had acknowledged the theoretical brilliance of his work, none had been prepared to endorse his conclusions. Unfazed by his peers' lack of confidence, Buckley, whose considerable store of patents had made him a wealthy man, had designed and built his own test vessel, the Dayhawk, named for a figure out of Babylonian mythology. With a volunteer crew embarked, he'd set out to demonstrate the validity of his work. The attempt, while spectacular, had not been a success. In fact, the imagery which had been recorded by the Dayhawk's escorts still turned up in slow motion in HD compilations of the most awe-inspiring disaster footage in galactic history. While Buckley undeniably deserved to be commemorated alongside such other greats as Warshawski and Radhakrishnan, and despite the huge body of other work he'd left behind, it was the dramatic nature of his demise for which he was best remembered and his various namesakes in SLN service had fared little better than he himself had. Of the current ship's predecessors, only one had survived to be withdrawn from service and decommissioned. Actually, only three of them were lost on active service, Cindy, Michelle pointed out. Four, if you count the battle cruiser, ma'am, Lecter argued respectfully. Well, all right, I'd forgotten about her, Michelle shrugged. Still, I don't think it's exactly fair to blame the Buckley curse for a ship lost to causes unknown, though. Why? Because having witnesses makes it more final? Or because faulty fusion bottles and wage-on-wage -wage collisions are more spectacular? They're certainly more in keeping with the original's final voyage, Michelle pointed out. All right, I'll grant that much, Lecter agreed. And actually, I suppose losing only four of them... Or three, if we go with your list, in the better part of 700 T years, probably isn't really proof the curse exists. And I'm not an especially superstitious gal myself. But having said all that, I wouldn't care to serve aboard one of them, and especially not... Her smile disappeared, and her eyes darkened. If I was sailing into what promised to be the ugliest war my navy'd ever fought... Neither would I... Michelle acknowledged. On the other hand, she doesn't think that's what she's doing, now does she?
Sir Ivar's Terakov sat in his command chair on HMS Quentin St. James's flag bridge and thought about the last time he'd taken a Saganami C-class heavy cruiser into combat. By most Navy standards, the odds he faced were even worse this time, but he wasn't really interested in most Navy standards. Unlike Uyang Jingwei and Hego Shavarshan, he knew precisely what those ten sensor ghosts they'd been picking up actually were. Four of them were the Sealax Pegasus, Hippogriff, Troll, and Goblin, with the next best thing to 400 Lax embarked. As stealthy as the Manticoran Alliance's light attack craft were, four Sealax were much smaller sensor targets than all those Lax would have been if they'd been deployed, which meant they could be more readily concealed or at least that their natures could be more readily disguised while they remained in their shipboard bays. Two more of the ghosts were ammunition ships, stuffed to the deckhead with Apollo missile pods crammed full of fusion-powered Mark 23 and Mark 23E MDMs. And the other four were Scotty Tremaine's cruisers, Alistair McKeon, Madeline Hoffman, Canopus, and Trebuchet. You just keep right on coming, Admiral Crandall. Terakov thought coldly. You don't even begin to realize just how much you've got us exactly where we want you, but you're about to find out. Sir Admiral Kumalo would like to speak to you, Lieutenant Analante Montella, his communications officer, said quietly. Put him on my display, Adelante. Yes, sir. A moment later, Augustus Kumalo's face appeared on the tiny comm screen deployed from Terakov's command chair. Good afternoon, sir, he said. Good afternoon, Ivars, Kumalo acknowledged. The admiral looked considerably calmer than Terakov suspected he actually was, and there was little sign of tension in his deep voice. As you can see, Kumalo continued, our friend Crandall at least has the virtue of punctuality. I suppose anyone has to have at least some positive qualities, sir. You may have been disabused of that supposition by the time you're my age, Kumala replied with a thin smile. At any rate, assuming she maintains her current acceleration and heads for a zero-zero intercept with the planet... She probably expects to be joining us here in about four hours. Of course, she doesn't expect any of us to still be alive when she gets here. Life is full of disappointment, sir. My own thought exactly. Kumalo's teeth showed briefly. Then he twitched his shoulders in a sort of abbreviated shrug. Admiral Enderby is launching his birds now. As soon as they're all clear of the bays, he'll pull the carriers further back in system to keep them out from underfoot, and Commander Badmachin is rolling pods. Unless Admiral Goldpeak decides differently, it looks like we'll be going with Agen Corps. Understood, sir. In that case, I'll leave you to it, Kumalo said with a nod. Kumalo, clear. He disappeared from Terakov's comm screen, and Terakov returned his attention to Quentin St. James's master plot. In many ways, he supposed, Overstegen's Nikes might have been a better choice than his own heavy cruisers, given that the Nike was equipped with keyhole and the Saganami Sea wasn't. In fact, before the ammunition ships Etna and Vesuvius had arrived with their massive loads of Apollo pods, the Nikes would have been in orbit around Flax, while the Saganami Seas played the part of the beaters coming along behind the quarry. The cruisers still had a lot of control links, however, almost certainly enough of them coupled with Apollo to show Crandall the error of her ways. And if there isn't, he thought grimly, there's always Admiral Goldpeak, isn't there? Captain? Yes, Nicolette? Captain Jacomina van Hoyts looked across Joseph Buckley's command deck at Commander Nicolette Sambroth. Ma'am, I'm still picking up those grav pulses, Sambroth said, and van Hoyts frowned. Sambroth was one of the better tack officers with whom she'd served, but the commander appeared to have been badly spooked by the implications of the Mantis' apparent FTL comm ability. 
Not that Van Hoyts really blamed her, assuming the report of the single dispatch boat to escape the New Tuscan debacle was accurate. Not only that, but she knew Vice Admiral Uyang shared Sambroth's concerns. And I'm not too damned happy over them myself, especially when I think about what's going to happen two or three engagements down the road when we run into a real mighty wall of battle, but for right now... You're passing your observations along to Admiral Uyang? Her tone made the question a statement, and Sambroth nodded. Of course, ma'am. Then we're just going to have to assume Admiral Crandall has that information as well, Van Hoyt pointed out rather gently. Sambroth looked up from her displays. Their eyes met for a moment. Then the tactical officer nodded again, with a rather different emphasis. Van Hoyts nodded back, returned her own attention to her plot, and settled back in her command chair. Joseph being always was a friggin' idiot, she thought. I'm not even going to pretend I miss him either, but this... She shook her head, eyes hardening on the plot, and wondered how many other members of the SLN officer corps secretly recognized that Bing's demise could only improve that officer corps' overall efficiency probably more than she was prepared to believe, actually. She certainly hoped so, at any rate, given what the ability to deny that reality implied. Yet as she contemplated what his removal was about to cost the Star Empire of Manticore, and ultimately cost the Solarian League Navy, the price tag seemed exorbitantly high. And it's only going to get worse. No matter how bad I think it's going to be, it's only going to get worse. Captain Alice Levinsky, commanding officer of LAC Group 711, watched the Shrikes and Katanas of Carrier Division 7.1 forming up around Her Majesty's light attack craft Typhoon. She was aware of a certain queasiness as she contemplated the juggernaut of super dreadnoughts rumbling steadily towards flags. Against a havenite wall of battle, even the Manticoran Alliance's newest generation lacks no longer possessed anywhere near the survivability they'd boasted when the Shrike A was first introduced all of nine T years ago. And even if they had, super dreadnoughts, even solid super dreadnoughts, were normally too heavily armored for even a Shrike's enormous grazer to damage significantly. Of course, the Shrike B, like her own Typhoon, had significantly improved its grazer's grav lensing when the newest generation of bow wall came in. The Bravos really could blast their way through SD armor, assuming they could get close enough. Despite that, two-thirds of her lacks were Katana-class space superiority fighters with magazines packed with Viper dual-purpose missiles because Manticoran lack doctrine had changed— especially after the hideous losses of the Battle of Manticore, to emphasize the missile defense role rather than the strike role. Lacks were smaller and much more elusive targets than any hyper-capable ship, and especially with the new Mark 33 counter-missiles, or the Vipers based on the same missile body and drive, one of them could provide very nearly as much screening capacity as an all-up destroyer which meant a lack group had become the most effective and least costly means of bolstering a wall of battle's missile defenses, which also freed up the perpetually insufficient number of lighter starships for deployment elsewhere. But, Levinsky reminded herself coldly, these weren't Havenite super dreadnoughts. They were Sollies, and that was an entirely different kettle of fish. Like the rest of 10th Fleet's officers, Levinsky had studied the technical data from the captured Solarian battlecruisers attentively, and unless that data was grossly inaccurate, the Sali's anti-lac capabilities were even more primitive, a lot more primitive, than the Havenites had been during Operation Buttercup, which suggested all sorts of interesting tactical possibilities to one Alice Levinsky. Commodore Tirakov confirms Arjun Corsair, Lieutenant Stilson MacDonald said. Thank you, Scotty Tremaine acknowledged. There was no need for his communications officer to know just how much calmer his voice was than he was. Had Captain Levinsky only known, a part of Tremaine, a rather large part as a matter of fact, would have preferred to be sitting where she was rather than in his palatial command chair on the flag deck of a brand spanking new heavy cruiser. 
it wasn't so much that he doubted his competence in his present role as that he'd become so comfortable in his previous role. How did a nice boy who only wanted to be a shuttle pilot end up sitting here of all places, he thought wryly. He'd really assumed that when he finally got Starship Command, it would be of a carrier, not a cruiser. But he'd also long since concluded that Bupers worked in mysterious and inscrutable ways. True, this one seemed a bit more inscrutable than most, but when the Navy offered you a command slot like this one, you took it. He couldn't imagine anyone who wouldn't, and if anyone had turned it down, the idiot in question would have signed the death warrant for any hope of future promotion. The Navy wasn't in the habit of entrusting its starships to people whose own actions demonstrated they lacked the confidence for that sort of responsibility. And if they really insist on prying me out of the lax, this is one hell of a lot better than a kick in the head, he admitted. Not only that, but at least they let me have the EWO I wanted. He glanced at the battered and bedamned-looking chief warrant officer sitting at the electronic warfare officer station. Aboard any other starship he could think of, that position would have been held by a commissioned officer. Aboard a unit as powerful as a Saganami C, especially on a division flagship staff, the officer in question would have been at least a senior-grade lieutenant, and more probably a lieutenant commander. But CWO Sir Horace Harkness was pretty much a law unto himself within the RMN. Of course you can have Harkness, Captain Shaw, Admiral Cortez's chief of staff, had snorted when he'd made the unusual request. There's a note somewhere in your personnel jacket that says, we're not supposed to break up Beauty and the Beast. The captain's lips had twitched at Tremaine's expression. Oh, you hadn't heard that particular nickname, Captain Tremaine? I hadn't realized it had escaped your attention. Then Shaw had sobered, tipping back in his chair and regarding Tremaine with thoughtful eyes. I don't say it's the sort of habit we really want to get into, Captain, but one thing Admiral Cortez has always recognized is that there are exceptions to every rule. Mind you, if it were just a case of favoritism, he wouldn't sign off on it for a minute. Fortunately, however, the two of you have demonstrated a remarkable and consistently high level of performance, not to mention the fact that between you, you and his wife seem to have permanently reformed him. So unless we have to, no one's interested in breaking up that particular team. Besides, he'd snorted in sudden amusement, even if we were, I'm quite sure Sir Horace would be more than willing to massage the computers in your favor. Tremaine had opened his mouth, but Shaw had waved his hand before he could speak. I'm perfectly well aware that he's promised not to do that sort of thing anymore, Captain Tremaine. Even the best intentioned can backslide, however, and we'd prefer not to expose him to too much temptation. Tremaine's own lips twitched in remembered amusement, and he was astonished how much better the memory made him feel. All right, Adam, he said, turning to Lieutenant Commander Adam Golbatsi, his operations officer. You heard, Stilson. Yes, sir, I'm on it, Golbatsi acknowledged. Good. Tremaine looked at Harkness. Any change on their EW chief? No, sir, not so as you'd notice. Harkness shrugged. I know we didn't get complete starts on their wall as at New Tuscany, Skipper, but so far, these guys don't look to have anything better than being had. Or if they do, they haven't bothered to bring it to the pot yet. I have to agree with Chief Harkness, sir, Commander Francine Klusner, Tremaine's chief of staff, said, looking up from her own console. If there'd been anyone on his staff who might have had his or her nose put out of joint by finding a mere warrant officer in the staff electronic warfare officer slot, Tremaine would have bet on Klusner not because the fair-haired, gray-eyed commander was anything but highly intelligent and competent in her own right. She was, however, by far the most nobly born of any of his staffers, with an accent that was almost as languid and drawling as Michael Oberstegen's. Fortunately, that was the only thing about her anyone could have accused of languor, and she and Harkness had actually hit it off very well from the beginning. I've been looking at the take from the platforms, she continued now. They ought to be pulling out all the stops after what happened to Bing. Better safe than sorry, after all. She shrugged. 
If they are, then I don't think their talk birds are going to have much problem locking up the real targets. Compared to PPW? Harkness shook his head with an evil smile. Not oddly, ma'am. These people are toast if that's the best they've got. Let's not get carried away with our own enthusiasm, chief, Tremaine said mildly. No, sir, Harkness agreed dutifully. Chapter 21 Coming up on turnover in two minutes, ma'am. Sandra Crandall looked up from a conversation with Pepe Bautista as her astrogator, Captain Baron Harhuish, made the announcement 114 minutes after her task force had started in system. Its velocity relative to the planet Flax had increased to just over 23,000 kilometers per second, and the range was down to a bit over 81 million kilometers, and Crandall nodded in satisfaction. Then she looked at Ouyang Jingwei. Any more movement out of them? No, ma'am, Ouyang replied. We're picking up more of those graph pulses, though, and I'm still a bit concerned about this volume here. She indicated a large-scale display of the space immediately about Flax. A zone directly on the far side of the planet was highlighted in amber, and Crandall glanced at the indicated area, then grimaced. The pulses have to be from that damned FTL comma theirs, she said with an impatient shrug. Her tone was irritated, perhaps even a bit petulant, as if she still didn't much care for admitting the Mantis really had developed a practical, faster-than-light means of communication. Unfortunately, even she had been forced to admit that what happened at New Tuscany demonstrated that they had. At the moment, though, she continued, all it really means is that they may be getting recon information on us a little quicker than we're getting it on them. It's not going to change the odds any, and unless they've magically teleported in reinforcements directly from Manticore, I'm not especially worried about what they may be hiding in that uncertainty volume of yours either, Jingwei. There wasn't anything particularly scary in there before we started in, after all. No, ma'am, Ouyang concurred. An outside observer might have detected a smidgen less than total agreement in her tone, however, Hago Shavarshan thought. On the other hand, she continued a bit diffidently, we never did get a resolution on those sensor ghosts, and we've got these other impeller sources over here. She dropped a cursor onto the master display, indicating the sextet of impeller wedges their remotes had picked up 36 minutes earlier. They hadn't been able to get a solid read on whatever was generating those impeller signatures, but from the wedge strength, whatever they were, they were well up into the multi-million ton range, despite the ridiculously high acceleration numbers they were putting out. Freighters, Bautista said dismissively. Ouyang looked at the chief of staff, and he shrugged. That's all they can be, Zheng Wei. Oh, I'll grant you they're fast. They must be fleet auxiliaries to pull that excel. Probably supply ships, maybe repair ships, but they sure as hell aren't warships. With their assumed masses, they'd have to be super dreadnoughts. And with us bearing down on them this way, why run with six of them and leave number seven behind with nothing but cruisers to support it? What I'm worried about is why they waited this long to run in the first place, Ouyang said rather more sharply than she normally spoke to Bautista. Waiting until they figured out we really weren't bluffing, probably, he replied with another slightly more impatient shrug. Or maybe just waiting until they were sure all our units were headed in system without leaving any light units outside the limit to micro-jump around the hypersphere and pounce when they come out the other side or maybe until they'd finished offloading their cargo, Ouyang said pointedly. Bautista arched an eyebrow, and the ops officer inhaled deeply. We've all agreed the missiles they used on Jean Bart had to come from pods, Pepe, she pointed out. To get that kind of range, they have to be bigger than their battle cruiser's tubes can manage, right? Bautista nodded, and it was her turn to shrug. Well, I don't know about you, but I have to wonder how many pods six freighters that size can transport. And I also have to wonder why it is that all of a sudden any recon drone we steer into a position to take a look at the planet's shadow is getting blown right out of space. 
You think they've stockpiled pods in that volume? Crandall asked, intervening before Bautista could respond to Uyang's God-give-me-strength tone. I think there's some reason they don't want us seeing in there, ma'am. The ops officer shook her head. And I agree with Pepe that they wouldn't be sending away six ships of the wall when we'll be into missile range of the planet in another hour and a half, not unless they were going to pull all of their ships out, at least. On the other hand, whatever these things are, their stealth and EW are good enough we couldn't get firm resolution on them, not even confirmation they were really there until they lit off their impellers. So I think we have to look very carefully at the possibility that their departing bogies hung around using EW to play hide-and-seek with our platforms until we actually started in system, then pulled out after unloading some cargo that didn't have the same kind of stealth capability, something we might have picked up if they'd just dumped it into orbit earlier. And if they've left something on the far side of the planet that they don't want us getting a good look at, missile pods are certainly the first possibility that leaps to my mind when I start thinking about that. Bautista had flushed in obvious irritation, but Crandall nodded thoughtfully. Makes sense, she acknowledged. Or as much sense as anything someone stupid enough not to surrender is likely to be doing anyway. And you're right, six freighters that size could dump a hell of a lot of pods. Bautista's expression smoothed quickly as Crandall took Uyang's suggestion seriously. It wasn't the first time something like that had happened, and Shavarshan wished he could believe Crandall had deliberately chosen Uyang for her staff— in hopes the ops officer's ability, for a battle fleet officer at least, to think outside the box might offset Bautista's inclination towards sycophancy and his habit of automatically dismissing any opinion that didn't agree with his own. Much as the frontier fleet officer might have wanted to believe Crandall had done it on purpose, he wouldn't have wagered anything on the probability. Still, now that Crandall had endorsed at least the possibility that Uyang had a point— Bautista's expression, after a moment of blankness, had become intently, one might almost have said theatrically, thoughtful. He may not do subtle very well, Shavarshin thought dryly, but he does have an awesome ability to spot the glaringly obvious, especially when someone rubs his nose in it. No siree, no one's going to hide any flare-lit old earth elephants from Pepe Bautista in any dark rooms, no matter how hard they try. All the same, Crandall continued, whatever they've got stockpiled is still going to be bottlenecked by their available fire control. Agreed, ma'am, Uyang acknowledged without even glancing in the chief of staff's direction. On the other hand, as Commander Shavarshan and I have both pointed out, we don't really know how good their fire control is. She shrugged. There's no way a heavy cruiser, even one the size the Manti seem to be building these days, could match a waller where control links are concerned, but I think it's entirely possible they can throw bigger salvos than we'd anticipated. Maybe. Bautista's tone, like his expression, was much more thoughtful than it had been, and he pursed his lips. I still don't see any way they could throw salvos big enough to saturate our defenses, though. I'm not saying they can, Uyang said. But they may not have to saturate our defenses to get at least a few leaguers through. The fact that they won't get a lot of concentrated hits doesn't mean we're not going to get hurt. And one way they might degrade our defenses would be to simply fire off huge numbers of missiles. Most of them might be basically blind-fired. But if they buried their real fire in that kind of background hash... It would take at least a little while for missile defense to sort out which were the genuine threats and engage them. It'd be wasteful as hell, and I'm not saying that's what they're going to do. I'm only saying they could do it, and that's why I'd feel a lot more comfortable knowing what they're so busy hiding. Well, I'm sure we'll be finding out shortly. Crandall smiled tightly. And when we do, they're going to find out that an alarm sounded, and Uyang stiffened in her chair. Status change, she announced sharply. We have hyper footprints directly astern of the task force, ma'am. Crandall snapped around to the master plot as 21 fresh icons flared into existence four and a half light minutes behind her own ships. 
Whatever they were, they'd popped out of hyperspace in an exhibition of pinpoint precise astrogation. Their tightly grouped crash translation put them right on the limit, approaching it at almost 5,000 kilometers per second, and everyone on Joseph Buckley's flag bridge seemed to hold his or her breath while they waited for the sensor platforms Yang had left behind to identify the newcomers, or almost everyone at least. Turn over in 15 seconds, ma'am. Harhuish announced. Crandall's eyes flicked to the astrogator, then back to the plot, and her expression was grim. Whatever else those new icons might be, they had to be Manticoran warships, warships which had been waiting in hyper until her own force was deeply mired inside the star's hyperlimit. And if it should happen that they were super dreadnoughts, her potential losses had just climbed drastically. The platforms make it 14 of those big battle cruisers, what look like four light cruisers, and three ships in the four to five million ton range, Ooyang finally announced. The icons in the master plot blinked, changing color and shape to reflect the IDs CIC had assigned to each of them as light speed data on their emissions came in. From their formation and emissions, it looks like the three biggies are probably freighters. Ammunition ships, I'd guess. Her voice was taut, but it also carried an undeniable note of relief, and Hago Shavarshian felt his own clenched stomach muscles relax. Crandall said nothing for a moment or two, but then she gave a sharp bark of a laugh. Well, I'll give them credit for audacity, she said as Bautista and Yang looked at her. This gold peak's obviously an ambitious bitch, isn't she? The admiral jutted her chin at the icons beginning to accelerate in system after her own forces. And she must have used quite a bit of ingenuity arranging her ambush. But ingenious or not, she's no mental giant. Crandall gazed at the plot for a few more seconds, then glanced at Harhuish. Go ahead and make turnover, Baron. Kick our D-cell to get us back on profile, then drop back to 80%. Yes, ma'am, the astrogator acknowledged, and began passing orders as she turned back to Bautista and Uyang. Like I say, I'll give them marks for audacity, she said with a grim smile. But falling in love with your own ingenuity can be painful sometimes. Her chuckle was harsh. Bad enough for them to even think about ambushing someone our size— Reminds me of the story about the kid who tried to catch a house cat and wound up catching a tiger, but they fucked up their timing, too. I don't care how much acceleration advantage they've got, they can't possibly overtake us until well after we've reached the planet and dealt with their friends in orbit. Did they screw up their timing, ma'am? Yang asked. The admiral gave her a sharp look, and the ops officer shrugged. I agree with what you just said about their ability to overtake us, but it strikes me as a bit of a coincidence that they should just happen to come in at almost exactly the same time we were scheduled to make turnover. Crandall considered that for several moments, then grimaced. You may be right that the timing was deliberate. I can't imagine what kind of an advantage they'd think it would give them, though. And I don't think we should completely rule out the possibility that it really was a coincidence they hit so close to our turnover point— In fact, I'm still inclined to think that's exactly what it was. We know they've got a range advantage, at least as long as they stick to their missile pods, and we also know from what they did at New Tuscany that they can obviously tow at least a fair number of pods inside their wedges without compromising their acceleration. So what they probably wanted to do was catch us in system of them, stuck inside the hyperlimit with them outside us, but close enough they could get into their range of us well before we reached the planet. There's no way we could match their acceleration rate, so as long as they were careful about it, they could probably get into their range of us while staying outside our missile range of them and use their Excel advantage to cut back out across the limit and escape into hyper if we reversed course to come after them. That's why I'm pretty sure they screwed the pooch with their timing, because even with the Excel rates Gruner reported, they can't catch us with the geometry they've actually got. And they damn sure can't do it before we get to the planet, pound every warship in orbit around it out of space, and bring the entire system's infrastructure, 
such as it is and what there is of it, into our own range. At which point, they've got three options. Surrender to keep us from trashing all that infrastructure. Go ahead and fight us on our terms, in which case we still wreck their infrastructure and they all get dead. Or turn around and run away with their tails between their legs when they run out of missiles. Ooyang nodded slowly, although Shavarshan wasn't at all sure the ops officer shared Crandall's conclusions, or at least that she shared her admiral's confidence. It was fairly obvious to the frontier fleet officer that Ooyang expected Task Force 496 to get hurt a lot worse than Crandall did, yet even the operations officer had to admit that two widely separated forces, each massively inferior to the single enemy force between them, were unlikely, to say the very least, to achieve victory. Well, Michelle Henke said, gazing into the master plot on HMS Artemis's flag bridge, at least we know what she's going to do now. Yes, ma'am, Dominica Adenauer said. Our arrival doesn't seem to have phased her, does it? Fair's fair, Michelle shrugged. There's not a lot else she could do, really. Adenauer nodded, although Michelle sensed her continuing disgruntlement. It wasn't so much that Adenauer disagreed with anything Michelle had just said, as that the ops officer was accustomed to dealing with Havenite opponents, and no Havenite admiral would ever have ambled this confidently towards a Manticoran foe. The fact that Sandra Crandall was doing just that did not give Dominica Adenauer a flattering estimate of the Sollies IQ. Michelle shared that opinion, but she also stood by her observation about Crandall's alternatives. Her super dreadnoughts were holding their acceleration to just over 337 gravities, in strict accordance with the 80% of maximum power, which was the galactic naval standard inertial compensator safety margin. At maximum military power, they could have managed almost 422 gravities, but that was it. At 80% power, Michelle's trio of four million-ton mil-spec ammunition ships, HMS Mauna Loa, New Popocatapetl, and Nova Kilimanjaro, could manage a hundred gravities more than the Sali SD's maximum military acceleration. Running flat out, they could manage over 650 gravities, while her Nikes could top 670. What that meant was that Crandall's ships of the wall could neither run away from nor catch her if they tried to go in pursuit. And with Michelle outside Crandall's position, coming up her ship's wakes, there was really no way she could dodge either. Nor could she possibly make it all the way across the hypersphere to the opposite edge of the limit without being brought to action. And however confident Crandall might be of her task force's defensive capabilities, the Solarian Admiral had to know her missiles were substantially outranged. In fact, just on the basis of what Michelle had done at New Tuscany before that first dispatch boat translated out, Crandall damned well ought to know her own anti-ship missile's maximum-powered envelope from rest was, at best, less than a quarter of that of the missiles which had killed Jean Bart. So given her unpalatable menu of maneuver options, the one she was pursuing actually made the most sense. However nimble Michelle's ships might be, the planet couldn't dodge, and it was what Michelle had to defend. So if Crandall could get into her own range of flax with what she no doubt believed to be her crushing superiority in missile tubes, she could compel Michelle to either come to her or concede strategic defeat, regardless of any tactical advantages the RMN might possess. And if we're wrong about our ability to penetrate their defenses, it could still work for her, Michelle conceded grimly. She gazed into the plot for several more seconds, then turned and crossed to her command station. She settled into the chair, looking down at the comm which was kept permanently tied into Artemis's command deck. Captain Armstrong, please, she told the comm rating, monitoring the link. Yes, ma'am. The rating disappeared. The crossed arrows of Artemis's wallpaper replaced her image for a moment, then disappeared in turn as Captain Victoria Armstrong appeared on Michelle's display. You called, Admiral? she inquired. Her dark green eyes were guileless, but Michelle had long since discovered the wicked sense of humor, which was just as much a part of Armstrong as the chestnut-haired flag captain's confidence and rock-steady competence. I believe I did, she replied. Now, let me see. 
There was something I wanted to discuss with you, but... Her voice trailed off, and Armstrong grinned appreciatively at her. Could it have had something to do with that unpleasant person headed for Flax, ma'am? The captain suggested in a politely helpful tone, and Michelle snapped her fingers. That was what I wanted to talk about, she said wonderingly, and heard someone behind her chuckling. Then her own expression sobered. So far, it looks pretty much like the Alpha Plan right down the line, Vicky. Yes, ma'am, Armstrong replied equally seriously. Wilton and Ron and I were just discussing that. I often wonder what's going through this Crandall's mind at the moment, though. I'd guess we gave her a bad few minutes when we turned up, judging by the way she delayed her turnover, but I imagine she got over it once she figured out we don't have any super dreadnoughts. At any rate, I don't expect her to be screening us with any surrender offers anytime soon. That would make it simpler, wouldn't it, ma'am? Probably, but it looks like it's going to take Admiral Kamalo and Commodore Terakov to convince her of that after all. In the meantime, go ahead with the Agincourt Alpha variant. We'll just quietly follow along behind until and unless we're needed. Yes, ma'am. Michelle nodded to the captain, then turned back to the plot, tipping back her chair and crossing her legs as she considered the imagery. At this scale, even Crandall's task force seemed to crawl across the display, and her own ship's motion was barely perceptible as they began building on the vector they'd carried across the Alpha Wall with them. Given the steady, consistent improvements in compensator design over the last ten or fifteen T years, Mantikoran captains and admirals, she thought wryly, no longer fretted anywhere near as much as the officers of other navies over compensator safety margins. The fact that they'd been operating on a wartime basis for twenty T years or so, rather than the peacetime basis of the rest of the galaxy, had something to do with that as well. The RMN had discovered that even with old-style compensators, book safety margins had been excessively cautious, and Michelle's current acceleration rate was 6.5 kps squared. She'd thought about restricting her excel, but there wasn't really much point. Even if the acceleration she'd displayed at New Tuscany hadn't been reported to Crandall, it must have already been reported to the SLN back on Old Earth in Sigby's official report. And if Crandall hadn't already been aware of it, perhaps seeing it now might rattle the Solly. Not that Michelle really expected it to have any impact on what was about to happen, and her mouth tightened as she recognized an all-too-familiar awareness deep down inside herself. She'd seen too many tactical plots like this one not to know what was coming, not to sense the inevitability. She remembered the first time she'd seen a plot like this and known it wasn't a simulation. She'd trained for that moment her entire professional life, and yet, deep inside, she hadn't quite believed it was real, or that it couldn't somehow be averted at the very last moment, at least. She'd done her best to prepare herself, and she'd thought, in her inexperience, that she'd succeeded. She'd been wrong. Despite the most realistic exercises the Royal Manticoran Navy had been able to provide, she hadn't been ready, not truly, for mortality still hadn't come face to face with the reality that she could die as easily as anyone else, that the universe could survive her personal extinction and go right on, and even worse, perhaps, she hadn't really recognized that all the weapons and targeting systems would do precisely and inevitably what they'd been designed to do, that once those missiles were fired in earnest, other people were going to die in shocking, horrifying numbers, whether she did or not. And now it was the turn of Sandra Crandall and all of the officers and enlisted personnel aboard her starships to face that recognition. She wondered how many would survive the experience. Gervais Archer watched his admiral and wondered what was going through her mind. As a rule, he felt generally confident of his ability to read her moods. She wasn't the most inscrutable person he'd ever met, after all. She could be as tactically sneaky and subtle as anyone he'd ever seen, but her personality was open and direct, not to mention stubborn, with a distinct tendency to come at things head-on. 
Yet at this moment, he couldn't read her body language, not clearly. There was no sign of hesitance or uncertainty, no indication of second-guessing herself, no sign any concern over future consequences would be permitted to erode present determination. But there was something, something he wasn't accustomed to seeing from her, and he wondered why the word he kept thinking of was sorrow. Michelle Hankey drew a deep breath and squared her shoulders, unaware of her flag lieutenant's thoughts as she ordered her own to attend to the business at hand. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. Too late to change that, and the decision wasn't really yours to begin with, girl. So instead of thinking about what Crandall's too damned stupid to see coming, think about what she is doing right this moment. Actually, she rather suspected Crandall was doing exactly the same thing she was, staring at icons in a plot. Of course, her own data was far better than anything Crandall could have. Michelle had seeded the entire star system with FTL sensor platforms, and she'd paid special attention to the volume inside the hyperlimit, particularly along the plane of the ecliptic. At the moment, her plot was being driven by a highly stealthy platform less than one light second from Crandall's flagship, and the directional transmissions from the platform were less than five seconds old by the time she saw them on the display. Aside from the actual impeller signatures of Tenth Fleet ships, any data Crandall had was almost five minutes old. At the moment, that meant little, but when missiles started to fly, it was going to mean a great deal indeed. Thank you, Michael and Sir Ivars, she thought sardonically. And thank you, Admiral Hempel. She glanced at the time display. Five minutes had passed since her battlecruiser squadrons re-entered normal space. Crandall clearly had no idea she was already in Michelle's powered range, assuming Michelle was prepared to accept a two-and-a-half-minute ballistic phase between her second and third missile drives. Powered range wasn't necessarily the same thing as accurate range, though, and she wasn't about to waste birds from this far out unless she had to. The range from Crandall to Kumalo and Terakov was shrinking steadily, however, and when it fell to three light minutes... About another seventeen minutes, Admiral Crandall, Vice Admiral Gloria Michelle Samantha Evelyn Henke thought grimly. Another seventeen minutes. I make it another seventeen minutes, sir, Commander Pope said quietly, and Ivar's Terakov nodded, then looked at Commander Stilwell Lewis. Let's go ahead and spot the Alpha launch, Stilwell. Yes, sir. Commander Lewis began inputting commands, and as those commands reached the shoals of pods the withdrawing ammunition ships had left behind, onboard tractors began reaching out from clusters of them. They locked onto the ships designated to control them, moving out of the planetary shadow, settling into launch position. And as if that had been a signal, which it had, the lax which had been left behind by the sea lax began jockeying into position. If everything went as planned, those lacks wouldn't be needed except to sweep up the pieces. Neither would Gold Peak's battlecruisers, for that matter. In fact, if everything went as planned, those battlecruisers would represent no more than an insurance policy which hadn't been needed after all, and possibly an additional threat to shape the thinking of the Sali CO. Of course, everything seldom went as planned, Terakov thought, remembering his battle plans at Monica and a star called Hyacinth. He watched Lewis, then glanced over his shoulder at Ensign Zilwicky, and his somber mood lightened suddenly. In fact, he found it difficult not to smile, despite the approaching Solarian juggernaut. The eyes of his extraordinarily youthful flag lieutenant were bright with concentration, watching everything on Quentin St. James's flag deck. If she'd been a cat, the lashing of her tail would have presented a serious safety hazard. Calmly, Helen, he said softly, barely loud enough for her to hear, and she looked at him quickly. Their eyes met, and then she grinned crookedly. That obvious, was I, sir? Let's just say it's reasonably apparent that what you'd really like to be doing just now is Commander Lewis's job. 
Sorry, sir. She grimaced. It's just... Just that the last time you and Abigail were sitting in the hot seats, he acknowledged. And you will be again some day. Promise. Yes, sir. He gave her another smile, then turned back to his own displays and his own thoughts. Despite the best efforts of both Bueps and Bue ships, the Royal Manticore and Navy's missile pods kept obstinately proliferating, spinning off one new variant after another, and of late, pod capacity had trended steadily downward. The original flat-pack pods, which had come in with the final generation of superconductor capacitors, had carried 12 MDMs each. Then along had come the next-generation flat packs with internal tractor systems. They'd still managed to keep capacity up to a dozen birds, but only until they'd shifted to the fusion-powered Mark 23. At that point, the designers had been forced to figure out how to cram in the pod's own fusion plant, since its new power budget had to be able to spin up the Mark 23's plants at launch. The Bureau of Weapons had opted to hold the pod's dimensions constant in order to simplify handling and manufacturing constraints, despite the fact that it had dropped its capacity to only 10 Mark 23s. The reduction in throw weight hadn't been universally popular, particularly since the number of pods each ship carried hadn't magically increased, which left them with a 16% overall reduction in magazine capacity. Bueps had argued, however, that the advantages of the new fusion-powered missiles, especially the advantages that kind of power supply made possible for the electronic warfare platforms, and of the new pod's vastly extended capacity for independent deployment, more than compensated for the reduction in missiles per pod, especially coupled with the introduction of the keyhole platforms. Although each pod might carry fewer missiles, keyhole-based tactics were going to emphasize stacked patterns anyway. The number of control links the new platforms made available would have required that, even with the older-style pods, if salvo density was going to be maximized. But then Apollo had come along, and the Apollo control missile, the Mark 23E. The Echo was the heart of the Apollo system, and big enough that a single Mark 23E displaced two standard Mark 23s. That had pushed the maximum capacity of a same-dimension pod down to just nine missiles, only eight of which were attack birds. No one had objected to that, given the incredible increase in lethality Apollo made possible, but it had constituted yet another reduction in overall ammunition stowage, so Bueps had gone back to work and come up with yet another in the flat-pack pod series, the Mark 19. The Mark 19 was the same as the Mark 15 and Mark 17 pods, and it contained no more missiles, but its surface contours had been changed significantly. Whereas earlier marks of pods had been symmetrical, the Mark 19 was asymmetrical. Its surface contours had been deliberately designed so that flipping alternate layers of pods allowed them to pack even more flatly into the available volume of the RMN's SDP's missile cores. As a consequence, although the total number of missiles which could be deployed using a single pattern of pods was no greater, the total missile stowage of the existing SDP classes had been restored to pre-fusion levels. In fact, it had actually increased by just under 4%. None of which had any particular relevance to 10th Fleet at this particular moment, since it had no SDPs currently on its order of battle, but the fact that the reserve missile pods for the Podnaught's 10th Fleet was supposed to receive had already arrived had quite a bit of relevance. And despite the fact that not a single one of Michelle Hankey's heavy cruisers mounted keyhole, and certainly none of them had keyhole 2 capability, Ivar's Terakov was very happy to settle for only nine missiles per pod. And wasn't it nice of Bueps to leave the Echo's sublight telemetry links in place too, he thought coldly, watching the icons of Sandra Crandall's ships sweeping closer and closer.